This is Audible. Blackstone Audio presents Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin by Timothy Snyder Your golden hair, Marguerite, your ashen hair, Shulamit, Paul Celan, Death Fugue Everything flows, everything changes. You can't board the same prison train twice. Vasily Grossman, Everything Flows a stranger drowned on the Black Sea alone, with no one to hear his prayers for forgiveness. Storm on the Black Sea, Ukrainian traditional song. Whole cities disappear, in nature's stead only a white shield to counter non-existence. Thomas Venklova, The Shield of Achilles. Preface Europe Now we will live. This is what the hungry little boy liked to say as he toddled along the quiet roadside or through the empty fields. But the food that he saw was only in his imagination. The wheat had all been taken away in a heartless campaign of requisitions that began Europe's era of mass killing. It was 1933, and Joseph Stalin was deliberately starving Soviet Ukraine. The little boy died, as did more than three million other people. I will meet her said a young Soviet man of his wife, under the ground. He was right. He was shot after she was, and they were buried among the 700,000 victims of Stalin's great terror of 1937 and 1938. They asked for my wedding ring, which I— The Polish officer broke off his diary just before he was executed by the Soviet secret police in 1940. He was one of about 200,000 Polish citizens shot by the Soviets or the Germans at the beginning of the Second World War, while Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union jointly occupied his country. Late in 1941, an 11-year-old Russian girl in Leningrad finished her own humble diary. Only Tanya is left. Adolf Hitler had betrayed Stalin. Her city was under siege by the Germans, and her family were among the four million Soviet citizens the Germans starved to death. The following summer, a twelve-year-old Jewish girl in Belarus wrote a last letter to her father. I am saying goodbye to you before I die. I am so afraid of this death because they throw small children into the mass graves alive. She was among the more than five million Jews gassed or shot by the Germans. In the middle of Europe, in the middle of the twentieth century, the Nazi and Soviet regimes murdered some fourteen million people. The place where all the victims died, the Bloodlands, extends from central Poland to western Russia, through Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states. During the consolidation of National Socialism and Stalinism, 1933 to 1938, the joint German-Soviet occupation of Poland, 1939 to 1941, and then the German-Soviet War, 1941-1945, mass violence of a sort never before seen in history was visited upon this region. The victims were chiefly Jews, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Poles, Russians, and Balts, the peoples native to these lands. The fourteen million were murdered over the course of only twelve years, between 1933 and 1945, while both Hitler and Stalin were in power. Though their homelands became battlefields midway through this period, these people were all victims of murderous policy rather than casualties of war. The Second World War was the most lethal conflict in history, and about half of the soldiers who perished on all of its battlefields all the world over died here in this same region, in the Bloodlands. Yet not a single one of the fourteen million murdered was a soldier on active duty. Most were women, children, and the aged. None were bearing weapons. Many had been stripped of their possessions, including their clothes. Auschwitz is the most familiar killing site of the Bloodlands. Today Auschwitz stands for the Holocaust, and the Holocaust for the evil of a century. Yet the people registered as laborers at Auschwitz had a chance of surviving. Thanks to the memoirs and novels written by survivors, its name is known. Far more Jews, most of them Polish Jews, were gassed in other German death factories where almost everyone died, and whose names are less often recalled. Treblinka, Kelno, Sobibor, Buzets. Still more Jews, Polish or Soviet or Baltic Jews, were shot over ditches and pits. 
Most of these Jews died near where they had lived, in occupied Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Soviet Ukraine, and Soviet Belarus. The Germans brought Jews from elsewhere to the bloodlands to be killed. Jews arrived by train to Auschwitz from Hungary, Czechoslovakia, France, the Netherlands, Greece, Belgium, Yugoslavia, Italy, and Norway. German Jews were deported to the cities of the bloodlands, to Lodz, or Kaunas, or Minsk, or Warsaw, before being shot or gassed. The people who lived on the block where I am writing now, in the ninth district of Vienna, were deported to Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Riga, all in the bloodlands. The German mass murder of Jews took place in occupied Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and the Soviet Union, not in Germany itself. Hitler was an anti-Semitic politician in a country with a small Jewish community. The Jews were fewer than 1% of the German population when Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, and about one quarter of 1% by the beginning of the Second World War. During the first six years of Hitler's rule, German Jews were allowed, in humiliating and impoverishing circumstances, to emigrate. Most of the German Jews who saw Hitler win elections in 1933 died of natural causes. The murder of 165,000 German Jews was a ghastly crime in and of itself, but only a very small part of the tragedy of European Jews, fewer than 3% of the deaths of the Holocaust. Only when Nazi Germany invaded Poland in 1939 and the Soviet Union in 1941 did Hitler's visions of the elimination of Jews from Europe intersect with the two most significant populations of European Jews. His ambition to eliminate the Jews of Europe could be realized only in the parts of Europe where Jews lived. The Holocaust overshadows German plans that envisioned even more killing. Hitler wanted not only to eradicate the Jews, he wanted also to destroy Poland and the Soviet Union as states, exterminate their ruling classes, and kill tens of millions of Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Poles. If the German war against the USSR had gone as planned, 30 million civilians would have been starved in its first winter, and tens of millions more expelled, killed, assimilated, or enslaved thereafter. Though these plans were never realized, they supplied the moral premises of German occupation policy in the East. The Germans murdered about as many non-Jews as Jews during the war, chiefly by starving Soviet prisoners of war, more than three million, and residents of besieged cities, more than a million, or by shooting civilians in reprisals, the better part of a million, chiefly Belarusians and Poles. The Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany on the Eastern Front in the Second World War, thereby earning Stalin the gratitude of millions and a crucial part in the establishment of the post-war order in Europe. Yet Stalin's own record of mass murder was almost as imposing as Hitler's. Indeed, in times of peace it was far worse. In the name of defending and modernizing the Soviet Union, Stalin oversaw the starvation of millions and the shooting of three-quarters of a million people in the 1930s. Stalin killed his own citizens no less efficiently than Hitler killed the citizens of other countries. Of the 14 million people deliberately murdered in the bloodlands between 1933 and 1945, a third belong in the Soviet account. This is a history of political mass murder. The 14 million were all victims of a Soviet or Nazi killing policy, often of an interaction between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, but never casualties of the war between them. A quarter of them were killed before the Second World War even began. A further 200,000 died between 1939 and 1941, while Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were remaking Europe as allies. The deaths of the 14 million were sometimes projected in economic plans or hastened by economic considerations, but were not caused by economic necessity in any strict sense. Stalin knew what would happen when he seized food from the starving peasants of Ukraine in 1933, just as Hitler knew what could be expected when he deprived Soviet prisoners of war of food eight years later. In both cases, more than three million people died. The hundreds of thousands of Soviet peasants and workers shot during the Great Terror in 1937 and 1938 were victims of express directives of Stalin, just as the millions of Jews shot and gassed between 1941 and 1945 were victims of an explicit policy of Hitler.
War did alter the balance of killing. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union was the only state in Europe carrying out policies of mass killing. Before the Second World War, in the first six and a half years after Hitler came to power, the Nazi regime killed no more than about 10,000 people. The Stalinist regime had already starved millions and shot the better part of a million. German policies of mass killing came to rival Soviet ones between 1939 and 1941, after Stalin allowed Hitler to begin a war. The Wehrmacht and the Red Army both attacked Poland in September 1939. German and Soviet diplomats signed a treaty on borders and friendship, and German and Soviet forces occupied the country together for nearly two years. After the Germans expanded their empire to the west in 1940 by invading Norway, Denmark, the Low Countries and France, the Soviets occupied and annexed Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and northeastern Romania. Both regimes shot educated Polish citizens in the tens of thousands and deported them in the hundreds of thousands. For Stalin, such mass repression was the continuation of old policies on new lands. For Hitler, it was a breakthrough. The very worst of the killing began when Hitler betrayed Stalin and German forces crossed into the recently enlarged Soviet Union in June 1941. Although the Second World War began in September 1939 with the joint German-Soviet invasion of Poland, the tremendous majority of its killing followed that second eastern invasion. In Soviet Ukraine, Soviet Belarus and the Leningrad district, lands where the Stalinist regime had starved and shot some four million people in the previous eight years, German forces managed to starve and shoot even more in half the time. Right after the invasion began, the Wehrmacht began to starve its Soviet prisoners, and special task forces called Einsatzgruppen began to shoot political enemies and Jews. Along with the German order police, the Waffen-SS and the Wehrmacht, and with the participation of local auxiliary police and militias, the Einsatzgruppen began that summer to eliminate Jewish communities as such. The bloodlands were where most of Europe's Jews lived, where Hitler and Stalin's imperial plans overlapped, where the Wehrmacht and the Red Army fought, and where the Soviet NKVD and the German SS concentrated their forces. Most killing sites were in the bloodlands. In the political geography of the 1930s and early 1940s, this meant Poland, the Baltic states, Soviet Belarus, Soviet Ukraine, and the western fringe of Soviet Russia. Stalin's crimes are often associated with Russia and Hitler's with Germany. But the deadliest part of the Soviet Union was its non-Russian periphery, and Nazis generally killed beyond Germany. The horror of the 20th century is thought to be located in the camps. But the concentration camps are not where most of the victims of National Socialism and Stalinism died. These misunderstandings regarding the sites and methods of mass killing prevent us from perceiving the horror of the 20th century. Germany was the site of concentration camps liberated by the Americans and the British in 1945. Russian Siberia was, of course, the site of much of the Gulag, made known in the West by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The images of these camps, in photographs or in prose, only suggest the history of German and Soviet violence. About a million people died because they were sentenced to labor in German concentration camps, as distinct from the German gas chambers and the German killing fields and the German starvation zones, where ten million people died. Over a million lives were shortened by exhaustion and disease in the Soviet Gulag between 1933 and 1945, as distinct from the Soviet killing fields and the Soviet hunger regions, where some six million people died, about four million of them in the bloodlands. Ninety percent of those who entered the Gulag left it alive. Most of the people who entered German concentration camps, as opposed to the German gas chambers, death pits, and prisoner of war camps, also survived. The fate of concentration camp inmates, horrible though it was, is distinct from that of those many millions who were gassed, shot, or starved. The distinction between concentration camps and killing sites cannot be made perfectly. People were executed and people were starved in camps. Yet there is a difference between a camp sentence and a death sentence, between labor and gas, between slavery and bullets. The tremendous majority of the mortal victims of both the German and the Soviet regimes never saw a concentration camp. 
Auschwitz was two things at once, a labor camp and a death facility, and the fate of non-Jews seized for labor and Jews selected for labor was very different from the fate of Jews selected for the gas chambers. Auschwitz thus belongs to two histories, related but distinct. Auschwitz as labor camp is more representative of the experience of the large number of people who endured German or Soviet policies of concentration, whereas Auschwitz as death facility is more typical of the fates of those who were deliberately killed. Most of the Jews who arrived at Auschwitz were simply gassed. They, like almost all of the 14 million killed in the bloodlands, never spent time in a concentration camp. The German and Soviet concentration camps surround the bloodlands, from both east and west, blurring the black with their shades of grey. At the end of the Second World War, American and British forces liberated German concentration camps such as Belsen and Dachau, but the Western Allies liberated none of the important death facilities. The Germans carried out all of their major killing policies on land subsequently occupied by the Soviets. The Red Army liberated Auschwitz, and it liberated the sites of Treblinka, Sobibor, Buzhets, Chelmno, and Majdanek as well. American and British forces reached none of the bloodlands and saw none of the major killing sites. It is not just that American and British forces saw none of the places where the Soviets killed, leaving the crimes of Stalinism to be documented after the end of the Cold War and the opening of the archives. It is that they never saw the places where the Germans killed, meaning that understanding of Hitler's crimes has taken just as long. The photographs and films of German concentration camps were the closest that most Westerners ever came to perceiving the mass killing. Horrible though these images were, they were only hints of the history of the bloodlands. They are not the whole story. Sadly, they are not even an introduction. Mass killing in Europe is usually associated with the Holocaust, and the Holocaust with rapid industrial killing. The image is too simple and clean. At the German and Soviet killing sites, the methods of murder were rather primitive. Of the 14 million civilians and prisoners of war killed in the bloodlands between 1933 and 1945, more than half died because they were denied food. Europeans deliberately starved Europeans in horrific numbers in the middle of the 20th century. The two largest mass killing actions after the Holocaust, Stalin's directed famines of the early 1930s and Hitler's starvation of Soviet prisoners of war in the early 1940s involved this method of killing. Starvation was foremost not only in reality, but in imagination. In a hunger plan, the Nazi regime projected the death by starvation of tens of millions of Slavs and Jews in the winter of 1941-1942. After starvation came shooting and then gassing. In Stalin's Great Terror of 1937-1938, nearly 700,000 Soviet citizens were shot. The 200,000 or so Poles killed by the Germans and the Soviets during their joint occupation of Poland were shot. The more than 300,000 Belarusians and the comparable number of Poles executed in German reprisals were shot. The Jews killed in the Holocaust were about as likely to be shot as to be gassed. For that matter, there was little especially modern about the gassing. The million or so Jews asphyxiated at Auschwitz were killed by hydrogen cyanide, a compound isolated in the 18th century. The 1.6 million or so Jews killed at Treblinka, Chelmno, Buzhets and Sobibor were asphyxiated by carbon monoxide, which even the ancient Greeks knew was lethal. In the 1940s, hydrogen cyanide was used as a pesticide, Carbon monoxide was produced by internal combustion engines. The Soviets and the Germans relied upon technologies that were hardly novel even in the 1930s and 1940s. Internal combustion, railways, firearms, pesticides, barbed wire. No matter which technology was used, the killing was personal. People who were starved were observed, often from watchtowers, by those who denied them food. People who were shot were seen through the sights of rifles at very close range, or held by two men while a third placed a pistol at the base of the skull. People who were asphyxiated were rounded up, put on trains, and then rushed into the gas chambers. They lost their possessions, and then their clothes, and then, if they were women, their hair. Each one of them died a different death, since each one of them had lived a different life. 
The sheer numbers of the victims can blunt our sense of the individuality of each one. I'd like to call you all by name, wrote the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova in her requiem, but the list has been removed and there is nowhere else to look. Thanks to the hard work of historians, we have some of the lists. Thanks to the opening of the archives in Eastern Europe, we have places to look. We have a surprising number of the voices of the victims. The recollections, for example, of one young Jewish woman who dug herself from the Nazi death pit at Babi Yar in Kiev, or of another who managed the same at Ponari, near Vilnius. We have the memoirs of some of the few dozen survivors of Treblinka. We have an archive of the Warsaw Ghetto, painstakingly assembled, buried, and then, for the most part, found. We have the diaries kept by the Polish officers shot by the Soviet NKVD in 1940 at Ketin, unearthed along with their bodies. We have notes thrown from the buses taking Poles to death pits during the German killing actions of that same year. We have the words scratched on the wall of the synagogue in Kovel, and those left on the wall of the Gestapo prison in Warsaw. We have the recollections of Ukrainians who survived the Soviet famine of 1933, those of Soviet prisoners of war who survived the German starvation campaign of 1941, and those of Leningraders who survived the starvation siege of 1941 to 1944. We have some of the records of the perpetrators taken from the Germans because they lost the war, or found in Russian or Ukrainian or Belarusian or Polish or Baltic archives after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. We have reports and letters from German policemen and soldiers who shot Jews, and of the German anti-partisan units who shot Belarusian and Polish civilians. We have the petition sent by the Communist Party activists before they enforced famine in Ukraine in 1932-1933. We have the death quotas for peasants and national minorities sent down from Moscow to regional NKVD offices in 1937 and 1938 and the replies asking that these quotas be increased. We have the interrogation protocols of the Soviet citizens who were then sentenced and killed. We have German death counts of Jews shot over pits and gassed at death facilities. We have Soviet death counts for the shooting actions of the Great Terror and at Ketin. We have good overall estimates of the numbers of killings of Jews at the major killing sites, based on tabulations of German records and communications, survivor testimonies, and Soviet documents. We can make reasonable estimates of the number of famine deaths in the Soviet Union, not all of which were recorded. We have Stalin's letters to his closest comrades, Hitler's table talk, Himmler's date book, and much else. Insofar as a book like this one is possible at all, it is thanks to the achievements of other historians, to their use of such sources and countless others. Although certain discussions in this book draw from my own archival work, the tremendous debt to colleagues and earlier generations of historians will be evident in its pages and the notes. Throughout, the work will recall the voices of the victims themselves and those of their friends and families. It will cite the perpetrators as well, those who killed and those who ordered the killing. It will also call as witnesses a small group of European writers, Anna Akhmatova, Hannah Arendt, Josef Chapsky, Gunter Grass, Vasily Grossman, Gareth Jones, Arthur Kestler, George Orwell, and Alexander Weisberg. It will also follow the career of two diplomats, the American-Russia specialist George Kennan, who found himself in Moscow at crucial moments, and the Japanese spy Chiuni Sugihara, who took part in the policies that Stalin saw as justifying mass terror and then saved Jews from Hitler's Holocaust. Some of these writers recorded one policy of mass killing, others two or even more. Some of them provided lucid analyses, others jarring comparisons, others unforgettable images. What they have in common is a sustained attempt to view Europe between Hitler and Stalin, often in disregard of the taboos of their day. In a comparison of the Soviet and Nazi regimes, the political theorist Hannah Arendt wrote in 1951, that factuality itself depends for its continued existence upon the existence of the non-totalitarian world. The American diplomat George Kennan made the same point in simpler words in Moscow in 1944. Here men determine what is true and what is false. Is truth nothing more than a convention of power, or can truthful historical accounts resist the gravity of politics? 
Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union sought to master history itself. The Soviet Union was a Marxist state, whose leaders proclaimed themselves to be scientists of history. National Socialism was an apocalyptic vision of total transformation, to be realized by men who believed that will and race could slough off the burden of the past. The twelve years of Nazi and the seventy-four years of Soviet power certainly weigh heavily on our ability to evaluate the world. Many people believe that the crimes of the Nazi regime were so great as to stand outside history. This is a troubling echo of Hitler's own belief that will triumphs over facts. Others maintain that the crimes of Stalin, though horrible, were justified by the need to create or defend a modern state. This recalls Stalin's view that history has only one course, which he understood, and which legitimates his policies in retrospect. Without a history built and defended upon an entirely different foundation, we will find that Hitler and Stalin continue to define their own works for us. What might that basis be? Although this study involves military, political, economic, social, cultural, and intellectual history, its three fundamental methods are simple. Insistence that no past event is beyond historical understanding or beyond the reach of historical inquiry, reflection upon the possibility of alternative choices and acceptance of the irreducible reality of choice in human affairs, and orderly chronological attention to all of the Stalinist and Nazi policies that killed large numbers of civilians and prisoners of war. Its form arises not from the political geography of empires, but from the human geography of victims. The bloodlands were no political territory, real or imagined. They are simply where Europe's most murderous regimes did their most murderous work. For decades, national history, Jewish, Polish, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian, Lithuanian, Estonian, Latvian, has resisted the Nazi and Soviet conceptualizations of the atrocities. The history of the bloodlands has been preserved, often intelligently and courageously, by dividing the European past into national parts, and then by keeping these parts from touching one another. Yet attention to any single persecuted group, no matter how well executed as history, will fail as an account of what happened in Europe between 1933 and 1945. Perfect knowledge of the Ukrainian past will not produce the causes of the famine. Following the history of Poland is not the best way to understand why so many Poles were killed in the Great Terror. No amount of knowledge of the Belarusian history can make sense of the prisoner of war camps and the anti-partisan campaigns that killed so many Belarusians. A description of Jewish life can include the Holocaust, but not explain it. Often what happened to one group is intelligible only in the light of what happened to another. But that is just the beginning of the connections. The Nazi and Soviet regimes, too, have to be understood in light of how their leaders strove to master these lands and saw these groups and their relationships to one another. Today, there is widespread agreement that the mass killing of the twentieth century is of the greatest moral significance for the twenty-first. How striking, then, that there is no history of the bloodlands. Mass killing separated Jewish history from European history and East European history from West European history. Murder did not make the nations, but it still conditions their intellectual separation, decades after the end of National Socialism and Stalinism. This study brings the Nazi and Soviet regimes together, and Jewish and European history together, and the national histories together. It describes the victims and the perpetrators. It discusses the ideologies and the plans, and the systems and the societies. This is a history of the people killed by the policies of distant leaders. The victims' homelands lay between Berlin and Moscow. They became the bloodlands after the rise of Hitler and Stalin. Introduction Hitler and Stalin The origins of the Nazi and the Soviet regimes and of their encounter in the bloodlands lie in the First World War of 1914-1918. The war broke the old land empires of Europe while inspiring dreams of new ones. It replaced the dynastic principle of rule by emperors with the fragile idea of popular sovereignty. It showed that millions of men would obey orders to fight and die for causes abstract and distant, in the name of homelands that were already ceasing to be or only coming into being. New states were created from virtually nothing, 
and large groups of civilians were moved or eliminated by the application of simple techniques. More than a million Armenians were killed by Ottoman authorities. Germans and Jews were deported by the Russian Empire. Bulgarians, Greeks and Turks were exchanged among national states after the war. Just as important, the war shattered an integrated global economy. No adult European alive in 1914 would ever see the restoration of comparable free trade. Most European adults alive in 1914 would not enjoy comparable levels of prosperity during the rest of their lives. The essence of the First World War was the armed conflict between, on the one side, the German Empire, the Habsburg Monarchy, the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria, the Central Powers, and on the other side, France, the Russian Empire, Great Britain, Italy, Serbia and the United States, the Entente Powers. The victory of the Entente powers in 1918 brought an end to three European land empires, the Habsburg, German and Ottoman. By the terms of the post-war settlements of Versailles, Saint-Germain, Sèvres and Trianon, multinational domains were replaced by national states and monarchies by democratic republics. The European great powers that were not destroyed by the war, Britain and especially France, were substantially weakened. Among the victors, the illusion after 1918 was that life might somehow return to its course before the war. Among the revolutionaries who hoped to lead the defeated, the dream was that the bloodshed could legitimate further radical transformations which could impart meaning to the war and undo its damage. The most important political vision was that of communist utopia. At war's end, it had been seventy years since Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had penned their most famous lines, Workers of the world unite. Marxism had inspired generations of revolutionaries with the summons to political and moral transformation, an end of capitalism and the conflict that private property was thought to bring, and its replacement by a socialism that would liberate the working masses and restore to all of humanity an unspoiled soul. For Marxists, historical progress followed from a struggle between rising and falling classes, groups made and remade by changes in the mode of economic production. Each dominant political order was challenged by new social groups, formed by new economic techniques. The modern class struggle was between those who owned factories and those who worked in them. Accordingly, Marx and Engels anticipated that revolutions would begin in the more advanced industrial countries with large working classes, such as Germany and Great Britain. By disrupting the capitalist order and weakening the great empires, the First World War brought an obvious opportunity to revolutionaries. Most Marxists, however, had by then grown accustomed to working within national political systems and chose to support their governments in time of war. Not so Vladimir Lenin, a subject of the Russian Empire and the leader of the Bolsheviks. His voluntarist understanding of Marxism, the belief that history could be pushed onto the proper track, led him to see the war as his great chance. For a voluntarist such as Lenin, assenting to the verdict of history gave Marxists a license to issue it themselves. Marx did not see history as fixed in advance, but as the work of individuals aware of its principles. Lenin hailed from largely peasant country, which lacked, from a Marxist perspective, the economic conditions for revolution. Once again, he had a revolutionary theory to justify his revolutionary impulse. He believed that colonial empires had granted the capitalist system an extended lease on life, but that a war among empires would bring a general revolution. The Russian Empire crumbled first, and Lenin made his move. The suffering soldiers and impoverished peasants of the Russian Empire were in revolt in early 1917. After a popular uprising had brought down the Russian monarchy that February, a new liberal regime sought to win the war by one more military offensive against its enemies, the German Empire and the Habsburg monarchy. At this point, Lenin became the secret weapon of Germany. The Germans dispatched Lenin from Swiss exile to the Russian capital, Petrograd, that April, to make a revolution that would take Russia from the war. With the help of his charismatic ally Leon Trotsky and his disciplined Bolsheviks, Lenin achieved a coup d'etat with some popular support in November. In early 1918, Lenin's new government signed a peace treaty with Germany that left Belarus, Ukraine, the Baltics and Poland under German control. 
Thanks in part to Lenin, Germany won the war on the Eastern Front and had a brief taste of Eastern Empire. Lenin's peace came at the price of German colonial rule of what had been the West of the Russian Empire. But surely, reasoned the Bolsheviks, the German Empire would soon collapse along with the rest of the oppressive capitalist system, and Russian and other revolutionaries could spread their new order westward, to these terrains and beyond. The war, Lenin and Trotsky argued, would bring inevitable German defeat on the Western Front, and then a workers' revolution within Germany itself. Lenin and Trotsky justified their own Russian revolution to themselves and other Marxists by their expectation of imminent proletarian revolt in the more industrial lands of Central and Western Europe. In late 1918 and in 1919, it seemed as if Lenin just might be right. The Germans were indeed defeated by the French, British and Americans on the Western Front in autumn 1918, and so had to withdraw, undefeated, from their new Eastern Empire. German revolutionaries began scattered attempts to take power. The Bolsheviks picked up the spoils in Ukraine and Belarus. The collapse of the old Russian Empire and the defeat of the old German Empire created a power vacuum in Eastern Europe, which the Bolsheviks, try as they might, could not fill. While Lenin and Trotsky deployed their new Red Army in civil wars in Russia and Ukraine, five lands around the Baltic Sea, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland, became independent republics. After these losses of territory, the Russia of the Bolsheviks was less westerly than the Russia of the Tsars. Of these new independent states, Poland was more populous than the rest combined, and strategically by far the most important. More than any of the other new states that came into being at war's end, Poland changed the balance of power in Eastern Europe. It was not large enough to be a great power, but it was large enough to be a problem for any great power with plans of expansion. It separated Russia from Germany for the first time in more than a century. Poland's very existence created a buffer to both Russian and German power, and was much resented in Moscow and Berlin. Poland's ideology was its independence. There had been no Polish state since the late 18th century, when the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been partitioned out of existence by its imperial neighbours. Polish politics had continued under imperial rule throughout the 19th century, and the idea of a Polish nation had, if anything, consolidated. The declaration of Polish independence in November 1918 was only possible because all three of the partitioning powers, the German, Habsburg and Russian empires, disappeared after war and revolution. This great historical conjuncture was exploited by a Polish revolutionary, Józef Pilsudski. A socialist in his youth, Pilsudski had become a pragmatist, capable of cooperating with one empire against the others. When all of the empires collapsed, he and his followers, already organized into military legions during the war, were in the best position to declare and defend a Polish state. Pilsudski's great political rival, the nationalist Roman Dmowski, made Poland's case to the victorious powers in Paris. The new Poland was founded as a democratic republic. Endorsed by the victorious Entente powers, Warsaw could count on a more or less favorable boundary with Germany to the west. But the question of Poland's eastern border was open. Because the Entente had won no war on the eastern front, it had no terms to impose in Eastern Europe. In 1919 and 1920, the Poles and the Bolsheviks fought a war for the borderlands between Poland and Russia that was decisive for the European order. The Red Army had moved into Ukraine and Belarus as the Germans had withdrawn, but these gains were not acknowledged by the Polish leadership. Pilsudski saw these lands between as independent political subjects, whose history was linked to that of Poland and whose leaders should wish to restore some version of the old Commonwealth in Belarus and Lithuania. He hoped that Polish armies, supported by Ukrainian allies, could help create an independent Ukrainian state. Once the Bolsheviks had brought Ukraine under control in 1919 and halted a Polish offensive there in spring 1920, Lenin and Trotsky thought that they would bring their own revolution to Poland, using the bayonet to inspire workers to fulfill their historical role. After Poland's fall, German comrades, assisted by the new Red Army, would bring to bear Germany's vast resources to save the Russian Revolution. 
but the Soviet forces on their way to Berlin were halted by the Polish army at Warsaw in August 1920. Pilsudski led a counterattack that drove the Red Army back into Belarus and Ukraine. Stalin, a political officer with the Red Army in Ukraine, was among the defeated. His own misjudgments there prevented the proper coordination of Bolshevik forces, leaving the Red Army vulnerable to Pilsudski's maneuver. The Polish military victory did not mean the destruction of Bolshevik power. Polish troops were too exhausted to march on Moscow, and Polish society too divided to support such an adventure. In the end, territories inhabited by Belarusians and Ukrainians were divided between Bolshevik Russia and Poland. Poland was thus established as a multinational state, its population perhaps two-thirds Polish reckoned by language, but including some five million Ukrainians, three million Jews, one million Belarusians, and somewhere between half a million and a million Germans. Poland was constitutionally a state for the Polish nation, but it held the largest population of Jews in Europe, and the second largest, after Bolshevik Russia, population of Ukrainians and Belarusians. It shared all three of its large national minorities, the Jews, the Ukrainians, and the Belarusians, with its eastern neighbor. As East European borders were being decided on the battlefields of Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland, the victors in the First World War were dictating terms in Central and Western Europe. While Poland and the Bolsheviks were fighting on what had been the Eastern Front of the First World War, defeated Germany sought to present a pacific face to the victors. Germany declared itself a republic, the better to negotiate terms with the French, British, and Americans. Its major Marxist party, the Social Democrats, rejected the Bolshevik example and made no revolution in Germany. Most German Social Democrats had been loyal to the German Empire during the war and now saw the declaration of a German Republic as progress. But these moderating choices helped Germany little. The post-war settlements were dictated rather than discussed. In violation of a long European tradition, the defeated were denied a place at the table at the Paris peace talks. The German government had no choice but to sign the Treaty of Versailles of June 1919, but few German politicians felt bound to defend its terms. Because the treaty was drafted by moralizing victors, it could easily be attacked as hypocritical. While fighting a war against continental empires, the Entente powers had declared themselves to be supporters of the liberation of the nations of Central Europe. The Americans in particular characterized their participation in the war as a crusade for national self-determination. But the French, who had suffered more than any power, wanted the Germans punished and France's allies rewarded. The Treaty of Versailles indeed contradicted the very principle for which the Entente powers had claimed to fight the war national self-determination. At Versailles, as at Trianon, June 1920, and Sèvres, August 1920, the peoples considered allies by the Entente, Poles, Czechs, Romanians, got more territory, and accordingly more numerous ethnic minorities within their frontiers. The nations considered enemies, Germans, Hungarians, Bulgarians, got less territory, and accordingly larger diasporas of their own people within the borders of other states. The Polish-Bolshevik War was fought in the period between the opening of discussions at Versailles and the signing of the treaty at Sèvres. Because Europe was still at war in the East while these treaties were being negotiated and signed in the West, the new post-war order was a bit ethereal. It seemed vulnerable to revolution from the left, inspired or even brought by the Bolsheviks. So long as the Polish-Bolshevik War was underway, revolutionaries in Germany could imagine that help was coming from the Red Army. The new German Republic also seemed vulnerable to revolution from the right. German soldiers returning from the Eastern Front, where they had been victorious, saw no reason to accede to what they regarded as the humiliation of their homeland by the new Republic and the Treaty of Versailles that it had signed. Many veterans joined right-wing militias, which fought against left-wing revolutionaries. The German Social Democratic government, in the belief that it had no alternative, used some of the right-wing militias to suppress communist attempts at revolution. The Polish victory over the Red Army at Warsaw in August 1920 brought an end to hopes for a European socialist revolution. The treaty between Poland and Bolshevik Russia, signed in Riga in March 1921, 
was the true completion of the post-war settlement. It established Poland's eastern border, ensured that divided Ukrainian and Belarusian lands would be a bone of contention for years to come, and made of Bolshevism a state ideology rather than an armed revolution. The Soviet Union, when established the following year, would be a state with borders, in that respect at least a political entity like others. The end of large-scale armed conflict was also the end of hopes on the right that revolution could lead to counter-revolution. Those who wished to overturn the new German Republic, whether from the far right or the far left, would have to count on their own forces. German Social Democrats would remain supporters of the Republic, while German Communists would praise the Soviet model and follow the Soviet line. They would take their instructions from the Communist International, established by Lenin in 1919. The German far right would have to reimagine the end of the post-war order as a goal of Germany alone, to be achieved after Germany itself was rebuilt and remade. The rebuilding of Germany seemed more difficult than it really was. Germany, blamed for the war, lost not only territory and population, but the right to normal armed forces. It suffered in the early 1920s from hyperinflation and political chaos. Even so, Germany remained, at least potentially, the most powerful country in Europe. Its population was second only to that of the Soviet Union, its industrial potential second to none, its territory unoccupied during the war, and its possibilities for expansion sketched implicitly in the logic of the peace settlements. Once the fighting in Europe had ceased, the German government quickly found common ground with the Soviet Union. After all, both Berlin and Moscow wanted to change the European order at the expense of Poland. Each wished to be less isolated in international politics. Thus it was a democratic German government that signed the Treaty of Rapallo with the Soviet Union in 1922, restoring diplomatic relations, easing trade, and inaugurating secret military cooperation. For many Germans, self-determination was both persecution and promise. About ten million speakers of the German language former subjects of the Habsburg monarchy, remained beyond Germany's borders. Some three million such people inhabited the northwestern rim of Czechoslovakia, right at the border of Czechoslovakia and Germany. There were more Germans in Czechoslovakia than there were Slovaks. Almost the entire population of Austria, resting between Czechoslovakia and Germany, were German speakers. Austria was nevertheless required by the Treaty of Saint-Germain to exist as a separate state although much of its population would have preferred accession to Germany. Adolf Hitler, the leader of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, established in 1920, was an Austrian and an advocate of an Anschluss, a unification of Austria and Germany. Such goals of national unity, dramatic as they were, actually concealed the full measure of Hitler's ambitions. Later, Hitler would be the German Chancellor who signed the treaty with the Soviet Union that divided Poland. In taking this step, he would be taking to an extreme an idea that many Germans held, that Poland's borders were illegitimate and its people unworthy of statehood. Where Hitler stood apart from other German nationalists was in his view of what must come next, after the unification of Germans within Germany and the mastery of Poland the elimination of the European Jews, and the destruction of the Soviet Union. Along the way, Hitler would offer friendship to both Poland and the Soviet Union, and disguise his more radical intentions from Germans until it was too late. But the catastrophic visions were present in National Socialism from the beginning. When the cataclysm of war finally ended in Eastern Europe in 1921, Lenin and his revolutionaries had to regroup and think. Deprived by the Poles of their European triumph, the Bolsheviks had no choice but to douse the revolutionary conflagration and build some sort of socialist state. Lenin and his followers took for granted that they should hold power. Indeed, the failure of the European revolution became their justification for extraordinary aspirations to political control. Power had to be centralized so that the revolution could be completed and so that it could be defended from its capitalist enemies. They quickly banned other political parties and terrorized political rivals, dismissing them as reactionary. They lost the only competitive elections that they held, and so held no others. The Red Army, 
though defeated in Poland, was more than sufficient to defeat all armed rivals on the territory of the old empire. The Bolshevik secret service, known as the Cheka, killed thousands of people in the service of the consolidation of the new Soviet state. It was easier to triumph in violence than it was to make a new order. Marxism was of only limited help as a program for a multicultural country of peasants and nomads. Marx had assumed that revolution would come first to the industrial world, and had devoted only sporadic attention to the peasant question and the national question. Now the peasants of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, and the nomads of Central Asia would have to somehow be induced to build socialism for a working class that was concentrated in Russian-speaking cities. The Bolsheviks had to transform the pre-industrial society that they had inherited in order to build the industrial society which history had not yet brought. Only then could they alter that industrial society so that it favoured workers. The Bolsheviks had first to perform the constructive work of capitalism before they could really begin the transformative work of socialism. As the state created industry, they decided, it would draw members of the Soviet Union's countless cultures into a larger political loyalty that would transcend any national difference. The mastery of both peasants and nations was a grand ambition indeed, and the Bolsheviks concealed its major implication, that they were the enemies of their own peoples, whether defined by class or by nation. They believed that the society that they governed was historically defunct, a bookmark to be removed before a page was turned. To consolidate their power when the war was over and to gain loyal cadres for the economic revolution to come, the Bolsheviks had to make some compromises. Nations under their control would not be allowed independent statehood, of course, but nor were they condemned to oblivion. Though Marxists generally thought that the appeal of nationalism would decline with modernization, the Bolsheviks decided to recruit the nations or at least their elites, to their own campaign to industrialize the Soviet Union. Lenin endorsed the national identity of the non-Russian peoples. The Soviet Union was an apparent federation of Russia with neighboring nations. Policies of preferential education and hiring were to gain the loyalty and trust of non-Russians. Themselves subjects of one and then rulers of another multinational state, the Bolsheviks were capable of subtle reasoning and tact on the national question. The leading revolutionaries themselves were far from being Russians in any simple way. Lenin, regarded and remembered as Russian, was also of Swedish, German, Jewish and Kalmyk background. Trotsky was Jewish, and Stalin was Georgian. The nations were to be created in a new communist image. The peasants were to be consoled until they could be overcome. The Bolsheviks made a compromise with their rural population that they knew, and the peasants feared, was only temporary. The new Soviet regime allowed peasants to keep land that they had seized from their former landlords and to sell their produce on the market. The disruptions of war and revolution had brought desperate food shortages. The Bolsheviks had requisitioned grain to the benefit of themselves and of those loyal to them. Several million people died of hunger and related diseases in 1921 and 1922. The Bolsheviks learned from this experience that food was a weapon. Yet once the conflict was over and the Bolsheviks had won, they needed reliable food supplies. They had promised their people peace and bread, and would have to deliver a minimum of both, at least for a time. Lenin's state was a political holding action for an economic revolution still to come. His Soviet polity recognized nations, although Marxism promised a world without them, and his Soviet economy permitted a market, although communism promised collective ownership. When Lenin died in January 1924, debates were already underway about when and how these transitional compromises should yield to a second revolution. And it was precisely discussion in the new Soviet order that determined the fate of the Soviet population. From Lenin, the Bolsheviks had inherited the principle of democratic centralism, a translation of Marxist historiosophy into bureaucratic reality. Workers represented the forward flow of history. The disciplined Communist Party represented the workers. The Central Committee represented the party. The Politburo, a group of a few men, represented the Central Committee. Society was subordinate to the state, which was controlled by party, which in practice was ruled by a few people.
Disputes among members of this small group were taken to represent not politics, but rather history, and their outcomes were presented as its verdict. Stalin's interpretation of Lenin's legacy was to be decisive. When Stalin spoke of socialism in one country in 1924, he meant that the Soviet Union would have to build its workers' paradise without much help from the workers of the world, who had not united. Though communists disagreed about the priorities of agricultural policy, all took for granted that the Soviet countryside would soon have to finance its own destruction. But where to find the initial capital for the traumatic transition from an agrarian to an industrial economy? A way would have to be found to extract a surplus from the peasant, which could be sold for the foreign currency needed to import machinery, and used to fill the bellies of a growing working class. In 1927, as state investment shifted decisively in favour of industry, this discussion entered the critical phase. The debate over modernization was, above all, a duel between Trotsky and Stalin. Trotsky was the most accomplished of Lenin's comrades. Stalin, however, had been placed in charge of the party bureaucracy as General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Bolsheviks. Stalin's control of personnel and his practical genius in committee meetings brought him to the top. He did not dazzle in theoretical discussions, but he knew how to assemble a coalition. Within the Politburo, he allied first with those who favoured a slower course of economic transformation and eliminated those who seemed more radical. Then he radicalised his own position and purged his previous allies. By the end of 1927, his former rivals from the left Trotsky, Grigory Zinoviev, and Lev Kamenev had been expelled from the party. By the end of 1929, Stalin had associated himself with the policies of those purged rivals and rid himself of his main ally on the right, Nikolai Bukharin. Like Zinoviev and Kamenev, Bukharin remained in the Soviet Union, stripped of his previous authority. Stalin found loyal supporters within the Politburo, notably Lazar Kaganovich and Vyacheslav Molotov. Trotsky left the country. Dexterous though he was in defining Soviet policy, Stalin now had to ensure that it fulfilled its promise. By 1928, by the terms of his first five-year plan, Stalin proposed to seize farmland, force the peasants to work it in shifts under state control, and treat the crops as state property, a policy of collectivization. Land, equipment, and people would all belong to the same collective farm, large entities that would, it was assumed, produce more efficiently. Collective farms would be organized around machine tractor stations, which would distribute modern equipment and house the political agitators. Collectivization would allow the state to control agricultural output and thus feed its workers and keep their support, and to export to foreign countries and win some hard currency for investment in industry. To make collectivization seem inevitable, Stalin had to weaken the free market and replace it with state planning. His ally, Kaganovich, proclaimed in July 1928 that peasants were engaging in a grain strike and that requisitioning their crops was the only solution. Once peasants saw that their produce could be taken, they hid it rather than selling it. Thus the market appeared even more unreliable, although the state was really to blame. Stalin could then argue, as he did, that market spontaneity was the fundamental problem and that the state had to control food supplies. The coming of the Great Depression seemed to prove Stalin right about the unreliability of the market. On Black Tuesday, the 29th of October, 1929, the American stock market crashed. On the 7th of November, 1929, the 12th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, Stalin described the socialist alternative to the market that his policies would quickly bring to the Soviet Union. He promised that 1930 would be the year of the Great Transformation, when collectivization would bring security and prosperity. The old countryside would cease to exist. Then the revolution could be completed in the cities, where the proletariat would grow great on food produced by the pacified peasantry. These workers would create the first socialist society in history and a powerful state that could defend itself from foreign enemies. As Stalin made his case for modernization, he was also staking his claim to power. While Stalin worked, Hitler inspired. 
whereas Stalin was institutionalizing a revolution and thereby assuring himself a place at the top of a one-party state, Hitler made his political career by rejecting the institutions around him. The Bolsheviks inherited a tradition of debate, then discipline, from years of illegal work in the Russian Empire. The National Socialists, Nazis, had no meaningful traditions of discipline or conspiracy. Like the Bolsheviks, the Nazis rejected democracy, but in the name of a leader who could best express the will of the race, not in the name of a party that understood the dictates of history. The world order was not made by capitalist imperialists, as the Bolsheviks believed, but rather by conspiratorial Jews. The problem with the modern society was not that the accumulation of property led to the domination of a class. The problem was that Jews controlled both finance capitalism and communism, and thus America, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Communism was just a Jewish fairy tale of impossible equality designed to bring naive Europeans under Jewish thrall. The answer to heartless Jewish capitalism and communism could only be national socialism, which meant justice for Germans at the expense of others. Nazis tended to emphasize, in the democratic years of the 1920s, what they had in common with other Germans. Hitler's National Socialists were like most other German parties of the 1920s in their revulsion at the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The Nazis had a certain obsession with their manifest destiny in the East, where German soldiers had been victorious in the field in the First World War, and where Germany had ruled a large occupation zone in Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Baltic region in 1918. Unlike European rivals such as France and Great Britain, Germany had no vast world empire. It had surrendered its modest overseas possessions after losing the war. Thus the East European frontier beckoned all the more. The Soviet Union, seen as an illegitimate and oppressive Jewish regime, would have to fall. Poland, which lay between Germany and its eastern destiny, would have to be overcome along the way. It could not be a buffer to German power. It would have to be either a weak ally or a defeated foe in the coming wars for the East. Hitler tried and failed to begin a German national revolution in Munich in November 1923, which led to a brief spell in prison. Though the substance of his national socialism was his own creation, his coup d'état was inspired by the success of the Italian fascists he admired. Benito Mussolini had taken power in Italy the previous year after the March on Rome, which Hitler imitated without success in Munich. Italian fascists, like Hitler and his Nazis, offered the glorification of the national will over the tedium of political compromise. Mussolini, and Hitler following him, used the existence of the Soviet Union within domestic politics. While admiring the discipline of Lenin and the model of the one-party state, both men used the threat of a communist revolution as an argument for their own rule. Though the two men differed in many respects, they both represented a new kind of European right one which took for granted that communism was the great enemy while imitating aspects of communist politics. Like Mussolini, Hitler was an outstanding orator and the one dominant personality in his movement. Hitler had little trouble regaining the leadership of the Nazi party after his release from prison in December 1924. Stalin rose to power in the second half of the 1920s, in large measure because of the cadres whom he appointed and could trust to support him. Hitler drew support by way of personal charisma, and expected his associates and supporters to devise policies and language that corresponded to his rhetoric and imagination. Stalin interpreted Marxist thought as necessary to hasten his rise and defend his policies but at least until 1933 he was never free to interpret Marxism exactly as he liked. Hitler, on the other hand, inspired others to do his practical thinking for him. In prison, Hitler had written the first volume of his biographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. This and his other writings, especially his so-called second book, expressed his plans clearly, but they were not part of a canon. Stalin was at first constrained by what his comrades might do, and later concerned by what they might say. Hitler never had to maintain even an appearance of dialogue or consistency. Hitler made a certain compromise with the German Republic after his release from prison. He practiced parliamentary politics as the leader of his National Socialist Party, 
if only as a means of spreading propaganda, identifying enemies, and approaching the institutions of power. He tried to stay out of prison, even as Nazi paramilitaries engaged in brawls with left-wing enemies. In 1928, after the German economy had shown several consecutive years of growth, the Nazis took only twelve seats in Parliament, with 2.6% of the votes cast. Then came the Great Depression, a greater boon to Hitler than even to Stalin. The collapse of the German economy summoned the spectre of a communist revolution. Both helped Hitler come to power. The international economic crisis seemed to justify radical change. The seeming possibility of a revolution led by the large Communist Party of Germany generated fears that Hitler could channel towards nationalism. In September 1930, the Nazis won 18% of the vote and 107 seats, and then won the elections of July 1932 with no less than 37% of the vote. By 1932, German parliamentary elections were a demonstration of popular support rather than a direct route to power, since democracy in Germany existed only in form. For the previous two years, heads of government, chancellors, had induced the president to issue decrees that had the force of law. The parliament, Reichstag, convened only thirteen times in 1932. Hitler was appointed chancellor in January 1933, with the help of conservatives and nationalists who believed that they could use him to keep the large German left from power. To their surprise, Hitler called snap elections and used his new position to assert his party's hegemony over German society. When the results were announced on the 5th of March 1933, the Nazis had defeated the Social Democrats and the Communists in dramatic fashion. With 43.9% of the vote, and 288 of 647 seats in the Reichstag. Hitler was remaking the German political system in spring 1933, at the same time that Stalin was asserting his own personal authority in the Soviet Union. In 1933, the Soviet and Nazi governments shared the appearance of a capacity to respond to the world economic collapse. Both radiated dynamism at a time when liberal democracy seemed unable to rescue people from poverty. Most governments in Europe, including the German government before 1933, had believed that they had few means at their disposal to address the economic collapse. The predominant view was that budgets should be balanced and money supplies tightened. This, as we know today, only made matters worse. The Great Depression seemed to discredit the political response to the end of the First World War free markets, parliaments, nation-states. The market had brought disaster, no parliament had an answer, and nation-states seemingly lacked the instruments to protect their citizens from immiseration. The Nazis and Soviets both had a powerful story about who was to blame for the Great Depression. Jewish capitalists, or just capitalists, and authentically radical approaches to political economy. The Nazis and Soviets not only rejected the legal and political form of the post-war order, but also questioned its economic and social basis. They reached back to the economic and social roots of post-war Europe and reconsidered the lives and roles of the men and women who worked the land. In the Europe of the 1930s, peasants were still the majority in most countries, and arable soil was a precious natural resource, bringing energy to economies still powered by animals and humans. Calories were counted, but for rather different reasons than they are counted now. Economic planners had to make sure that populations could be kept fed, alive, and productive. Most of the states of Europe had no prospect of social transformation, and thus little ability to rival or counter the Nazis and the Soviets. Poland and other new East European states had tried land reform in the 1920s, but their efforts had proven insufficient. Landlords lobbied to keep their property, and banks and states were miserly with credit to peasants. The end of democracy across the region, except in Czechoslovakia, at first brought little new thinking on economic matters. Authoritarian regimes in Poland, Hungary, and Romania had less hesitation about jailing opponents and better recourse to find phrases about the nation. But none seemed to have much to offer in the way of a new economic policy during the Great Depression. In 1933, the Soviet and Nazi alternatives to democracy depended on their rejection of simple land reform, now the discredited pabulum of the failed democracies. 
Hitler and Stalin, for all of their many differences, presumed that one root of the problem was the agricultural sector, and that the solution was drastic state intervention. If the state could enact a radical economic transformation, that would then undergird a new kind of political system. The Stalinist approach, public since the beginning of Stalin's five-year plan in 1928, was collectivization. Soviet leaders allowed peasants to prosper in the 1920s, but took the peasants' land away from them in the early 1930s in order to create collective farms where peasants would work for the state. Hitler's answer to the peasant question was just as imaginative, and just as well camouflaged. Before, and even for a few years after he came to power in 1933, it appeared that Hitler was concerned above all with the German working class and would address Germany's lack of self-sufficiency in foodstuffs by means of imports. A policy of rapid and illegal rearmament removed German men from the unemployment rolls by placing them in barracks or in arms factories. Public works programs began a few months after Hitler came to power. It even appeared that the Nazis would do less for German farmers than they had indicated. Though the Nazi Party program promised the redistribution of land from richer to poorer farmers, this traditional version of land reform was quietly tabled after Hitler became Chancellor. Hitler pursued international agreements rather than redistributive agrarian policy. He sought special trade arrangements with East European neighbours by which German industrial goods were, in effect, exchanged for foodstuffs. Hitler's agricultural policy of the 1930s was a bit like Lenin's of the 1920s. It was political preparation for a vision of almost unimaginably radical economic change. Both National Socialism and Soviet Socialism baited peasants with the illusion of land reform, but involved far more radical plans for their future. The true Nazi agricultural policy was the creation of an eastern frontier empire. The German agricultural question would be resolved not within Germany, but abroad, by taking fertile land from Polish and Soviet peasants, who would be starved, assimilated, deported, or enslaved. Rather than importing grain from the East, Germany would export its farmers to the East. They would colonize the lands of Poland and the Western Soviet Union. Although Hitler spoke generally about the need for greater living space, he never made quite clear to German farmers that he expected them to migrate in large numbers to the East any more than the Bolsheviks had made clear to Soviet peasants that they expected them to concede their property to the state. During collectivization in the early 1930s, Stalin treated the campaign against his own peasants as a war for their grain. Hitler counted on victory in a future war to feed Germany. The Soviet program was made in the name of universal principles. The Nazi plan was for massive conquest in Eastern Europe for the benefit of a master race. Hitler and Stalin rose to power in Berlin and Moscow, but their visions of transformation concerned above all the lands between. Their utopias of control overlapped in Ukraine. Hitler remembered the ephemeral German Eastern colony of 1918 as German access to the Ukrainian breadbasket. Stalin, who had served his revolution in Ukraine shortly thereafter, regarded the land in much the same way. Its farmland and its peasants were to be exploited in the making of a modern industrial state. Hitler looked upon collectivization as a disastrous failure, and presented it as proof of the failure of Soviet communism as such. But he had no doubt that Germans could make of Ukraine a land of milk and honey. For both Hitler and Stalin, Ukraine was more than a source of food. It was the place that would enable them to break the rules of traditional economics rescue their countries from poverty and isolation, and remake the continent in their own image. Their programs and their power all depended upon their control of Ukraine's fertile soil and its millions of agricultural labourers. In 1933, Ukrainians would die in the millions, in the greatest artificial famine in the history of the world. This was the beginning of the special history of Ukraine, but not the end. In 1941, Hitler would seize Ukraine from Stalin and attempt to realize his own colonial vision, beginning with the shooting of Jews and the starvation of Soviet prisoners of war. The Stalinists colonized their own country, and the Nazis colonized occupied Soviet Ukraine. And the inhabitants of Ukraine suffered and suffered. During the years that both Stalin and Hitler were in power, 
more people were killed in Ukraine than anywhere else in the bloodlands or in Europe or in the world. Chapter 1. The Soviet Famines 1933 was a hungry year in the Western world. The streets of American and European cities teemed with men and women who had lost their jobs and grown accustomed to waiting in line for food. An enterprising young Welsh journalist, Gareth Jones, saw unemployed Germans in Berlin rally to the voice of Adolf Hitler. In New York he was struck by the helplessness of the American worker three years into the Great Depression. I saw hundreds and hundreds of poor fellows in single file, some of them in clothes which once were good, all waiting to be handed out two sandwiches, a doughnut, a cup of coffee, and a cigarette. In Moscow, where Jones arrived that March, hunger in the capitalist countries was cause for celebration. The Depression seemed to herald a world socialist revolution. Stalin and his coterie boasted of the inevitable triumph of the system they had built in the Soviet Union. Yet 1933 was also a year of hunger in the Soviet cities, especially in Soviet Ukraine. In Ukraine cities, Kharkiv, Kiev, Stalino, Dnipropetrovsk, hundreds of thousands of people waited each day for a simple loaf of bread. In Kharkiv, the Republic's capital, Jones saw a new sort of misery. People appeared at two o'clock in the morning to queue in front of shops that did not open until seven. On an average day, forty thousand people would wait for bread. Those in line were so desperate to keep their places that they would cling to the belts of those immediately in front of them. Some were so weak from hunger that they could not stand without the ballast of strangers. The waiting lasted all day, and sometimes for two. Pregnant women and maimed war veterans had lost their right to buy out of turn, and had to wait in line with the rest if they wanted to eat. Somewhere in line a woman would wail, and the moaning would echo up and down the line, so that the whole group of thousands sounded like a single animal with an elemental fear. People in the cities of Soviet Ukraine were afraid of losing their place in bread lines, and they were afraid of starving to death. They knew that the city offered their only hope of nourishment. Ukrainian cities had grown rapidly in the previous five years, absorbing peasants and making of them workers and clerks. Ukrainian peasant sons and daughters, along with the Jews, Poles, and Russians who had inhabited these cities for much longer, were dependent upon food they obtained in shops. Their families in the country had nothing. This was unusual. Normally, in times of hunger, city dwellers will make for the countryside. In Germany or the United States, the farmers almost never went hungry, even during the Great Depression. Workers and professionals in cities were reduced to selling apples or stealing them, but always somewhere, in the Altes land or in Iowa, there was an orchard, a silo, a larder. The city folk of Ukraine had nowhere to go, no help to seek from the farms. Most had ration coupons that they would need to present in order to get any bread. Ink on paper gave them what chance to live that they had, and they knew it. The proof was all around. Starving peasants begged along the bread lines, asking for crumbs. In one town, a fifteen-year-old girl begged her way to the front of the line, only to be beaten to death by the shopkeeper. The city housewives making the queues had to watch as peasant women starved to death on the sidewalks. A girl walking to and from school each day saw the dying in the morning and the dead in the afternoon. One young communist called the peasant children he saw living skeletons. A party member in Industrial Stalino was distressed by the corpses of the starved that he found at his back door. Couples strolling in parks could not miss the signs forbidding the digging of graves. Doctors and nurses were forbidden from treating or feeding the starving who reached their hospitals. The city police seized famished urchins from city streets to get them out of sight. In Soviet Ukrainian cities, policemen apprehended several hundred children a day. One day in early 1933, the Kharkiv police had a quota of 2,000 to fill. About 20,000 children awaited death in the barracks of Kharkiv at any given time. The children pleaded with the police to be allowed, at least, to starve in the open air. Let me die in peace. I don't want to die in the death barracks. Hunger was far worse in the cities of Soviet Ukraine than in any city in the Western world. 
In 1933 in Soviet Ukraine, a few tens of thousands of city dwellers actually died of starvation. Yet the vast majority of the dead and dying in Soviet Ukraine were peasants, the very people whose labors had brought what bread there was to the cities. The Ukrainian cities lived, just, but the Ukrainian countryside was dying. City dwellers could not fail to notice the destitution of peasants who, contrary to all seeming logic, left the fields in search of food. The train station at Dnipropetrovsk was overrun with starving peasants, too weak even to beg. On a train, Gareth Jones met a peasant who had acquired some bread, only to have it confiscated by the police. They took my bread away from me, he repeated over and over again, knowing that he would disappoint his starving family. At the Stalino station, a starving peasant killed himself by jumping in front of a train. That city, the center of industry in southeastern Ukraine, had been founded in imperial times by John Hughes, a Welsh industrialist for whom Gareth Jones's mother had worked. The city had once been named after Hughes, now it was named after Stalin. Today it is known as Donetsk. Stalin's five-year plan, completed in 1932, had brought industrial development at the price of popular misery. The deaths of peasants by railways bore a frightful witness to these new contrasts. Throughout Soviet Ukraine, rail passengers became unwitting parties to dreadful accidents. Hungry peasants would make their way to the cities along railway lines, only to faint from weakness on the tracks. At Kurtzisk, Peasants who had been chased away from the station hanged themselves on nearby trees. The Soviet writer Vasily Grossman, returning from a family visit to his hometown Berdichev, encountered a woman begging for bread at the window of his train compartment. The political émigré Arthur Kestler, who had come to the Soviet Union to help build socialism, had a similar experience. As he recalled much later, outside Kharkiv station, peasant women held up to the carriage windows horrible infants with enormous wobbling heads, stick-like limbs, and swollen, pointed bellies. He found that the children of Ukraine looked like embryos out of alcohol bottles. It would be many years before these two men, now regarded as two of the moral witnesses of the twentieth century, wrote about what they had seen. City dwellers were more accustomed to the sight of peasants at the marketplace, spreading their bounty and selling their wares. In 1933, peasants made their way to familiar city markets, but now to beg, rather than to sell. Market squares, now empty of both goods and customers, conveyed only the disharmonies of death. Early in the day, the only sound was the soft breathing of the dying, huddled under rags that had once been clothes. One spring morning, amidst the piles of dead peasants at the Kharkiv market, an infant suckled the breast of its mother whose face was a lifeless grey. Passers-by had seen this before, not just the disarray of corpses, not just the dead mother and the living infant, but that precise scene, the tiny mouth, the last drops of milk, the cold nipple. The Ukrainians had a term for this. They said to themselves quietly as they passed, These are the buds of the socialist spring. The mass starvation of 1933 was the result of Stalin's first five-year plan, implemented between 1928 and 1932. In those years, Stalin had taken control of the heights of the Communist Party, forced through a policy of industrialization and collectivization, and emerged as the frightful father of a beaten population. He had transformed the market into the plan, farmers into slaves, and the wastes of Siberia and Kazakhstan into a chain of concentration camps. His policies had killed tens of thousands by execution, hundreds of thousands by exhaustion, and put millions at risk of starvation. He was still rightly concerned about opposition within the Communist Party, but was possessed of immense political gifts, assisted by willing satraps and atop a bureaucracy that claimed to see and make the future. That future was communism, which required heavy industry, which in turn required collectivized agriculture, which in turn required control of the largest social group in the Soviet Union, the peasantry. The peasant, perhaps especially the Ukrainian peasant, was unlikely to see himself as a tool in this great mechanization of history. Even if he understood entirely the final purposes of Soviet policy, which was very unlikely, he could hardly endorse them. 
he was bound to resist the policy designed to relieve him of his land and his freedom. Collectivization had to mean a great confrontation between the largest group within Soviet society, the peasantry, and the Soviet state and its police, then known as the OGPU. Anticipating this struggle, Stalin had ordered in 1929 the most massive deployment of state power in Soviet history. The labor of building socialism, said Stalin, would be like raising the ocean. That December he announced that kulaks would be liquidated as a class. The Bolsheviks presented history as a struggle of classes, the poorer making revolutions against the richer to move history forward. Thus, officially, the plan to annihilate the Kulaks was not a simple decision of a rising tyrant and his loyal retinue. It was a historical necessity, a gift from the hand of a stern but benevolent Cleo. The naked attack of organs of state power upon a category of people who had committed no crime was furthered by vulgar propaganda. One poster, under the title, We Will Destroy the Kulaks as a Class, portrayed a Kulak under the wheels of a tractor a second kulak as an ape hoarding grain, and a third sucking milk directly from a cow's teat. These people were inhuman, they were beasts, so went the message. In practice, the state decided who was a kulak and who was not. The police were to deport prosperous farmers who had the most to lose from collectivization. In January 1930, the Politburo authorized the state police to screen the peasant population of the entire Soviet Union. The corresponding Ogpu order of the 2nd of February specified the measures needed for the liquidation of the Kulaks as a class. In each locality, a group of three people, or Troika, would decide the fate of the peasants. The Troika, composed of a member of the state police, a local party leader, and a state procurator, had the authority to issue rapid and severe verdicts, death, exile, without the right to appeal. Local party members would often make recommendations. At the plenums of the village Soviet, one local party leader said, we create kulaks as we see fit. Although the Soviet Union had laws and courts, these were now ignored in favor of the simple decision of three individuals. Some 30,000 Soviet citizens would be executed after sentencing by troikas. In the first four months of 1930, 113,637 people were forcibly transported from Soviet Ukraine as kulaks. Such an action meant about 30,000 peasant huts emptied one after another, their surprised inhabitants given little or no time to prepare for the unknown. It meant thousands of freezing freight cars filled with terrified and sick human cargo bound for destinations in northern European Russia, the Urals, Siberia, or Kazakhstan. It meant gunshots and cries of terror at the last dawn peasants would see at home. It meant frostbite and humiliation on the trains, and anguish and resignation as peasants disembarked as slave labourers on the taiga or the steppe. The Ukrainian peasantry knew about deportations to prison camps which had touched them from the mid-1920s onward. They now sang a lament that was already traditional. O oh, Solovki, Solovki, such a long road, the heart cannot beat, terror crushes the soul. Solovki was a prison complex on an island in the Arctic Sea. In the minds of Ukrainian peasants, Solovki stood for all that was alien, repressive, and painful in exile from the homeland. For the communist leadership of the Soviet Union, Solovki was the first place where the labor of deportees had been transformed into profit for the state. In 1929, Stalin had decided to apply the model of Solovki across the entire Soviet Union, ordering the construction of special settlements and concentration camps. The concentration camps were demarcated zones of labor, usually surrounded by fences and patrolled by guards. The special settlements were new villages purpose-built by the inmates themselves after they were dropped on the empty steppe or taiga. All in all, some 300,000 Ukrainians were among the 1.7 million kulaks deported to special settlements in Siberia, European Russia, and Kazakhstan. Mass deportation of peasants for purposes of punishment coincided with the mass use of forced labor in the Soviet economy. In 1931, the special settlements and the concentration camps were merged into a single system known as the Gulag. The Gulag, 
which the Soviets themselves called a system of concentration camps, began alongside the collectivization of agriculture and depended upon it. It would eventually include 476 camp complexes to which some 18 million people would be sentenced, of whom between a million and a half and three million would die during their periods of incarceration. The free peasant became the slave laborer engaged in the construction of the giant canals, mines and factories that Stalin believed would modernize the Soviet Union. Among the labor camps, the Ukrainian peasant was most likely to be sent to dig the Bellamore, a canal between the White Sea and the Baltic Sea that was a particular obsession of Stalin. Some 170,000 people dug through frozen soil with picks and shovels, and sometimes with shards of pottery or with their hands, for twenty-one months. They died by the thousand from exhaustion or disease, finding their end at the bottom of a dry canal that, when completed in 1933, turned out to be of little practical use in water transport. The death rates of the special settlements were also high. Soviet authorities expected 5% of the prisoners in the special settlements to die. In fact, the figure reached 10 to 15%. An inhabitant of Arkhangelsk, the major city on the White Sea, complained of the senselessness of the endeavor. It is one thing to destroy the Kulak in an economic sense. To destroy their children in a physical sense is nothing short of barbaric. Children died in the far north in such numbers that their corpses are taken to the cemetery in threes and fours without coffins. A group of workers in Vologda questioned whether the journey to world revolution had to pass through the corpses of these children. The death rates in the Gulag were high, but they were no higher than those that would soon attend parts of the Ukrainian countryside. Workers at the Bellamore were given very poor food rations, some six hundred grams of bread, about thirteen hundred calories a day. Yet this was actually better nutrition than what was available in Soviet Ukraine at about the same time. Forced laborers at Bellamore got twice or three times or six times as much as the peasants who remained in Soviet Ukraine would get on the collective farms in 1932 and 1933, when they got anything at all. In the first weeks of 1930, collectivization proceeded at a blinding pace in Soviet Ukraine and throughout the Soviet Union. Moscow sent quotas of districts to be collectivized to capitals of the Soviet republics, where party leaders vowed to exceed them. The Ukrainian leadership promised to collectivize the entire republic in one year, and then local party activists, with an eye to impressing their own superiors, moved even more quickly promising collectivization in a matter of nine to twelve weeks. Threatening deportation, they coerced peasants into signing away their claims to land and joining the collective farm. The state police intervened with force, often deadly force, when necessary. Twenty-five thousand workers were shipped to the countryside to add numbers to police power and overmaster the peasantry. Instructed that the peasants were responsible for food shortages in the towns, workers promised to make soap out of the kulak. By the middle of March 1930, 71 percent of the arable land in the Soviet Union had been, at least in principle, attached to collective farms. This meant that most peasants had signed away their farms and joined a collective. They no longer had any formal right to use land for their own purposes. As members of a collective, they were dependent upon its leaders for their employment, pay, and food. They had lost or were losing their livestock, and would depend for their equipment upon the machinery, usually lacking, of the new machine tractor stations. These warehouses, the centers of political control in the countryside, were never short on party officials and state policemen. Perhaps even more so than in Soviet Russia, where communal farming was traditional, the Soviet Ukraine peasants were terrified by the loss of their land. Their whole history was one of a struggle with landlords, which they seemed finally to have won during the Bolshevik Revolution. But in the years immediately thereafter, between 1918 and 1921, the Bolsheviks had requisitioned food from the peasants as they fought their civil wars. So peasants had good reason to be wary of the Soviet state. Lenin's compromise policy of the 1920s had been very welcome, even if peasants suspected, with good reason, that it might one day be reversed. In 1930, collectivization seemed to them to be a second serfdom, the beginning of a new bondage, 
now not to the wealthy landowners, as in recent history, but to the Communist Party. Peasants in Soviet Ukraine feared the loss of their hard-won independence, but they also feared starvation, and indeed for the fate of their immortal souls. The rural societies of Soviet Ukraine were still, for the most part, religious societies. Many of the young and the ambitious, those swayed by official communist atheism, had left for the big Ukrainian cities, or for Moscow or Leningrad. Though their orthodox church had been suppressed by the atheist communist regime, the peasants were still Christian believers, and many understood the contract with the collective farm as a pact with the devil. Some believed that Satan had come to earth in human form as a party activist, his collective farm register a book of hell promising torment and damnation. The new machine tractor stations looked like the outposts of Gehenna. Some Polish peasants in Ukraine, Roman Catholics, also saw collectivization in apocalyptic terms. One Pole explained to his son why they would not join the collective farm. I do not want to sell my soul to the devil. Understanding this religiosity, party activists propagated what they called Stalin's First Commandment. The collective farm supplies first the state, and only then the people. As the peasants would have known, the First Commandment in its biblical form reads, Thou shalt have no other god before me. Ukrainian villages had been deprived of their natural leaders by the deportations of kulaks to the gulag. Even without the deported kulaks, peasants tried to rescue themselves and their communities. They tried to preserve their own little plots, their small patches of autonomy. They endeavoured to keep their families away from the state, now physically manifest in the collective farms and the machine tractor stations. They sold or slaughtered their livestock, rather than lose it to the collective. Fathers and husbands sent daughters and wives to do battle with the party activists and the police, believing that women were less likely to be deported than men. Sometimes men dressed as women just for the chance to put a hoe or a shovel into the body of a local communist. Crucially, though, the peasants had few guns and poor organization. The state had a near monopoly on firepower and logistics. Peasants' actions were recorded by a powerful state police apparatus, one that perhaps did not understand their motives, but grasped their general direction. The Ogpu noted almost one million acts of individual resistance in Ukraine in 1930. Of the mass peasant revolts in the Soviet Union that March, almost half took place in Soviet Ukraine. Some Ukrainian peasants voted with their feet, walking westward, across the frontier into neighboring Poland. Whole villages followed their example, taking up church banners or crosses, or sometimes just black flags tied to sticks, and marching westward toward the border. Thousands of them reached Poland, where knowledge of famine conditions in the Soviet Union spread. The flight of peasants to Poland was an international embarrassment and perhaps a source of real concern for Stalin and the Politburo. It meant that Polish authorities, who at the time were trying to stage a political rapprochement with their own large Ukrainian national minority, learned about the course and consequences of collectivization. Polish border guards patiently interviewed the refugees, gaining knowledge of the course and the failure of collectivization. Some of the peasants begged for a Polish invasion to halt their misery. The refugee crisis also provided Poland with a major propaganda weapon to use against the Soviet Union. Under Józef Pilsudski, Poland never planned an aggressive war against the Soviet Union, but it did prepare contingency plans for the disintegration of the Soviet Union along national lines, and did take some steps designed to hasten such a course of events. Even as Ukrainians were fleeing Soviet Ukraine, Poland was dispatching its own spies in the opposite direction, to encourage the Ukrainians to revolt. Their propaganda posters called Stalin a hunger czar, who exported grain while starving his own people. In March 1930, Politburo members feared that the Polish government might intervene. Collectivization was a general policy. The Soviet Union was a vast state, and instability in one borderland had to be considered in light of general scenarios for war. Stalin and the Soviet leaders regarded Poland as the western part of an international capitalist encirclement, and Japan as the eastern. Polish-Japanese relations were rather good, 
and in spring 1930, Stalin seemed most troubled by the specter of a joint Polish-Japanese invasion. The Soviet Union, by far the largest country in the world, extended from Europe to the Pacific Ocean, and Stalin had to attend not only to European powers, but also to the Asian ambitions of Japan. Tokyo had made its military reputation at the expense of Russians. Japan had emerged as a world power by defeating the Russian Empire in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, seizing the railways built by the Russians to reach Pacific ports. As Stalin well knew, both Poland and Japan took an interest in Soviet Ukraine and in the national question in the Soviet Union. Stalin seemed to feel the history of Russian humiliation in Asia quite deeply. He was fond of the song, On the Hills of Manchuria, which promised bloody vengeance upon the Japanese. So, just as chaos brought by collectivization in the Western Soviet Union gave rise to fears of a Polish intervention, disorder in the Eastern Soviet Union seemed to favor Japan. In Soviet Central Asia, especially in largely Muslim Soviet Kazakhstan, collectivization brought even greater chaos than in Soviet Ukraine. It required an even more drastic social transformation. The peoples of Kazakhstan were not peasants, but nomads, and the first step in Soviet modernization was to make them settle down. Before collectivization could even begin, the nomadic populations had to become farmers. The policy of sedentarization deprived the herdsmen of their animals, and thus of their means of supporting themselves. People rode their camels or horses across the border into the Muslim Xinjiang or Turkestan region of China, which suggested to Stalin that they might be agents of the Japanese, the dominant foreign power amidst Chinese internal conflicts. All was not going as planned. Collectivization, which was supposed to secure the Soviet order, seemed instead to destabilize the borderlands. In Soviet Asia, as in Soviet Europe, a five-year plan that was supposed to bring socialism had brought instead enormous suffering, and a state that was supposed to represent justice responded with very traditional security measures. Soviet Poles were deported from western border zones, and the border guard was strengthened everywhere. The world revolution would have to take place behind closed borders, and Stalin would have to take steps to protect what he called socialism in one country. Stalin had to delay foreign adversaries and rethink domestic plans. He asked Soviet diplomats to initiate discussions with Poland and Japan on non-aggression pacts. He saw to it that the Red Army was ordered to full battle readiness in the Western Soviet Union. Most tellingly, Stalin suspended collectivization. In an article dated the 2nd of March 1930 under the brilliant title Dizzy with Success, Stalin maintained that the problem with collectivization was that it had been implemented with just a little too much enthusiasm. It had been a mistake, he now asserted, to force the peasants to join the collective farms. The latter now disappeared just as quickly as they had been created. In spring 1930, peasants in Ukraine harvested the winter wheat and sowed the seeds for the autumn crops just as if the land belonged to them. They could be forgiven for thinking that they had won. Stalin's withdrawal was tactical. Given time to think, Stalin and the Politburo found more effective means to subordinate the peasantry to the state. In the countryside the following year, Soviet policy proceeded with much greater deftness. In 1931, collectivization would come because peasants would no longer see a choice. The lower cadres of the Ukrainian branch of the Soviet Communist Party were purged to ensure that those working within the villages would be true to their purpose and understand what would await them if they were not. The independent farmer was taxed until the collective farm became the only refuge. As the collective farms slowly regrouped, they were granted indirect coercive power over neighboring independent farmers. They were allowed, for example, to vote to take the seed grain away from independent farmers. The seed grain, what is kept from one crop to plant the next, is indispensable to any working farm. The selection and preservation of the seed grain is the basis of agriculture. For most of human history, eating the seed grain has been synonymous with utter desperation. An individual who lost control of the seed grain to the collective lost the ability to live from his or her own labor. 
deportations resumed, and collectivization proceeded. In late 1930 and early 1931, some 32,127 more households were deported from Soviet Ukraine, about the same number of people as had been removed during the first wave of deportations a year before. Peasants thought that they would die either of exhaustion in the gulag or of hunger close to home, and preferred the latter. Letters from exiled friends and family occasionally escaped the censor. One included the following advice. No matter what, don't come. We are dying here. Better to hide, better to die there, but no matter what, don't come here. Ukrainian peasants who yielded to collectivization chose, as one party activist understood, to face starvation at home rather than banishment to the unknown. Because collectivization came more slowly in 1931, family by family rather than whole villages at once, it was harder to resist. There was no sudden attack to provoke a desperate defense. By the end of the year, the new approach had succeeded. About 70% of the farmland in Soviet Ukraine was now collectivized. The levels of March 1930 had been reached again, and this time durably. After the false start of 1930, Stalin had won the political victory in 1931. Yet the triumph in politics did not extend to economics. Something was wrong with the grain yields. The harvest of 1930 had been wonderfully bountiful. Farmers deported in early 1930 had sown their winter wheat already, and that crop could be harvested by someone else that spring. The months of January and February, when most of the country had been collectivized on paper in 1930, is a time when farmers are idle in any case. After March 1930, when the collectives were dissolved, peasants had the time to put down their spring crops as free men and women. The weather was unusually fine that summer. The crop of 1930 in Ukraine set a standard that could not be met in 1931, even if collectivized agriculture were as efficient as individual farming, which it was not. The bumper crop of 1930 provided the baseline number that the party used to plan requisitions for 1931. Moscow expected far more from Ukraine than Ukraine could possibly give. By autumn 1931, the failure of the first collectivized harvest was obvious. The reasons were many. The weather was poor, pests were a problem, animal power was limited because peasants had sold or slaughtered livestock, the production of tractors was far less than anticipated, the best farmers had been deported, sowing and reaping were disrupted by collectivization, and peasants who had lost their land saw no reason to work very hard. The Ukrainian party leader, Stanislav Kozio, had reported in August 1931 that requisition plans were unrealistic given low yields. Lazar Kaganovich told him that the real problem was theft and concealment. Kozio, though he knew better, enforced this line on his subordinates. More than half of the non-spoiled harvest was removed from Soviet Ukraine in 1931. Many collective farms met their requisition targets only by handing over their seed grain. Stalin ordered on the 5th of December that collective farms that had not yet fulfilled their annual requirements must surrender their seed grain. Stalin perhaps believed that peasants were hiding food, and thought that the threat of taking the seed grain would motivate them to hand over what they had. But by this time, many of them truly had nothing. By the end of 1931, many peasants were already going hungry. With no land of their own, and with little ability to resist requisitions, they simply had no way to ensure that a sufficient number of calories reached their households. Then, in early 1932, they had no seed grain with which to plant the fall crop. The Ukrainian party leadership asked for seed grain in March 1932, but by that time the planting was already delayed meaning that the harvest that fall would be poor. In early 1932, people asked for help. Ukrainian communists requested that their superiors in the Ukrainian party ask Stalin to call in the Red Cross. Members of collective farms tried writing letters to state and party authorities. One of these, after several paragraphs of formal administrative prose, closed with the plaintive, Give us bread, give us bread. Give us bread. 
Ukrainian party members bypassed Kozior and wrote directly to Stalin, taking an angry tone. How can we construct the socialist economy when we are all doomed to death by hunger? The threat of mass starvation was utterly clear to Soviet Ukrainian authorities, and it became so to Stalin. Party activists and secret police officers filed countless reports of death by starvation. In June 1932, the head of the party in the Kharkiv region wrote to Kozior that starvation had been reported in every single district of his region. Kozior received a letter from a member of the Young Communists dated 18th of June 1932 with a graphic description that was probably by then all too familiar. Collective farm members go into the fields and disappear. After a few days their corpses are found and, entirely without emotion, as though this were normal, buried in graves. The next day one can already find the body of someone who had just been digging graves for others. That same day, 18th of June 1932, Stalin himself admitted, privately, that there was famine in Soviet Ukraine. The previous day, the Ukrainian party leadership had requested food aid. He did not grant it. His response was that all grain in Soviet Ukraine must be collected as planned. He and Kaganovich agreed that it is imperative to export without fail immediately. Stalin knew perfectly well, and from personal observation, what would follow. He knew that famine under Soviet rule was possible. Famine had raged throughout Russia and Ukraine during and after the civil wars. A combination of poor harvests and requisitions had brought starvation to hundreds of thousands of peasants in Ukraine, especially in 1921. Scarcity of food was one of the reasons Lenin had made his compromise with peasants in the first place. Stalin was well aware of that history in which he had taken part. That Stalin's own policy of collectivization could cause mass starvation was also clear. By summer 1932, as Stalin knew, more than a million people had already starved to death in Soviet Kazakhstan. Stalin blamed the local party leader, Philip Goloschekin, but he must have understood some of the structural issues. Stalin, a master of personal politics, presented the Ukrainian famine in personal terms. His first impulse, and his lasting tendency, was to see the starvation of Ukrainian peasants as a betrayal by members of the Ukrainian Communist Party. He could not allow the possibility that his own policy of collectivization was to blame. The problem must be in the implementation, in the local leaders, anywhere but in the concept itself. As he pushed forward with his transformation in the first half of 1932, the problem he saw was not the suffering of his people, but rather the possibility that the image of his collectivization policy might be tarnished. Starving Ukrainian peasants, he complained, were leaving their home republic and demoralizing other Soviet citizens by their whining. Somewhat inchoately, Stalin seemed to think in spring and summer 1932 that if starvation could somehow just be denied, then it would go away. Perhaps he reasoned that Ukraine was in any case overpopulated, and that the deaths of a few hundred thousand people would matter little in the long run. He wanted local Ukrainian officials to meet grain procurement targets despite the certain prospect of lower yields. Local party officials found themselves between Stalin's red hammer and the grim reaper's sickle. The problems they saw were objective and not soluble through ideology or rhetoric. Lack of seed grain, late sowing, poor weather, machinery insufficient to replace animal labor, chaos from the final push toward collectivization in late 1931, and hungry peasants unable to work. The world as local party activists had to see it, in the Ukrainian countryside, was described far better by this Ukrainian children's song than by the terse orders and propaganda conceits coming from Moscow. Father Stalin, look at this. Collective farming is just bliss. The huts in ruins, the barns all sagged, all the horses broken nags. And on the hut a hammer and sickle, and in the hut death and famine. No cows left, no pigs at all, just your picture on the wall. Daddy and Mommy are in the kolkos. The poor child cries as alone he goes. There's no bread and there's no fat. The party's ended all of that. Seek not the gentle nor the mild. A father's eaten his own child. The party man he beats and stamps, 
and sends us to Siberian camps. Around the local party activists was death, and above them was denial. Starvation was a brute fact, indifferent to words and formulas, deportations and shootings. Beyond a certain point, the starving peasant could no longer productively work, and no amount of ideological correctness or personal commitment could change this. Yet, as this message travelled upward through institutional channels, it lost its force. True reports of hunger from below met political pressure from the top, at a Ukrainian Party Central Committee plenum of the 6th to the 9th of July, 1932, in Kharkiv. Ukrainian speakers complained of the impossibility of meeting the annual targets for grain requisitions. Yet they were silenced by Lazar Kaganovich and Vyacheslav Molotov, Politburo members and Stalin's emissaries from Moscow. Stalin had instructed them to defeat the Ukrainian destabilizers. Molotov and Kaganovich were Stalin's loyal and trusted allies, and with him dominated the Politburo and thus ruled the Soviet Union. Stalin was not yet an unrivaled dictator, and the Politburo was still in principle a kind of collective dictatorship. Yet these two men, unlike some of his previous allies in the Politburo, were unconditionally loyal. Stalin manipulated them ceaselessly, but he did not really have to. They served the revolution by serving him, and tended not to distinguish between the two. Kaganovich was already calling Stalin our father. In July 1932, in Kharkiv, they told Ukrainian comrades that talk of starvation was just an excuse for laziness on the part of peasants who did not wish to work, and activists who did not wish to discipline them and requisition grain. By this time, Stalin was on vacation having travelled in a train well stocked with fine provisions south from Moscow through the starving Ukraine to the pretty resort town of Sochi on the Black Sea. He and Kaganovich wrote to each other, confirming their shared view of the famine as a plot directed against them personally. Stalin managed a nice reversal, imagining that it was the peasants, not him, who were using hunger as a weapon. Kaganovich reassured Stalin that talk of Ukrainians as innocent victims was just a rotten cover-up for the Ukrainian party. Stalin expressed his fear that we could lose Ukraine. Ukraine would have to be made into a fortress. The two of them agreed that the only reasonable approach was to hold tight to a policy of requisitions and to export the grain as quickly as possible. By now, Stalin seemed to have worked out, at least to his own satisfaction, the connection between starvation and the disloyalty of Ukrainian communists. Hunger was a result of sabotage. Local party activists were the saboteurs. Treacherous higher party officials protected their subordinates, all in the service of Polish espionage. Perhaps as late as 1931, Stalin might indeed have interpreted Polish and Japanese policies as heralding an encirclement of the Soviet Union. The year 1930 was a peak time for Polish espionage in the Soviet Union. Poland had secretly founded a Ukrainian army on its own soil and was training dozens of Ukrainians and Poles for special missions inside the Soviet Union. Japan was indeed ever more threatening. In 1931, the Soviets had intercepted a note from the Japanese ambassador in Moscow in which he advocated preparations for an offensive war to conquer Siberia. That year, Japan had invaded Manchuria, a northeastern Chinese region with a long border with Soviet Siberia. In fall 1931, according to a Soviet intelligence report, Poland and Japan had signed a secret agreement concerning a joint attack on the Soviet Union. This was not the case, and insofar as there had been an incipient Polish-Japanese alliance, it was prevented by an adept Soviet foreign policy. Though Japan had declined to negotiate a non-aggression pact with Moscow, Poland had agreed. The Soviet Union wanted a treaty with Poland so that its economic transformation could be pursued in peace. Poland never had any intentions of starting a war, and was now experiencing economic depression. Its largely unreformed agrarian economic system could not support increasing military expending at a time of economic collapse. Soviet military budgets, comparable to Poland's for many years, were now far greater. The Soviet-Polish agreement was initialed in January 1932. In 1932 and 1933, there could be no serious thought of Poland as a threat by itself. 
the Polish army had suffered massive budget cuts. The Soviet police and border guards had captured a large number of Polish spies. Polish agents had not hindered collectivization during the chaos of 1930 and were helpless to rouse a starving population in 1932. They tried, and they failed. Even the most enthusiastic Polish proponents of an aggressive policy saw summer 1932 as a time for calm. If the Soviets promised peace, it seemed best to make no provocative moves. Polish diplomats and spies were witnesses to the famine. They knew that cannibalism has become a habit of sorts, and that entire villages have died out completely. But they had nothing to do with the famine's origins and could do nothing to help the victims. Poland did not publicize to the world what its diplomats knew about the famine. In February 1932, for example, an anonymous letter reached the Polish consulate in Kharkiv, pleading with the Poles to inform the world of the famine in Ukraine. But by then, the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union had been initialed, and Warsaw would take no such step. Stalin now had won far more room for maneuver in his western borderlands than he had had in 1930. Poland had accepted the status quo by signing the non-aggression pact in July 1932, and so the Ukrainian peasants were at his mercy. With pedantic enthusiasm, Stalin in August, still on vacation, offered his closest collaborators the theory that collectivization was missing only the correct legal basis. Socialism, he claimed, just like capitalism, needed laws to protect property. The state would be strengthened if all agricultural production was declared to be state property, any unauthorized collection of food deemed theft, and such theft made punishable by immediate execution. Thus, a starving peasant could be shot if he picked up a potato peel from a furrow in land that until recently had been his own. Perhaps Stalin really did think that this could work. The result, of course, was the removal of any legal protection that peasants may have had from the full violence of the triumphant state. The simple possession of food was presumptive evidence of a crime. The law came into force on the 7th of August, 1932. Soviet judges usually ignored the letter of the law, but the rest of the party and state apparatus understood its spirit. Often the most enthusiastic enforcers of the law were younger people, educated in the new Soviet schools, who believed in the promise of the new system. Members of the official youth organization were told that their main task was the struggle against theft and the hiding of grain, as well as kulak sabotage. For the young generation in the cities, communism had offered social advance, and the world demonized in this agitation was one that they had left behind. The Communist Party in Soviet Ukraine, though disproportionately Russian and Jewish in its membership, now included many young Ukrainians who believed that the countryside was reactionary and were eager to join in campaigns against peasants. Watchtowers went up in the fields to keep peasants from taking anything for themselves. In the Odessa region alone, more than 700 watchtowers were constructed. Brigades went from hut to hut, 5,000 youth organization members among their members, seizing everything they could find. Activists used, as one peasant recalled, long metal rods to search through stables, pigsties, stoves. They looked everywhere and took everything, down to the last little grain. They rushed through the village like the Black Death, calling out, Peasant, where is your grain? Confess. The brigades took everything that resembled food, including supper from the stove, which they ate themselves. Like an invading army, the party activists lived off the land, taking what they could and eating their fill, with little to show for their work and enthusiasm but misery and death. Perhaps from feelings of guilt, perhaps from feelings of triumph, they humiliated the peasants wherever they went. They would urinate in barrels of pickles, or order hungry peasants to box each other for sport or make them crawl and bark like dogs, or force them to kneel in the mud and pray. Women caught stealing on one collective farm were stripped, beaten, and carried naked through the village. In one village the brigade got drunk in a peasant's hut and gang-raped his daughter. Women who lived alone were routinely raped at night under the pretext of grain confiscations, and their food was indeed taken from them after their bodies had been violated. This was the triumph of Stalin's law and Stalin's state. Raids and decrees could not create food where there was none. Of course peasants will hide food, and hungry people will steal food, 
But the problem in the Ukrainian countryside was not theft and deceit, which might indeed have been solved by the application of violence. The problem was starvation and death. Grain targets were not met because collectivization had failed, the harvest of autumn 1932 was poor, and requisition targets were too high. Stalin sent Molotov to Ukraine to urge comrades forward in the struggle for grain. But the enthusiasm of Stalin's servants could not change what had already happened. Even Molotov was forced to recommend on the 30th of October that quotas for Ukraine be reduced somewhat. Stalin accepted the recommendation, but soon he was more categorical than ever. As of November 1932, only about one-third of the annual target had been met. As reports about failed requisitions were delivered to the Kremlin, Stalin's wife killed herself. She chose the 7th of November 1932, the 15th anniversary of the October Revolution, to shoot herself in the heart. Just what this meant to Stalin can never be entirely clear, but it seems to have been a shock. He threatened to kill himself as well. Kaganovich, who found Stalin a changed man, had to give the funeral oration. The next day, Stalin approached the problem of the famine with a new degree of malice. He placed the blame for problems in Ukraine at the feet of Ukrainian comrades and peasants. Two Politburo telegrams sent out on the 8th of November 1932 reflected the mood. Individual and collective farmers in Soviet Ukraine who failed to meet requisition targets were to be denied access to products from the rest of the economy. A special troika was created in Ukraine to hasten the sentencing and execution of party activists and peasants who, supposedly, were responsible for sabotage. Some 1,623 Kolkhoz officials were arrested that month. Deportations within Ukraine were resumed. 30,400 more people were gone by the end of the year. The activists told the peasants, Open up or we'll knock down the door. We'll take what you have and you'll die in a camp. As Stalin interpreted the disaster of collectivization in the last weeks of 1932, he achieved new heights of ideological daring. The famine in Ukraine, whose existence he had admitted earlier, when it was far less severe, was now a fairy tale, a slanderous rumor spread by enemies. Stalin had developed an interesting new theory, that resistance to socialism increases as its successes mounts because its foes resist with greater desperation as they contemplate their final defeat. Thus any problem in the Soviet Union could be defined as an example of enemy action, and enemy action could be defined as evidence of progress. Resistance to his policies in Soviet Ukraine, Stalin argued, was of a special sort, perhaps not visible to the imperceptive observer. Opposition was no longer open, for the enemies of socialism were now quiet and even holy. The Kulaks of today, he said, were gentle people, kind, almost saintly. People who appeared to be innocent were to be seen as guilty. A peasant slowly dying of hunger was, despite appearances, a saboteur working for the capitalist powers in their campaign to discredit the Soviet Union. Starvation was resistance, and resistance was a sign that the victory of socialism was just around the corner. These were not merely Stalin's musings in Moscow. This was the ideological line enforced by Molotov and Kaganovich as they travelled through regions of mass death in late 1932. Stalin never personally witnessed the starvations that he so interpreted, but comrades in Soviet Ukraine did. They had somehow to reconcile his ideological line to the evidence of their senses. Forced to interpret distended bellies as political opposition, they produced the utterly tortured conclusion that the saboteurs hated socialism so much that they intentionally let their families die. Thus the racked bodies of sons and daughters and fathers and mothers were nothing more than a façade behind which foes plotted the destruction of socialism. Even the starving themselves were sometimes presented as enemy propagandists with a conscious plan to undermine socialism. Young Ukrainian communists in the cities were taught that the starving were enemies of the people who risked their lives to spoil our optimism. Ukrainians in Poland gathered money for food donations, only to learn that the Soviet government categorically rejected any assistance. Ukrainian communists who asked for food relief from abroad, accepted by Soviet authorities in the early 1920s during the previous famine, got no hearing at all. 
For political reasons, Stalin did not wish to accept any help from the outside world. Perhaps he believed that if he were to remain atop the party, he could not admit that his first major policy had brought famine. Yet Stalin might have saved millions of lives without drawing any outside attention to the Soviet Union. He could have suspended food exports for a few months, released grain reserves, three million tons, or just given peasants access to local grain storage areas. Such simple measures, pursued as late as November 1932, could have kept the death toll to the hundreds of thousands rather than the millions. Stalin pursued none of them. In the waning weeks of 1932, facing no external security threat and no challenge from within, with no conceivable justification except to prove the inevitability of his rule, Stalin chose to kill millions of people in Soviet Ukraine. He shifted to a position of pure malice, where the Ukrainian peasant was somehow the aggressor and he, Stalin, the victim. Hunger was a form of aggression. For Kaganovich in a class struggle, for Stalin in a Ukrainian national struggle, against which starvation was the only defense. Stalin seemed determined to display his dominance over the Ukrainian peasantry, and seemed even to enjoy the depths of suffering that such a posture would require. Amartya Sen has argued that starvation is a function of entitlements and not of food availability as such. It was not food shortages, but food distribution that killed millions in Soviet Ukraine, and it was Stalin who decided who was entitled to what. Though collectivization was a disaster everywhere in the Soviet Union, the evidence of clearly premeditated mass murder on the scale of millions is most evident in Soviet Ukraine. Collectivization had involved the massive use of executions and deportations everywhere in the Soviet Union, and the peasants and nomads who made up the bulk of the Gulag's labor force hailed from all of the Soviet republics. Famine had struck parts of Soviet Russia as well as much of Soviet Ukraine in 1932. Nevertheless, the policy response to Ukraine was special and lethal. Seven crucial policies were applied only, or mainly, in Soviet Ukraine in late 1932 or early 1933. Each of them may seem like an anodyne administrative measure, and each of them was certainly presented as such at the time, and yet each of them had to kill. 1. On the 18th of November 1932, peasants in Ukraine were required to return grain advances that they had previously earned by meeting grain requisition targets. This meant that the few localities where peasants had had good yields were deprived of what little surplus they had earned. The party brigades and the state police were unleashed on these regions in a feverish hunt for whatever food could be found. Because peasants were not given receipts for the grain that they did hand over, they were subject to endless searches and abuse. The Ukrainian party leadership tried to protect the seed grain, but without success. 2. Two days later, on the 20th of November 1932, a meat penalty was introduced. Peasants who were unable to make grain quotas were now required to pay a special tax in meat. Peasants who still had livestock were now forced to surrender it to the state. Cattle and swine had been a last reserve against starvation. As a peasant girl remembered, whoever had a cow didn't starve. A cow gives milk, and as a last resort it can be slaughtered. Another peasant girl remembered that the family's one pig was seized, and then the family's one cow. She held its horns as it was led away. This was, perhaps, the attachment that teenaged girls on farms feel for their animals. But it was also desperation. Even after the meat penalty was paid, peasants still had to fulfill the original grain quota. If they could not do this under the threat of losing their animals, they certainly could not do so afterward. They starved. 3. Eight days later, on the 28th of November 1932, Soviet authorities introduced the Blacklist. According to this new regulation, collective farms that failed to meet grain targets were required, immediately, to surrender fifteen times the amount of grain that was normally due in a whole month. In practice, this meant, again, the arrival of hordes of party activists and police, with the mission and the legal right to take everything. No village could meet the multiplied quota, and so whole communities lost all of the food that they had. Communities on the blacklist also had no right to trade or to receive deliveries of any kind from the rest of the country.
They were cut off from food or indeed any other sort of supply from anywhere else. The blacklisted communities in Soviet Ukraine, sometimes selected from as far away as Moscow, became zones of death. 4. On the 5th of December 1932, Stalin's hand-picked security chief for Ukraine presented the justification for terrorizing Ukrainian party officials to collect the grain. Vsevolod Balitsky had spoken with Stalin personally in Moscow on the 15th and 24th of November. The famine in Ukraine was to be understood, according to Balitsky, as the result of a plot of Ukrainian nationalists, in particular of exiles with connections to Poland. Thus, anyone who failed to do his part in requisitions was a traitor to the state. Yet this policy line had still deeper implications. The connection of Ukrainian nationalism to Ukrainian famine authorized the punishment of those who had taken part in earlier Soviet policies to support the development of the Ukrainian nation. Stalin believed that the national question was, in essence, a peasant question and as he undid Lenin's compromise with the peasants, he also found himself undoing Lenin's compromise with the nations. On the 14th of December, Moscow authorized the deportation of local Ukrainian communists to concentration camps on the logic that they had abused Soviet policies in order to spread Ukrainian nationalism, thus allowing nationalists to sabotage the grain collection. Balitsky then claimed to have unmasked a Ukrainian military organization, as well as Polish rebel groups. He would report, in January 1933, the discovery of more than a thousand illegal organizations and, in February, the plans of Polish and Ukrainian nationalists to overthrow Soviet rule in Ukraine. The justifications were fabricated, but the policy had consequences. Poland had withdrawn its agents from Ukraine and had given up any hope of exploiting the disaster of collectivization. The Polish government, attempting to be loyal to the Soviet-Polish Non-Aggression Pact signed in July 1932, declined even to draw international attention to the worsening Soviet famine. Yet Balitsky's policy, though it rode the coattails of phantoms, generated local obedience to Moscow's policy. The mass arrests and mass deportations he ordered sent a very clear message. Anyone who defended the peasants would be condemned as an enemy. In these crucial weeks of late December, as the death toll in Soviet Ukraine rose into the hundreds of thousands, Ukrainian activists and administrators knew better than to resist the party line. If they did not carry out requisitions, they would find themselves, in the best case, in the Gulag. 5. On the 21st of December 1932, Stalin, through Kaganovich, affirmed the annual grain requisition quota for Soviet Ukraine to be reached by January 1933. On the 27th of November, the Soviet Politburo had assigned Ukraine a full third of the remaining collections for the entire Soviet Union. Now, hundreds of thousands of starvation deaths later, Stalin sent Kaganovich to hold the whip hand over the Ukrainian party leadership in Kharkiv. Right after Kaganovich arrived on the evening of the 20th of December, the Ukrainian Politburo was forced to convene. Sitting until four o'clock the next morning, it resolved that requisition targets were to be met. This was a death sentence for about three million people. As everyone in that room knew in those early morning hours, grain could not be collected from an already starving population without the most horrific of consequences. A simple respite from requisitions for three months would not have harmed the Soviet economy, and would have saved most of those three million lives. Yet Stalin and Kaganovich insisted on exactly the contrary. The state would fight ferociously, as Kaganovich put it, to fulfill the plan. Having achieved his mission in Kharkiv, Kaganovich then travelled through Soviet Ukraine, demanding 100% fulfilment of the plan, and sentencing local officials and ordering deportations of families as he went. He returned to Kharkiv on the 29th of December 1932, to remind Ukrainian party leaders that the seed grain was also to be collected. 6. As starvation raged throughout Ukraine in the first weeks of 1933, Stalin sealed the borders of the Republic so that peasants could not flee, and closed the cities so that peasants could not beg. As of the 14th of January 1933, Soviet citizens had to carry internal passports in order to reside in cities legally. Peasants were not to receive them. 
On the 22nd of January 1933, Valitsky warned Moscow that Ukrainian peasants were fleeing the Republic, and Stalin and Molotov ordered the state police to prevent their flight. The next day, the sale of long-distance rail tickets to peasants was banned. Stalin's justification was that the peasant refugees were not in fact begging bread, but rather engaging in a counter-revolutionary plot by serving as living propaganda for Poland and other capitalist states that wished to discredit the collective farm. By the end of February 1933, some 190,000 peasants had been caught and sent back to their home villages to starve. Stalin had his fortress in Ukraine, but it was a stronghold that resembled a giant starvation camp, with watchtowers, sealed borders, pointless and painful labor, and endless and predictable death. 7. Even after the annual requisition target for 1932 was met in late January 1933, collection of grain continued. Requisitions went forward in February and March as party members sought grain for the spring sowing. At the end of December 1932, Stalin had approved Kaganovich's proposal that the seed grain for the spring be seized to make the annual target. This left the collective farms with nothing to plant for the coming fall. Seed grain for the spring sowing might have been drawn from the trainloads bound at that very moment for export, or taken from the three million tons that the Soviet Union had stored as a reserve. Instead, it was seized from what little the peasants in Soviet Ukraine still had. This was very often the last bit of food that peasants needed to survive until the spring harvest. Some 37,392 people were arrested in Soviet Ukrainian villages that month many of them presumably trying to save their families from starvation. This final collection was murder, even if those who executed it very often believed that they were doing the right thing. As one activist remembered, that spring he saw people dying from hunger. I saw women and children with distended bellies, turning blue, still breathing, but with vacant, lifeless eyes. Yet he saw all this and did not go out of my mind or commit suicide. He had faith. As before, I believed because I wanted to believe. Other activists, no doubt, were less faithful and more fearful. Every level of the Ukrainian party had been purged in the previous year. In January 1933, Stalin sent in his own men to control its heights. Those communists who no longer expressed their faith formed a wall of silence that doomed those it surrounded. They had learned that to resist was to be purged, and to be purged was to share the fate of those whose deaths they were now bringing about. In Soviet Ukraine in early 1933, the Communist Party activists who collected the grain left a deathly quiet behind them. The countryside has its own orchestra of sound, softer and slower than the city, but no less predictable and reassuring for those born to it. Ukraine had gone mute. Peasants had killed their livestock, or lost it to the state. They had killed their chickens, they had killed their cats and their dogs. They had scared the birds away by hunting them. The human beings had fled, too, if they were lucky. More likely they, too, were dead, or too weak to make noise. Cut off from the attention of the world by a state that controlled the press and the movements of foreign journalists, cut off from official help or sympathy by a party line that equated starvation with sabotage, cut off from the economy by intense poverty and inequitable planning, cut off from the rest of the country by regulations and police cordons, people died alone, families died alone, whole villages died alone. Two decades later, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt would present this famine in Ukraine as the crucial event in the creation of a modern, atomized society, the alienation of all from all. Starvation led not to rebellion, but to amorality, to crime, to indifference, to madness, to paralysis, and finally to death. Peasants endured months of indescribable suffering, indescribable because of its duration and pain, but also indescribable because people were too weak, too poor, too illiterate to chronicle what was happening to them. But the survivors did remember. As one of them recalled, no matter what peasants did, they went on dying dying, dying. The death was slow, humiliating, ubiquitous, and generic. 
To die of starvation with some sort of dignity was beyond the reach of almost everyone. Petro Velli showed rare strength when he dragged himself through his village on the day he expected to die. The other villagers asked him where he was going, to the cemetery, to lay himself down. He did not want strangers coming and dragging his body away to a pit, so he had dug his own grave. But by the time he reached the cemetery, another body had filled it. He dug himself another one, lay down, and waited. A very few outsiders witnessed and were able to record what happened in these most terrible of months. The journalist Gareth Jones had paid his own way to Moscow, and, violating a ban on travel to Ukraine, took a train to Kharkiv on the 7th of March, 1933. He disembarked at random at a small station and tramped through the countryside with a backpack full of food. He found famine on a colossal scale. Everywhere he went he heard the same two phrases, everyone is swollen from starvation and we are waiting to die. He slept on dirt floors with starving children and learned the truth. Once, after he had shared his food, a little girl exclaimed, Now that I have eaten such wonderful things, I can die happy. Maria Lovinska travelled that same spring through Soviet Ukraine, accompanying her husband as he tried to sell his handiworks. The villages they knew from previous treks were now deserted. They were frightened by the unending silence. If they heard a cock crow, they were so happy that they were alarmed by their own reaction. The Ukrainian musician Josip Panasenko was dispatched by central authorities with his troop of Bandura players to provide culture to the starving peasants. Even as the state took the peasants' last bit of food, it had the grotesque inclination to elevate the minds and rouse the spirits of the dying. The musicians found village after village completely abandoned. Then they finally came across some people. Two girls dead in a bed, two legs of a man protruding from a stove, and an old lady raving and running her fingers through the dirt. The party official, Viktor Kravchenko, entered a village to help with the harvest one evening. The next day he found seventeen corpses in the marketplace. Such scenes could be found in villages throughout Soviet Ukraine, where, in that spring of 1933, people died at a rate of more than 10,000 a day. Ukrainians who chose not to resist the collective farms believed that they had at least escaped deportation. But now they could be deported because collective farming did not work. Some 15,000 peasants were deported from Soviet Ukraine between February and April 1933. Just east and south of Soviet Ukraine, in parts of the Russian Republic of the Soviet Union inhabited by Ukrainians, some 60,000 people were deported for failing to make grain quotas. In 1933, some 142,000 more Soviet citizens were sent to the Gulag, most of them either hungry or sick with typhus, many of them from Soviet Ukraine. In the camps they tried to find enough to eat. Since the Gulag had a policy of feeding the strong and depriving the weak, and these deportees were already weak from hunger, this was desperately difficult. When hungry prisoners poisoned themselves by eating wild plants and garbage, camp officials punished them for shirking. At least 67,297 people died of hunger and related illnesses in the camps, and 241,355 perished in the special settlements in 1933, many of them natives of Soviet Ukraine. Untold thousands more died on the long journey from Ukraine to Kazakhstan or the far north. Their corpses were removed from the trains and buried on the spot, their names and their numbers unrecorded. Those who were starving when they left their homes had little chance of survival in an alien environment. As one state official recorded in May 1933, when traveling, I often witnessed administrative exiles haunting the villages like shadows in search of a piece of bread or refuse. They eat carrion, slaughter dogs and cats. The villagers keep their houses locked. Those who get a chance to enter a house drop on their knees in front of the owner and, with tears, beg for a piece of bread. I witnessed several deaths on the roads between villages, in the bathhouses and in the barns. I myself saw hungry, agonized people crawling on the sidewalk. They were picked up by the police and died several hours later. In late April, an investigator and I passed by a barn and found a dead body. 
When we sent for a policeman and a medic to pick it up, they discovered another body inside the barn. Both died of hunger with no violence. The Ukrainian countryside had already exported its food to the rest of the Soviet Union. Now it exported some of the resulting starvation to the Gulag. Children born in Soviet Ukraine in the late 1920s and early 1930s found themselves in a world of death, among helpless parents and hostile authorities. A boy born in 1933 had a life expectancy of seven years. Even in these circumstances, some younger children could manage a bit of good cheer. Anna Sobolevska, who lost her father and five brothers and sisters to starvation, remembered her youngest brother Josef's painful hope. Even as he swelled from hunger, he kept finding signs of life. One day he thought he could see the crops rising from the ground. On another he believed that he had found mushrooms. Now we will live, he would exclaim, and repeat these words before he went to sleep each night. Then one morning he awoke and said, Everything dies. Schoolchildren at first wrote to the appropriate authorities in the hope that starvation was the result of a misunderstanding. One class of elementary school students, for example, sent a letter to party authorities asking for your help, since we are falling down from hunger. We should be learning, but we are too hungry to walk. Soon this was no longer noteworthy. In eight-year-old Yuri Lysenko's school in the Kharkiv region, a girl simply collapsed in class one day as if asleep. The adults rushed in, but Yuri knew that she was beyond hope, that she had died, and that they would bury her in the cemetery like they had buried people yesterday and the day before yesterday and every day. Boys from another school pulled out the severed head of a classmate while fishing in a pond. His whole family had died. Had they eaten him first? or had he survived the deaths of his parents only to be killed by a cannibal? No one knew, but such questions were commonplace for the children of Ukraine in 1933. The duties of parents could not be fulfilled. Marriages suffered as wives, sometimes with their husbands' anguished consent, prostituted themselves with local party leaders for flour. Parents, even when alive and together and acting in the best of faith, could hardly care for children. One day, a father in the Venezia region went to bury one of his two children and returned to find the other dead. Some parents loved their children by protecting them, locking them in cottages to keep them safe from roving bands of cannibals. Others sent their children away in the hope that they could be saved by others. Parents would give their children to distant family or to strangers or leave them at train stations. The desperate peasants holding up infants to train windows were not necessarily begging for food. Often they were trying to give their children away to someone aboard a train who was likely from the city and therefore not about to starve to death. Fathers and mothers sent their children to the cities to beg with very mixed results. Some children starved on the way or at their destination. Others were taken by city police to die in the dark in a strange metropolis and be buried in a mass grave with other small bodies. Even when children returned, the news was rarely good. Petro Savera went with one of his brothers to Kiev to beg and returned to find his other two brothers already dead. In the face of starvation, some families divided, parents turning against children and children against one another. As the state police, the Ogpu found itself obliged to record, in Soviet Ukraine, families kill their weakest members, usually children, and use the meat for eating. Countless parents killed and ate their children, and then died of starvation later anyway. One mother cooked her son for herself and her daughter. One six-year-old girl, saved by other relatives, last saw her father when he was sharpening a knife to slaughter her. Other combinations were, of course, possible. One family killed their daughter-in-law, fed her head to the pigs, and roasted the rest of her body. In a broader sense, though, it was politics as well as starvation that destroyed families, turning a younger generation against an older. Members of the young communists served in the brigades that requisitioned food. Still younger children, in the pioneers, were supposed to be the eyes and ears of the party inside the family. The healthier ones were assigned to watch over the fields to prevent theft. 
Half a million pre-adolescent and young teenage boys and girls stood in the watchtowers observing adults in Soviet Ukraine in summer 1933. All children were expected to report on their parents. Survival was a moral as well as a physical struggle. A woman doctor wrote to a friend in June 1933 that she had not yet become a cannibal, but was not sure that I shall not be one by the time my letter reaches you. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or to prostitute themselves died. Those who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to kill their fellow man died. Parents who resisted cannibalism died before their children did. Ukraine in 1933 was full of orphans, and sometimes people took them in. Yet without food, there was little that even the kindest of strangers could do for such children. The boys and girls lay about on sheets and blankets, eating their own excrement, waiting for death. In one village in the Kharkiv region, several women did their best to look after children. As one of them recalled, they formed something like an orphanage. Their wards were in a pitiful condition. The children had bulging stomachs, they were covered in wounds, in scabs, their bodies were bursting. We took them outside, we put them on sheets, and they moaned. One day the children suddenly fell silent. We turned around to see what was happening, and they were eating the smallest child little Petrus. They were tearing strips from him and eating them. And Petrus was doing the same. He was tearing strips from himself and eating them. He ate as much as he could. The other children put their lips to his wounds and drank his blood. We took the child away from the hungry mouths, and we cried. Cannibalism is a taboo of literature as well as life, as communities seek to protect their dignity by suppressing the record of this desperate mode of survival. Ukrainians outside Soviet Ukraine, then and since, have treated cannibalism as a source of great shame. Yet while the cannibalism in Soviet Ukraine in 1933 says much about the Soviet system, it says nothing about Ukrainians as a people. With starvation will come cannibalism. There came a moment in Ukraine when there was little or no grain, and the only meat was human. A black market arose in human flesh. Human meat may even have entered the official economy. The police investigated anyone selling meat, and state authorities kept a close eye on slaughterhouses and butcher shops. A young communist in the Kharkiv region reported to his superiors that he could make a meat quota, but only by using human beings. In the villages, smoke coming from a cottage chimney was a suspicious sign, since it tended to mean that cannibals were eating a kill, or that families were roasting one of their members. Police would follow the smoke and make arrests. At least 2,505 people were sentenced for cannibalism in the years 1932 and 1933 in Ukraine, though the actual number of cases was certainly much greater. People in Ukraine never considered cannibalism to be acceptable. Even at the height of the famine, villagers were outraged to find cannibals in their midst so much so that they were spontaneously beaten or even burned to death. Most people did not succumb to cannibalism. An orphan was a child who had not been eaten by his parents. And even those who did eat human flesh acted from various motivations. Some cannibals were clearly criminals of the worst kind. Vasily Granyevich, for example, lost his brother Kolya to a cannibal. When the cannibal was arrested by the militia, Kolya's head was among eleven found in his house. Yet cannibalism was, sometimes, a victimless crime. Some mothers and fathers killed their children and ate them. In those cases the children were clearly victims. But other parents asked their children to make use of their own bodies if they passed away. More than one Ukrainian child had to tell a brother or sister, Mother says that we should eat her if she dies. This was forethought and love. One of the very last functions that the state performed was the disposal of dead bodies. As a Ukrainian student wrote in January 1933, the task was a difficult one. The burial of the dead is not always possible because the hungry die in the fields of wandering from village to village. In the cities, carts would make rounds early in the mornings to remove the peasant dead of the night before. In the countryside, the healthier peasants formed brigades to collect the corpses and bury them. 
They rarely had the inclination or the strength to dig graves very deeply, so that hands and feet could be seen above the earth. Burial crews were paid according to the number of bodies collected, which led to certain abuses. Crews would take the weak along with the dead and bury them alive. They would talk with such people along the way, explaining to the starving that they would die soon anyway, so what difference could it make? In a few cases, such victims managed to dig their way out of the shallow mass graves. In their turn, the grave diggers weakened and died, their corpses left where they lay. As an agronomist recalled, the bodies were then devoured by those dogs that had escaped being eaten and had gone savage. In fall 1933, in villages across Soviet Ukraine, the harvest was brought in by Red Army soldiers, Communist Party activists, workers and students. Forced to work even as they died, starving peasants had put down crops in spring 1933 that they would not live to harvest. Resettlers came from Soviet Russia to take over houses and villages, and saw that first they would have to remove the bodies of the previous inhabitants. Often the rotten corpses fell apart in their hands. Sometimes the newcomers would then return home, finding that no amount of scrubbing and painting could quite remove the stench. Yet sometimes they stayed. Ukraine's ethnographic material, as one Soviet official told an Italian diplomat, had been altered. As earlier in Soviet Kazakhstan, where the change was even more dramatic, the demographic balance in Soviet Ukraine shifted in favor of Russians. How many people were killed by famine in the Soviet Union and in its Ukrainian Republic in the early 1930s? We will never know with precision. No good records were kept. Such records as do exist confirm the mass scale of the event. Public health authorities in Kiev Oblast, for example, recorded that 493,644 people were going hungry in that region alone in the month of April 1933. Local authorities feared to record deaths by starvation and, after a while, were in no position to record anything at all. Very often, the only instance of state power that had any contact with the dead were the brigades of gravediggers and they kept nothing like systematic records. The Soviet census of 1937 found eight million fewer people than projected. Most of these were famine victims in Soviet Ukraine, Soviet Kazakhstan, and Soviet Russia, and the children that they did not then have. Stalin suppressed its findings and had the responsible demographers executed. In 1933, Soviet officials in private conversations most often provided the estimate of 5.5 million dead from hunger. This seems roughly correct, if perhaps somewhat low, for the Soviet Union in the early 1930s, including Soviet Ukraine, Soviet Kazakhstan, and Soviet Russia. One demographic retrojection suggests a figure of about 2.5 million famine deaths for Soviet Ukraine. This is too close to the recorded figure of excess deaths, which is about 2.4 million. The latter figure must be substantially low, since many deaths were not recorded. Another demographic calculation, carried out on behalf of the authorities of independent Ukraine, provides the figure of 3.9 million dead. The truth is probably in between these numbers, where most of the estimates of respectable scholars can be found. It seems reasonable to propose a figure of approximately 3.3 million deaths by starvation and hunger-related disease in Soviet Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. Of these people, some 3 million would have been Ukrainians, and the rest Russians, Poles, Germans, Jews, and others. Among the million or so dead in the Soviet Russian Republic were probably at least 200,000 Ukrainians, since the famine struck heavily in regions where Ukrainians lived. Perhaps as many as 100,000 more Ukrainians were among the 1.3 million people who died in the earlier famine in Kazakhstan. All in all, no fewer than 3.3 million Soviet citizens died in Soviet Ukraine of starvation and hunger-related diseases and about the same number of Ukrainians, by nationality, died in the Soviet Union as a whole. Rafal Lemkin, the international lawyer who later invented the term genocide, would call the Ukrainian case the classic example of Soviet genocide. 
the fabric of rural society of Ukraine was tested, stretched, and rent. Ukrainian peasants were dead, or humbled, or scattered among camps the length and breadth of the Soviet Union. Those who survived carried feelings of guilt and helplessness, and sometimes memories of collaboration and cannibalism. Hundreds of thousands of orphans would grow up to be Soviet citizens, but not Ukrainians, at least not in the way that an intact Ukrainian family and a Ukrainian countryside might have made them. Those Ukrainian intellectuals who survived the calamity lost their confidence. The leading Soviet Ukrainian writer and the leading Soviet Ukrainian political activist both committed suicide, the one in May and the other in July 1933. The Soviet state had defeated those who wished for some autonomy for the Ukrainian people and those who wished for some autonomy for themselves and their families. Foreign communists in the Soviet Union, witnesses to the famine, somehow managed to see starvation not as a national tragedy but as a step forward for humanity. The writer Arthur Kessler believed at the time that the starving were enemies of the people who preferred begging to work. His housemate in Kharkiv, the physicist Alexander Weisberg, knew that millions of peasants had died. Nevertheless, he kept the faith. Kessler naively complained to Weisberg that the Soviet press did not write that Ukrainians have nothing to eat and therefore are dying like flies. He and Weisberg knew that to be true, as did everyone who had any contact with the country. Yet to write of the famine would have made their faith impossible. Each of them believed that the destruction of the countryside could be reconciled to a general story of human progress. The deaths of Ukrainian peasants were the price to be paid for a higher civilization. Kestler left the Soviet Union in 1933. When Weisberg saw him off at the train station, his parting words were, Whatever happens, hold the banner of the Soviet Union high. Yet the end result of the starvation was not socialism in any but the Stalinist sense of the term. In one village in Soviet Ukraine, the triumphal arch built to celebrate the completion of the five-year plan was surrounded by the corpses of peasants. The Soviet officials who persecuted the Kulaks had more money than their victims, and the urban party members far better life prospects. Peasants had no right to ration cards, while party elites chose from a selection of food at special stores. If they grew too fat, however, they had to beware the roving sausage-makers, especially at night. Rich women in Ukrainian cities, usually the wives of high officials, traded their food rations for peasant embroidery and ornaments stolen from country churches. In this way, too, collectivization robbed the Ukrainian village of its identity, even as it destroyed the Ukrainian peasant morally and then physically. Hunger drove Ukrainians and others to strip themselves and their places of worship before it drove them to their deaths. Although Stalin, Kaganovich, and Balyitsky explained the repressions in Soviet Ukraine as a response to Ukrainian nationalism, Soviet Ukraine was a multinational republic. The starvation touched Russians, Poles, Germans, and many others. Jews in Soviet Ukraine tended to live in towns and cities, but those in the countryside were no less vulnerable than anyone else. One day in 1933, a staff writer for the party newspaper Pravda, which denied the famine, received a letter from his Jewish father. This is to let you know, wrote the father, that your mother is dead. She died of starvation after months of pain. Her last wish was that their son say Kaddish for her. This exchange reveals the generational difference between parents raised before the revolution and children raised thereafter. Not only among Jews, but among Ukrainians and others, the generation educated in the 1920s was far more likely to accept the Soviet system than the generations raised in the Russian Empire. German and Polish diplomats informed their superiors of the suffering and death of the German and Polish minorities in Soviet Ukraine. The German consul in Kharkiv wrote that, Almost every time I venture into the streets, I see people collapsing from hunger. Polish diplomats faced long lines of starving people, desperate for a visa. One of them reported, Frequently the clients, grown men, cry as they tell of wives and children starving to death or bursting from hunger. As these diplomats knew, many peasants in Soviet Ukraine, not only Poles and Germans, hoped for an invasion from abroad to release them from their agony. 
until the middle of 1932, their greatest hope was Poland. Stalin's propaganda had been telling them for five years that Poland was planning to invade and annex Ukraine. When the famine began, many Ukrainian peasants hoped that this propaganda was true. As one Polish spy reported, they clung to the hope that Poland, or for that matter any other state, would come and liberate them from misery and oppression. When Poland and the Soviet Union signed their non-aggression pact in July 1932, that hope was dashed. Thenceforth, the peasants could only hope for a German attack. Eight years later, those who survived would be in a position to compare Soviet to German rule. The basic facts of mass hunger and death, although sometimes reported in the European and American press, never took on the clarity of an undisputed event. Almost no one claimed that Stalin meant to starve Ukrainians to death. Even Adolf Hitler preferred to blame the Marxist system. It was controversial to note that starvation was taking place at all. Gareth Jones did so in a handful of newspaper articles. It seems that he was the only one to do so in English under his own name. When Cardinal Theodore Initzer of Vienna tried to appeal for food aid for the starving in summer and autumn 1933, Soviet authorities rebuffed him nastily, saying that the Soviet Union had neither cardinals nor cannibals, a statement that was only half true. Though the journalists knew less than the diplomats, most of them understood that millions were dying from hunger. The influential Moscow correspondent of the New York Times, Walter Durante, did his best to undermine Jones's accurate reporting. Durante, who won a Pulitzer Prize in 1932, called Jones's account of the famine a big scare story. Durante's claim that there was no actual starvation, but only widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition, echoed Soviet usages and pushed euphemism into mendacity. This was an Orwellian distinction, and indeed George Orwell himself regarded the Ukrainian famine of 1933 as a central example of a black truth that artists of language had covered with bright colors. Durante knew that millions of people had starved to death, yet he maintained in his journalism that the hunger served a higher purpose. Durante thought that you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Aside from Jones, the only journalist to file serious reports in English was Malcolm Muggeridge, writing anonymously for the Manchester Guardian. He wrote that the famine was one of the most monstrous crimes in history, so terrible that people in the future will scarcely be able to believe that it happened. In fairness, even the people with the most obvious interest in events in Soviet Ukraine the Ukrainians living beyond the border of the Soviet Union, needed months to understand the extent of the famine. Some five million Ukrainians lived in neighboring Poland, and their political leaders worked hard to draw international attention to the mass starvation in the Soviet Union. And yet even they grasped the extent of the tragedy only in May 1933, by which time most of the victims were already dead. Throughout the following summer and autumn, Ukrainian newspapers in Poland covered the famine, and Ukrainian politicians in Poland organized marches and protests. The leader of the Ukrainian feminist organization tried to organize an international boycott of Soviet goods by appealing to the women of the world. Several attempts were made to reach Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States. None of this made any difference. The laws of the international market ensured that the grain taken from Soviet Ukraine would feed others. Roosevelt, preoccupied above all by the position of the American worker during the Great Depression, wished to establish diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. The telegrams from Ukrainian activists reached him in autumn 1933, just as his personal initiative in U.S.-Soviet relations was bearing fruit. The United States extended diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union in November 1933. The main result of the summer campaign of Ukrainians in Poland was skillful Soviet counter-propaganda. On the 27th of August 1933, the French politician Édouard Herriot arrived in Kiev on an official invitation. The leader of the Radical Party, Herriot had been French Prime Minister three times, most recently in 1932. He was a corpulent man of known physical appetites who compared his own body shape to that of a woman pregnant with twins. 
At the receptions in the Soviet Union, Ariel was kept away from the German and the Polish diplomats, who might have spoiled the fun with an untoward word about starvation. The day before Ariel was to visit the city, Kiev had been closed, and its population ordered to clean and decorate. The shop windows, empty all year, were now suddenly filled with food. The food was for display, not for sale, for the eyes of a single foreigner. The police, wearing fresh new uniforms, had to disperse the gaping crowds. Everyone who lived or worked along Aereo's planned route was forced to go through a dress rehearsal of the visit, demonstrating that they knew where to stand and what to wear. Aereo was driven down Kiev's incomparable broad avenue, Hreschatyk. It pulsed with the traffic of automobiles, which had been gathered from several cities and were now driven by party activists to create the appearance of bustle and prosperity. A woman on the street muttered that, perhaps this bourgeois will tell the world what is happening here. She was to be disappointed. Ariel instead expressed his astonishment that the Soviet Union had managed so beautifully to honor both the socialist spirit and Ukrainian national feeling. On the 30th of August, 1933, Ariel visited the Felix Dzerzhinsky Children's Commune in Kharkiv, a school named after the founder of the Soviet secret police. At this time, children were still starving to death in the Kharkiv region. The children he saw were gathered from among the healthiest and fittest. Most likely, they wore clothes that they had been loaned that morning. The picture, of course, was not entirely false. The Soviets had built schools for Ukrainian children and were on the way to eliminating illiteracy. Children who were alive at the end of 1933 would very likely become adults who could read. This is what Ariel was meant to see. What, the Frenchman asked, entirely without irony, had the students eaten for lunch? It was a question, posed casually, on which the image of the Soviet Union depended. Vasily Grossman would repeat the scene in both of his great novels. As Grossman would recall, the children had been prepared for this question and gave a suitable answer. Ariel believed what he saw and heard. He journeyed onward to Moscow, where he was fed caviar in a palace. The collective farms of Soviet Ukraine, Ariel told the French upon his return, were well-ordered gardens. The official Soviet party newspaper, Pravda, was pleased to report Ariel's remarks. The story was over. Or perhaps the story was elsewhere. Chapter 2 Class Terror Stalin's second revolution in the Soviet Union, his collectivization and the famine it brought, was overshadowed by Hitler's rise to power in Germany. Many Europeans, distressed by the Nazification of Germany, looked hopefully to Moscow for an ally. Gareth Jones was one of the few to observe the two systems in early 1933, as both Hitler and Stalin were consolidating power. On the 25th of February 1933, he flew with Adolf Hitler from Berlin to Frankfurt, as the first journalist to travel by air with the new German Chancellor. If this aeroplane should crash, he wrote, the whole history of Europe would be changed. Jones had read Mein Kampf, and he grasped Hitler's ambitions. The domination of Germany, the colonization of Eastern Europe, the elimination of the Jews. Hitler, already Chancellor, had dissolved the Reichstag and was in the midst of an electoral campaign, aiming to gain a greater mandate for himself and a stronger presence for his party in the German Parliament. Jones saw how Germans reacted to their new Chancellor, first in Berlin and then at a rally in Frankfurt. He felt the pure, primitive worship. When Jones made for Moscow, he was travelling from, as he put it, a land where dictatorship has just begun, to the dictatorship of the working class. Jones understood an important difference between the two regimes. Hitler's rise meant the beginning of a new regime in Germany. Stalin, meanwhile, was securing his hold on a one-party state with a powerful police apparatus capable of massive and coordinated violence. His policy of collectivization had required the shooting of tens of thousands of citizens and the deportations of hundreds of thousands and had brought millions more to the brink of death by starvation as Jones would see and report. 
Later in the 1930s, Stalin would order the shooting of hundreds of thousands more Soviet citizens in campaigns organized by social class and ethnic nation. All of this was well beyond Hitler's capabilities in the 1930s and probably beyond his intentions. For some of the Germans and other Europeans who favored Hitler and his enterprise, the cruelty of Soviet policy seemed to be an argument for National Socialism. In his stirring campaign speeches, Hitler portrayed communists and the Soviet state as the great enemies of Germany and Europe. During the very first crisis of his young chancellorship, he exploited fears of communism to gather more power to himself and his office. On the 27th of February, 1933, two days after Hitler and Jones had landed in Frankfurt, a lone Dutchman set fire to the German Parliament building. Though the arsonist was caught in the act and confessed, Hitler immediately seized the occasion to demonize opposition to his new government. Working himself up into a theatrical display of rage, he shouted that, Anyone who stands in our way will be butchered. Hitler blamed the Reichstag fire on German communists who, he claimed, were planning further terrorist attacks. For Hitler, the timing of the Reichstag fire could not have been better. As head of government, he could move against his political opponents. As a candidate running for election, he could turn fear to his advantage. On the 28th of February 1933, a decree suspended the rights of all German citizens, allowing their preventive detainment. In an atmosphere of insecurity, the Nazis decisively won the elections on the 5th of March, with 43.9% of the vote and 288 seats in the Reichstag. In the weeks and months that followed, Hitler used German police and Nazi paramilitaries to crush the two parties he grouped together as Marxists, the Communists and the Social Democrats. Hitler's close ally, Heinrich Himmler, established the first Nazi concentration camp at Dachau on the 20th of March. Himmler's SS, a paramilitary that had arisen as Hitler's bodyguard, provided the staff. Although the concentration camp was not a new institution, Himmler's SS meant to use it for intimidation and terror. As an SS officer said to the guards at Dachau, any of the comrades who can't see blood should resign. The more of these bastards go down, the fewer of them we'll have to feed. After his electoral victory, Hitler the Chancellor quickly became Hitler the Dictator. On the 23rd of March 1933, with the first prisoners already incarcerated at Dachau, the new parliament passed an enabling act which allowed Hitler to rule Germany by decree without reference to either the president or the parliament. This act would be renewed and would remain in force so long as Hitler lived. Gareth Jones returned to Berlin from the Soviet Union on the 29th of March, 1933, a month after he had left Germany for the Soviet Union and gave a press conference about the starvation in Soviet Ukraine. The worst political famine in history seemed like a minor news item compared to the establishment of a new dictatorship in the German capital. Indeed, the suffering in the Soviet Union had already become, during Jones's absence, part of the story of Hitler's rise to power. Hitler had used the Ukrainian famine in his election campaign, making the event a matter of furious ideological politics before it was established as historical fact. As he raged against the Marxists, Hitler used the starvation in Ukraine as an indictment of Marxism in practice. To a gathering at the Berlin Sport Palace on the 2nd of March 1933, Hitler proclaimed that millions of people are starving in a country that could be a breadbasket for a whole world. With a single word, Marxists, Hitler united the mass death in the Soviet Union with the German Social Democrats, the bulwark of the Weimar Republic. It was easier for most to reject or accept his entire perspective than it was to disentangle the true from the false. For people lacking close familiarity with Soviet politics, which meant almost everyone, to accept Hitler's assessment of the famine was to take a step toward accepting his condemnation of left-wing politics, which, in his rhetoric, was mixed with the rejection of democracy as such. Stalin's own policies made it easier for Hitler to make this case, because they offered a similarly binary view of the political world. Stalin, 
his attention focused on collectivization and famine, had unwittingly performed much of the ideological work that helped Hitler come to power. When Stalin had begun to collectivize agriculture in the Soviet Union, the Communist International had instructed fraternal communist parties to follow the line of class against class. Communists were to maintain their ideological purity and avoid alliances with social democrats. Only communists had a legitimate role to play in human progress, and others who claimed to speak for the oppressed were frauds and social fascists. They were to be grouped together with every party to their right, including the Nazis. In Germany, communists were to regard the social democrats, not the Nazis, as the main enemy. In the second half of 1932 and the first months of 1933, during the long moment of Stalin's provocation of catastrophe, it would have been difficult for him to abandon the international line of class against class. The class struggle against the Kulak, after all, was the official explanation of the horrible suffering and mass death within the Soviet Union. In German domestic politics, this line prevented the German left from cooperating against Hitler. The crucial months for the famine, however, were also critical time for the future of Germany. The insistence of German communists on the need for immediate class revolution gained the Nazis' votes from the middle classes. It also ensured that clerks and the self-employed voted Nazi rather than social democratic. Even so, the communists and the social democrats together had more popular support than the Nazis. But Stalin's line ensured that they could not work together. In all of these ways, Stalin's uncompromising stand in foreign policy during collectivization and famine in the Soviet Union helped Hitler win the elections of both July 1932 and March 1933. Whereas the true consequences of Stalin's economic policies had been hidden from foreign reporters, Hitler deliberately drew attention to the policies of redistribution that were among his first policies as dictator. At the very moment that starvation in the Soviet Union was peaking, the German state began to steal from its Jewish citizens. After the Nazis' electoral victory of the 5th of March 1933, they organized an economic boycott of Jewish businesses throughout Germany. Like collectivization, the boycotts indicated which sector of society would lose the most in coming social and economic transformations. Not the peasants, as in the USSR, but the Jews. The boycotts, although carefully managed by Nazi leaders and Nazi paramilitaries, were presented as a result of the spontaneous anger of the people at Jewish exploitation. In this respect, Hitler's policies resembled Stalin's. The Soviet leader presented the disarray in the Soviet countryside and then decolacization as the result of an authentic class war. The political conclusion was the same in Berlin and Moscow the state would have to step in to make sure that the necessary redistribution was relatively peaceful. Whereas Stalin had achieved by 1933 the authority and gathered the coercive power to force through collectivization on a mass scale, Hitler had to move far more slowly. The boycott had only a limited effect. The main consequence was the emigration of some 37,000 German Jews in 1933. It would be five more years before substantial transfers of property from Jews to non-Jewish Germans, which the Nazis called Aryanization, took place. The Soviet Union began from a position of international isolation, and with the help of many sympathizers abroad, was able with some success to control its image. By many, Stalin was given the benefit of the doubt, even as his policies moved from shooting to deportation to starvation. Hitler, on the other hand, had to reckon with international opinion, which included voices of criticism and outrage. Germany in 1933 was full of international journalists and other travellers, and Hitler needed peace and trade for the next few years. So even as he called an end to the boycott, Hitler used unfavourable attention in the foreign press to build up a rationale for the more radical policies to come. The Nazis presented European and American newspapers as controlled by Jews, and any foreign criticism as part of the international Jewish conspiracy against the German people. An important legacy of the March 1933 boycotts was thus rhetorical. 
Hitler introduced an argument that he would never cease to use, even much later, when his armies had conquered much of Europe and his institutions were killing millions of Jews. No matter what Germany or Germans did, it was because they were defending themselves from international jury. The Jews were always the aggressor, the Germans always the victims. At first, Hitler's anti-communism was more pertinent to domestic politics than his anti-Semitism. To control the German state, he would have to break the communists and the social democrats. Over the course of 1933, some 200,000 Germans were locked up, most of them men seen as left-wing opponents of the regime. Hitler's terror in 1933 was meant to intimidate rather than eliminate. Most of these people were released after short periods in what the Nazis euphemistically called protective custody. The Communist Party was not allowed to take up the 81 seats that it had won in the elections. Soon, all of its property was seized by the state. By July 1933, it was illegal in Germany to belong to any other political party than the Nazis. In November, the Nazis staged a parliamentary election in which only their candidates could run and win. Hitler had very quickly made of Germany a one-party state, and certainly not the sort of one-party state that Stalin might have expected. The German Communist Party, for years the strongest outside the Soviet Union itself, was broken in a matter of a few months. Its defeat was a serious blow to the prestige of the international communist movement. At first, Stalin seemed to hope that the Soviet-German special relationship could be preserved, despite Hitler's rise to power. Since 1922, the two states had engaged in military and economic cooperation, on the tacit understanding that both had an interest in the remaking of Eastern Europe at the expense of Poland. The 1922 agreement at Rapallo had been confirmed by the Neutrality Pact of the Treaty of Berlin, signed in 1926, and extended for another five years in 1931. The clearest sign of good relations and common purpose were the German military exercises on Soviet soil. These came to an end in September 1933. In January 1934, Nazi Germany signed a non-aggression declaration with Poland. This surprise move seemed to signal a basic reorientation in German foreign policy. It seemed that Warsaw had replaced Moscow as Berlin's favoured partner in the East. Might the Germans and the Poles now fight together against the Soviet Union? The new German relationship with Poland likely meant more to Stalin than the oppression of the German communists. Stalin himself always conducted foreign policy at two levels, the diplomatic and the ideological, one directed at states, the other at societies, including his own. For the one he had his commissar for foreign affairs, Maxim Litvinov, for the other, he had the Communist International. He probably assumed that Hitler's approach was much the same, and thus that overt anti-communism need not prevent good relations between Berlin and Moscow. But the approach to Poland added what looked like anti-Soviet diplomacy to anti-communist ideology. As Stalin correctly suspected, Hitler was trying to enlist Poland as a junior ally in a crusade against the Soviet Union. While the German-Polish negotiations were underway in late 1933, Soviet leaders rightly worried that the Germans were trying to buy Polish territory in the West, with the promise that Poland could later annex territories from Soviet Ukraine. Poland, however, never showed any interest in Germany's propositions to extend the accord in such a way. The German-Polish declaration did not, in fact, include a secret protocol on military cooperation against the USSR despite what Soviet intelligence and propaganda claimed. Yet Hitler did wish to use the German-Polish declaration as the beginning of a rapprochement with Warsaw that would culminate in a military alliance against the USSR. He wondered aloud in spring 1934 about the necessary inducements. In January 1934, the Soviet Union seemed to be in a dreadful position. Its domestic policies had starved millions of its own citizens to death. Its foreign policies had contributed to the rise of a threatening anti-communist dictator, Hitler, who had made peace with the previous common German-Soviet enemy, Poland. Stalin found the rhetorical and ideological escape route. 
at the Soviet Communist Party Congress of January-February 1934, known as the Congress of Victors, Stalin claimed that a second revolution had been completed within the Soviet Union. The famines, the most unforgettable experience of the Soviet peoples, went unmentioned. They blurred into a general story of how Stalin and his loyal retinue had overcome the resistance of enemies to implement the five-year plan. Lazar Kaganovich praised his master Stalin as the creator of the greatest revolution that human history has ever known. The rise of Hitler, despite appearances, was a sign of the coming victory of the Soviet system in the world. The brutality of the Nazis revealed that capitalism would soon collapse under its own contradictions, and that a European revolution was around the corner. This interpretation could only make sense to revolutionaries by conviction, to communists already bound to their leader by faith and fear. It took a special sort of mind to truly believe that the worse things appeared, the better they actually were. Such reasoning went by the name dialectics, but by this time that word, despite its proud descent from the Greeks through Hegel and Marx, meant little more than the psychic capacity to adjust one's own perceptions to the changing expressions of Stalin's will. For his part, Stalin knew that rhetoric was not enough. Even as he proclaimed that Hitler's revolution was a sign of the coming socialist victory, Stalin hastened to change his domestic policy. He did not take revenge on the Ukrainian peasant year after year. The peasants had to live on, frightened and intimidated, but productive of the foodstuffs needed by the Soviet state. Soviet policy now allowed all peasants to cultivate a small plot, the equivalent of a private garden, for their own use. Requisition quotas and export targets ceased their unreasoning climb. Starvation within the Soviet Union came to an end in 1934. The rise of Hitler was indeed an opportunity to present the Soviet Union as the defense of European civilization. Stalin, after more than a year, finally took it in June 1934. According to the new line of the Communist International, propagated then, politics was no longer a matter of class against class. Instead, the Soviet Union and communist parties around the world would unite the left in a camp of anti-fascists. Rather than engaging in uncompromising class struggle, communists would rescue civilization from the rising tide of fascism. Fascism, the term popularized by Mussolini in Italy, was presented by the Soviets as a general corruption of late capitalism. Though fascism's spread signified the end of the old capitalist order, its vicious hatred of the Soviet Union, went the argument, justified Soviet and communist compromises with other capitalist forces, in the interest of defending the Soviet Union. European communists were to restyle themselves as anti-fascists and to cooperate with social democrats and other parties of the left. Communists in Europe were expected to join popular fronts, electoral alliances, and win election victories with social democrats and other parties of the left. For the time being, communists were to work within democracies rather than toward their destruction. This came too late for German communists and social democrats, of course, but throughout Western and Southern Europe, people concerned with halting the spread of Hitler and fascism celebrated the new Soviet approach. By presenting the Soviet Union as the homeland of anti-fascism, Stalin was seeking after a monopoly of the good. Surely reasonable people would want to be on the side of the anti-fascists rather than that of the fascists. Anyone who was against the Soviet Union, was the suggestion, was probably a fascist, or at least a sympathizer. During the period of the Popular Front, from June 1934 through August 1939, about three-quarters of a million Soviet citizens would be shot to death by order of Stalin, and still more deported to the Gulag. Most of the repressed would be peasants and workers, the people whom the Soviet social system was supposed to serve. The others would generally be members of national minorities. Just as Hitler's rise had obscured the Soviet famine of 1933, Stalin's response would distract attention from the Great Terror. The Popular Front enjoyed the greatest chances for success in the West European democracies furthest from the Soviet Union, France and Spain. The greatest triumph was in Paris, where a Popular Front government indeed came to power in May 1936. Left-wing parties, including Ariel's Radicals, won elections, and the socialist Leon Blum became prime minister. 
The French Communists, part of a victorious electoral coalition, did not formally join the government, but they did provide the parliamentary majority and influence policy. The votes could thus be found for reforms. Although the Communists were chiefly concerned with ensuring that French foreign policy was friendly to the Soviet Union. In Paris, the Popular Front was seen as a triumph of native traditions of the left. But many, not the least the political refugees from Nazi Germany, saw it as a Soviet success, and even a confirmation that the Soviets supported democracy and freedom. The Popular Front in France made it far more difficult for some of the most impressive European intellectuals to criticize the Soviet Union. In Spain, a coalition of parties also formed a Popular Front, and won the elections of February 1936. There, events took a rather different turn. In July, army officers, supported by far-right groups, tried to overturn the elected government in a coup d'etat. The government resisted, and the Spanish Civil War began. Though for Spaniards this was an essentially domestic struggle, the ideological enemies of the Popular Front era took sides. The Soviet Union began to supply arms to the embattled Spanish Republic in October 1936, while Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy supported the right-wing forces led by General Francisco Franco. The Spanish Civil War occasioned closer relations between Berlin and Rome, and became the center of attention of Soviet policy in Europe. Spain was on the front pages of major Soviet newspapers every day for months. Spain became the rallying cry of European socialists who came to fight for the side of the endangered republic, many of whom took for granted that the Soviet Union was on the side of democracy. One of the more perceptive of the European socialists, the English writer George Orwell, was dismayed by the struggle of Stalinists within Spain to dominate the Spanish left. As he saw it, the Soviets exported their political practices along with their weapons. Stalin's assistance to the Spanish Republic came with a price, his right to carry out factional struggles on Spanish territory. Stalin's greatest rival, Trotsky, was still alive, if in distant Mexican exile, and many of the Spaniards defending their republic were more attached to Trotsky's person than to Stalin's Soviet Union. Soon, communist propaganda was presenting the Spanish Trotskyites as fascists, and Soviet NKVD officers were sent to Spain to shoot them for their treason. The enemies of the Popular Front presented it as a conspiracy of the Communist International to rule the world. The Popular Front provided Japan and Germany with a convenient pretext to solidify their own relations. On the 25th of November, 1936, Germany and Japan signed the Anti-Comintern Pact, which obliged the two states to consult with each other if either was attacked. An agreement between Japanese and German intelligence agencies of the 11th of May, 1937, provided for the exchange of intelligence on the USSR and included a plan for both to use national movements in the Soviet borderlands against the Soviet Union. From the Soviet perspective, the Japanese threat was more immediate than the German. During the first half of 1937, Germany appeared to be an addendum to a Japanese threat rather than the other way around. A Japanese politics was dominated by dueling visions of empire, one in the south and one in the north. An important clique in the Japanese military believed that Siberian resources were the key to the country's future economic development. Japan's Manchurian satellite, Manchukuo, had a long border with Soviet Siberia and looked ever more like a launching pad for an invasion. The Japanese were toying with the idea of establishing a puppet Ukrainian state on Soviet territory in eastern Siberia based on the million or so Ukrainians who lived there as deportees or settlers. As Tokyo understood, Ukrainians deported to the Gulag might well oppose Soviet power, given the assurance of foreign backing. Polish spies who knew of the idea referred to it as Manchukuo No. 2. The Japanese certainly seemed to have a long-term interest in Siberia. A special Japanese academy in Manchukuo, in the city of Harbin, had already trained a first generation of young Russian-speaking imperialists, such as Tiuni Sugihara. He was one of the negotiators of an agreement whereby the Soviets, in 1935, sold their rights to the railway in Manchuria to the Japanese. Sugihara was also in charge of the foreign policy office of Manchukuo. A convert to the Russian Orthodox religion and husband to a Russian wife, 
Sugihara called himself Sergei and spent most of his time in the Russian quarter of Harbin. There he befriended Russian exiles and recruited them for espionage missions within the Soviet Union. The drama of the Soviet-Japanese duel in East Asia attracted the attention of Gareth Jones, who travelled to Manchuria that same year. The Welshman, with his uncanny instinct for news, was right to see this region as the crucial theatre in the global conflict between fascism and anti-fascism. In somewhat mysterious circumstances, he was abducted by bandits and murdered. Stalin had to be concerned not only with a direct Japanese attack on Soviet Siberia, but also with the consolidation of a Japanese empire in East Asia. Manchukuo was one Japanese colony taken from historically Chinese territory. Perhaps more were to come. China had the longest border with the Soviet Union and an unstable polity. China's nationalist government had the upper hand in an ongoing civil war with the Chinese Communist Party. In the Long March, Chinese Communist troops, led by Mao Zedong, had been forced to withdraw to the north and west of the country. Neither side, however, seemed able to achieve anything resembling a monopoly of force in the country. Even in regions where the nationalists had the upper hand, they were reliant upon local warlords. Perhaps most importantly for Stalin, the nationalists and communists were unable to cooperate against the advance of the Japanese. Soviet foreign policy had to balance between support for fraternal communist parties, less important, and concerns of Soviet state security, more important. While in principle the communist international supported the Chinese communists, Stalin armed and funded the nationalist government in the hope of pacifying the border. In the largely Muslim Chinese province of Xinjiang, which had a long border with Soviet Kazakhstan, Stalin took an equally unideological approach. He supported the local warlord, Sheng Shikai, sending engineers and miners to exploit natural resources and NKVD men to ensure security. Globally, the German-Japanese rapprochement could be seen as completing an encirclement of the Soviet homeland by Japan, Germany and Poland. These were the three most important neighbors of the Soviet Union. They were also three states that had defeated the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire in the wars of Stalin's lifetime. Even though Germany had lost the First World War, its troops had defeated the Russian army on the Eastern Front in 1917. Japan had humiliated the Russian army and navy in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Poland had defeated the Red Army as recently as 1920. Now, after the German-Polish and the German-Japanese agreements, these three powers appeared to be arrayed against the Soviet Union. If the Anti-Comintern Pact and the German-Polish Non-Aggression Declaration had indeed included secret protocols concerning an offensive war on the Soviet Union, then Stalin would have been right about encirclement. In fact, neither did, and an offensive alliance between Tokyo, Warsaw and Berlin was highly unlikely, if not impossible. Although Poland's relations with Japan were good, Warsaw wished to take no step that could be interpreted as hostile to the Soviet Union. Poland declined Germany's invitation to join the anti-Comintern pact. Part of Stalin's political talent was his ability to equate foreign threats with failures in domestic policy, as if the two were actually the same thing, and as if he were responsible for neither. This absolved him of blame for policy failures, and allowed him to define his chosen internal enemies as agents of foreign powers. As early as 1930, as problems of collectivization became apparent, he was already speaking of international conspiracies between supporters of Trotsky and various foreign powers. It was obvious, Stalin proclaimed, that as long as the capitalist encirclement exists, there will continue to be present among us wreckers, spies, saboteurs and murderers. Any problem with Soviet policies was the fault of reactionary states that wished to slow the proper course of history. Any seeming flaws of the five-year plan were a result of foreign intervention. Hence the harshest of penalties was justified for traitors, and the blame always resided in Warsaw, Tokyo, Berlin, London or Paris. In these years, Stalinism thus involved a kind of double bluff. The success of the Popular Front depended on a record of progress towards socialism that was largely a matter of propaganda. 
Meanwhile, the explanation of famine and misery at home depended upon the idea of foreign subversion, which was essentially without merit. Atop the Soviet Party apparatus and atop the Communist International, Stalin was making these two bluffs simultaneously, and he knew just how they could be called. By a foreign military intervention by a state crafty enough to enlist Soviet citizens who had suffered under his policies. The power of the combination of foreign war and domestic opposition was, after all, the first lesson of Soviet history. Lenin himself had been a German secret weapon in the First World War. The Bolshevik Revolution itself was a side effect of the German foreign policy of 1917. Twenty years later, Stalin had to fear that his opponents within the Soviet Union would use a coming war to overthrow his own regime. Trotsky was in emigration, just as Lenin had been in 1917. During a war, Trotsky might come back and rally his supporters, just as Lenin had done twenty years before. By 1937, Stalin faced no meaningful political opposition within the Soviet Communist Party. But this only seemed to convince him that his enemies had learnt political invisibility. Just as he had during the height of the famine, he argued again that year that the most dangerous enemies of the state appeared to be harmless and loyal. All enemies, even the invisible ones, would have to be unmasked and eradicated. On the 7th of November, 1937, the 20th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, and the 5th anniversary of his wife's suicide, Stalin raised a toast. We will mercilessly destroy anyone who, by his deeds or his thoughts, yes, his thoughts, threatens the unity of the socialist state, to the complete destruction of all enemies, themselves and their kin. Unlike Hitler, Stalin had at his disposal the tool to effect such a policy. The state police, once known as the Cheka and the Ogpu, and by this time called the NKVD. The Soviet state police had arisen during the Bolshevik Revolution itself, when it was known as the Cheka. Its mission at the beginning had been more political than legal, the elimination of opponents of the revolution. Once the Soviet Union had been established, the Cheka, Ogpu, NKVD, became a massive state police force that was charged with the enforcement of Soviet law. In situations regarded as exceptional, such as collectivization in 1930, normal legal procedures were suspended, and Ogpu officers, leading troikas, in effect served as judges, juries, and executioners. This was a return to the revolutionary tradition of the Cheka, and was justified by the presence of a revolutionary situation, either an advance toward or a threat to socialism. In order to be in a position to crush the enemies of his choice in the second half of the 1930s, Stalin would need the NKVD to recognize that some sort of crisis was underway, one that required this sort of special measure. A dramatic murder gave Stalin the opportunity to assert control over the NKVD. In December 1934, one of Stalin's closest comrades, Sergei Kirov, was assassinated in Leningrad. Stalin exploited the Kirov assassination, much as Hitler had used the Reichstag fire the previous year. He blamed internal political opponents for the murder, and claimed that they planned further terrorist attacks against Soviet leaders. Although the assassin, Leonid Nikolaev, was arrested the day the crime was committed, Stalin would not be satisfied with a simple police action. He forced through a special law allowing for the swift execution of terrorists. Emphasizing the threat of terrorism, he declared that his former Politburo opponents on the left plotted the murder of the Soviet leadership and the overthrow of Soviet power. Stalin's interpretation of the Leningrad murder was a direct challenge to the Soviet state police. His was not a theory that the NKVD was inclined to accept not least because there was no evidence. When the NKVD chief, Genrich Jagoda, dared to make inquiries of Stalin, he was told that he should beware, lest he be slapped down. Stalin found a confederate, Nikolai Yezhov, who was willing to propagate Stalin's version of events. Yezhov, a diminutive man from the Polish-Lithuanian borderlands, was already known for his view that opposition was simultaneous with terrorism. In February 1935, he took charge of a control commission that collected compromising information about members of the Central Committee for the benefit of the Politburo. Stalin and Yezhov seemed to reinforce each other's beliefs in ubiquitous conspiracies. Stalin came to rely on Yezhov, 
even going so far in a rare sign of intimacy as to express concern about Yezhov's health. Yezhov first became Yagoda's deputy, then his replacement. In September 1936, Yezhov became Commissar of Internal Affairs, Chief of the NKVD. Yagoda was first appointed to another post, then executed two years later. Beginning in August 1936, Yezhov charged Stalin's former political opponents with fantastic offences in public show trials. The confession of these famous men drew the attention of the world. Lev Kamienev and Grigory Zinoviev, once Trotsky's allies and Stalin's opponents, were tried between the 19th and 24th of August. They confessed to participation in a terrorist plot to murder Stalin and, along with fourteen other men, were sentenced to death and executed. These old Bolsheviks had been intimidated and beaten and were doing little more than uttering lines from a script. But their confessions, which were widely believed, provided a kind of alternative history of the Soviet Union, one in which Stalin had always been right. In the show trials to come, Stalin even followed the rhythm of the late 1920s. Having dealt with his one-time opponents from the left, Kamienev and Zinoviev, he turned against his one-time opponent from the right, Nikolai Bukharin. Back when debate had still been possible, in 1928, Bukharin threatened to call Stalin an organizer of famine. Though he never fulfilled this threat, he died anyway. Trotsky, who could not be show-tried because he was abroad, was supposedly the ringleader. The party newspaper, Pravda, made the connection clear in a headline of the 22nd of August, 1936. Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamienev, Gestapo. Could the three Bolsheviks in question, men who had built the Soviet Union, truly be paid agents of capitalist powers? Were these three communists of Jewish origin likely agents of the secret state police of Nazi Germany? They were not, but the charge was taken seriously even outside the Soviet Union. For many Europeans and Americans, the show trials were simply trials, and confessions were reliable evidence of guilt. Some observers who were sympathetic to the Soviet Union saw them as a positive development. The British socialist Beatrice Webb, for example, was pleased that Stalin had cut out the deadwood. Other Soviet sympathizers no doubt suppressed their suspicions on the logic that the USSR was the enemy of Nazi Germany and thus the hope of civilization. European public opinion was so polarized by 1936 that it was indeed difficult to criticize the Soviet regime without seeming to endorse fascism and Hitler. This, of course, was the shared binary logic of National Socialism and the Popular Front. Hitler called his enemies Marxists, and Stalin called his Fascists. They agreed that there was no middle ground. Stalin appointed Yezhov just as he decided to intervene in Spain. The show trials and the Popular Front were, from his perspective, the same policy. The Popular Front allowed for the definition of friends and enemies, subject, of course, to the changing line from Moscow. Like any opening to non-communist political forces, it demanded great vigilance, both at home and abroad. For Stalin, the Spanish Civil War was simultaneously a battle against armed fascism in Spain and its foreign supporters, and a struggle against left-wing and internal enemies. He believed that the Spanish government was weak because it was unable to find and kill enough spies and traitors. The Soviet Union was both a state and a vision, both a domestic political system and an internationalist ideology. Its foreign policy was always domestic policy, and its domestic policy was always foreign policy. That was its strength and its weakness. As Orwell perceived, the public Soviet story of a clash with European fascism coincided with the blood purge of past or potential opponents at home. Soviet missions were installed in Barcelona and Madrid just as the show trials began. The encounter with fascism in Spain justified vigilance in the Soviet Union, and the purges in the Soviet Union justified vigilance in Spain. The Spanish Civil War revealed that Stalin was determined, despite the Popular Front rhetoric of pluralism, to eliminate opposition to his version of socialism. Orwell watched as the Communists provoked clashes in Barcelona in May 1937, and then as the Spanish government, beholden to Moscow, banned the Trotskyite party. As Orwell wrote of that skirmish in Barcelona, 
This squalid brawl in a distant city is more important than might appear at first. He was exactly right. Stalin thought that Barcelona had revealed a fascist fifth column. The event revealed the single powerful Stalinist logic, defying geography and local political reality. It was the subject of a moving chapter in his Homage to Catalonia, the war memoir that taught at least some Western leftists and Democrats that fascism was not the only enemy. Within the Soviet Union, the confessions of the show trial seemed to create evidence of organized conspiracies, which Yezhov called centers backed by foreign intelligence agencies. In late June 1937, in Moscow, Yezhov informed the Central Committee of the Party of the conclusions that he had drawn. There was, Yezhov announced to the party elite, one master conspiracy, a center of centers that embraced all of the political opponents, the armed forces, and even the NKVD. Its aim was nothing less than the destruction of the Soviet Union and the restoration of capitalism on its territories. The agents of the center of centers would stop at nothing, including the castration of prize sheep, an act of sabotage Yezhov specifically mentioned. All of this justified purges within the party, the army, and the NKVD. Eight high commanders of the armed forces were show-tried that same month. About half of the generals in the Red Army would be executed in the months to come. Of the 139 members of the Central Committee who took part in the Party Congress of 1934, the Congress of Victors, some 98 were shot. All in all, the purification of the armed forces, state institutions, and the Communist Party led to about 50,000 executions. During these same years, 1934 to 1937, Hitler was also using violence to assert his control over the institutions of power, the party, the police, and the military. Like Stalin, he revisited his own rise to power and visited death upon some of the people who had aided him. Although the scale of the murder was far smaller, Hitler's purges clarified that the rule of law in Germany was subject to the whims of the leader. Unlike Stalin, who had to subordinate the NKVD to his own authority, Hitler ordered terror as a way to develop his own favored paramilitary, the SS, and assert its superiority over the various German state police forces. Whereas Stalin used his purges to intimidate the Soviet armed forces, Hitler actually drew the German generals closer to his person by killing a Nazi that the army high command regarded as a threat. The most prominent target of Hitler's purge was Ernst Röhm, the leader of one of the Nazi paramilitaries, the SA Brownshirts. The SA had helped Hitler assert his personal authority to intimidate opponents and voters and to come to power in 1933. The street fighting of the SA was less useful to Hitler as chancellor than it had been for Hitler as politician. Röhm spoke in 1933 and 1934 of the need for a second revolution, an idea that Hitler rejected. Röhm also nurtured personal ambitions that ill-fit Hitler's plans to rebuild the German military. Röhm portrayed his SA as a better reflection of the Nazi spirit than the German armed forces, which he wished to control himself. His three million SA brownshirts far outnumbered the hundred thousand soldiers permitted to the German armed forces by the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler meant to break those treaty obligations, but by rebuilding the German army rather than by replacing or merging it with a paramilitary. In late June 1934, Hitler ordered the SS to murder Röhm and several dozen of his associates, as well as other rivals within the Nazi movement and a few other politicians. The SS was led by Heinrich Himmler, who emphasized racial purity, ideological training, and personal loyalty to Hitler. In what came to be known as the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler was using one of the Nazi paramilitaries, the SS, to master the other, the SA. He was endorsing Himmler's work and putting an end to Rome, and dozens of other people. Hitler told the Parliament on the 14th of July, 1935, that 74 men had been killed. The true number was at least eighty-five, several of whom were Nazi parliamentary deputies. He claimed, naturally, that Rome and the others had been planning a coup against his legitimate government and had to be stopped in advance. In addition to the SA leadership, Hitler's blood purge had reached conservatives and former heads of government. Of the three chancellors who had preceded him, one was murdered, 
one was arrested, and the third fled. Because the SS was the chosen instrument of the murder campaign, Himmler moved closer to the center of power. The SS, now separated institutionally from the SA, became the most powerful institution within the National Socialist Party. After the Night of the Long Knives, its task would be to subordinate the many German police institutions to Nazi ideology. Himmler would seek to merge his SS with Germany's established police forces by way of rotation of personnel and institutional centralization under his personal command. In 1936, Hitler named Himmler the chief of German police. This placed him in charge of the uniformed men of the order police, the detectives of the criminal police, and the operatives of the secret state police, Gestapo. The police was a state institution or rather comprised a number of different state institutions, and the SS was a Nazi party institution. Himmler sought to bring the two together. In 1937, Himmler established the office of higher SS and police leaders, regional chiefs who, in theory, commanded both SS and police forces, and unified the hierarchy of command. Just as important as the elevation of the SS over the SA, was the improvement of relations between Hitler and the generals. The execution of Röhm earned Hitler a debt of gratitude from the army high command. Until 1934, the army had been the only important state institution that Hitler had not fully mastered. Once Hitler showed that he planned to rebuild the army rather than overwhelm it with the SA, this quickly changed. When the German president died a few weeks later, the military endorsed Hitler's elevation to head of state. Hitler would never claim the title President, he preferred Leader. From August 1934, German soldiers swore an unconditional oath of personal loyalty to Hitler, and thenceforth addressed him as My Leader. Later that month, Hitler's titles as Leader and Reich Chancellor were confirmed by national plebiscite. In March 1935, Hitler publicly renounced Germany's commitments under the Versailles Treaty, reintroduced military conscription, and began to rebuild the German armed forces. Like Stalin, Hitler showed himself to be the master of the organs of power, presenting himself as the victim of plots and then ridding himself of real or imagined rivals. Simultaneously, however, Hitler was creating the kinds of instruments of coercion that Stalin had inherited from Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution. The SS and the German police would never be capable of organized terror within Germany on the scale of the NKVD in the Soviet Union. The Night of the Long Knives, with its dozens of victims, was dwarfed by the Soviet purges of the party, armed forces, and NKVD, in which tens of thousands of people were executed. That was far more people than the Nazi regime would kill before the Second World War. The SS would need time and practice before it could rival the NKVD. Himmler saw his charges as ideological soldiers, but they would fulfill their mission of racial conquest and domination only at the backs of true soldiers, behind the lines in Poland after 1939 or in the Soviet Union after 1941. The logic of Hitler's domestic terror was of a future offensive war, fought by an expanded Wehrmacht loyal to Hitler, transformed into a war of destruction by the SS and the police. In this one sense, Stalin's fears of war were perfectly justified. The Germans, however, were not counting on help from the Soviet population in that coming war. In this respect, Stalin's scenario of threat, the union of foreign enemies with domestic opponents, was quite wrong. Thus, the still greater terror that Stalin would unleash upon his own population in 1937 and 1938 was entirely fruitless, and indeed counterproductive. The Soviet purges within the Army, Party, and NKVD were the prelude to Stalin's Great Terror, which in 1937 and 1938 would take the lives of hundreds of thousands of people for reasons of class and nation. The interrogation of tens of thousands of people during the purges generated a multitude of organizations, plots, and groups, categories into which more and more Soviet citizens could fall. The executions of Communist Party members no doubt gave rise to fears within the Communist Party. But the party would generally be spared if its members followed Stalin's lead in summer 1937 and agreed to pursue the true enemies within the mass of Soviet society. 
The purges also tested the loyalty of the NKVD, as its leadership was changed at the whim of Stalin, and its officers were forced to watch as their colleagues were purged. Yet in summer 1937 the besieged NKVD would be turned against social groups that many of its officers were ready to define as enemies. For months the top leadership of the Soviet Union had been plotting a blow against a group that they perhaps did fear, the Kulaks. The Kulaks were peasants, the stubborn survivors of Stalin's revolution, of collectivization and famine, and very often of the Gulag. As a social class, the Kulak, prosperous peasant, never really existed. The term was rather a Soviet classification that took on a political life of its own. The attempt to liquidate the Kulaks during the first five-year plan had killed a tremendous number of people, but it created rather than destroyed a class. Those who had been stigmatized and repressed, but who had survived. The millions of people who were deported or who fled during collectivization were forever after regarded as Kulaks, and sometimes accepted the classification. What Soviet leaders had to consider was the possibility that the revolution itself had created its own opponents. At the plenum of the Central Committee of the Communist Party in February and March 1937, several speakers drew the logical conclusions. Alien elements were corrupting the pure proletariat of the cities. The Kulaks were impassioned enemies of the Soviet system. To be a Kulak was not only to have suffered, it was to have survived movement across vast distances. Collectivization had forced millions of Kulaks into the Gulag or into the cities. This meant journeys of hundreds or even thousands of miles. Some three million peasants, at least, had become paid laborers during the first five-year plan. That, after all, was the plan, that the Soviet Union would be transformed from an agrarian to an industrial country. Perhaps 200,000 people who would have been stigmatized as kulaks had made for the cities before they could be executed or deported. About 400,000 kulaks had managed to flee the special settlements, some for the cities, more for the countryside. Tens of thousands more had been allowed to leave concentration camps and the special settlements after serving their terms. Five-year gulag sentences in 1930, 1931, and 1932 meant mass releases of Gulag survivors in 1935, 1936, and 1937. The optimistic assumption had been that the movement and the punishment would strip the Kulak of his harmful social origins and make of him a Soviet person. By the second half of the 1930s, Stalinism had shed any such expectations of progress. The very social mobility intrinsic to his policy of industrialization was now unsettling. Kulaks were rejoining the collective farms. Perhaps they would lead rebellions, as other peasants had done in 1930. The Kulaks were returning to a social order that was traditional in many ways. Stalin knew from the 1937 census that he suppressed that a majority of adults still defied the atheism of the Soviet state and believed in God. Twenty years after the Bolshevik Revolution, religious faith was perplexing and perhaps unnerving. Could the Kulaks rebuild the society that once had been? The Kulaks sentenced later or to longer terms in the Gulag were still in exile in Siberia or Kazakhstan, in Soviet East or Central Asia. Might not such people support a Japanese invasion? The NKVD reported in June 1937 that exiled Kulaks in Siberia constituted a broad base on which to build an insurgent rebellion. Surely, given the support of a foreign power and the cover of war, the Kulaks would fight against Soviet power. In the meantime, they were the enemy within. One repressive policy created the foundations for another. Exiled Kulaks did not love the Soviet system, and their place of exile, so far from their homes, was close to a source of foreign threat, the expanding Japanese Empire. Reports from the NKVD in the Far East provided the scenario for an alliance between internal opponents and a foreign power. In April 1937, riots had broken out against the Soviet presence in the Chinese province of Xinjiang. In the Japanese puppet state Manchukuo, the Japanese were recruiting Russian emigres, who were making contact with Kulaks in exile throughout Siberia. According to the NKVD, a Russian General Military Union, backed by Japan, 
plan to incite exiled Kulaks to rebel when Japan invaded. In June 1937, the regional NKVD received permission to carry out mass arrests and executions of people suspected of collaborating with the Russian General Military Union. The targets of the operation were to be exiled Kulaks and the former Russian imperial officers who supposedly commanded them. Naturally, the former were in much greater supply than the latter, and so began the killing of the Kulaks in their Siberian exile. Soviet leaders always regarded the Japanese threat as the eastern half of a global capitalist encirclement involving Poland and Nazi Germany. Preparations for a war against Japan in Asia were also preparations for a war in Europe. Precisely because many Kulaks were returning home at this time, from Soviet Asia to Soviet Europe, it was possible to imagine networks of enemies that extended from one end of the Soviet Union to the other. Though the shooting of peasants began in Siberia, Stalin apparently decided to punish Kulaks not only in eastern exile, but throughout the Soviet Union. In a telegram entitled, on anti-Soviet elements, Stalin and the Politburo issued general instructions on the 2nd of July, 1937, for mass repressions in every region of the Soviet Union. The Soviet leadership held Kulaks responsible for recent waves of sabotage and criminality, which meant, in effect, anything that had gone wrong within the Soviet Union. The Politburo ordered the provincial offices of the NKVD to register all Kulaks who resided in their regions, and to recommend quotas for execution and deportation. Most regional NKVD officers asked to be allowed to add various anti-Soviet elements to the lists. By the 11th of July, the Politburo already had a first round of lists of people to be repressed. At Stalin's initiative, these initial numbers were rounded up, adding an extra thousand. This raised the stakes of the operation, sending a clear signal to the state police that they were to do more than simply sentence all of the people on whom they already had files. In order to demonstrate their diligence in a climate of threats and purges, NKVD officers would have to find still more victims. Stalin and Yezhov wanted the direct physical liquidation of the entire counter-revolution, which meant the elimination of enemies once and for all. The revised quotas were sent back down from Moscow to the regions as part of Order 00447, dated the 31st of July 1937, on the operations to repress former Kulaks, criminals, and other anti-Soviet elements. Here, Stalin and Yezhov anticipated the execution of 79,950 Soviet citizens by shooting and the sentencing of 193,000 more to eight to ten years in the Gulag. It was not that the Politburo or the NKVD central office in Moscow had 272,950 particular people in mind for repression. Just which Soviet citizens would fulfill these quotas remained to be seen. The local NKVD branches would decide that. The killing and imprisonment quotas were officially called limits, though everyone involved knew that they were meant to be exceeded. Local NKVD officers had to explain why they could not meet a limit, and were encouraged to exceed them. No NKVD officer wished to be seen as lacking élan when confronting counter-revolution, especially when Yezhov's line was, better too far than not far enough. Not 79,950, but five times as many people would be shot in the Kulak action. By the end of 1938, the NKVD had executed some 386,798 Soviet citizens in fulfillment of Order 00447. Order 00447 was to be implemented by the same institution that had brought terror to the Soviet countryside in the early 1930s, the Three-Person Commission, or Troika. Composed of a regional NKVD chief, a regional party leader, and a regional prosecutor, the Troikas were responsible for transforming the quotas into executions, the numbers into bodies. The overall quota for the Soviet Union was divided among 64 regions, each with a corresponding Troika. In practice, the Troikas were dominated by the NKVD chiefs, who usually chaired the meetings. Prosecutors had been ordered to ignore legal procedures. Party chiefs had other responsibilities, were not experts on security matters, and were afraid that they might themselves be targeted. NKVD chiefs were in their element. 
The fulfillment of Order 00447 began with the emptying of the file cabinets. The NKVD had some sort of material on Kulaks, since Kulak was a category created by the state. Criminals, the second group mentioned in the order, were by definition people who had an encounter with the judicial system behind them. In practical terms, the other anti-Soviet elements named in the order were simply the people on whom the local NKVD had a file. Local NKVD officers, helped by police, carried out investigations in operational sectors within each of the 64 zones. An operational group assembled a list of people to be interrogated. Those targeted were arrested, forced to confess, and encouraged to implicate others. Confessions were elicited by torture. The NKVD and other police organs applied the conveyor method, which meant uninterrupted questioning day and night. This was complemented by the standing method, in which suspects were forced to stand in a line near a wall and beaten if they touched it or fell asleep. Under time pressure to make quotas, officers simply beat prisoners until they confessed. Stalin authorized this on the 21st of July, 1937. In Soviet Belarus, interrogating officers would hold prisoners' heads down in the latrine and then beat them when they tried to rise. Some interrogators carried with them draft confessions and simply filled in the prisoners' personal details and changed an item here or there by hand. Others simply forced prisoners to sign blank pages and then filled them in later at leisure. In this way, Soviet organs unmasked the enemy, delivering his thoughts to the files. The numbers came down from the centre, but the corpses were made locally. The troikas who fulfilled Order 00447 were responsible for sentencing the prisoners, with no need for any confirmation from Moscow and no possibility for appeal. The three members of a troika would meet at night with investigating officers. For each case they would hear a very brief report, along with a recommendation for sentencing, death or the gulag. Only a very few of those arrested were not sentenced at all. The troikas would almost always accept these recommendations. They handled hundreds of cases at a time, at a pace of sixty per hour or more. The life or death of an individual human being was decided in a minute or less. In a single night, the Leningrad Troika, for example, sentenced to death 658 prisoners of the concentration camp at Solovki. Terror prevailed in the Gulag, as everywhere else. It might be difficult to see how concentration camp inmates could threaten the Soviet state, but like the regions of the USSR, the Gulag system had its own death quota, to be met or exceeded. Just as people who had been defined as Kulaks might be dangerous, so might people who were incarcerated as Kulaks. So went the logic. The camps of the Gulag had an initial quota of 10,000 executions, though in the end 30,178 of its prisoners were shot. Omsk, a southwest Siberian city whose environs were full of special settlers deported during collectivization, was the site of some of the most vicious campaigns. Its NKVD chief had already requested an additional quota of 8,000 executions on the 1st of August 1937, before Order 00447 even went into effect. His men once sentenced 1,301 people in a single night. This Kulak operation was carried out in secret. No one, including the condemned, was told of the sentences. Those sentenced would simply be taken, first to some sort of prison, and then either to a freight car or an execution site. Execution facilities were built or chosen with an eye to discretion. Killings were always carried out at night and in seclusion. They took place in soundproofed rooms below ground, in large buildings such as garages where noise could cover gunshots, or far from human settlement in forests. The executioners were always NKVD officers, generally using a Nagan pistol. While two men held a prisoner by his arms, the executioner would fire a single shot from behind into the base of the skull, and then often a control shot into the temple. After the executions, one set of instructions specified, the bodies are to be laid in a pit dug beforehand, then carefully buried, and the pit is to be camouflaged. As the winter of 1937 came and the ground froze, the pits were prepared using explosives. Everyone who took part in these operations was sworn to secrecy. 
only a very few people were directly involved. A team of just 12 Moscow NKVD men shot 20,761 people at Butovo, on the outskirts of Moscow, in 1937 and 1938. The Kulak operation involved shooting from the beginning to the end. Yezhov reported to Stalin, with evident pride, that 35,454 people had been shot by the 7th of September 1937. During the year 1937, however, the number of gulag sentences exceeded the number of death sentences. As time passed, new allocations tended to be for executions rather than exile. In the end, the number of people killed in the gulag operation was about the same as the number sent to the gulag. 378,326 and 389,070, respectively. The overall shift from exile to execution was for practical reasons. It was easier to kill than to deport, and the camps quickly filled to capacity, and had little use for many of the deportees. One investigation in Leningrad led to the shooting, not the deportation, of thirty-five people who were deaf and dumb. In Soviet Ukraine, the NKVD chief Israel Leplevsky ordered his officers to shoot rather than exile the elderly. In such cases, Soviet citizens were killed because of who they were. Soviet Ukraine, where Kulak resistance had been widespread during collectivization, was a major center of the killing. Leplevsky expanded the framework of Order 00447 to include supposed Ukrainian nationalists, who, since the famine, had been treated as a threat to the territorial integrity of the Soviet Union. Some 40,530 people in Soviet Ukraine were arrested on the charge of nationalism. In one variant, Ukrainians were arrested for supposedly having requested food aid from Germany in 1933. When the already twice-increased quotas for Soviet Ukraine were fulfilled in December 1937, Leplevsky asked for more. In February 1938, Yezhov added 23,650 to the death quota for the Republic. All in all, in 1937 and 1938, NKVD men shot 70,868 inhabitants of Soviet Ukraine in the Kulak operation. The ratio of shootings to other sentences was especially high in Soviet Ukraine during the year 1938. Between January and August, some 35,563 people were shot, as against only 830 sent to camps. The Troika for the Stalino district, for example, met seven times between July and September 1938, and sentenced to death every single one of the 1,102 people accused. The Troika in Voroshilovgrad similarly sentenced to death all 1,226 people whose cases it reviewed in September 1938. These tremendous numbers meant regular and massive executions over enormous and numerous death pits. In Soviet Ukrainian industrial cities, workers with real or imagined Kulak backgrounds were sentenced to death for some sort of sabotage and typically killed the same day. In Vinnytsia, People sentenced to death were tied, gagged, and driven to a car wash. There a truck awaited, its engine running to cover the sound of the gunshots. The bodies were then placed in the truck and driven to a site in the city, an orchard, perhaps, or a park, or a cemetery. Before their work was done, the NKVD men had dug no fewer than eighty-seven mass graves in and around Vinnytsia. Like the show trials, the Kulak operation allowed Stalin to relive the years of the late 1920s and early 1930s, the period of his true political vulnerability, this time with a predictable outcome. The former political opponents, representing the moment of political debate over collectivization, were physically eliminated. So were the Kulaks, standing for the moment of mass resistance to collectivization. Just as the murder of party elites confirmed Stalin's succession of Lenin, so the murder of Kulaks confirmed his interpretation of Lenin's policies. If collectivization had led to mass starvation, that had been the fault of those who starved and the foreign intelligence agencies who somehow arranged the whole thing. If collectivization had given rise to a sense of grievance among the population, that too was the fault of the very people who had suffered and their supposed foreign sponsors. 
Precisely because Stalin's policy was so disastrous in the first place, its defense seemed to require such tortured logic and massive death. Once these measures had been taken, they could be presented as the verdict of history. Yet even as Stalin presented his own policies as inevitable, he was abandoning, without admitting anything of the kind, the Marxism that allowed leaders to discuss and pretend to know the future. In so far as Marxism was a science of history, its natural world was the economy, and its object of investigation the social class. Even in the harshest of Leninist interpretations of Marxism, people opposed the revolution because of their class background. Yet with Stalinism, something was changing. Normal state security concerns had infused the Marxist language and changed it unalterably. The accused in the show trials had supposedly betrayed the Soviet Union to foreign powers. Theirs was a class struggle, according to the accusation, only in the most indirect and attenuated sense. They supposedly had aided states that represented the imperialist states that encircled the homeland of socialism. Although the Kulak action was at first glance a class terror, the killing was sometimes directed, as in Soviet Ukraine, against nationalists. Here, too, Stalinism was introducing something new. In Lenin's adaptation of Marxism, nationalities were supposed to embrace the Soviet project, as their social advance coincided with the construction of the Soviet state. Thus, the peasant question was initially linked to the national question in a positive way. People rising from the peasantry into the working or clerical or professional classes would come to national awareness as loyal Soviet citizens. Now, under Stalin, the peasant question was linked to the national question in a negative sense. The attainment of Ukrainian national consciousness by Ukrainian peasants was dangerous. Other, smaller national minorities were more threatening still. Most of the victims of Order 00447 in Soviet Ukraine were Ukrainians, but a disproportionate number were Poles. Here the connection between class and nation was perhaps most explicit. In a kind of operational shorthand, NKVD officers said, Once a Pole, always a Kulak. The Nazi terror of 1936-1938 proceeded along somewhat similar lines, usually punishing members of politically defined social groups for what they were, rather than individuals for anything that they might have done. For the Nazis, the most important category were the asocials, groups that were thought to be, and sometimes truly were, resistant to the Nazi worldview. These were homosexuals, vagrants, and people who were thought to be alcoholic, addicted to drugs, or unwilling to work. They were also Jehovah's Witnesses, who rejected the premises of the Nazi worldview with strikingly greater clarity than most other German Christians. The Nazi leadership regarded such people as racially German but corrupt, and thus to be improved by confinement and punishment. Like the Soviet NKVD, the German police carried out organized raids of district in 1937 and 1938, seeking to meet a numerical quota of specified sectors of the population. They, too, often overfulfilled these quotas in their zealous desire to prove loyalty and impress superiors. The outcome of arrests, however, was different, almost always confinement, very rarely execution. The Nazi repression of these undesirable social groups required the creation of a network of German concentration camps. To the camps at Dachau and Lichtenberg, both established in 1933, were added Sachsenhausen, 1936, Buchenwald, 1937, and Flossenburg, 1938. By comparison with the Gulag, these five camps were rather modest. While more than a million Soviet citizens toiled in the Soviet concentration camps and special settlements in late 1938, the number of German citizens in the German concentration camps was about 20,000. When the difference in population size is taken into account, the Soviet system of concentration camps was about 25 times larger than the German one at this time. Soviet terror at this point was not only on a far greater scale, it was incomparably more lethal. Nothing in Hitler's Germany remotely resembled the execution of nearly 400,000 people in 18 months, as under Order 00447 in the Soviet Union. In the years 1937 and 1938, 
267 people were sentenced to death in Nazi Germany, as compared to 378,326 death sentences within the Kulak operation alone in the Soviet Union. Again, given the difference in population size, the chances that a Soviet citizen would be executed in the Kulak action were about 700 times greater than the chances that a German citizen would be sentenced to death in Nazi Germany for any offence. After a purge of the leadership and an assertion of dominance over the key institutions, both Stalin and Hitler carried out social cleansings in 1937 and 1938. But the Kulak action was not the entirety of the Great Terror. It could be seen, or at least presented, as class war. But even as the Soviet Union was killing class enemies, it was also killing ethnic enemies. By the late 1930s, Hitler's National Socialist regime was well known for its racism and anti-Semitism. But it was Stalin's Soviet Union that undertook the first shooting campaigns of internal national enemies. Chapter 3 National Terror People belonging to national minorities should be forced to their knees and shot like mad dogs. It was not an SS officer speaking, but a Communist Party leader, in the spirit of the national operations of Stalin's Great Terror. In 1937 and 1938, a quarter of a million Soviet citizens were shot on essentially ethnic grounds. The five-year plans were supposed to move the Soviet Union toward a flowering of national cultures under socialism. In fact, the Soviet Union in the late 1930s was a land of unequalled national persecutions. Even as the Popular Front presented the Soviet Union as the homeland of toleration, Stalin ordered the mass killing of several Soviet nationalities. The most persecuted European national minority in the second half of the 1930s was not the 400,000 or so German Jews, the number declining because of emigration, but the 600,000 or so Soviet Poles, the number declining because of executions. Stalin was a pioneer of national mass murder, and the Poles were the preeminent victim among the Soviet nationalities. The Polish national minority, like the Kulaks, had to take the blame for the failures of collectivization. The rationale was invented during the famine itself in 1933, and then applied during the Great Terror in 1937 and 1938. In 1933, the NKVD chief for Ukraine, Vsevolod Valyetsky, had explained the mass starvation as a provocation of an espionage cabal that he called the Polish Military Organization. According to Valyetsky, this Polish Military Organization had infiltrated the Ukrainian branch of the Communist Party and backed Ukrainian and Polish nationalists who sabotaged the harvest and then used the starving bodies of Ukrainian peasants as anti-Soviet propaganda. It had supposedly inspired a nationalist Ukrainian military organization, a doppelganger performing the same fell work and sharing responsibility for the famine. This was a historically inspired invention. There was no Polish military organization during the 1930s in Soviet Ukraine or anywhere else. It had once existed, back during the Polish-Bolshevik War of 1919-1920, as a reconnaissance group for the Polish army. The Polish military organization had been overmastered by the Cheka and was dissolved in 1921. Valietsky knew the history since he had taken part in the deconspiracy and the destruction of the Polish military organization back then. In the 1930s, Polish spies played no political role in Soviet Ukraine. They lacked the capacity to do so even in 1930 and 1931, when the USSR was most vulnerable and they could still run agents across the border. They lacked the intention to intervene after the Soviet-Polish Non-Aggression Pact was initialed in January 1932. After the famine, they generally lost any remaining confidence about their ability to understand the Soviet system, much less change it. Polish spies were shocked by the mass starvation when it came, and unable to formulate a response. Precisely because there was no real Polish threat in 1933, Belietsky had been able to manipulate the symbols of Polish espionage as he wished. This was typical Stalinism. It was always easier to exploit the supposed actions of an organization that did not exist. 
The Polish military organization, Dalitsky had argued back in summer 1933, had smuggled into the Soviet Union countless agents who pretended to be communists fleeing persecution in their Polish homeland. In fact, communism was marginal and illegal in Poland, and Polish communists saw the Soviet Union as their natural place of refuge. Although Polish military intelligence doubtless tried to recruit Polish communists, most of the Polish leftists who came to the Soviet Union were simply political refugees. The arrests of Polish political emigres in the Soviet Union began in July 1933. The Polish communist playwright Witold Wandorski was jailed in August 1933 and forced to confess to participation in the Polish military organization. With this link between Polish communism and Polish espionage documented in interrogation protocols, more Polish communists were arrested in the USSR. The Polish communist Jerzy Sochatsky left a message in his own blood before jumping to his death from a Moscow prison in 1933. I am faithful to the party to the end. The Polish military organization provided a rationale for the scapegoating of Poles for Soviet policy failures. After the signing of the German-Polish non-aggression declaration in January 1934, Poles were blamed not only for the famine, but also for the worsening of the Soviet international position. At that month, Balitsky blamed the Polish military organization for the continuation of Ukrainian nationalism. In March 1934, in Soviet Ukraine, some 10,800 Soviet citizens of Polish or German nationality were arrested. In 1935, as the level of NKVD activity decreased in the Soviet Union as a whole, it continued to increase in Soviet Ukraine, with special attention to Soviet Poles. In February and March 1935, some 41,650 Poles, Germans and Kulaks were resettled from Western to Eastern Ukraine. Between June and September 1936, some 69,283 people, for the most part Soviet Poles, were deported from Ukraine to Kazakhstan. Polish diplomats were confused by these developments. Poland was pursuing a policy of equal distance between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Non-aggression agreements with both, alliances with neither. The Polish military organization, conjured up during the famine in 1933, was sustained as pure bureaucratic fantasy in Soviet Ukraine, then adapted to justify a national terror of Poles throughout the Soviet Union. Stalin gave a first cue in December 1934, asking that the Pole, Jerzy Sochatsky, be removed from the NKVD. Sosnowski, long before a member of the Polish military organization, had been turned by the Cheka and had worked productively for the Soviets for more than a decade. In part because the Soviet state police had been founded by a Polish communist, Felix Dzerzhinsky, many of its most prominent officers were Poles, often people recruited in those early days. Yezhov, the NKVD chief seems to have been threatened by these veteran Polish officers. He was certainly obsessed with Poles generally. Inclined to believe in intricate plots orchestrated by foreign intelligence agencies, he gave pride of place to Poland because Poles, in his view, know everything. The investigation of Sosnowski, who was arrested in December 1936, might have brought the historical Polish military organization to Yezhov's attention. Yezhov followed Balietsky's anti-Polish campaign in Soviet Ukraine and then reconceptualized it. As the show trials began in Moscow in 1936, Yezhov drew his subordinate Balietsky into a trap. While prominent communists confessed in Moscow, Balietsky was reporting from Kiev that the Polish military organization had been recreated in Soviet Ukraine. No doubt he simply wished to claim attention and resources for himself and his local apparatus at a time of security panic. Yet now, in a turn of events that must have surprised Balitsky, Yezhov declared that the Polish military organization was an even greater danger than Balitsky claimed. It was a matter not for the regional NKVD in Kiev, but for the central NKVD in Moscow. Balitsky, who had invented the plot of the Polish military organization, now lost control of the story. Soon a confession was extracted from the Polish communist Tomasz Dombow, 
who claimed to have directed the Polish military organization in the entire Soviet Union. Thanks to Yezhov's initiative, the Polish military organization lost any residue of its historical and regional origins and became simply a threat to the Soviet Union as such. On the 16th of January 1937, Yezhov presented his theory of a grand Polish conspiracy to Stalin, and then, with Stalin's approval, to a plenum of the Central Committee. In March, Yezhov purged the NKVD of Polish officers. Although Baliecki was not Polish but Ukrainian by nationality, he now found himself in a very awkward position. If the Polish military organization had been so important, asked Yezhov, why had Baliecki not been more vigilant? Thus Baliecki, who had summoned up the spectre of the Polish military organization in the first place, became a victim of his own creation. He yielded his Ukrainian position in May to his former deputy, Israel Leplevsky, the NKVD officer who carried out the Kulak operation in Soviet Ukraine with such vigor. On the 7th of July, Baliecki was arrested on charges of espionage for Poland. A week later, his name was removed from the stadium where Dynamo Kiev played its soccer matches, to be replaced by Yezhov's. Baliecki was executed that November. In June 1937, when Yezhov introduced the imaginary Center of Centers to explain the Kulak action and the continuing show trials, he also announced the threat of the equally unreal Polish military organization. The two supposedly were connected. Like the justification for the Kulak action, the justification for the Polish action permitted the rewriting of the entirety of Soviet history so that responsibility for all policy problems could be placed upon enemies, and those enemies clearly defined. In Yezhov's account, the Polish military organization had been active in the Soviet Union from the beginning, and had penetrated not only the Communist Party, but the Red Army and the NKVD. It had been invisible, went Yezhov's argument, precisely because it was so important. It had agents in high places who were able to mask themselves and their works. On the 11th of August, 1937, Yezhov issued Order 00485, mandating that the NKVD carry out the total liquidation of the networks of spies of the Polish military organization. Though issued shortly after the beginning of the Kulak operation, Order 00485 notably radicalized the terror. Unlike Order 00447, which targeted familiar categories of enemies definable at least theoretically by class, Order 00485 seemed to treat a national group as an enemy of the state. To be sure, the Kulak Order also specified criminals and was applied to nationalists and political enemies of various kinds. But there was at least a faltering aureole of class analysis. Kulaks as a group could at least be described in Marxist terms. The enmity of the nations of the Soviet Union toward the Soviet project was something else. It looked like an abandonment of the basic socialist premise of the fraternity of peoples. Soviet influence in the world in these years of the Popular Front depended upon an image of toleration. Moscow's major claim to moral superiority in a Europe where fascism and national socialism were on the rise, and for American Southerners journeying from a land of racial discrimination and lynchings of blacks, was as a multicultural state with affirmative action. In the popular Soviet film Circus of 1936, for example, the heroine was an American performer who, having given birth to a black child, finds refuge from racism in the Soviet Union. Internationalism was not hypocrisy, and ethnic killing was a shock to the Soviet system. The NKVD was composed of many nationalities and represented a kind of internationalism. When the show trials began in 1936, the heights of the NKVD were dominated by men whose own origins were within the Soviet national minorities, Jews above all. About 40% of high-ranking NKVD officers had Jewish nationality recorded in their identity documents, as did more than half of the NKVD generals. In the climate of the day, Jews had perhaps more reason than others to resist policies of ethnic destruction. Perhaps to counter the internationalist or self-preservation instinct of his officers, Yezhov sent out a special circular, assuring them that their task was to punish espionage rather than ethnicity. 
on the fascist insurgent sabotage defeatist and terrorist activity of the Polish intelligence service in the USSR. Its 30 pages expanded upon the theory that Yezhov had already shared with the Central Committee and with Stalin, that the Polish military organization was connected to other espionage centers and had penetrated every key Soviet institution. Even if the idea of a deep Polish penetration of Soviet institutions persuaded Yezhov and Stalin, it could not serve as the evidentiary basis for individual arrests. There simply was nothing resembling a vast Polish plot in the Soviet Union. NKVD officers had too few leads to follow. Even with a great deal of ingenuity, connections between the Polish state and events in the Soviet Union would be hard to document. The two most obvious groups of Polish citizens, diplomats and communists, were clearly inadequate for a mass killing action. The heyday of Polish espionage in the Soviet Union was long past, and the NKVD knew what there was to be known about what the Poles had tried to do in the late 1920s and early 1930s. To be sure, Polish diplomats still tried to gather intelligence, but they were protected by diplomatic immunity, not very numerous, and under constant surveillance already. For the most part, they knew better by 1937 than to contact Soviet citizens and thereby endanger their lives. This was a time when they themselves were furnished with instructions on how to behave when arrested. Yezhov told Stalin that Polish political émigrés were major suppliers of spies and provocateur elements in the USSR. Leading Polish communists were often already in the Soviet Union and sometimes already dead. Some sixty-nine of the hundred members of the Central Committee of the Polish Party were executed in the USSR. Most of the rest were behind bars in Poland and so were unavailable for execution. And, in any case, these numbers were far too small. Precisely because there was no Polish plot, NKVD officers had little choice but to persecute Soviet Poles and other Soviet citizens associated with Poland, Polish culture or Roman Catholicism. The Polish ethnic character of the operation quickly prevailed in practice, as perhaps it was bound to from the beginning. Yezhov's letter authorized the arrest of nationalist elements and of Polish military organization members who had yet to be discovered. These categories were so vague that NKVD officers could apply them to almost anyone of Polish ethnicity or with some connection to Poland. NKVD officers who wished to show the appropriate zeal in carrying out the operation would have to be rather vague about the charges against individual people. Balietsky's previous actions against Poles had created a pool of suspects sufficient for a few purges, but this was far from enough. Local NKVD officers would have to take the initiative, not in looking up the card files, as in the Kulak operation, but in creating a new paper trail to follow. One Moscow NKVD chief understood the gist of the order. His organization should destroy the Poles entirely. His officers looked for Polish names in the telephone book. Soviet citizens would have to unmask themselves as Polish agents, because the groups and scenarios of the ostensible Polish plot had to be generated from nothing, torture played an important role in the interrogations. In addition to the traditional conveyor method and the standing method, many Soviet Poles were subjected to a form of collective torture called the conference method. Once a large number of Polish suspects had been gathered in a single place, such as the basement of a public building in a town or village of Soviet Ukraine or Soviet Belarus, a policeman would torture one of them in full view of the others. Once the victim had confessed, the others would be urged to spare themselves the same sufferings by confessing as well. If they wanted to avoid pain and injury, they would have to implicate not only themselves, but others. In this situation, each person had an incentive to confess as quickly as possible. It was obvious that everyone would be implicated eventually anyway, and a quick confession might at least spare the body. In this way, testimony that implicated an entire group could be assembled very quickly. The legal procedures were somewhat different than in the Kulak operation, but no less scanty. In the Polish operation, the investigating officer would compose a brief report for each of the prisoners, describing the supposed crime, usually sabotage, terrorism or espionage, and recommending one of two sentences, death or the Gulag. 
Every ten days he would submit all of his reports to the regional NKVD chief and a prosecutor. Unlike the Troikas of the Kulak operation, this two-person commission, a Dvoika, could not sentence the prisoners by itself, but had to ask for approval from higher authorities. It assembled the reports into an album, noted its recommended sentence for each case, and sent them on to Moscow. In principle, the albums were then reviewed by a central dvoika, Yezhov as the Commissar for State Security and Andrei Vyshinsky as State Prosecutor. In fact, Yezhov and Vyshinsky merely initialed the albums after a hasty review by their subordinates. On a single day, they might finalize 2,000 death sentences. The album method gave the appearance of a formal review by the highest Soviet authorities. In reality, the fate of each victim was decided by the investigating officer and then more or less automatically confirmed. Biographies became death sentences, as attachment to Polish culture or Roman Catholicism became evidence of participation in international espionage. People were sentenced for the most apparently minor of offences. Ten years in the Gulag for owning a rosary. Death for not producing enough sugar. Details of everyday life were enough to generate a report, an album entry, a signature, a verdict, a gunshot, a corpse. After twenty days, or two cycles of albums, Yezhov reported to Stalin that 23,216 arrests had already been made in the Polish operation. Stalin expressed his delight. Very good. Keep on digging up and cleaning out this Polish filth. Eliminate it in the interests of the Soviet Union. In the early stages of the Polish operation, many of the arrests were made in Leningrad, where the NKVD had large offices and where thousands of Poles lived within easy reach. The city had been a traditional place of settlement of Poles since the days of the Russian Empire. Janina Yuryevitz, then a young Polish girl in Leningrad, saw her life altered by these early arrests. The youngest of three sisters, she was very attached to Maria, the eldest. Maria fell in love with a young man called Stanislav Viganovsky, and the three of them would go for walks together, little Janina serving as chaperone. Maria and Stanislav married in 1936, were a happy couple. When Maria was arrested in August 1937, her husband seemed to know what this meant. I will meet her, he said, under the ground. He went to the authorities to make inquiries and was arrested himself. In September, the NKVD visited the Yuryevitz family home, confiscated all of the Polish books, and arrested Janina's other sister, Elzbieta. She, Maria and Stanislav were all executed by a shot to the back of the neck and buried anonymously in mass graves. When Janina's mother asked the police about them, she was told the typical lie. Her daughters and son-in-law had been sentenced to ten years without the right to correspondence. Because this was another possible sentence, people believed it and hoped. Many of them kept hoping for decades. People such as the Yuryevitzes, who had nothing to do with Polish espionage of any kind, were the filth to which Stalin was referring. The family of Jerzy Makowski, a young Leningrad student, suffered a similar fate. He and his brothers were all ambitious, wishing to build careers for themselves in the Soviet Union, and fulfill their deceased father's wish that they master a trade. Yerzy, the youngest of the brothers, wanted to be a shipbuilder. He studied each day with his older brother Stanislav. One morning, the two of them were awakened by three NKVD men who had come to arrest Stanislav. Though he tried to reassure his little brother, he was so nervous that he could not tie his shoes. This was the last Yerzy saw of his brother. Two days later, the next brother, Vladislav, was also arrested. Stanislav and Vladislav Makovsky were executed. Two of the 6,597 Soviet citizens shot in the Leningrad region in the Polish operation. Their mother was told the typical lie, that her sons had been sent to the Gulag without the right of correspondence. The third brother, Eugeniusz, who had wished to be a singer, now took a factory job to support the family. He contracted tuberculosis and died. The Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, then living in Leningrad, lost her son to the Gulag during the terror. 
she recalled an innocent Russia that writhed beneath the bloody boots of the executioners, beneath the wheels of the Black Marias. Innocent Russia was a multinational country, Leningrad was a cosmopolitan city, and its national minorities were the people most at risk. In the city of Leningrad in 1937 and 1938, Poles were thirty-four times more likely to be arrested than their fellow Soviet citizens. Once arrested, a Pole in Leningrad was very likely to be shot. Eighty-nine percent of those sentenced in the Polish operation in this city were executed, usually within ten days of the arrest. This was only somewhat worse than the situation of Poles elsewhere. On average, throughout the Soviet Union, seventy-eight percent of those arrested in the Polish operation were executed. The rest, of course, were not released. Most of them served sentences of eight to ten years in the Gulag. Leningraders and Poles had little idea of these proportions at the time. There was only the fear of the knock on the door in the early morning, and the sight of the prison truck, called the Black Mariah, or the Soul Destroyer, or by Poles, the Black Raven, nevermore. As one Pole remembered, people went to bed each night not knowing whether they would be awakened by the sun or by the Black Raven. Industrialization and collectivization had scattered Poles throughout the vast country. Now they simply disappeared from their factories, barracks, or homes. To take one example of thousands, in a modest wooden house in the town of Kunzevo, just west of Moscow, lived a number of skilled workers, among them a Polish mechanic and a Polish metallurgist. These two men were arrested on the 18th of January 1938 and the 2nd of February 1938, and shot. Evgenia Babushkina, a third victim of the Polish operation in Kuncevo, was not even Polish. She was a promising and apparently loyal organic chemist, but her mother had once been a washerwoman for Polish diplomats, and so Evgenia was shot as well. Most Soviet Poles lived not in Soviet Russian cities, such as Leningrad or Kuncevo, but in westerly Soviet Belarus and Soviet Ukraine, lands Poles had inhabited for hundreds of years. These districts had been part of the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 17th and 18th centuries. Over the course of the 19th century, when these territories were western regions of the Russian Empire, Poles had lost a great deal of their status and in many cases had begun to assimilate with the surrounding Ukrainian and Belarusian populations. Sometimes, though, the assimilation was in the other direction, as speakers of Belarusian or Ukrainian who regarded Polish as the language of civilization presented themselves as Poles. The original Soviet nationality policy of the 1920s had sought to make proper Poles of such people, teaching them literary Polish in Polish-language schools. Now, during the Great Terror, Soviet policy distinguished these people once again, but negatively, by sentencing them to death or to the Gulag. As with the contemporary persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany, the targeting of an individual on ethnic grounds did not mean that this person actually identified himself strongly with the nation in question. In Soviet Belarus, the terror coincided with a massive purge of the party leadership in Minsk, carried out by NKVD commander Boris Berman. He accused local Belarusian communists of abusing Soviet affirmative action policies and fomenting Belarusian nationalism. Later than in Ukraine, but with much the same reasoning, the NKVD presented the Polish military organization as the mastermind behind supposed Belarusian disloyalty. Soviet citizens in Belarus were accused of being Belarusian national fascists, Polish spies, or both. Because Belarusian lands, like Ukrainian lands, were divided between the Soviet Union and Poland, such arguments could easily be made. To be concerned with Belarusian or Ukrainian culture, as such, involved attention to developments on the other side of a state border. The mass killing in Soviet Belarus included the deliberate destruction of the educated representatives of Belarusian national culture. As one of Behrman's colleagues later put it, he destroyed the flower of the Belarusian intelligentsia. No fewer than 218 of the country's leading writers were killed. Behrman told his subordinates that their careers depended upon their rapid fulfillment of Order 00485. 
The speed and quality of the work in discovering and arresting Polish spies will be the main consideration taken into account in the evaluation of each leader. Berman and his men took advantage of economies of scale, killing at one of the largest murder sites in the Soviet Union. They carried out executions in the Kurapachi forest, twelve kilometers north of Minsk. The woods were known for their white flowers, Kuraslepi in literary Belarusian, Kurapachi in the local dialect. The black ravens drove through the white flowers day and night, in such numbers that they flattened the narrow gravel alley into what the locals called the road of death. Within the forest, fifteen hectares of pine had been cleared and hundreds of pits dug. After condemned Soviet citizens were driven through the gates, they were escorted by two men to the edge of a pit. There they were shot from behind and pushed into the ditch. When bullets were in short supply, NKVD men would force their victims to sit side by side, their heads in a line, so that a single bullet could be fired through several skulls at once. The corpses were arranged in layers and covered with sand. Of the 19,931 people arrested in the Polish operation in the Belarusian Republic, 17,772 were sentenced to death. Some of these people were Belarusians and some were Jews, but most were Poles, who were also subject to arrest in Belarus in the Kulak action and in the other purges. All in all, as a result of execution and death sentences, the number of Poles in Soviet Belarus fell by more than 60,000 during the Great Terror. The Polish operation was most extensive in Soviet Ukraine, which was home to about 70% of the Soviet Union's 600,000 Poles. Some 55,928 people were arrested in Soviet Ukraine in the Polish operation, of whom 47,327 were shot. In 1937 and 1938, Poles were twelve times more likely than the rest of the Soviet Ukrainian population to be arrested. It was in Soviet Ukraine that the famine had generated the theory of the Polish military organization, here that Balitsky had persecuted Poles for years, and here that his former deputy, Israel Leplevsky, had to prove his vigilance after his former superior was removed from the scene. It did Leplevsky little good. He too was arrested in April 1938 and executed before the Polish operation in Ukraine was even completed. His successor, A.I. Uspensky, was wise enough to disappear in September 1938, but was eventually found and executed. One of Leplevsky's deputies, Lev Reichmann, provided categories of arrest that could be applied to the large Polish population of Soviet Ukraine. One of the suspect groups, interestingly enough, was that of Soviet police agents working among the Soviet Poles. This recreated the dilemma of vigilance facing Balietsky, Leplevsky, and NKVD officers generally. Once it had been established that the Polish military organization was and had been ubiquitous in Soviet Ukraine and powerful throughout the Soviet Union, the NKVD could always argue that policemen and informers had failed to show sufficient vigilance at an earlier moment. Although many of these police agents were themselves Soviet Poles, some were Ukrainians, Jews, or Russians. Jadwiga Mozinska fell into this trap. A Polish journalist working for a Polish-language newspaper, she informed on her colleagues to the police. As her colleagues were arrested and charged as Polish spies, she was left in an impossible position. Why had she not told the authorities that the entire Polish community was a nest of foreign agents? Czesława Angielczyk, an NKVD officer of Polish Jewish organization who reported on teachers of the Polish language, suffered a similar fate. Once the Polish operation was in full swing and teachers were routinely arrested, she too was vulnerable to the accusation that she had not previously been sufficiently diligent in her work. Both women were executed and buried at Bikivnia, a huge collection of mass graves northeast of Kiev. At least 10,000 Soviet citizens were executed at that site during the Great Terror. In the Ukrainian countryside, the Polish operation was, if anything, even more arbitrary and ferocious than in Kiev and the cities. The Black Raven flew, as Polish survivors remembered, from town to town, village to village, visiting grief upon the Poles. 
the NKVD would bring crews to cities in the hopes of completing the business of arresting and executing Poles in a few weeks, or even days. In Zmerinka, an important railway junction, the NKVD appeared in March 1938, rounded up hundreds of Poles, and tortured them to produce confessions. In Polon, the Dwyka of the NKVD chief and prosecutor commandeered the desecrated Roman Catholic Church building. Poles from Polon and surrounding villages were arrested and locked in the church basement. Some 168 people were killed in the Polon church. In the smallest settlements, it was difficult to discern even the emptiest of judicial formalities. NKVD task forces appeared suddenly with instructions to arrest and execute a certain number of people. They would begin from the assumption that an entire village, factory, or collective farm was guilty, surround the place by night, and then torture the men until they got the results they needed. Then they would carry out the executions and move on. In many such cases, the victims were long dead by the time that the albums with their case files were assembled and reviewed in Moscow. In the countryside, the NKVD task forces were death squads. In Chernivka, the NKVD waited until the 25th of December 1937, Christmas for Roman Catholic Poles, not for Orthodox Ukrainians, and then arrested whoever attended church. Those arrested simply disappeared, as a local woman remembered, a stone in the water. Those arrested were almost always men, and their arrests left families in despair. Zephyrina Kozhevitz saw her father for the last time as he was arrested at his factory and taken to Polon for interrogation. His last words to her were, Listen to your mother. Yet most mothers were all but helpless. In the Ukrainian countryside, as throughout the Soviet Union, wives would ritually visit the prison each day, bringing food and clean undergarments. Prison guards would give them soiled undergarments in exchange. Since these were the only sign that husbands still lived, they were received with joy. Sometimes a man would manage to smuggle out a message, as did one husband in the underwear he had passed to his wife. I suffer, and I am innocent. One day the undergarments would be soiled by blood, and the next day there would be no undergarments, and then there would be no husband. In October and November 1937, before the camps and special settlements were full, Wives were exiled to Kazakhstan after their husbands were shot. During these weeks, the NKVD often abducted Polish children over the age of ten and took them to orphanages. That way they would certainly not be raised as Poles. From December 1937, when there was no longer much room in the Gulag, women were generally not exiled but were left alone with their children. Ludwig Pivinsky, for example, was arrested while his wife was giving birth to their son. He could not tell her his sentence, as he was never allowed to see her, and only learned it himself on the train. Ten years felling trees in Siberia. He was one of the lucky ones, one of those relatively few Poles who was arrested but who survived. Eleonora Pashkevitz watched her father being arrested on the 19th of December 1937, and then watched her mother giving birth on Christmas Day. The Polish operation was fiercest in Soviet Ukraine, in the very lands where deliberate starvation policies had killed millions only a few years before. Some Polish families who lost men to the terror in Soviet Ukraine had already been horribly struck by the famine. Hanna Sobolewska, for example, had watched five siblings and her father die of starvation in 1933. Her youngest brother, Josef, was the toddler who, before his own death by starvation, had liked to say, now we will live. In 1938, the Black Raven took her one surviving brother, as well as her husband. As she remembered the terror in Polish villages in Ukraine, children cry, women remain. In September 1938, the procedures of the Polish operation came to resemble those of the Kulak operation, as the NKVD was empowered to sentence, kill, and deport without formal oversight. The album method, simple as it was, had become too cumbersome. Even though the albums had been subject to only the most cursory review in Moscow, they nevertheless arrived more quickly than they could be processed. By September 1938, more than 100,000 cases awaited attention. As a result, special troikas were created to read the files at a local level. These were composed of a local party head, 
a local NKVD chief, and a local prosecutor, often the same people who were carrying out the Kulak operation. Their task was now to review the accumulated albums of their districts and to pass judgment on all of the cases. Since the new Troikas were usually just the original Dvoika plus a Communist Party member, they were just approving their own previous recommendations. Considering hundreds of cases a day, going through the backlog in about six weeks, the special Troikas sentenced about 72,000 people to death. In the Ukrainian countryside, the Troikas also operated now as they had in the Kulak operation, sentencing and killing people in large numbers and in great haste. In the Zhitomir region, in the far west of Soviet Ukraine, near Poland, a Troika sentenced an even 100 people to death on the 22nd of September 1938, then another 138 on the following day, and then another 408 on the 28th of September. The Polish operation was, in some respects, the bloodiest chapter of the Great Terror in the Soviet Union. It was not the largest operation, but it was the second largest, after the Kulak action. It was not the action with the highest percentage of executions among the arrested, but it was very close, and the comparably lethal actions were much smaller in scale. Of the 143,810 people arrested under the accusation of espionage for Poland, 111,091 were executed. Not all of these were Poles, but most of them were. Poles were also targeted disproportionately in the Kulak action, especially in Soviet Ukraine. Taking into account the number of deaths, the percentage of death sentences to arrests, and the risk of arrest, ethnic Poles suffered more than any other group within the Soviet Union during the Great Terror. By a conservative estimate, some 85,000 Poles were executed in 1937 and 1938, which means that one-eighth of the 681,692 mortal victims of the Great Terror were Polish. This is a staggeringly high percentage, given that Poles were a tiny minority in the Soviet Union, constituting fewer than 0.4% of the general population. Soviet Poles were about 40 times more likely to die during the Great Terror than Soviet citizens generally. The Polish operation served as a model for a series of other national actions. They all targeted diaspora nationalities, enemy nations in the new Stalinist terminology, groups with real or imagined connections to a foreign state. In the Latvian operation, some 16,573 people were shot as supposed spies for Latvia. A further 7,998 Soviet citizens were executed as spies for Estonia, and 9,078 as spies for Finland. In some, the national operations, including the Polish, killed 247,157 people. These operations were directed against national groups that, taken together, represented only 1.6% of the Soviet population. They yielded no fewer than 36% of the fatalities of the Great Terror. The targeted national minorities were thus more than 20 times as likely to be killed in the Great Terror than the average Soviet citizen. Those arrested in the national actions were also very likely to die. In the Polish operation, the chances of execution were 78%, and in all of the national operations taken together, the figure was 74%. Whereas a Soviet citizen arrested in the Kulak action had an even chance of being sentenced to the Gulag, a Soviet citizen arrested in a national action had a three in four chance of being shot. This was perhaps more an accident of timing than a sign of especially lethal intent. The bulk of the arrests for the Kulak action was earlier than the bulk of the arrests for the national actions. In general, the later in the Great Terror that a citizen was arrested, the more likely he was to be shot, for the simple reason that the Gulag lacked space. Although Stalin, Yezhov, Balitsky, Leblevsky, Berman and others linked Polish ethnicity to Soviet security, Murdering Poles did nothing to improve the international position of the Soviet state. During the Great Terror, more people were arrested as Polish spies than were arrested as German and Japanese spies together. But few, and very possibly none, of the people arrested were in fact engaged in espionage for Poland. In 1937 and 1938, Warsaw carefully pursued a policy of equal distance between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. 
Poland harbored no plans for an offensive war with the Soviet Union. But perhaps, Stalin reasoned, killing Poles could do no harm. He was right to think that Poland would not be an ally with the Soviet Union in a war against Germany. Because Poland lay between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, it could not be neutral in any war for Eastern Europe. It would either oppose Germany and be defeated, or ally with Germany and invade the Soviet Union. Either way, a mass murder of Soviet Poles would not harm the interests of the Soviet Union, so long as the interests of the Soviet Union had nothing to do with the life and well-being of its citizens. Even such cynical reasoning was very likely mistaken. As puzzled diplomats and spies noted at the time, the Great Terror diverted much energy that might usefully have been directed elsewhere. Stalin misunderstood the security position of the Soviet Union, and a more traditional approach to intelligence matters might have served him better in the late 1930s. In 1937, Japan seemed to be the immediate threat. Japanese activity in East Asia had been the justification for the Kulak operation. The Japanese threat was the pretext for actions against the Chinese minority in the Soviet Union, and against Soviet railway workers who had returned from Manchuria. Japanese espionage was also the justification for the deportation of the entire Soviet Korean population, about 170,000 people from the Far East to Kazakhstan. Korea itself was then under Japanese occupation, so the Soviet Koreans became a kind of diaspora nationality by association with Japan. Stalin's client in the western Chinese district of Xinjiang, Shang Shikai, carried out a terror of his own, in which thousands of people were killed. The People's Republic of Mongolia, to the north of China, had been a Soviet satellite since its creation in 1924. Soviet troops entered Allied Mongolia in 1937, and Mongolian authorities carried out their own terror in 1937-1938, in which 20,474 people were killed. All of this was directed at Japan. None of these killings served much of a strategic purpose. The Japanese leadership had decided upon a southern strategy, toward China and then the Pacific. Japan intervened in China in July 1937, right when the Great Terror began, and would move further southward only thereafter. The rationale of both the Kulak action and these eastern national actions was thus false. It is possible that Stalin feared Japan, and he had good reason for concern. Japanese intentions were certainly aggressive in the 1930s, and the only question was about the direction of expansion, north or south. Japanese governments were unstable and prone to rapid changes in policy. In the end, however, mass killings could not preserve the Soviet Union from an attack that was not coming. Perhaps, as with the Poles, Stalin reasoned that mass killing had no costs. If Japan meant to attack, it would find less support inside the Soviet Union. If it did not, then no harm to Soviet interests had been done by preemptive mass murder and deportation. Again, such reasoning coheres only when the interests of the Soviet state are seen as distinct from the lives and well-being of its population. And again, the use of the NKVD against internal enemies and against itself, prevented a more systematic approach to the actual threat that the Soviet Union faced, a German attack without Japanese or Polish assistance, and without the help of internal opponents of Soviet rule. A Germany, unlike Japan and Poland, was indeed contemplating an aggressive war against the Soviet state. In September 1936, Hitler had let it be known to his cabinet that the main goal of his foreign policy was the destruction of the Soviet Union. The essence and the goal of Bolshevism, he claimed, is the elimination of those strata of mankind which have hitherto provided the leadership, and their replacement by world jury. Germany, according to Hitler, would have to be ready for war within four years. Thus Hermann Göring took command in 1936 of a four-year plan authority which would prepare the public and private sectors for an aggressive war. Hitler was a real threat to the Soviet Union, but Stalin seems not to have abandoned hope that the Soviet-German relations could be improved. For this reason, perhaps, actions against Soviet Germans were milder than those against Soviet Poles. Some 41,989 people were shot in a German national operation, most of whom were not Germans. 
In these years of the Popular Front, the Soviet killings and deportations went unnoticed in Europe. Insofar as the Great Terror was noticed at all, it was seen only as a matter of show trials and party and army purges. But these events, noticed by specialists and journalists at the time, were not the essence of the Great Terror. The Kulak operations and the national operations were the essence of the Great Terror. Of the 681,692 executions carried out for political crimes in 1937 and 1938, the Kulak and national orders accounted for 625,483. The Kulak action and the national operations brought about more than nine-tenths of the death sentences and three-quarters of the Gulag sentences. The Great Terror was thus chiefly a Kulak action, which struck most heavily in Soviet Ukraine, and a series of national actions, the most important of them the Polish, where again Soviet Ukraine was the region most affected. Of the 681,692 recorded death sentences in the Great Terror, 123,421 were carried out in Soviet Ukraine and this figure does not include natives of Soviet Ukraine shot in the Gulag. Ukraine, as a Soviet Republic, was overrepresented within the Soviet Union, and Poles were overrepresented within Soviet Ukraine. The Great Terror was a third Soviet Revolution. Whereas the Bolshevik Revolution had brought a change in political regime after 1917 and collectivization a new economic system after 1930, the Great Terror of 1937-1938 involved a revolution of the mind. Stalin had brought to life his theory that the enemy could be unmasked only by interrogation. His tale of foreign agents and domestic conspiracies was told in torture chambers and written in interrogation protocols. Insofar as Soviet citizens can be said to have participated in the high politics of the late 1930s, it was precisely as instruments of narration. For Stalin's larger story to live on, their own stories sometimes had to end. Yet the conversion of columns of peasants and workers into columns of figures seemed to lift Stalin's mood, and the course of the Great Terror certainly confirmed Stalin's position of power. Having called a halt to the mass operations in November 1938, Stalin once again replaced his NKVD chief. Lavrenti Beria succeeded Yezhov, who was later executed. The same fate awaited many of the highest officers of the NKVD blamed for the supposed excesses, which were in fact the substance of Stalin's policy. Because Stalin had been able to replace Yagoda with Yezhov and then Yezhov with Beria, he showed himself to be at the top of the security apparatus. Because he was able to use the NKVD against the party, but also the party against the NKVD, he showed himself to be the unchallengeable leader of the Soviet Union. Soviet socialism had become a tyranny where the tyrant's power was demonstrated by the mastery of the politics of his own court. The Soviet Union was a multinational state, using a multinational apparatus of repression to carry out national killing campaigns. At the time when the NKVD was killing members of national minorities, most of its leading officers were themselves members of national minorities. In 1937 and 1938, NKVD officers, many of whom were of Jewish, Latvian, Polish or German nationality, were implementing policies of national killing that exceeded anything that Hitler and his SS had yet attempted. In carrying out these ethnic massacres, which of course they had to if they wished to preserve their positions and their lives, they comprised an ethic of internationalism, which must have been important to some of them. Then they were killed anyway, as the terror continued, and usually replaced by Russians. The Jewish officers who brought the Polish operation to Ukraine and Belarus, such as Israel Leblevsky, Lev Reichman, and Boris Berman, were arrested and executed. This was part of a larger trend. When the mass killing of the Great Terror began, about a third of the high-ranking NKVD officers were Jewish by nationality. By the time Stalin brought it to an end on the 17th of November 1938, about 20% of the high-ranking officers were. A year later, that figure was less than 4%. The Great Terror could be, and by many would be, blamed on the Jews. To reason this way was to fall into a Stalinist trap.
Stalin certainly understood that Jewish NKVD officers would be a convenient scapegoat for national killing actions, especially after both the Jewish secret policemen and the national elites were dead. In any event, the institutional beneficiaries of the terror were not Jews or members of other national minorities, but Russians who moved up in the ranks. By 1939, Russians, two-thirds of the ranking officers, had replaced Jews at the heights of the NKVD, a state of affairs that would become permanent. Russians became an overrepresented national majority. Their population share at the heights of the NKVD was greater than their share in the Soviet population generally. The only national minority that was highly overrepresented in the NKVD at the end of the Great Terror were the Georgians, Stalin's own. This third revolution was really a counter-revolution, implicitly acknowledging that Marxism and Leninism had failed. In its fifteen or so years of existence, the Soviet Union had achieved much for those of its citizens who were still alive. As the Great Terror reached its height, for example, state pensions were introduced. Yet some essential assumptions of revolutionary doctrine had been abandoned. Existence, as the Marxists had said, no longer preceded essence. People were guilty not because of their place in a socio-economic order, but because of their ostensible personal identities or cultural connections. Politics was no longer comprehensible in terms of class struggle. If the diaspora ethnicities of the Soviet Union were disloyal, as the case against them went, it was not because they were bound to a previous economic order, but because they were supposedly linked to a foreign state by their ethnicity. The link between loyalty and ethnicity was taken for granted in the Europe of 1938. Hitler was using this very argument at this very time to claim that the three million Germans of Czechoslovakia and the regions they inhabited must be allowed to join Germany. In September 1938, at a conference in Munich, Britain, France and Italy had agreed to let Germany annex the western rim of Czechoslovakia, where most of those Germans lived. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain declared that the arrangement had brought peace for our time. French Prime Minister Edouard Daladier believed nothing of the sort, but he allowed the French people to indulge the fancy. The Czechoslovaks were not even invited to the conference and were simply expected to accept the result. The Munich Agreement deprived Czechoslovakia of the natural protection of mountain ranges and the fortifications therein, leaving the country vulnerable to a future German attack. Stalin interpreted the settlement to mean that the Western powers wished to make concessions to Hitler in order to turn the Germans toward the East. In 1938, Soviet leaders were concerned to present their own national policy as something very different from that of the racism of Nazi Germany. A campaign of that year devoted to this goal included the publication of children's stories, including one called A Tale of Numbers. Soviet children learned that Nazis were rummaging through all kinds of old documents to establish the nationality of the German population. This was, of course, true. Germany's Nuremberg Laws of 1935 excluded Jews from political participation in the German state and defined Jewishness according to descent. German officials were indeed using the records of synagogues to establish whose grandparents were Jews. Yet in the Soviet Union, the situation was not so very different. The Soviet internal passports had a national category, so that every Soviet Jew, every Soviet Pole, and indeed every Soviet citizen had an officially recorded nationality. In principle, Soviet citizens were allowed to choose their own nationality, but in practice this was not always so. In April 1938, the NKVD required that in certain cases information about the nationality of parents be entered. By the same order, Poles and other members of diaspora nationalities were expressly forbidden from changing their nationality. The NKVD would not have to rummage around in old documents, since it already had its own. In 1938, German oppression of Jews was much more visible than the national operations in the USSR, though its scale was much smaller. The Nazi regime began a program of Aryanization designed to deprive Jews of their property. This was overshadowed by the more public and spontaneous theft and violence that followed the German annexation of Austria that same month. In February, 
Hitler issued an ultimatum to the Austrian Chancellor Kurt von Schuschnigg, demanding that he make of his country a German satellite. Schuschnigg at first accepted the terms, then returned to Austria and defied Hitler by calling a referendum on independence. On the 12th of March, the German army entered Austria. The next day, Austria ceased to exist. About 10,000 Austrian Jews were deported to Vienna that summer and fall. Thanks to the energetic efforts of Adolf Eichmann, they were among the many Austrian Jews who left the country in the coming months. In October 1938, Germany expelled 17,000 Jews of Polish citizenship from the Reich into Poland. These Jews were arrested at night, placed in train cars, and dumped unceremoniously on the Polish side of the border. A Polish Jew in France, whose parents had been expelled, decided to take revenge. He assassinated a German diplomat. A deed unfortunate in itself, and unfortunate in its timing. The shooting took place on the 7th of November, the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. Its victim died the next day, the anniversary of Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. The murder gave German authorities the pretext for Kristallnacht the first large open pogrom in Nazi Germany. Pressure had been building in the Reich, especially in Vienna, where in the previous weeks there had been at least one attack every day on Jewish property. Between the 9th and 11th of November 1938, a few hundred Jews were killed, the official count was 91, and thousands of shops and hundreds of synagogues destroyed. This was generally regarded in Europe, except by those who supported the Nazis, as a sign of barbarism. The Soviet Union benefited from the public violence in Nazi Germany. In this atmosphere, supporters of the Popular Front counted on the Soviet Union to protect Europe from the descent into ethnic violence. Yet the Soviet Union had just engaged in a campaign of ethnic murder on a far larger scale. It is probably fair to say that no one beyond the Soviet Union had any notion of this. A week after Kristallnacht, the Great Terror was brought to an end. After some 247,157 Soviet citizens had been shot in the national operations. As of the end of 1938, the USSR had killed about a thousand times more people on ethnic grounds than had Nazi Germany. The Soviets had, for that matter, killed far more Jews to that point than had the Nazis. The Jews were targeted in no national action, but they still died in the thousands in the Great Terror, and for that matter, during the famine in Soviet Ukraine. They died not because they were Jews, but simply because they were citizens of the most murderous regime of the day. In the Great Terror, the Soviet leadership killed twice as many Soviet citizens as there were Jews living in Germany. But no one beyond the Soviet Union, not even Hitler, seemed yet to have grasped that mass shootings of this kind were possible. Certainly nothing of the kind was carried out in Germany before the war. After Kristallnacht, Jews entered the German concentration camp system in large numbers for the first time. Hitler wished at this point to intimidate German Jews so that they would leave the country. The vast majority of the 26,000 Jews who entered the concentration camps at this time left them again soon thereafter. More than 100,000 Jews left Germany in late 1938 or 1939. The violence and motion did stimulate the Nazi imagination about the fate of European Jews generally. A few days after Kristallnacht, on the 12th of November 1938, Hitler had his close collaborator, Hermann Goering, present a plan for the removal of European Jews. They were to be sent by boat to the island of Madagascar, in the southern Indian Ocean, off the southeastern coast of Africa. Although Hitler and Goering would no doubt have liked to see German Jews work to death on some sort of SS reservation on the island, such grand imaginative plans really pertain to some future scenario wherein Germany controlled a large population of Jews. The Madagascar scheme was most applicable to a future in which Germany had mastered a large Jewish population. Jews at the time comprised no more than half of one percent of the German population and even this total was shrinking with emigration. There had never been very many Jews in Germany, but insofar as they were regarded as a problem, the solution had already been found—expropriation, intimidation, and emigration. 
German Jews would have departed even faster than they did had the British allowed them to go to Palestine, or the Americans seen fit to increase or even fill immigration quotas. At the Evian Conference of July 1938, only the Dominican Republic agreed to take more Jewish refugees from Germany. Madagascar, in other words, was a solution for a Jewish problem that had not yet really arisen. Grand deportation schemes made a kind of sense in 1938, when leading Nazis could still delude themselves that Poland might become a German satellite and join in an invasion of the Soviet Union. More than three million Jews lived in Poland, and Polish authorities had also investigated Madagascar as a site for their resettlement. Although Polish leaders envisioned no policies toward their large national minorities, five million Ukrainians, three million Jews, one million Belarusians, that were remotely comparable to Soviet realities or Nazi plans, they did wish to reduce the size of the Jewish population by voluntary emigration. After the death of the Polish dictator Józef Pilsudski in 1935, his successors had taken on the position of the Polish nationalist right on this particular question, and had established a ruling party that was open only to ethnic Poles. In the late 1930s, the Polish state supported the aims of the right-wing, or revisionist Zionists in Poland, who wished to create a very large state of Israel in the British Mandate of Palestine if necessary, by means of violence. So long as Warsaw and Berlin thought in terms of a Jewish problem and some distant territorial solution, and so long as the Germans were still courting the Poles for an Eastern alliance, the Germans could imagine some arrangement to deport East European Jews involving Polish support and infrastructure. But there would be no alliance with Poland, and no common German-Polish plan for the Jews. Pilsudski's heirs in this respect followed Pilsudski's line, a policy of equal distance between Berlin and Moscow, with non-aggression pacts with both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, but no alliance with either. On the 26th of January 1939 in Warsaw, the Poles turned down the German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop one last time. In five years of trying, the Germans had failed to convince the Poles that it was in Poland's interests to fight a war of aggression for Soviet territory, while granting Germany Polish territory and becoming a German satellite. This meant a German war not with Poland, but against Poland, and against Poland's Jews. Though the Madagascar plan was not abandoned, it seemed to yield now, in Hitler's mind, to a vision of a Jewish reservation in a conquered Poland. If Poland would not cooperate in war and deportation, then Poland itself could become a colony where other European Jews could be gathered, perhaps pending some other final removal. It was just after Ribbentrop's return from Warsaw, when Hitler realized that his first war would be against Poland, that he made an important speech on the Jewish issue. On the 30th of January 1939, Hitler promised the German Parliament that he would destroy the Jews if they brought Germany into another world war. I want to be a prophet once more today. If international finance, jury in Europe and beyond, should succeed once more in plunging the peoples of the world into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. At the moment of Hitler's oration, about 98% of the Jews of Europe lived beyond the borders of Germany, most of them in Poland and the Western Soviet Union. Just how they could be annihilated was unknown, but war would have to be the first step. By early 1939, Hitler had reached a turning point. His foreign policy of gathering in Germans had succeeded in Czechoslovakia and Austria, and his attempts to recruit Poland for an Eastern war had failed. He had rearmed Germany and extended its borders as far as possible without war. The annexation of Austria had brought in six million more citizens and extensive reserves of hard currency. Munich brought Hitler not only three million more citizens, but also the bulk of the Czechoslovak armaments industry, perhaps the best in the world at the time. In March 1939, Hitler destroyed Czechoslovakia as a state thus removing any illusions that his goals were limited to ethnic Germans. The Czech lands were added to the Reich as a protectorate. Slovakia became a nominally independent state under Nazi tutelage. On the 21st of March, the Germans tried to intimidate the Poles into an arrangement and were again rebuffed. 
On the 25th of March, Hitler gave the instructions for the Wehrmacht to prepare for an invasion of Poland. As Hitler's power grew, the nature of Stalin's diplomacy changed. The weaknesses of the Popular Front against Fascism were evident. Munich had meant the end of a Czechoslovak democracy friendly to the Soviet Union, and Czechoslovakia itself had been dismantled in March 1939. The reactionaries of Francisco Franco won the Spanish Civil War in April 1939. The Popular Front government in France had already fallen. The relationships between Moscow and the European powers would have to be mainly military and diplomatic, since Stalin lacked the political levers to influence their behavior from within. In spring 1939, Stalin made a striking gesture toward Hitler, the great ideological foe. Hitler had pledged not to make peace with Jewish communists. Nazi propaganda referred to the Soviet Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Maxim Litvinov, as Finkelstein. Litvinov was indeed Jewish. His brother was a rabbi. Stalin obliged Hitler by firing Litvinov on the 3rd of May 1939. Litvinov was replaced by Stalin's closest ally, Molotov, who was Russian. The indulgence of Hitler was not as strange as it might appear. Stalinist ideology answered all of its own questions. From one day to the next, in June 1934, the Popular Front had transformed social democrats from social fascists into allies. If social fascists could be the friend of the Soviet Union, why not fascists themselves? Fascism, after all, was nothing more, in the Soviet analysis, than a deformation of capitalism and the Soviet Union had enjoyed good relations with capitalist Germany between 1922 and 1933. In purely political terms, the arrangement with Germany had a certain logic. The alternative to a German orientation, an alliance with Great Britain and France, seemed to offer little. London and Paris had granted security guarantees to Poland in March 1939 to try to deter a German attack and tried thereafter to bring the Soviet Union into some kind of defensive coalition. But Stalin was quite aware that London and Paris were unlikely to intervene in Eastern Europe if Germany attacked Poland or the Soviet Union. It seemed wisest to come to terms with the Germans and then watch the capitalist powers fight in Western Europe. Destroy the enemies by their own hands, was Stalin's plan, and remain strong to the end of the war. Stalin could see, as he later put it, that he and Hitler had a common desire to get rid of the old equilibrium. In August 1939, Hitler responded to Stalin's opening. Hitler wanted his war that year. He was far more flexible about the possible allies than about the issue of timing. If the Poles would not join in a war against the Soviet Union, then perhaps the Soviets would join in a war against Poland. From Hitler's perspective, an accord with Moscow would prevent a complete encirclement of Germany if the British and French did declare war after the coming German attack on Poland. On the 20th of August 1939, Hitler sent a personal message to Stalin asking him to receive Ribbentrop no later than the 23rd. Ribbentrop made for Moscow, where, as both Orwell and Kessler noted, swastikas adorned the airport of the capital of the homeland of socialism. This the final ideological shock that separated Kessler from communism was really a sign that the Soviet Union was no longer an ideological state. The two regimes immediately found common ground in their mutual aspiration to destroy Poland. Once Hitler had abandoned his hope of recruiting Poland to fight the Soviet Union, Nazi and Soviet rhetoric about the country were difficult to distinguish. Hitler saw Poland as the unreal creation of the Treaty of Versailles. Molotov as its ugly offspring. Officially, the agreement signed in Moscow on the 23rd of August 1939 was nothing more than a non-aggression pact. In fact, Ribbentrop and Molotov also agreed to a secret protocol designating areas of influence for Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union within Eastern Europe, in what were still the independent states of Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. The irony was that Stalin had very recently justified the murder of more than 100,000 of his own citizens by the false claim that Poland had signed just such a secret codicil with Germany under the cover of a non-aggression pact. The Polish operation had been presented as preparation for a German-Polish attack. 
Now the Soviet Union had agreed to attack Poland along with Germany. On the 1st of September 1939, the Wehrmacht attacked Poland from the north, west and south, using men and arms from annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia. Hitler had begun his war. In August and September 1939, Stalin was reading maps not just of East Europe, but of East Asia. He had found an opportunity to improve the Soviet position in the Far East. Stalin could now be confident that no German-Polish attack was coming from the West. If the Soviet Union moved against Japan in East Asia, there would be no fear of a second front. The Soviets and their Mongolian allies attacked Japanese and puppet Manchukuo forces at a contested border area between Mongolia and Manchukuo on the 20th of August 1939. Stalin's policy of rapprochement with Berlin of the 23rd of August 1939 was also directed against Tokyo. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, signed three days after the Soviet offensive, nullified the anti-Comintern Pact between Germany and Japan. Even more than the battlefield defeat, the Nazi-Soviet alliance brought a political earthquake in Tokyo. The Japanese government fell, as would several more in the coming months. Once Germany seemed to have chosen the Soviet Union rather than Japan as its ally, the Japanese government found itself in an unexpected and confusing situation. The consensus among Japanese leaders was already to expand southward rather than northward, into China and the Pacific rather than into Soviet Siberia. Yet if the union between Moscow and Berlin held, the Red Army would be able to concentrate its forces in Asia rather than in Europe. Japan would then be forced to keep its best troops in the north, in Manchukuo, in simple self-defense, which would make the advance into the south much more difficult. Hitler had given Stalin a free hand in East Asia, and the Japanese could only hope that Hitler would soon betray his new friend. Japan established a consulate in Lithuania as an observation point for German and Soviet military preparations. The consul there was the Russophone spy Chiuni Sugihara. When the Red Army defeated the Japanese on the 15th of September 1939, Stalin had achieved exactly the result that he wanted. The national actions of the Great Terror had been aimed against Japan, Poland and Germany in that order, and against the possibility of encirclement by these three states working together. The 681,692 killings of the Great Terror did nothing to make encirclement less likely but diplomacy and military force did. By the 15th of September, Germany had practically destroyed the Polish army as a fighting force. A German-Polish attack on the Soviet Union was obviously out of the question, and a German-Japanese attack on the Soviet Union also looked very unlikely. Stalin had replaced the phantom of a German-Polish-Japanese encirclement of the Soviet Union with a very real German-Soviet encirclement of Poland, an alliance that isolated Japan. Two days after the Soviet military victory over Japan, on the 17th of September 1939, the Red Army invaded Poland from the east. The Red Army and the Wehrmacht met in the middle of the country and organized a joint victory parade. On the 28th of September, Berlin and Moscow came to a second agreement over Poland, a treaty on borders and friendship. So began a new stage in the history of the Bloodlands. By opening half of Poland to the Soviet Union, Hitler would allow Stalin's terror, so murderous in the Polish operation, to recommence within Poland itself. Thanks to Stalin, Hitler was able, in occupied Poland, to undertake his first policies of mass killing. In the twenty-one months that followed the joint German-Soviet invasion of Poland, the Germans and the Soviets would kill Polish civilians in comparable numbers for similar reasons, as each ally mastered its half of occupied Poland. The organs of destruction of each country would be concentrated on the territory of a third. Hitler, like Stalin, would choose Poles as the target of his first major national shooting campaign. Chapter 4 Molotov-Ribbentrop Europe The German terror began in the sky. At 4.20 in the morning on the 1st of September 1939, the bombs fell, without warning, on the central Polish city of Wielun. 
the Germans had chosen a locality bereft of military significance as the site of a lethal experiment. Could a modern air force terrorize a civilian population by deliberate bombing? The church, the synagogue, the hospital, all went up in flames. Wave after wave of munitions fell, seventy tons of bombs in all, destroying most of the buildings and killing hundreds of people, mostly women and children. The population fled the city. When a German administrator arrived, there were more corpses than live people. Throughout western Poland, scores of towns and villages met a similar fate. As many as a hundred and fifty-eight different settlements were bombed. In the Polish capital, Warsaw, people saw the planes race across the clear blue sky. Ours, people said to themselves, hopefully. They were wrong. The 10th of September, 1939, marked the first time a major European city was bombed systematically by an enemy air force. There were seventeen German raids on Warsaw that day. By mid-month, the Polish army was all but defeated, but the capital still defended itself. On the 25th of September, Hitler declared that he wanted the surrender of Warsaw. Some 560 tons of bombs were dropped that day, along with 72 tons of firebombs. In all, some 25,000 civilians and 6,000 soldiers were killed, as a major population centre and historic European capital was bombed at the beginning of an undeclared war. Throughout the month, the columns of refugees were already streaming east, away from the Wehrmacht. German fighter pilots took their pleasure in strafing them. Poland fought alone. France and Britain declared war on Germany, as promised, but took no meaningful military action during the campaign. The French advanced a few miles into the Tsar region and then withdrew again. The Polish army rushed to take defensive positions. The Polish military had been trained to expect an attack either from the east or from the west, from either the Red Army or the Wehrmacht. In the war plans and war games of the 1920s and 1930s, both variants had been taken into account. Now all available forces, some thirty-nine divisions, about nine hundred thousand men, were thrown against the fifty German divisions, one point five million troops. Even so, Polish forces were outnumbered, outgunned, and outflanked by the motorized assault from the north, west, and south. Yet resistance in some places was stiff. The Wehrmacht had become used to strolling into countries that had already given themselves up, such as Austria and Czechoslovakia. Now German soldiers were actually facing hostile fire. Not everything went their way. In Danzig, the free city on the Baltic coast that Hitler wanted for Germany, Poles defended their post office. German firemen poured gasoline in the basement and burned out the defenders. The director of the post office left the building waving a white handkerchief. He was immediately shot. Eleven people died of burn wounds. The Germans denied them medical treatment. Thirty-eight men were sentenced to death and shot for the supposedly illegal defense of the building. One of them, Francis Jacques Krauss, was the uncle of a boy named Gunther Grass, who later became the great novelist of West Germany. Thanks to his novel, The Tin Drum, this particular war crime became widely known. It was one of many. German soldiers had been instructed that Poland was not a real country and that its army was not a real army. Thus the men resisting the invasion could not be real soldiers. German officers instructed their troops that the death of Germans in battle was murder, since resisting the German master race was, in Hitler's terminology, insolence, Polish soldiers had no right to be treated as prisoners of war. In the village of Jurich, Polish prisoners of war were gathered into a barn where they were told they would spend the night. Then the Germans burned it down. Near the village of Schladow, Germans used prisoners of war as human shields as they engaged the remnants of a cavalry unit. After the Germans had killed the cavalrymen, who were unwilling to shoot at their fellow Poles, they made the prisoners bury the bodies of their comrades. Then they lined up the prisoners against the wall at the bank of the Vistula River and shot them. Those who tried to escape by jumping into the river were shot, as the one survivor remembered, like ducks. Some three hundred people died. On the 22nd of August, 1939, Hitler had instructed his commanders to close your hearts to pity. The Germans killed prisoners. At Chepielov, after a pitched battle, 
300 Polish prisoners were taken. Despite all the evidence, the German commander declared that these captured soldiers were partisans, irregular fighters unprotected by the laws of war. The Polish officers and soldiers, wearing full uniform, were astonished. The Germans made them disrobe. Now they looked more like partisans. All of them were gunned down and thrown in a ditch. In the short Polish campaign there were at least sixty-three such actions. No fewer than three thousand Polish prisoners of war were murdered. The Germans also murdered the Polish wounded. In one case, German tanks turned to attack a barn marked with a red cross. It was a Polish first aid station. If it had not been marked with a cross, the tank commanders would likely have ignored it. The tanks fired on the barn, setting it aflame. The machine gunners fired at people who tried to escape. Then the tanks ran over the remnants of the barn, and any survivors. Wehrmacht officers and soldiers blamed Polish civilians for the horrors that now befell them. As one general maintained, Germans are the masters and Poles are the slaves. The army leadership knew that Hitler's goals for the campaign were anything but conventional. As the chief of staff summarized, it was the intention of the leader to destroy and exterminate the Polish people. Soldiers had been prepared to see the Polish civilian population as devious and subhuman. One of them was so convinced of Polish hostility that he interpreted a Pole's death grimace as the expression of irrational hatred for Germans. The soldiers quickly took to taking out their frustrations on whomever they happened to see. As a rule, the Germans would kill civilians after taking new territories. They would also kill civilians after losing ground. If they took casualties at all, they would blame whoever was at hand, men in the first instance, but also women and children. In the town of Widzow, the Germans summoned the men, who, fearing nothing because they had done nothing, answered the call. One pregnant wife had a sense of foreboding, but she was torn away from her husband. All of the men in the town were lined up against a fence and shot. In Longinovka, forty Polish citizens were locked in a building which was then set aflame. Soldiers fired on people as they leapt from windows. Some of the reprisal actions were unthinkably casual. In one case, a hundred civilians were assembled to be shot because someone had fired a gun. It turned out that the gun had been fired by a German soldier. Poland never surrendered, but hostilities came to an end on the 6th of October 1939. Even as the Germans established their civilian occupation authorities that autumn, the Wehrmacht continued to kill Polish citizens in large numbers in quite arbitrary reprisal actions. In December, after two German soldiers were killed by known Polish criminals, the Germans machine gunned 114 men who had nothing to do with the incident. In January, the Germans shot 255 Jews in Warsaw after the Jewish community had failed to turn over someone whom the Germans, judging by his last name, thought to be Jewish. The person in question had nothing to do with the Jewish community. German soldiers had been instructed to regard the Jews as Eastern barbarians, and in Poland they did encounter something that they never would have seen in Germany, large communities of religious Jews. Though Hitler raged on about the destructive roles of Jews in German society, the Jews were an extremely small proportion of the German population. Among the German citizens defined by the Nuremberg laws as Jewish, most were secular, and many did not identify strongly with the Jewish community. Jews in Germany were highly assimilated, and very often married non-Jews. For historical reasons, Jewish life in Poland was very different. Jews had been expelled from Germany in the late Middle Ages, as they had been from most of Central and Western Europe. Poland had been for centuries a haven for Jews, and became and remained the centre of European Jewish settlement. In 1939, about 10% of the Polish population were Jews, and most of these were religiously observant and traditional in dress and custom. They generally spoke Yiddish, which Germans tended to hear as a deformed version of their own language. In Warsaw and Lodz, the most important Jewish cities in Poland, Jews were about one-third of the population. Judging by their correspondence, German officers and soldiers saw Polish Jews as living stereotypes rather than as human beings, a special blight on an already benighted Polish land. Germans wrote to their wives and girlfriends to describe an inhuman assemblage of disorder and filth. 
In their image of Poland, everything that was beautiful was the work of previous German settlers, while everything ugly was the result of Jewish corruption and Polish laziness. Germans seemed to feel an uncontrollable urge to neaten the appearance of the Jews. Again and again, soldiers would surround Jewish men and shave their side curls, while others would laugh and take photographs. They would also rape Jewish women, casually, as though this were not an offence for which they could be punished. When they were caught, they were reminded of German laws against racial mixing. In the town of Solitz, Jews were taken as hostages and locked in a cellar. After an escape attempt, soldiers threw grenades into the cellar, killing everyone. In Rava Mazowiecka, a German soldier asked a Jewish boy for some water. When the boy ran away, the soldier took aim and shot. He hit one of his own comrades instead. The Germans then gathered hundreds of people in the town square and killed them. In Dinov, some two hundred Jews were machine-gunned one night in mid-September. In all, Jews were about seven thousand of the forty-five thousand or so Polish civilians killed by the Germans by the end of 1939 somewhat more than the Jewish share of the Polish population. Even more than a Polish soldier, a Jewish soldier posed a problem for the Nazi worldview in which German soldiers and officers had been indoctrinated. Jews had been purged from the German armed forces since 1935, yet Polish Jews, like all male Polish citizens, were subject to military service in the Polish army. Jews, especially Jewish doctors, were well represented among officers. Germans separated Jews from their units and sent them to special punitive labor camps. Germany had all but won the war by the time the Soviets entered it on the 17th of September. On that day, the German air force was bombing Lvov, today Lviv, the most important Polish city in the southeast, as the Red Army approached it. The crossing of half a million Soviet soldiers into Poland had elicited both fear and hope. Poles wanted to believe that the Soviets had come to fight the Germans. Some confused Polish soldiers, driven eastward by the German attack, could believe for a moment that they had found allies. The Polish armed forces were desperate for support. The Soviets claimed that their intervention was necessary because the Polish state had ceased to exist. Since Poland could no longer protect its own citizens, went the argument, the Red Army had to enter the country on a peacekeeping mission. Poland's large Ukrainian and Belarusian minorities, went the Soviet propaganda, were in particular need of rescue. Yet despite the rhetoric, the Soviet officers and soldiers were prepared for war and fought one. The Red Army disarmed Polish units and engaged them wherever necessary. Half a million men had crossed the frontier that was no longer defended to fight an enemy that was all but defeated. Soviet soldiers would meet German soldiers, demarcate the border, and, in one instance, stage a joint victory march. Stalin spoke of an alliance with Germany cemented in blood. It was mainly the blood of Polish soldiers, more than 60,000 of whom died in combat. In cities like Lwów, where both the Wehrmacht and the Red Army were nearby, Polish soldiers had a difficult choice. To whom should they surrender? The Soviet military promised them safe passage back home after a brief interview. Nikita Khrushchev, who had accompanied the Soviet soldiers, repeated the assurance. The artist, Józef Chapsky, a Polish reserve officer, was among those who were betrayed by this lie. His unit had been beaten back by the Germans and then surrounded by Soviet armor. He and his men were promised that they would be taken to Lvov and released there. Instead, they were all packed into trucks on the city's market square. Tearful women threw them cigarettes. A young Jewish man bought apples from a stand and tossed them to the prisoners in the truck. Near the post office, women took the notes that the soldiers had written for their families. The prisoners were taken to the train station and sent east. As they crossed the Soviet border, they had the feeling of entering, as Tsapsky recalled, another world. Zapsky sat with a botanist friend, another reserve officer, who marveled at the tall grasses of the Ukrainian steppe. In another train, Polish farmers looked through the cracks at Soviet collective farms and shook their heads in distress at the disorder and neglect they saw. At a stop in Kiev, the capital of Soviet Ukraine, Polish officers met an unexpected reception. Ukrainians were saddened to see Polish officers under Soviet guard. 
Some of them, it seems, still believed that it would be the Polish army that would liberate Ukraine from Stalin. Instead, about 15,000 Polish officers were taken to three Soviet prison camps run by the NKVD, one in the eastern part of Soviet Ukraine, in Starobilsk, and two more in Soviet Russia, at Kozelsk and Ostashkov. The removal of these men, and all but one of them were men, was a kind of decapitation of Polish society. The Soviets took more than 100,000 prisoners of war, but released the men and kept only the officers. More than two-thirds of these officers came from the reserves. Like Tsapsky and his botanist companion, these reserve officers were educated professionals and intellectuals, not military men. Thousands of doctors, lawyers, scientists, professors, and politicians were thus removed from Poland. Meanwhile, Soviet occupying forces in eastern Poland placed the lower orders of society in the vacated heights. Prisons were emptied, and political prisoners, usually communists, were put in charge of local government. Soviet agitators urged peasants to take revenge on landlords. Though most people resisted the call to criminality, chaos reigned as thousands did not. Mass murders with axes were suddenly frequent. One man was tied to a stake, then had some of his skin peeled off and his wound salted before being forced to watch the execution of his family. Usually the Red Army behaved well, though sometimes soldiers joined in the violence, as when a pair killed a local official and then took his gold teeth. In the background, the NKVD entered the country in force. In the twenty-one months to come, it made more arrests in occupied eastern Poland than in the entire Soviet Union, seizing some 109,400 Polish citizens. The typical sentence was eight years in the Gulag. About 8,513 people were sentenced to death. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, where Germany ruled, methods were even less subtle. Now that the Wehrmacht had defeated a foreign army, the methods of the SS could be tried against an alien population. The tool of persecution, the Einsatzgruppe, was the creation of Heinrich Himmler's right-hand man, Reinhard Heydrich. The Einsatzgruppen were special task forces led by security police and including other policemen, whose apparent mission was to pacify the rear areas after military expansion. As of 1939, they were subordinate to Heydrich's Reich Security Main Office, which united the security police, a state institution, with the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, the intelligence service of the SS, a Nazi party institution. Einsatzgruppen had been deployed in Austria and Czechoslovakia, but met little resistance in these countries and had no special mission to kill selected groups. It was in Poland that the Einsatzgruppen were to fulfill their mission as ideological soldiers by eliminating the educated classes of a defeated enemy. They were, in some sense, killing their peers. Fifteen of the twenty-five Einsatzgruppe and Einsatzkommando commanders had doctorates. In Operation Tannenberg, Heydrich wanted the Einsatzgruppen to render the upper levels of society harmless by murdering 61,000 Polish citizens. As Hitler put it, only a nation whose upper levels are destroyed can be pushed into the ranks of slavery. The ultimate goal of this decapitation project was to destroy Poland as a functioning society. By killing the most accomplished Poles, the Einsatzgruppen were to make Poland resemble the German racist fantasy of the country and leave the society incapable of resisting German rule. The Einsatzgruppen approached their task with murderous energy, but lacked the experience and thus the skills of the NKVD. They killed civilians, to be sure, often under the cover of retaliatory operations against supposed partisans. In Bidgosh, the Einsatzgruppen killed about 900 Poles. In Katowice, they killed another 750 in a courtyard, many of them women and girls. All in all, the Einsatzgruppen probably killed about 50,000 Polish citizens in actions that had nothing to do with combat. But these were not, it seems, the first 50,000 on their list of 61,000. They were very often groups selected on the spur of the moment. Unlike the NKVD, the Einsatzgruppen did not follow protocols carefully, and in Poland they did not keep careful records of the people they killed. The Einsatzgruppen were more successful in missions against Jews, which required much less discrimination. 
One Einsatzgruppe was tasked with terrorizing Jews so that they would flee east from the German occupation zone to the Soviet side. As much of this as possible was to be accomplished in September 1939, while military operations were still taking place. So in Benjin, for example, this Einsatzgruppe burned down the synagogue with flamethrowers, killing about 500 Jews in two days. Einsatzkommandos, smaller detachments, fulfilled similar missions. In the city of Xelm, one of them was tasked to rob wealthy Jews. The Germans carried out strip searches of women who looked Jewish on the street and cavity searches in private. They broke fingers to get at wedding rings. In Pershemischel, between the 16th and the 19th of September, Einsatzkommandos shot at least 500 Jews. As a result of such actions, hundreds of thousands of Jews fled to the Soviet occupation zone. In the vicinity of the city of Lublin, more than 20,000 Jews were simply expelled. After the conquest of Poland was complete, the Germans and their Soviet allies met once again to reassess their relations. On the 28th of September 1939, the day Warsaw fell to the Germans, the Allies signed their Treaty on Borders and Friendship, which changed the zones of influence somewhat. It assigned Warsaw to the Germans and Lithuania to the Soviets. It is this border that appears on the maps as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Line. It also obliged the two sides to suppress any Polish resistance to the regime of the other. On the 4th of October, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union agreed to a further protocol, defining their new common border. Poland had ceased to exist. A few days later, Germany formally annexed some of the territories in its zone, leaving the rest as a colony known as the General Government. This was to be a dumping ground for unwanted people, Poles and Jews. Hitler thought that Jews could be held in some eastern district in a kind of nature preserve. The general governor, Hitler's former lawyer, Hans Frank, clarified the position of the subject population in two orders issued in late October 1939. One specified that order was to be maintained by the German police. The other, that the German police had the authority to issue a death sentence to any Pole who did anything that might appear to be against the interests of Germany or Germans. Frank believed that Poles would soon realize the hopelessness of their national fate and accept the leadership of the Germans. East of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Soviets were extending their own system. Moscow enlarged its Ukrainian and Belarusian republics to the west, forcing their new populations, the residents of what had been eastern Poland, to participate in the annexation of their own homeland. When the Red Army entered Poland, it presented Soviet power as the great liberator of the national minorities from Polish rule, and the great supporter of the peasants against their masters. In eastern Poland, the population was about 43% Polish, 33% Ukrainian, and 8% each Jewish and Belarusian, with a small number of Czechs, Germans, Russians, Roma, Tatars, and others. But now everyone from every nation and every class would have to express a ritualized support of the new order. On the 22nd of October 1939, all adults in what the Soviets called Western Belarus and Western Ukraine had to vote in elections to two assemblies, whose provisional character was revealed by their one legislative undertaking, to request that the lands of Eastern Poland be incorporated by the Soviet Union. By the 15th of November, the formalities of annexation were complete. The Soviet Union was bringing its own institutions and practices to eastern Poland. Everyone now had to register for an internal passport, which meant that the state had a record of all its new citizens. With the registration of citizens came the military draft. Some 150,000 young men, Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Jews, soon found themselves in the Red Army. Registration also allowed for the smooth pursuit of a major Soviet socialist policy, deportation. On the 4th of December 1939, the Soviet Politburo ordered the NKVD to arrange the expulsion of certain groups of Polish citizens deemed to pose a danger to the new order. Military veterans, foresters, civil servants, policemen and their families. Then, on one evening in February 1940, in temperatures of about 40 below zero, the NKVD gathered them all. 
139,794 people taken from their homes at night, at gunpoint, to unequipped freight trains bound for special settlements in distant Soviet Kazakhstan or Siberia. The entire course of life was changed before people knew what had happened to them. The special settlements, part of the Gulag system, were the forced labor zones to which the Kulaks had been sent ten years before. Because the NKVD defined family very expansively, the trains were full of aged parents as well as the children of people who were thought to be dangerous. At halts on the journey east, guards would go from car to car asking if there were any more dead children. Vislav Adamczyk, an eleven-year-old child at the time, asked his mother if the Soviets were taking them to hell. Food and water were given very irregularly, and the cattle cars were without facilities and extremely cold. As time passed, the children learned to lick the frost from metal nails, and watched as the elderly began to freeze to death. Now the adult dead would be taken out and thrown into a hastily dug mass grave. Another boy looked out and tried to remember them, writing later that even as the dead disappeared, in our thoughts remained their dreams and their wishes. During the passage alone, some five thousand people would die. About eleven thousand more would perish by the following summer. One little Polish girl in a Siberian school described what happened to her family. My brother got sick and in a week died from hunger. We buried him in a hill on the Siberian steppe. Mom from Murray also got sick from hunger, swelled up and lay in the barrack for two months. They didn't want to take her to the hospital until it was the end. Then they took her. Mama lay in the hospital for two weeks. Then her life ended. When we learned this we were seized by a great despair. We went to the burial twenty-five kilometers away. We went to the hill. You could hear the sound of the Siberian forest where two of my family were left. Even more than the Kulaks who had preceded them, these Poles were alien and helpless in Central Asia or the Russian North. They usually did not speak Russian, let alone Kazakh. The locals, especially in Central Asia, saw them as one more imposition coming from the center. The natives, as one Pole recalled Kazakhstan, spoke little Russian, and greatly resented the whole arrangement and the new mouths to feed, and would at first sell us nothing, nor help in any way. Poles could not have known that a third of the population of Kazakhstan had starved to death only a decade before. One Polish father of four was murdered for his boots on a collective farm. Another farmer died of starvation in Siberia. As his son remembered, he swelled up. They wrapped him in a sheet and threw him in the ground. A third father died of typhus in Vologda, the North Russian city of death. His son, aged twelve, had already learned a kind of philosophy. A man is born once and dies only once, and so it happened. Deported Polish citizens had probably never heard the Russian word kulak before, but now they were discovering its history. In one Siberian settlement, Poles found the skeletons of kulaks deported in the 1930s. In another, a sixteen-year-old Pole realized that the foreman at his work camp was a kulak. He told me frankly, the boy remembered, what was in his heart, faith in God. Because Poles were thought to be Roman Catholics and thus Christian believers, their presence elicited such confessions of faith from Ukrainians and Russians. But even in the distant East, the Soviet authorities reacted with great hostility to any sign of Polishness. A Polish boy who came to town to sell his clothes for food met a policeman who struck the cap from his head. The cap had a white eagle, the symbol of the Polish state. The policeman would not let the boy pick it up from the ground. As Soviet journalists kept writing and teachers kept saying, Poland had fallen and would never rise again. With calculation, classification, and practiced violence, the Soviets could force Poles into a system that already existed. After a few weeks of chaos, they had extended their state westward, and dispensed with the most dangerous of possible opponents. In the western half of Poland, west of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Germans could take no such approach. Hitler had enlarged his Reich very recently into Austria and Czechoslovakia, but never into territories populated by quite so many non-Germans. Unlike the Soviets, the Nazis could not even claim to be bringing justice and equality to oppressed peoples or classes. 
Everyone knew that Nazi Germany was for the Germans, and the Germans did not bother to pretend otherwise. The premise of National Socialism was that Germans were a superior race, a presumption that, when confronted by the evidence of Polish civilization, the Nazis had to prove, at least to themselves. In the ancient Polish city of Krakow, the entire professoriate of the renowned university was sent to concentration camps. The statue of Adam Mickiewicz, the great romantic poet, was pulled down from its pedestal on the market square, which was renamed Adolf Hitlerplatz. Such actions were symbolic as well as practical. The university at Krakow was older than any university in Germany. Mickiewicz had been respected by the Europeans of his day as much as Goethe. The existence of such an institution and such a history, like the presence of the Polish educated classes as such, was a barrier to German plans, but also a problem for Nazi ideology. Polishness itself was to disappear from these lands, to be replaced by Germandom. As Hitler had written, Germany must seal off these alien racial elements so that the blood of its people will not be corrupted again or it must, without further ado, remove them and hand over the vacated territory to its own national comrades. In early October 1939, Hitler conferred a new responsibility upon Heinrich Himmler. Already the leader of the SS and the chief of the German police forces, Himmler now became the Reich Commissar for the Strengthening of Germandom, a kind of minister for racial affairs. In the regions that Germany annexed from Poland, Himmler was to remove the native population and replace it with Germans. Although Himmler embraced the project with enthusiasm, it was a difficult assignment. These were Polish territories. There had not been a large German minority in independent Poland. When the Soviets said they were entering eastern Poland to defend Ukrainians and Belarusians, this had at least a demographic plausibility. There were about six million such people in Poland. There were, by contrast, fewer than a million Germans. In Germany's newly annexed territories, Poles outnumbered Germans by about fifteen to one. By now, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, had mastered the German press, so Germans, and those who believed their propaganda, had the impression that there were massive numbers of Germans in western Poland, and that they had been subject to horrible repressions. The reality was quite different. It was not just that the nine million or so Poles massively outnumbered the Germans in the new districts of the Reich. Hitler had just added significantly more Jews, at least six hundred thousand, to his Reich than he had added Germans, and for that matter nearly tripled the population of Jews in Germany, from about three hundred and thirty thousand to nearly a million. If the general government, with its 1,560,000 Jews, was included, he had added well over two million Jews to Berlin's dominions. There were more Jews in the city of Lodz, 233,000, which was added to Germany, than in Berlin, 82,788, and Vienna, 91,480, combined. There were more Jews in Warsaw, now in the general government, than there had been in all of Germany. Hitler had added more Poles to the Reich in this annexation than he had added Germans in this and all previous annexations, including Austria and the border regions of Czechoslovakia. Taking into account the general government and the protectorate of Bohemia Moravia annexed from dissembled Czechoslovakia, Hitler had added about twenty million Poles, six million Czechs, and two million Jews to his empire. There were now more Slavs in Germany than in any other European state, except the Soviet Union. On a crusade for racial purity, Germany had become, by the end of 1939, Europe's second-largest multinational state. The largest, of course, was the Soviet Union. Arthur Greiser, placed in charge of the largest of Germany's new regions, known as the Reichskau Vaterland, was particularly receptive to the idea of strengthening Germandom. His province extended west to east from the major Polish city Poznan to the major Polish city Lodz. It was home to about four million Poles, 366,000 Jews, and 327,000 Germans. Himmler proposed to deport one million people by February 1940, including all of the Jews and several hundred thousand Poles. 
Greiser began the project of strengthening Germandom by emptying three psychiatric hospitals and having the patients shot. Patients from a fourth psychiatric hospital, Adovinska, met a different fate. They were taken to the local Gestapo headquarters in October and November 1939 and gassed by carbon monoxide released from canisters. This was the first German mass murder by this method. Some 7,700 Polish citizens found in mental institutions were murdered, beginning a policy of euthanasia that would soon be followed within the boundaries of pre-war Germany as well. Over the course of the next two years, more than 70,000 German citizens would be gassed as life unfit for life. Strengthening Germandom had an internal and an external dimension. Aggressive war abroad allowed for the murder of German citizens. So it began, and so it would continue. The goal of removing the Jews from Germany clashed with another ideological priority, that of resettling Germans from the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union had extended its borders west by taking eastern Poland, Hitler had to be concerned about the Germans, formerly Polish citizens, who then fell under Soviet rule. Hitler arranged for these people to be sent to Germany. They would live in the Vaterland, on the homesteads vacated by deported Poles. But this meant that Polish farmers, rather than Jews, had to be deported in the first instance to make room for these incoming Germans. But even if Jews were allowed, for the time being, to remain in their homes, they faced enormous suffering and humiliation. In Kozienica, Orthodox Jews were forced to dance next to a pile of burning books and chant that, The war is our fault. In Lovitch, on the 7th of November 1939, the entire male Jewish population was forced to march to the prison to be ransomed by the Jewish community. In the first deportation from the Vaterland to the general government, carried out from the 1st to the 17th of December 1939, the vast majority of the 87,883 people expelled were Poles. The police chose in the first instance Poles who represent an immediate danger to German nationhood. In a second deportation, carried out between the 10th of February and the 15th of March, 1940, another 40,128 people were sent away, again, most of them Poles. The journey was rather short. In normal times, the journey from Poznan, the capital of the Vaterland, to Warsaw, the largest city of the general government, would take a few hours. Nevertheless, thousands of people froze to death on the trains, which were often left idle on side tracks for days. Commented Himmler, It's just the climate there. The weather in Poland, needless to say, was essentially the same as the weather in Germany. The winter of 1939-1940 in Poland and Germany was unusually cold. The winter in Ukraine, Russia, and northern Kazakhstan was even colder. As the days shortened in the Soviet special settlements, thousands of Polish citizens fell ill and died. In the three camps in Soviet Russia and Soviet Ukraine, where the Soviets held the Polish prisoners of war, the men followed their own political and religious calendar. In Kozelsk, Ostashkov, and Starobilsk, people found ways to commemorate the 11th of November, Polish Independence Day. In all three camps, the men planned to celebrate Christmas Day. These prisoners were generally Roman Catholics, with a considerable admixture of Jews, Protestants, Orthodox Christians, and Greek Catholics. They found themselves in desecrated Orthodox monastic complexes, praying or taking communion in quiet corners of crumbling cathedrals. The prisoners saw the signs of what had happened to the Orthodox monks and the nuns during the Bolshevik Revolution. Skeletons in shallow graves, outlines of human bodies traced in bullets against the walls. One prisoner at Starobilsk could not help but notice the clouds of black ravens that never seemed to leave the monastery. Nevertheless, prayer seemed to bring hope, and the people of various faiths worshipped together, until the 24th of December 1939, when the priests, pastors, and rabbis were taken away from all three camps, never to be seen again. The three camps were a sort of laboratory for observing the behavior of the Polish educated classes. Kozelsk, Ostashkov, and Starobilsk became Polish in appearance. 
The prisoners had no other clothes but their army uniforms, with white eagles on their caps. Needless to say, no one wore that particular emblem in public in the former eastern Poland, where the public space was now graced by the hammer, sickle, and red star. Even as Polish universities were closed on the German side, or made Ukrainian and Russian on the Soviet, camp inmates organized lectures led by the prominent Polish scientists and humanists who were among the reserve officers. Officers organized modest credit unions so that poorer officers could borrow from richer. They declaimed by heart the poetry they had learned at school. Some of them could recite from memory the massively long novels from the period of Polish realism. Of course, the prisoners also disagreed, fought, and stole. And a few people, as it turned out, a very few, agreed to cooperate with the Soviets. The officers disagreed about how to comport themselves during the long nighttime interrogations. Yet the spirit of national solidarity was palpable, perhaps to the Soviets as well. The men were nevertheless lonely. They could write to their families, but could not discuss their situation. Knowing that the NKVD read everything they wrote, they had to be discreet. One prisoner at Kozelsk, Dobieslav Yakubovich, entrusted to his diary the letters he wished to write to his wife, his dreams of watching her dress, and of playing with their daughter. The prisoners had to give a sanatorium as their return address, which led to much painful confusion. The prisoners befriended the dogs who served as sentries, and the dogs from nearby towns. Dogs would visit the camps, entering through the gate past the guards, or through holes in or under the barbed wire fences too small for a man. One of the reserve officers at Starobilsk was Maximilian Labedz, the most famous veterinarian in Warsaw. An older gentleman, he had barely survived the transport. He looked after the dogs, and occasionally even performed surgeries. His special pet was a mutt that the officers called Linek, which was short for Stalinek, Little Stalin in Polish. The favorite among the dogs that visited was called Foch, after the French general who was supreme commander of the Allied armies that defeated Germany in 1918. This was a time, in late 1939 and early 1940, when a Polish government in exile had established itself in Paris, and when Poles generally hoped that France could defeat Germany and rescue Poland. They attached their own hopes for contact with the outside world to the little dog Foch, who seemed to have a home in town. They would tuck notes under his collar, hoping for a response. One day, in March 1940, they got one. People say that soon you'll be released from Starobilsk. People say that you'll go home. We don't know if that's true. It was not true. That month in Moscow, Stalin's secret police chief, Lavrenti Beria, had come to a conclusion, perhaps inspired by Stalin. Beria made clear in writing that he wanted the Polish prisoners of war dead. In a proposal to the Politburo, and thus really to Stalin, Beria wrote on the 5th of March 1940 that each of the Polish prisoners was just waiting to be released in order to enter actively into the battle against Soviet power. He claimed that counter-revolutionary organizations in the new Soviet territories were led by former officers. Unlike the claims about the Polish military organization a couple of years before, this was no fantasy. The Soviet Union had occupied and annexed half of Poland, and some Poles were bound to resist. Perhaps 25,000 of them took part in some kind of resistance organization in 1940. True, these organizations were quickly penetrated by the NKVD and most of these people arrested, but the opposition was real and demonstrable. Beria used the reality of Polish resistance to justify his proposal for the prisoners, to apply to them the supreme punishment, shooting. Stalin approved Beria's recommendation, and the mechanisms of the Great Terror began again. Beria established a special troika to deal rapidly with the files of all the Polish prisoners of war. It was empowered to disregard the recommendations of the previous interrogators and to issue verdicts without any contact with the prisoners themselves. It seems that Beria established a quota for the killings, as had been done in 1937 and 1938. All of the prisoners at the three camps 
plus 6,000 people held in prisons in western Belarus and western Ukraine, 3,000 in each, plus especially dangerous elements among non-commissioned officers who were not in captivity. After quick examination of the files, 97% of the Poles in the three camps, about 14,587 people, were sentenced to death. The exceptions were a few Soviet agents, people of ethnic German or Latvian background, and people with foreign protection. The 6,000 from the prisons were also condemned to death, along with 1,305 other people who were arrested in April. The prisoners of the three camps were expecting that they would be allowed to return home. When, in April 1940, the first groups were taken from the camp at Kozelsk, they were given a farewell reception by their comrades. Fellow officers formed, as best they could without their weapons, an honor guard as they walked to the buses. In groups of a few hundred at a time, the prisoners were taken by rail through Smolensk to the smaller station at Gnazdovo. There they found themselves disembarking from the train into a cordon of NKVD soldiers with bayonets fixed. About thirty of them at a time entered a bus, which took them to the Goat Hills, at the edge of a forest called Ketin. There, at an NKVD resort, they were searched and their valuables taken. One officer, Adam Solsky, had been keeping a diary up to this moment. They asked about my wedding ring, which I... The prisoners were taken into a building on the complex where they were shot. Their bodies were then delivered, probably by truck in batches of thirty, to a mass grave that had been dug in the forest. This continued until all 4,410 prisoners sent from Kozelsk had been shot. At Ostashkov, a band played as the prisoners left the camp to lift their spirits. They were taken by train, in groups of about 250 to 500, to the NKVD prison at Kalinin, today Tver. All were held briefly while their data were checked. They waited, not knowing what would come next, probably not suspecting until the very last moment. An NKVD officer asked one of the waiting prisoners, alone then with his captors, how old he was. The boy was smiling. Eighteen. What did you do? Still smiling. Telephone operator. How long had you worked? The boy counted on his hands. Six months. Then he, like all of the 6,314 prisoners who passed through this room, was handcuffed and led to a soundproofed cell. Two men held him by the arms as a third shot him from behind in the base of the skull. The chief executioner at Kalinin, whom the prisoners never saw, was Vasily Blokin. He had been one of the main killers during the Great Terror when he had commanded an execution squad in Moscow. He had been entrusted with some of the executions of high-profile defendants of show trials, but had also shot thousands of workers and peasants who were killed entirely in secret. At Kalinin he wore a leather cap, apron, and long gloves to keep the blood and gore from himself and his uniform. Using German pistols, he shot, each night, about two hundred and fifty men, one after another. Then the bodies were driven, in a truck, to nearby Mednoya, where the NKVD had some summer houses. They were thrown into a large pit, dug earlier by a backhoe. From the camp at Starobilsk, the prisoners made the trip by rail, a hundred or two hundred at a time, to Kharkiv, where they were held at the NKVD prison. Though they could not have known this, they had been brought to one of the main killing centers of Poles in the Soviet Union. Now it was their turn, and they went to their deaths ignorant of the past, ignorant of what was happening to their comrades in other camps, ignorant of what would happen to them. After a day or so in prison, they were taken to a room, where their details were checked. Then they were led to another room, this one dark and without windows. A guard would ask, May I? and then lead in the prisoner. As one of the NKVD men remembered, there was a clack, and that was the end. The bodies were piled onto trucks, jackets were pulled over the heads of the corpses so that the truck platform would not be stained by the blood. The bodies were loaded head first, then feet first, so they would stack. In this way, 3,739 prisoners of Starobilsk were killed, including all of Josef Chapsky's friends and acquaintances, the botanist whom he remembered for his calm, but also an economist who tried to hide his fears from his pregnant wife, a doctor who was known in Warsaw for visiting cafes and supporting artists, the lieutenant who recited plays and novels by heart, the lawyer who was an enthusiast for a European federation, 
All the engineers, teachers, poets, social workers, journalists, surgeons, and soldiers. But not Chapsky himself. He, like a few others from each of the three camps, was sent on to another camp and survived. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin by Timothy Snyder Fyodor Dostoevsky had set a crucial scene of the brothers Karamazov at the Optin Hermitage in Kozelsk, which in 1939 and 1940 became the site of the Soviet prisoner of war camp. Here took place the most famous exchange in the book, a discussion between a young nobleman and a monastery elder about the possibility of morality without God. If God is dead, is everything permitted? In 1940, the real building where this fictional conversation took place, the former residence of some of the monks, housed the NKVD interrogators. They represented a Soviet answer to that question. Only the death of God allowed for the liberation of humanity. Unconsciously, many of the Polish officers provided a different answer, that in a place where everything is permitted, God is a refuge. They saw their camps as churches and prayed in them. Many of them attended Easter services before they were dispatched to their deaths. The prisoners in the three camps, or at least many of them, guessed that they were being filtered, selected for some role that they might play in the Soviet Union. They had little or no idea, however, that when they failed this test they would be killed. They knew nothing of the Polish operation of the Great Terror, in which tens of thousands of Soviet Poles had been shot only two years before. Even had they understood the stakes, it seems hard to imagine that very many of them could have demonstrated any sort of believable loyalty to the Soviets. In the camps they had to see Soviet newspapers, watch Soviet propaganda films, and listen to Soviet news broadcasts over loudspeakers. They generally found it all ridiculous and insulting. Even those who informed on their comrades found the system absurd. The two cultures did not communicate well, at least not without some obvious shared interest. During this period, when Stalin was Hitler's ally, no such common ground could easily be imagined. The possibilities for misunderstanding, on the other hand, were enormous. Collectivization and industrialization had modernized the Soviet Union, but without the attention to the population, or rather to consumers, that characterized the capitalist West. The Soviet citizens who ruled eastern Poland were falling off bicycles, eating toothpaste, using toilets as sinks, wearing multiple watches or bras as earmuffs, or lingerie as evening gowns. Polish prisoners were also ignorant, and about more fundamental matters. Unlike Soviet citizens in their position, the Poles believed that they could not be sentenced or killed without a legal basis. It was a sign of the great civilizational transformation of Stalinism that these Soviet and Polish citizens, many of whom had been born in the same Russian Empire, now understood each other so poorly. The chief interrogator at Kozelsk, the man who inherited the residence of Dostoevsky's monastic elder, put this delicately. It was a matter of two divergent philosophies. In the end, the Soviets could extend and enforce theirs. Jokes at the expense of the Soviets in eastern Poland could be answered with the easy retort, What is the country called now? The Poles in the camps would not be made to fit Soviet civilization. They did not live like Soviet people. This was the recollection of the Russian and Ukrainian peasants who saw them, who decades later recalled their neatness, cleanliness, and proud bearing. They could not be made to live like Soviet people, at least not on such short notice, and not in these circumstances but they could be made to die like them. Many of the Polish officers were stronger and better educated than the NKVD captors, but disarmed, confused, and held by two men, they could be shot by a third and buried where no one, it seemed, would ever find them. In death, it seemed, they could join the silence of the citizens of Soviet history. In all, this lesser terror, this revival of the Polish operation, killed 21,892 Polish citizens. The vast majority of them, though not all, were Poles by nationality. 
Poland was a multinational state with a multinational officer corps, and so many of the dead were Jews, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. Some eight percent of the victims were Jews, corresponding to the proportion of Jews in eastern Poland. As in the Great Terror, the families of the repressed were to be punished as well. Three days before proposing that all of the prisoners in these camps be shot, Beria had ordered that their families be deported. The Soviets knew who these people were. This was why they had allowed the prisoners to correspond with their loved ones, to collect names and addresses. Operational troikas in western Belarus and western Ukraine prepared the names of 60,667 people to be sent to special settlements in Kazakhstan. Most of them were family members of what one order called former people. These were usually families without husbands and fathers. Wives were told, in a typical Soviet lie, that they were being sent to join their husbands. In fact, families were dropped on the Siberian tiger, the eternal mud and snow, as one thirteen-year-old Polish boy remembered it, as the men were being shot at Ketin, Kalinin, Kharkiv, Bikivnia, and Kurapati. Some Polish children wrote to Stalin on the 20th of May 1940, promising to be good Soviet citizens, complaining only that it's hard to live without our fathers. The following day, NKVD men were given cash awards for having cleared out the three camps without allowing a single escape. Because the men were absent, this deportation was even harder on its victims than the one in February. Women were dropped with their children and often with their aged parents-in-law in Kazakhstan. Departing in April on a moment's notice, most women had inadequate clothing. The clothes they brought they often had to sell to buy food. Women survived the following winter by learning to collect and burn dung for heat. Thousands of women died. Many of them had to decide how to keep their children alive. They wished to raise them as Poles, but often realized that they had to give them to Soviet institutions if they were to be fed and to survive. One woman left five of her six children at an NKVD office and disappeared with the sixth at her breast, never to be seen again. The pregnant wife of the worried economist held at Starobilsk and killed at Kharkiv gave birth to their child in exile. The infant died. At the same time, in March 1940, NKVD Chief Beria had ordered a deportation of people who had declined to accept a Soviet passport. This meant a rejection of the Soviet system, and also a practical problem for Soviet bureaucrats. Polish citizens who refused to allow their identities to enter Soviet records could not be observed and punished with desirable efficiency. As it happened, the vast majority of people who had rejected the Soviet passport were Jewish refugees from western Poland. These people had fled the Germans, but had no wish to become Soviet citizens. They feared that, if they accepted Soviet documents, they would not be allowed to return to Poland, once it was restored. So, in this way, Jews proved to be loyal citizens of Poland, and became victims of both of the regimes that had conquered their homeland. They had fled the depredations of the SS only to be deported by the NKVD to Kazakhstan and Siberia. Of the 78,339 people deported in the June 1940 action that targeted refugees, about 84% were Jewish. Usually people who had no experience in the countryside, Polish Jews were at least as helpless as the Poles who had gone before them. Artisans and cobblers were sent to the far Russian north to fell trees. A Jewish boy called Joseph remembered that the Jews in his hometown had been forced to burn down their own synagogue as the Germans laughed. His family fled to the Soviet zone, but refused the Soviet passport. His brother, father, and mother all died in exile. In Western Europe this period was known as the Phony War. Nothing seemed to be happening. France and Britain were at war with Germany as of September 1939, but that autumn, winter, and the following spring, as Poland was defeated, destroyed, and divided, and tens of thousands of its citizens murdered and hundreds of thousands deported, there was no Western front in the war. The Germans and their Soviet allies were free to do as they liked. The Germans invaded Denmark and Norway in April 1940, thereby securing access to mineral reserves in Scandinavia and preventing any British intervention in Northern Europe. But the phony war was well and truly over when Germany attacked the Low Countries and France on the 10th of May. 
By the 14th of June, about a hundred thousand French and sixty thousand British soldiers were dead, and the Germans were in Paris. France had fallen far more quickly than anyone expected. That same month, June 1940, the Soviet Union also extended its empire to the west, annexing all three of the independent Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The largest and most populous Baltic state, Lithuania, was also the one with the most complicated nationalities issues and international relations. Throughout the interwar period, Lithuania had claimed the city of Vilnius and its environs, which lay in northeastern Poland. Though these territories were inhabited mainly by Poles, Jews and Belarusians, Lithuanians regarded Vilnius as their rightful capital, since the city had been the capital of an important medieval and early modern state known as the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. In the 1920s and 1930s, the leaders of the independent Lithuanian state had used Kaunas as an administrative centre, but regarded Vilnius as their capital. Stalin played on such emotions in 1939. Rather than annexing Vilnius to the Soviet Union, he granted it to still-independent Lithuania. The price, not surprisingly, was the establishment of Soviet military bases on Lithuanian territory. Soviet forces, already installed in Lithuania, stood at the ready as a political revolution, even more hasty and artificial than in eastern Poland, was imposed in summer 1940. Much of the Lithuanian political elite escaped to Nazi Germany. All of this was carefully observed by the Japanese consul in Lithuania, Chiuni Sugihara, who was in Kaunas to monitor German and Soviet military movements. In summer 1940, the Japanese leadership had set a clear course. It would seek a neutrality pact with the Soviet Union. With the North thus secured, the Japanese could plan a move southward for 1941. Sugihara was one of the relatively few Japanese officials in a position to follow German-Soviet relations after the fall of France. Lacking a staff of his own, he used as his informers and assistants Polish military officers who had escaped arrests by the Soviets and the Germans. He rewarded them with Japanese passports and the use of the Japanese diplomatic post. Sugihara helped the Poles find an escape route for their officer comrades. The Poles realized that it was possible to arrange a trip across the Soviet Union to Japan with a certain kind of Japanese exit visa. Only a very few Polish officers escaped by this route, though at least one of them reached Japan and filed intelligence reports about what he had seen while crossing the USSR. At the same time, Jewish refugees began to visit Sugihara. These Jews were Polish citizens who had originally fled the German invasion of September 1939, but who now feared the Soviets. They had heard of the June 1940 deportation of Jews and feared the same for themselves. They were right to do so. A year later, the Soviets would deport about 17,500 people from Lithuania, 17,000 from Latvia, and 6,000 from Estonia. With the help of the Polish officers, Sugihara helped several thousand Jews escape Lithuania. They made the long trip across the Soviet Union by rail, then to Japan by ship, and then onward to Palestine or the United States. This action was the coda, silent but firm, of decades of Polish-Japanese intelligence cooperation. In 1940, the Nazi leaders would have liked to rid themselves of the two million or so Jews in their half of Poland, but could not agree among themselves as to how this was to be achieved. The original wartime plan had been to create some sort of reservation for Jews in the Lublin district of the general government. But since the area of German conquest in Poland was relatively small, and Lublin not much further from Berlin, 700 kilometers, than the two great cities from which the Jews would have to be deported, Warsaw, 600 kilometers, and Lodz, 500 kilometers, this had never been a satisfying solution. Hans Frank, the general governor, objected to the arrival of more Jews in his terrain. In late 1939 and 1940, Himmler and Greiser continued to dump Poles from the Vaterland into the general government, some 408,525 in all, similar to the number of Polish citizens deported by the Soviets. This brought enormous suffering to the people in question, but did little to change the national balance in Germany. There were simply too many Poles, and moving them from one part of occupied Poland to another brought little more than chaos. 
It hardly fulfilled Hitler's grand dreams of living space in the East. A specialist on deportation, Adolf Eichmann, was recruited in autumn 1939 to improve the efficiency of the operation. Eichmann had already shown his skills by speeding the emigration of Austrian Jews from Vienna. Yet the problem of deporting Jews to the general government, as Eichmann found, was not so much inefficiency as senselessness. Eichmann learned that Hans Frank, the general governor, had no wish to see any more Jews in his colony. Eichmann managed to send about 4,000 Austrian and Czech Jews to the general government in October 1939, before this policy was halted. Eichmann then drew what must have seemed like the obvious conclusion, that the two million Jews under German power should be deported east to the vast territory of Germany's ally, the Soviet Union. Stalin, after all, had already created a zone of Jewish settlement, Birobijan, deep in Soviet Asia. As the Germans noted, and would have occasion to note again, the Soviet regime, unlike their own, had the state capacity and sheer terrain required for effective mass deportations. The Germans proposed the transfer of European Jews in January 1940. Stalin was not interested. If the general government was too near and too small to resolve what Nazis saw as the racial problem, and the Soviets were not interested in taking Jews, what was to be done with the racial enemies who made up its native population? They were to be held under control and exploited until the time for the final solution, still seen as deportation, came. The model came from Greiser, who ordered the creation of a ghetto for the 233,000 Jews of Lodz on the 8th of February 1940. That same month, Ludwig Fischer, the German mayor of Warsaw, entrusted the lawyer Waldemar Schoen with the task of designing a ghetto. In October and November, more than a 100,000 non-Jewish Poles were cleared out of the northwesterly district of Warsaw that the Germans declared to be the ghetto and more than a hundred thousand Warsaw Jews moved in from elsewhere in the city. Jews were forced to wear a yellow star to identify themselves as Jews, and to submit to other humiliating regulations. They lost property outside the ghettos, in the first instance to Germans, and then sometimes to Poles, who often had lost their own homes under German bombs. If Warsaw Jews were caught outside the ghetto without permission, they were subject to the death penalty. The fate of the Jews in the rest of the general government was the same. The Warsaw Ghetto and the other ghettos became improvised labor camps and holding pens in 1940 and 1941. The Germans selected a Jewish council, or Judenrat, usually from among the people who had been pre-war leaders of the local Jewish community. In Warsaw, the head of the Judenrat was Adam Chernyakov, a journalist and pre-war senator. The task of the Judenrat was to mediate between the Germans and the Jews of the ghetto. The Germans also created unarmed Jewish police forces, in Warsaw headed by Josef Scherzinski, which were to maintain order, prevent escapes, and carry out German policies of coercion. It was not at all clear what these would be, although with time Jews were able to see that life in the ghetto could not be sustained indefinitely. In the meantime, the Warsaw Ghetto became a tourist attraction for visiting Germans. The ghetto historian Emanuel Ringelblum noted that the shed where dozens of corpses lie awaiting burial is particularly popular. The Baedeker Guide to the General Government would be published in 1943. The Germans themselves returned in summer 1940, after the fall of France, to the idea of a distant final solution. The Soviets had rejected a deportation of Jews to the Soviet Union, and Frank had prevented their massive resettlement in his general government. Madagascar was a French possession. With France subdued, all that stood in the way of its recolonization was the Royal Navy. Himmler mused along those lines. I trust that thanks to a great journey of Jews to Africa, or to some other colony, I will see the complete extirpation of the concept of Jews. That, of course, was not the end of the ambition. As Himmler continued, Over a somewhat longer period of time, it must be possible to cause the disappearance on our territory of the national conceptions Ukrainians, Gorals, Lemkos. And what has been said about these clans applies, on an appropriately greater scale, also to the Poles. Jews were dying at high rates, especially in the Warsaw Ghetto, where well over 400,000 Jews were assembled. 
The ghetto comprised an area of only about two square miles, so the population density was about 200,000 people per square mile. For the most part, however, the Jews dying in Warsaw were not Warsaw Jews. In the Warsaw district, as elsewhere in the general government, the Germans drove Jews from smaller settlements into the larger ghettos. Jews from beyond Warsaw were usually poorer to begin with, and lost what they had as they were deported. They were sent to Warsaw with little time to prepare, and often unable to carry what they had. These Jews from the Warsaw district became the vulnerable ghetto underclass, prone to hunger and disease. Of the perhaps 60,000 Jews who died in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1940 and 1941, the vast majority were resettlers and refugees. It was they who suffered most from harsh German policies, such as the decision to deny any food to the ghetto for the entire month of December 1940. Their death was often a hungry one, after long suffering and moral degradation. Parents often died first, leaving their children alone in a strange city. Gietla Schultzmann remembered that after the death of her mother and her father, she wandered aimlessly through the ghetto and became entirely swollen with hunger. Sarah Zborov, whose mother died with her in bed, and whose sister then swelled and starved and died, wrote, Inside myself I know everything, but I can't say it. The very articulate teenager Israel Lederman understood that there were two wars, a war of bullets and a war of hunger. The war of hunger is worse, because then a person suffers. From bullets you die at once. As a doctor remembered, ten-year-old children sold themselves for bread. In the Warsaw Ghetto, Jewish community organizations established shelters for orphans. Some children, in their desperation, wished for their parents to die, so that they could at least get their food allotment as orphans. Some of the shelters were awful spectacles. As one social worker remembered, the children curse, beat each other, jostle each other around the pot of porridge. Critically ill children lie on the floor, children bloated from hunger, corpses that have not been removed for several days. She worked hard to bring order to a shelter, only to see the children catch typhus. She and her charges were blockaded inside, in quarantine. The shelter, she wrote in her diary with uncanny foresight, now serves as a gas chamber. Whereas the Germans preserved pre-war Polish Jewish elites, choosing from among them a Judenrat to implement German policies in the ghetto, they tended to regard non-Jewish Polish elites as a political threat. In early 1940, Hitler came to the conclusion that the more dangerous Poles in the general government should simply be executed. He told Frank that Polish leadership elements had to be eliminated. Frank drew up a list of groups to be destroyed that was very similar to that of Operation Tannenberg. The educated, the clergy, the politically active. By an interesting coincidence, he announced this plan to liquidate groups regarded as spiritual leaders to his subordinates on the 2nd of March 1940, three days before Beria initiated the terror actions against the Polish prisoners in the Soviet Union. His basic policy was the same as Beria's to kill people already under arrest, and to arrest people regarded as dangerous, and kill them too. Unlike Beria, Frank would use the opportunity to execute common criminals as well, presumably to clear prison space. By the end of summer 1940, the Germans had killed some 3,000 people they regarded as politically dangerous, and about the same number of common criminals. The German operation was less well coordinated than the Soviet one. The AB Axion, Außerordentliche Befriedungsaktion, Extraordinary Pacification Action, as these killings were known, was implemented differently in each of the various districts of the general government. In the Krakow district, prisoners were read a summary verdict, although no sentence was actually recorded. The verdict was treason, which would have justified a death sentence. But then, contradictorily, everyone was recorded as having been shot while trying to escape. In fact, the prisoners were taken from Montelupi prison in Krakow to nearby Kzezavice, where they dug their own death pits. A day later they were shot, thirty to fifty at a time. In the Lublin district, people were held at the town castle, then taken to a site south of the city. By the light of the headlamps of trucks, they were machine-gunned in front of pits. 
On one night, the 15th of August, 1940, 450 people were killed. In the Warsaw district, prisoners were held at the Paviak prison, then driven to the Palmyri forest. There, the Germans had used forced labor to dig several long ditches, three meters wide by thirty meters long. Prisoners were awakened at dawn and told to collect their things. In the beginning, at least, they thought that they were being transferred to another camp. Only when the trucks turned into the forest did they understand their fate. The bloodiest night was the 20th to the 21st of June, 1940, when 358 people were shot. In the Radom district, the action was especially systematic and brutal. Prisoners were bound and read a verdict. They were a danger to German security. As in the other cities, Poles did not usually understand that this was supposed to have been a judicial procedure. They were taken away in large groups in the afternoon according to a schedule. 3.30 binding, 3.45 reading of verdict, 4 o'clock transport. The first few groups were driven to a sandy area twelve kilometers north of Częstochowa, where they were blindfolded and shot. The wife of one of the prisoners, Jadwiga Flack, was later able to find her way to the killing site. She found in the sand the unmistakable signs of what had happened, shards of bone and bits of blindfold. Her husband Marion was a student who had just turned twenty-two. Four prisoners who were members of the city council had survived. Himmler's brother-in-law, who happened to be the man who ran the city for the Germans, believed that he needed them to construct a swimming pool and a brothel for Germans. Later groups from Częstochowa were taken to the woods. On the 4th of July, 1940, the three Glinska sisters, Irena, Janina, and Serafina, were all shot there. All three of them had refused to disclose the whereabouts of their brothers. Janina called German rule laughable and temporary. She said that she would never betray her brother or another Pole. She did not. On the way to the killing sites, prisoners would throw notes from the truck, in the hope that passers-by would find them and convey them to their families. This was something of a Polish custom, and the notes would surprisingly often find their way to their destination. The people who wrote them, unlike the prisoners in the three Soviet camps, knew that they were going to die. The prisoners at Kozelsk, Ostashkov, and Starobilsk also threw notes from the buses as they left the camps, but they said things like, we can't tell where they are sending us. Thus a difference between Soviet and German repression. East of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Soviets wished for secrecy, and barring some extraordinary accident, they preserved it. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, Germans did not always want discretion, and were poor at maintaining it even when they so wished. So the victims of the A.B. Action were reconciling themselves, or trying to reconcile their families, to a fate they foresaw. The people awaiting death disagreed about the meaning of it all. Mrs. Habrovsky wrote that, The blood shed on the Polish land will enrich her, and raise the avengers of a free and great Poland. Richard Schmidt, who had physically attacked his interrogators, wanted to discourage revenge. Let the children not take revenge, for revenge breeds more revenge. Marian Mushinsky simply bade farewell to his family. God be with you. I love you all. Some of the people going to their deaths in the A.B. Action were thinking of family who had been taken prisoner by the Soviets. Although the Soviets and the Germans did not coordinate their policies against the Polish educated classes, they targeted the same sorts of people. The Soviets acted to remove elements that they regarded as dangerous to their system, on the pretext of fighting a class war. The Germans were also defending their territorial gains, though also acting on their sense that the inferior race had to be kept in its place. In the end, the policies were very similar with more or less concurrent deportations and more or less concurrent mass shootings. In at least two cases, the Soviet terror killed one sibling, the German terror the other. Janina Dovbor was the only female among the Polish officers taken prisoner by the Soviets. An adventurous soul, she had learned as a girl to hang glide and parachute. She was the first woman in Europe to jump from a height of five kilometers or more. She trained as a pilot in 1939 and enlisted in the Polish Air Force Reserve. In September 1939, she was taken prisoner by the Soviets. According to one account, her plane had been shot down by the Germans. 
parachuting to safety, she found herself arrested by the Soviets as a Polish second lieutenant. She was taken to Ostashkov and then to Kozelsk. She had her own accommodations and spent her time with Air Force comrades with whom she felt safe. On the 21st or 22nd of April 1940, she was executed at Kertin and buried there in the pits along with 4,409 men. Her younger sister, Agnieszka, had remained in the German zone. Along with some friends, she had joined a resistance organization in late 1939. She was arrested in April 1940, at about the time that her sister was executed. She was killed in the Palmyri forest on the 21st of June 1940. Both sisters were buried in shallow graves after sham trials and shots to the head. The Vnuk brothers, who hailed from a region that had once been in east-central Poland but was now quite close to the German-Soviet border, met the same fate. Boleslav, the older brother, was a populist politician who had been elected to the Polish parliament. Jakob, the younger brother, studied pharmacology and designed gas masks. Both married in 1932 and had children. Jakob, along with the other experts from his institute, was arrested by the Soviets and killed at Ketin in April 1940. Boleslav was arrested by the Germans in October 1939, taken to Lublin Castle in January, and executed in the AB Axion on the 29th of June 1940. He left a farewell note on a handkerchief. I die for the fatherland with a smile on my lips, but I die innocent. In spring and summer 1940, the Germans were extending their small system of concentration camps so that they could intimidate and exploit Poles. In late April 1940, Heinrich Himmler visited Warsaw and ordered that 20,000 Poles be placed in concentration camps. At the initiative of Erich von dem bach zelewski Himmler's commissar for the strengthening of Germandom for the Silesia region, a new concentration camp was established at the site of a Polish army barracks close to Krakow. Oswiecim, better known by its German name, Auschwitz. As the AB Axion came to a close, prisoners were no longer executed, but sent to German camps, very often Auschwitz. The first transport to Auschwitz was made up of Polish political prisoners from Krakow. They were sent on the 14th of June 1940, and given the numbers 31 to 758. In July, transports of Polish political prisoners were sent to Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald. In November followed two more to Auschwitz. On the 15th of August began mass roundups in Warsaw, where hundreds and then thousands of people would be seized on the streets and sent to Auschwitz. In November 1940 the camp became an execution site for Poles. At around the same time it attracted the attention of investors from IG Farben. Auschwitz became a giant labor camp very much on the Soviet model although its slave labor served the interests of German companies rather than Stalin's dream of planned industrialization. Unlike the Germans, who wrongly believed that they had eliminated the Polish educated classes in their part of Poland, the Soviets in considerable measure actually had. In the general government, the Polish resistance was growing, whereas in the Soviet Union, networks were quickly broken and activists arrested, exiled, and sometimes executed. Meanwhile, a new challenge to Soviet rule from Ukrainians was in view. Poland had been home to about five million Ukrainians, almost all of whom now inhabited Soviet Ukraine. They were not necessarily satisfied by the new regime. Ukrainian nationalists, whose organizations had been illegal in interwar Poland, knew how to work underground. Now that Poland no longer existed, the focus of their labors naturally changed. Soviet policy had made some local Ukrainians receptive to the nationalists' message. While some Ukrainian peasants had initially welcomed Soviet rule and its gifts of farmland, collectivization had quickly turned them against the regime. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists now began to take action against the institutions of Soviet power. Some leading Ukrainian nationalists had interwar connections with German military intelligence and with Reinhard Heydrich's SS intelligence service, the Zicker Heitsdienst. As Stalin knew, several of them were still gathering intelligence for Berlin. Thus a fourth Soviet deportation from the annexed territories of eastern Poland chiefly targeted Ukrainians. The first two operations had targeted mainly Poles, and the third mainly Jews. 
an action of May 1941 moved 11,328 Polish citizens, most of them Ukrainians, from western Soviet Ukraine to the special settlements. The very last deportation on the 19th of June touched 22,353 Polish citizens, most of them Poles. As a little Polish boy from Bialystok remembered, they took us under bombs and there was fire because people began to burn up in the cars. Germany invaded the Soviet Union in a surprise attack on the 22nd of June and its bombers caught up with the Soviet prison trains. About 2,000 deportees died in the freight cars, victims of both regimes. In purging his new lands, Stalin had been preparing for another war, but he did not believe that it would come so soon. When Germany invaded the Soviet Union in a surprise attack on the 22nd of June 1941, Poland and the Soviet Union were suddenly transformed from enemies to allies. Each was now fighting Germany. Nevertheless, it was an awkward situation. In the previous two years, the Soviets had repressed about half a million Polish citizens, about 315,000 deported, about 110,000 more arrested, and 30,000 executed, and about 25,000 more who died in custody. The Polish government knew about the deportations, but not about the killings. Nevertheless, the Soviets and the Poles began to form a Polish army from the hundreds of thousands of Polish citizens now scattered across Soviet prisons, labor camps, and special settlements. The Polish High Command realized that several thousand Polish officers were missing. Józef Czapski, the Polish officer and artist who had survived Kozelsk, was sent to Moscow by the Polish government with the mission of finding the missing men, his former campmates. A sober man, he nevertheless understood his task as a calling. Poland would now have a second chance to fight the Germans, and Czapski was to find the officers who would lead men into battle. As he journeyed to Moscow, to his mind came snatches of Polish romantic poetry. First, the deeply masochistic reverie of Juliusz Slovatsky, asking God to keep Poland on the cross until she had the strength to stand by herself. Then, speaking to an appealingly honest fellow Pole, Czapski recalled the most famous lines of Cyprian Norvid's poem of desire for the homeland written in exile. I long for those who say yes for yes and no for no, for a light without shadow. An urbane, sophisticated man from a nationally mixed family, Chapsky found solace by understanding his own nation in the terms of romantic idealism. Chapsky was indirectly invoking scripture, for Norvid's poem cites the book of Matthew. Let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. This was the very same verse with which Arthur Kestler had just ended Darkness at Noon, his own novel of the Great Terror. Chapsky was on his way to the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, the setting of that novel. This was also the very place where Kessler's friend, Alexander Weisberg, had been interrogated before his release in 1940. Weisberg and his wife had both been arrested in the late 1930s. Their experiences were one source of Kessler's novel. Chapsky was intending to ask one of the Lubyanka interrogators about his own friends, the missing Polish prisoners. He had an appointment with Leonid Reichmann, an NKVD officer who had interrogated Polish prisoners. Chapsky passed Reichmann a report, describing the known movements of the thousands of missing officers. Reichmann seemed to read it from beginning to end, following each line with a pencil but marking nothing. He then spoke some non-committal words and promised to call Chapsky at his hotel after he had informed himself about the matter. One night, at about midnight, the phone rang. It was Reichmann, who claimed that he had to leave the city on urgent business. He had no new information. He provided Chapsky with some names of other officials with whom to speak, all of whom had already been approached by the Polish government. Chapsky even now did not suspect the truth, that all of the missing officers had been murdered. But he understood that something was being concealed. He decided to leave Moscow. The next day, returning to his hotel room, Chapsky felt a pair of eyes staring at him. Weary of the attention that his Polish officer's uniform drew in the Soviet capital, he paid no attention. An elderly Jew approached him as he reached the elevator. You're a Polish officer? The Jew was from Poland, but had not seen his homeland in thirty years and wished to see it again. Then, he said, I could die without regrets. 
On the spur of the moment, Chapsky invited the gentleman to his room, with the intention of giving him a copy of a magazine published by the Polish embassy. On the first page happened to be a photograph of Warsaw. Warsaw, the capital of Poland, the centre of Jewish life, the locus of two civilizations, and the site of their encounter. The castle square was destroyed, the famous column of King Zygmunt broken. This was Warsaw after the German bombing. Chapsky's companion slumped against a chair, put his head down, and wept. When the Jewish gentleman had gone, Chapsky himself began to weep. After the loneliness and mendacity of official Moscow, a single moment of human contact had changed everything for him. The eyes of the poor Jew, he remembered, rescued me from a descent into the abyss of unbelief and utter despair. The sadness the two men shared was of a moment that had just passed, the moment of the joint German-Soviet occupation of Poland. Together, between September 1939 and June 1941, in their time as allies, the Soviet and German states had killed perhaps 200,000 Polish citizens and deported about a million more. Poles had been sent to the Gulag and to Auschwitz, where tens of thousands more would die in the months and years to come. Polish Jews under German occupation were enclosed in ghettos, awaiting an uncertain fate. Tens of thousands of Polish Jews had already died of hunger or disease. A particular wound was caused by the intention, in both Moscow and Berlin, to decapitate Polish society, to leave Poles as a malleable mass that could be ruled rather than governed. Hans Frank, citing Hitler, defined his job as the elimination of Poland's leadership elements. NKVD officers took their assignment to a logical extreme by consulting a Polish who's who in order to define their targets. This was an attack on the very concept of modernity or indeed the social embodiment of enlightenment in this part of the world. In Eastern Europe, the pride of societies was the intelligentsia, the educated classes who saw themselves as leading the nation, especially during periods of statelessness and hardship, and preserving national culture in their writing, speech, and behavior. The German language has the same word, with the same meaning. Hitler ordered quite precisely the extermination of the Polish intelligentsia, the chief interrogator at Kozelsk had spoken of a divergent philosophy. One of the German interrogators in the AB Aktion had ordered an old man to be killed for exhibiting a Polish way of thinking. It was the intelligentsia who was thought to embody this civilization and to manifest this special way of thinking. Its mass murder by the two occupiers was a tragic sign that the Polish intelligentsia had fulfilled its historical mission. Chapter 5. The Economics of Apocalypse The 22nd of June, 1941, is one of the most significant days in the history of Europe. The German invasion of the Soviet Union that began that day under the cryptonym Operation Barbarossa was much more than a surprise attack, a shift of alliances, or a new stage in a war. It was the beginning of a calamity that defies description. The engagement of the Wehrmacht and its allies with the Red Army killed more than ten million soldiers, not to speak of the comparable number of civilians who died in flight, under bombs, or of hunger and disease as a result of the war on the Eastern Front. During this Eastern War, the Germans also deliberately murdered some ten million people, including more than five million Jews and more than three million prisoners of war. In the history of the Bloodlands, Operation Barbarossa marks the beginning of a third period. In the first, 1933 to 1938, the Soviet Union carried out almost all of the mass killing. In the second, during the German-Soviet alliance, 1939 to 1941, the killing was balanced. Between 1941 and 1945, the Germans were responsible for almost all of the political murder. Each shift of stages poses a question. In the transition from the first stage to the second, the question was, how could the Soviets make an alliance with the Nazis? In the transition from the second to the third, the question is, why did the Germans break that alliance? The Molotov-Ribbentrop Europe made by Moscow and Berlin between 1939 and 1941 meant occupation or loss of territory for Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, and Romania. 
It also meant mass deportations and mass shootings for the citizens of Poland, Romania, and the Baltic states. But for the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, it meant fruitful economic cooperation, military victories, and expansion at the expense of these countries. What was it about the Nazi and Soviet systems that permitted mutually advantageous cooperation between 1939 and 1941, but also the most destructive war in human history between 1941 and 1945? Very often the question of 1941 is posed in a more abstract way, as a matter of European civilization. In some arguments, German and Soviet killing policies are the culmination of modernity, which supposedly began when enlightened ideas of reason in politics were practiced during the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. The pursuit of modernity in this sense does not explain the catastrophe of 1941, at least not in any straightforward way. Both regimes rejected the optimism of the Enlightenment, that social progress would follow a masterly march of science through the natural world. Hitler and Stalin both accepted a late 19th century Darwinistic modification. Progress was possible, but only as a result of violent struggle between races or classes. Thus it was legitimate to destroy the Polish upper classes, Stalinism, or the artificially educated layers of Polish subhumanity, National Socialism. Thus far, the ideologies of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union permitted a compromise, the one embodied in the conquest of Poland. The alliance allowed them to destroy the fruits of the European Enlightenment in Poland by destroying much of the Polish educated classes. It allowed the Soviet Union to extend its version of equality, and Nazi Germany to impose racial schema upon tens of millions of people, most dramatically by separating Jews into ghettos pending some final solution. It is possible, then, to see Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union as representing two instances of modernity, which could emanate hostility to a third, the Polish. But this is a far cry from their representing modernity as such. The answer to the question of 1941 has less to do with the intellectual heritage of the Enlightenment and more to do with the possibilities for imperialism, less to do with Paris and more to do with London. Hitler and Stalin both confronted the two chief inheritances of the British nineteenth century, imperialism as an organizing principle of world politics and the unbroken power of the British Empire at sea. Hitler, unable to rival the British on the oceans, saw Eastern Europe as ripe for a new land empire. The East was not quite a tabula rasa. The Soviet state and all of its works had to be cleared away. But then it would be, as Hitler said in July 1941, a Garden of Eden. The British Empire had been a central preoccupation of Stalin's predecessor, Lenin, who believed that imperialism artificially sustained capitalism. Stalin's challenge, as Lenin's successor, was to defend the homeland of socialism, the Soviet Union, against a world where both imperialism and capitalism persisted. Stalin had made his concession to the imperialist world well before Hitler came to power. Since imperialism continued, socialism would have to be represented not by world revolution, but by the Soviet state. After this ideological compromise, socialism in one country, Stalin's alliance with Hitler was a detail. After all, when one's country is a fortress of good surrounded by a world of evil, any compromise is justified, and none is worse than any other. Stalin said that the arrangement with Germany had served Soviet interests well. He expected it to end at some point, but not in 1941. Hitler wanted the Germans to become an imperial people. Stalin wanted the Soviets to endure the imperial stage of history, however long it lasted. The contradiction here was less of principle than of territory. Hitler's Garden of Eden, the pure past to be found in the near future, was Stalin's promised land, a territory mastered at great cost, about which a canonical history had already been written, Stalin's short course of 1938. Hitler always intended to conquer the Western Soviet Union. Stalin wanted to develop and strengthen the Soviet Union in the name of self-defense against just such imperialist visions, although his fears involved Japan and Poland, or a Japanese-Polish-German encirclement more than an invasion from Germany. The Japanese and the Poles took more trouble than the Germans to cultivate national movements within the boundaries of the Soviet Union. 
Stalin assumed that anyone who would assay an invasion of his vast country would first cultivate an ally within its boundaries. The contradiction was not a matter of ideas acting on their own. Hitler wanted a war, and Stalin did not, at least not the War of 1941. Hitler had a vision of empire, and it was of great importance. But he was also courting the possibilities and rebelling against the constraints of a very unusual moment. The crucial period was the year between the 25th of June 1940 and the 22nd of June 1941, between the unexpectedly swift German victory in France and the invasion of the Soviet Union that was supposed to bring a similarly rapid triumph. By the middle of 1940, Hitler had conquered much of Central, Western, and Northern Europe, and had only one enemy, Great Britain. His government was backed by Soviet wheat and oil, and his army was seemingly unbeatable. Why, given the very real gains to Germany of the Soviet alliance, did Hitler choose to attack his ally? In late 1940 and early 1941, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were the only great powers on the European continent. But they were not the only two European powers. Germany and the Soviet Union had remade Europe, but Great Britain had made a world. The Soviet Union and Nazi Germany influenced each other in certain ways, but both were influenced by Great Britain, the enemy that defied their alliance. Britain's empire and navy structured a world system that neither the Nazis nor the Soviets aimed, in the short run, to overturn. Each instead accepted that they would have to win their wars, complete their revolutions, and build their empires, despite the existence of the British Empire and the dominance of the Royal Navy. Whether as enemies or as allies, and despite their different ideologies, the Soviet and Nazi leaderships faced the same basic question posed by the reality of British power. How could a large land empire thrive and dominate in the modern world without reliable access to world markets and without much recourse to naval power? Stalin and Hitler had arrived at the same basic answer to this fundamental question. The state must be large in territory and self-sufficient in economics, with a balance between industry and agriculture that supported a hardily conformist and ideologically motivated citizenry capable of fulfilling historical prophecies. Either Stalinist internal industrialization or Nazi colonial agrarianism. Both Hitler and Stalin aimed at imperial autarky, within a large land empire well supplied in food, raw materials, and mineral resources. Both understood the flashy appeal of modern materials. Stalin had named himself after steel, and Hitler paid special attention to its production. Yet both Stalin and Hitler understood agriculture as a key element in the completion of their revolutions. Both believed that their systems would prove their superiority to decadent capitalism and guarantee independence from the rest of the world by the production of food. As of late 1940 and early 1941, war factored into this grand economic planning very differently for the Soviets than it did for the Nazis. By then, Stalin had an economic revolution to defend, whereas Hitler needed a war for his economic transformation. Whereas Stalin had his socialism in one country, Hitler had in mind something like national socialism in several countries, a vast German empire arranged to assure the prosperity of Germans at the expense of others. Stalin presented collectivization itself, both as an internal class war and as a preparation for the foreign wars to come. Hitler's economic vision could be realized only after actual military conflict. Indeed, after a total military victory over the Soviet Union. The secret of collectivization, as Stalin had noted long before, was that it was an alternative to expansive colonization, which is to say, a form of internal colonization. Unlike Stalin, Hitler believed that colonies could still be seized abroad, and the colonies he had in mind were the agrarian lands of the Western Soviet Union, as well as the oil reserves in the Soviet Caucasus. Hitler wanted Germany, as he put it, to be the most autarkic state in the world. Defeating Britain was not necessary for this. Defeating the Soviet Union was. In January 1941, Hitler told the military command that the immense riches of the Soviet Union would make Germany unassailable. The willingness of the British to fight on alone after the fall of France in June 1940 brought these contradictions to the fore. Between June 1940 and June 1941, Britain was Germany's lone enemy, 
but stronger than it appeared. The United States had not joined the war, but President Franklin D. Roosevelt had made his commitments clear. In September 1940, the Americans traded 50 destroyers to the British for basing rights in the Caribbean. As of March 1941, the President had the authority, under the Lend-Lease Act, to send war material. British troops had been driven from the European continent when France had fallen, but Britain had evacuated many of them at Dunkirk. In summer 1940, the Luftwaffe engaged the Royal Air Force, but could not defeat it. It could bomb British cities, but not intimidate the British people. Germany could not establish air superiority, a major problem for a power planning an invasion. Though an amphibious assault upon the British Isles would have involved a major crossing of the English Channel with men and material, Germany lacked the ships necessary to control the waters and effect the transport. In summer 1940, the Kriegsmarine had three cruisers and four destroyers, no more. On the 31st of July 1940, even as the Battle of Britain was just beginning, Hitler had already decided to invade his ally, the Soviet Union. On the 18th of December, he ordered operational plans for the invasion to crush Soviet Russia in a rapid campaign. Hitler intended to use the Soviet Union to solve his British problem, not in its present capacity as an ally, but in its future capacity as a colony. During this crucial year between June 1940 and June 1941, German economic planners were working hard to devise the ways in which a conquered Soviet Union would make Germany the kind of superpower that Hitler wanted it to become. The key planners worked under the watchful eye of Heinrich Himmler and under the direct command of Reinhard Heydrich. Under the general heading of Generalplan Ost, SS Standartenführer Professor Konrad Meyer drafted a series of plans for a vast eastern colony. A first version was completed in January 1940, a second in July 1941, a third in late 1941, and a fourth in May 1942. The general design was consistent throughout. Germans would deport, kill, assimilate, or enslave the native populations, and bring order and prosperity to a humbled frontier. Depending upon the demographic estimates, between 31 and 45 million people, mostly Slavs, were to disappear. In one redaction, 80 to 85 percent of the Poles, 65 percent of the West Ukrainians, 75 percent of the Belarusians, and 50 percent of the Czechs were to be eliminated. After the corrupt Soviet cities were raised, German farmers would establish, in Himmler's words, pearls of settlement, utopian farming communities that would produce a bounty of food for Europe. German settlements of 15 to 20,000 people each would be surrounded by German villages within a radius of 10 kilometers. The German settlers would defend Europe itself at the Ural Mountains against the Asiatic barbarism that would be forced back to the east. Strife at civilization's edge would test the manhood of coming generations of German settlers. Colonization would make of Germany a continental empire fit to rival the United States, another hardy frontier state based upon exterminatory colonialism and slave labor. The East was the Nazi manifest destiny. In Hitler's view, in the East a similar process will repeat itself for a second time as in the conquest of America. As Hitler imagined the future, Germany would deal with the Slavs much as the North Americans had dealt with the Indians. The Volga River in Russia, he once proclaimed, will be Germany's Mississippi. Here ideology met necessity. So long as Britain did not fall, Hitler's only relevant vision of empire was the conquest of further territory in Eastern Europe. The same held for Hitler's intention to rid Europe of Jews. So long as Britain remained in the war, Jews would have to be eliminated on the European continent, rather than on some distant island such as Madagascar. In late 1940 and early 1941, the Royal Navy prevented Hitler's oceanic version of the final solution. Madagascar was a French possession and France had fallen, but the British still controlled the sea lanes. The Allied Soviet Union had rejected Germany's proposal to import two million European Jews. So long as the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were allies, there was little that the Germans could do but accept the Soviet refusal and bide their time. But if Germany conquered the Soviet Union, it could use Soviet territories as it pleased. 
Hitler had just ordered preparations for the Soviet invasion when he proclaimed to a large crowd at the Berlin Sport Palace in January 1941 that a world war would mean that the role of jury would be finished in Europe. The final solution would not follow the invasion of Britain, plans for which were indefinitely postponed. It would follow the invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941. The first major shooting actions would take place in occupied Soviet Ukraine. The Soviet Union was the only realistic source of calories for Germany and its West European Empire, which together and separately were net importers of food. As Hitler knew, in late 1940 and early 1941, 90% of the food shipments from the Soviet Union came from Soviet Ukraine. Like Stalin, Hitler tended to see Ukraine itself as a geopolitical asset, and its people as instruments who tilled the soil, tools that could be exchanged with others or discarded. For Stalin, mastery of Ukraine was the precondition and proof of the triumph of his version of socialism. Purged, starved, collectivized and terrorized, it fed and defended Soviet Russia and the rest of the Soviet Union. Hitler dreamed of the endlessly fertile Ukrainian soil, assuming that Germans would extract more from the terrain than the Soviets. Food from Ukraine was as important to the Nazi vision of an Eastern Empire as it was to Stalin's defense of the integrity of the Soviet Union. Stalin's Ukrainian fortress was Hitler's Ukrainian breadbasket. The German Army General Staff concluded in an August 1940 study that Ukraine was agriculturally and industrially the most valuable part of the Soviet Union. Herbert Bakker, the responsible civilian planner, told Hitler in January 1941 that the occupation of Ukraine would liberate us from every economic worry. Hitler wanted Ukraine so that no one is able to starve us again, like in the last war. The conquest of Ukraine would first insulate Germans from the British blockade, and then the colonization of Ukraine would allow Germany to become a global power on the model of the United States. In the long run, the Nazis' General Plan Ost involved seizing farmland, destroying those who farmed it, and settling it with Germans. But in the meantime, during the war and immediately after its anticipated rapid conclusion, Hitler needed the locals to harvest food for German soldiers and civilians. In late 1940 and early 1941, German planners decided that victorious German forces in the conquered Soviet Union should use the tool that Stalin had invented for the control of food supply, the collective farm. Some German political planners wished to abolish the collective farm during the invasion, believing that this would win Germany the support of the Ukrainian population. Economic planners, however, believed that Germany had to maintain the collective farm in order to feed the army and German civilians. They won the argument. Barker, Goering's food expert in the four-year plan authority, reputedly said that the Germans would have had to introduce the collective farm if the Soviets had not already arranged it. As German planners saw matters, the collective farm should be used again to starve millions of people. In fact, this time, the intention was to kill tens of millions. Collectivization had brought starvation to Soviet Ukraine, first as an unintended result of inefficiencies and unrealistic grain targets, and then as an intended consequence of the vengeful extractions of late 1932 and early 1933. Hitler, on the other hand, planned in advance to starve unwanted Soviet populations to death. German planners were contemplating the parts of Europe already under German domination, requiring imports to feed about 25 million people. They also regarded a Soviet Union whose urban population had grown by about 25 million since the First World War. They saw an apparently simple solution. The latter would die, so that the former could live. By their calculations, the collective farms produced just the right amount of food to sustain Germans, but not enough to sustain the peoples of the East. So in that sense, they were the ideal tool for political control and economic balance. This was the Hunger Plan, as formulated by the 23rd of May 1941. During and after the war on the USSR, the Germans intended to feed German soldiers and German and West European civilians by starving the Soviet citizens they would conquer, especially those in the big cities. Food from Ukraine would now be sent not north to feed Russia and the rest of the Soviet Union, but rather west to nourish Germany and the rest of Europe. 
In the German understanding, Ukraine, along with parts of southern Russia, was a surplus region, which produced more food than it needed, while Russia and Belarus were deficit regions. Inhabitants of Ukrainian cities, and almost everyone in Belarus and in northwestern Russia, would have to starve or flee. The cities would be destroyed. The terrain would be returned to natural forest, and about thirty million people would starve to death in the winter of 1941-1942. The hunger plan involved the extinction of industry as well as a great part of the population in the deficit regions. These guidelines of the 23rd of May 1941 included some of the most explicit Nazi language about intentions to kill large numbers of people. Many tens of millions of people in this territory will become superfluous and will die or must emigrate to Siberia. Attempts to rescue the population there from death through starvation by obtaining surpluses from the Black Earth Zone can only come at the expense of the provisioning of Europe. They prevent the possibility of Germany holding out until the end of the war. They prevent Germany and Europe from resisting the blockade. With regard to this, absolute clarity must reign. Hermann Goering, at this time Hitler's most important associate, held overall responsibility for economic planning. His four-year plan authority had been charged with preparing the German economy for war between 1936 and 1940. Now his four-year plan authority, entrusted with the hunger plan, was to meet and reverse Stalin's five-year plan. The Stalinist five-year plan would be imitated in its ambition to complete a revolution, exploited in its attainment, the collective farm, but reversed in its goals, the defense and industrialization of the Soviet Union. The hunger plan foresaw the restoration of a pre-industrial Soviet Union with far fewer people, little industry, and no large cities. The forward motion of the Wehrmacht would be a journey backward in time. National socialism was to damn the advance of Stalinism and then reverse the course of its great historical river. Starvation and colonization were German policy, discussed, agreed, formulated, distributed, and understood. The framework of the hunger plan was established by March 1941. An appropriate set of economic policy guidelines was issued in May. A somewhat sanitized version, known as the Green Folder, was circulated in 1,000 copies to German officials that June. Just before the invasion, both Himmler and Goering were overseeing important aspects of the post-war planning. Himmler, the long-term racial colony of General Plan Ost, Goering, the short-term starvation and destruction of the hunger plan. German intentions were to fight a war of destruction that would transform Eastern Europe into an exterminatory agrarian colony. Hitler meant to undo all the work of Stalin. Socialism in one country would be supplanted by socialism for the German race. Such were the plans. Germany did have an alternative, at least in the opinion of its Japanese ally. Thirteen months after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had alienated Tokyo from Berlin, German-Japanese relations were re-established on the basis of a military alliance. On the 27th of September 1940, Tokyo, Berlin, and Rome signed a tripartite pact. At this point in time, when the central conflict in the European war was the air battle between the Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe, Japan hoped that this alliance might be directed at Great Britain. Tokyo urged upon the Germans an entirely different revolution in world political economy than the one German planners envisioned. Rather than colonizing the Soviet Union, thought the Japanese, Nazi Germany should join with Japan and defeat the British Empire. The Japanese, building their empire outward from islands, understood the sea as the method of expansion. It was in the interest of Japan to persuade the Germans that the British were the main common enemy, since such agreement would aid the Japanese to conquer British and Dutch colonies in the Pacific. Yet the Japanese did have a vision on offer to the Germans, one that was broader than their own immediate need for the mineral resources from British and Dutch possessions. There was a grand strategy. Rather than engage the Soviet Union, the Germans should move south, drive the British from the Near East, and meet the Japanese somewhere in South Asia, perhaps India. 
If the Germans and the Japanese controlled the Suez Canal and the Indian Ocean, went Tokyo's case, British naval power would cease to be a factor. Germany and Japan would then become the two world powers. Hitler showed no interest in this alternative. The Germans told the Soviets about the tripartite pact, but Hitler never had any intention of allowing the Soviets to join. Japan would have liked to see a German-Japanese-Soviet coalition against Great Britain, but this was never a possibility. Hitler had already made up his mind to invade the Soviet Union. Though Japan and Italy were now Germany's allies, Hitler did not include them in his major martial ambition. He assumed that the Germans could and should defeat the Soviets themselves. The German alliance with Japan would remain limited by underlying disagreements about goals and enemies. The Japanese needed to defeat the British, and eventually the Americans, to become a dominant naval empire in the Pacific. The Germans needed to destroy the Soviet Union to become a massive land empire in Europe, and thus to rival the British and the Americans at some later stage. Japan had been seeking a neutrality pact with the Soviet Union since summer 1940. One was signed in April 1941. Chiuni Sugihara, the Soviet specialist among Japanese spies, spent that spring in Königsberg, the German city in East Prussia on the Baltic Sea, trying to guess the date of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Accompanied by Polish assistance, he made journeys through eastern Germany, including the lands that Germany had seized from Poland. His estimation, based upon observation of German troop movements, was mid-June 1941. His reports to Tokyo were just one of thousands of indications, sent by intelligence staffs in Europe and around the world, that the Germans would break the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and invade their ally in late spring or early summer. Stalin himself received more than a hundred such indications, but chose to ignore them. His own strategy was always to encourage the Germans to fight wars in the West, in the hope that the capitalist powers would thus exhaust themselves, leaving the Soviets to collect the fallen fruit of a prone Europe. Hitler had won his battles in Western Europe against Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France too quickly and too easily for Stalin's taste. Yet he seemed unable to believe that Hitler would abandon the offensive against Great Britain, the enemy of both Nazi and Soviet ambitions, the one world power on the planet. He expected war with Germany, but not in 1941. He told himself and others that the warnings of an imminent German attack were British propaganda, designed to divide Berlin and Moscow despite their manifest common interests. Apart from anything else, Stalin could not believe that the Germans would attack without winter gear, which none of the espionage reports seemed to mention. That was the greatest miscalculation of Stalin's career. The German surprise attack on the Soviet Union of the 22nd of June 1941 looked at first like a striking success. Three million German troops in three army groups crossed over the Molotov-Ribbentrop line and moved into the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine, aiming to take Leningrad, Moscow, and the Caucasus. The Germans were joined in the invasion by their allies Finland, Romania, Hungary, Italy, and Slovakia, and by a division of Spanish and a regiment of Croatian volunteers. This was the largest offensive in the history of warfare. Nevertheless, unlike the invasion of Poland, it came only from one side, and would lead to war on one very long front. Hitler had not arranged with his Japanese ally a joint attack on the Soviet Union. Japan's leaders might have decided to attack the USSR on their own initiative, but instead decided not to break the neutrality pact. A few Japanese leaders, including Foreign Minister Yosuke Matsuoka, had urged an invasion of Soviet Siberia, but they had been overruled. On the 24th of June, 1941, two days after German troops had entered the Soviet Union, the Japanese Army and Navy chiefs had adopted a resolution not to intervene in the German-Soviet war for the time being. In August, Japan and the Soviet Union reaffirmed their neutrality pact. German officers had every confidence that they could defeat the Red Army quickly. Success in Poland, and above all in France, had made many of them believers in Hitler's military genius. 
The invasion of the Soviet Union, led by armor, was to bring a lightning victory within nine to twelve weeks. With the military triumph would come the collapse of the Soviet political order and access to Soviet foodstuffs and oil. German commanders spoke of the Soviet Union as a house of cards or as a giant with feet of clay. Hitler expected that the campaign would last no more than three months, probably less. It would be child's play. That was the greatest miscalculation of Hitler's career. Ruthlessness is not the same thing as efficiency, and German planning was too bloodthirsty to be really practical. The Wehrmacht could not implement the hunger plan. The problem was not one of ethics or law. The troops had been relieved by Hitler from any duty to obey the laws of war towards civilians, and German soldiers did not hesitate to kill unarmed people. They behaved in the first days of the attack much as they had in Poland. By the second day of the invasion, German troops were using civilians as human shields. As in Poland, German soldiers often treated Soviet soldiers as partisans to be shot upon capture, and killed Soviet soldiers who were trying to surrender. Women in uniform, no rarity in the Red Army, were initially killed just because they were female. The problem for the Germans was rather that the systematic starvation of a large civilian population is an inherently difficult undertaking. It is much easier to conquer territory than to redistribute calories. Eight years before, it had taken a strong Soviet state to starve Soviet Ukraine. Stalin had put to use logistical and social resources that no invading army could hope to muster. An experienced and knowledgeable state police, a party with roots in the countryside, and throngs of ideologically motivated volunteers. Under his rule, people in Soviet Ukraine and elsewhere stooped over their own bulging bellies to harvest a few sheaves of wheat that they were not allowed to eat. Perhaps more terrifying still is that they did so under the watchful eye of numerous state and party officials, often people from the very same regions. The authors of the hunger plan assumed that the collective farm could be exploited to control grain supplies and starve a far larger number of people, even as Soviet state power was destroyed. The idea that any form of economic management would work better under Soviet than German control was perhaps unthinkable to the Nazis. If so, German efficiency was an ideological assumption rather than a reality. The German occupiers never had the ability to starve when and where they chose. For the hunger plan to be implemented, German forces would have had to secure every collective farm, observe the harvest everywhere, and make sure that no food was hidden or went unrecorded. The Wehrmacht was able to maintain and control the collective farms, as were the SS and local assistants, but never so effectively as the Soviets had done. Germans did not know the local people, the local harvest, or the local hiding places. They could apply terror, but less systematically than the Soviets had done. They lacked the party and the fear and faith that it could arouse. They lacked the personnel to seal off cities from the countryside. And as the war continued longer than planned, German officers worried that organized starvation would create a resistance movement behind the lines. Operation Barbarossa was supposed to be quick and decisive, bringing a lightning victory within three months at the latest. Yet while the Red Army fell back, it did not collapse. Two weeks into the fighting, the Germans had taken all of what had been Lithuania, Latvia and eastern Poland, as well as most of Soviet Belarus and some of Soviet Ukraine. Franz Holder, chief of staff of the German army, confided to his diary on the 3rd of July, 1941, that he believed that the war had been won. By the end of August, the Germans had added Estonia, a bit more of Soviet Ukraine, and the rest of Soviet Belarus. Yet the pace was all wrong, and the fundamental objectives were not achieved. The Soviet leadership remained in Moscow. As one German corps commander noted pithily on the 5th of September 1941, no victorious blitzkrieg, no destruction of the Russian army, no disintegration of the Soviet Union. Germany starved Soviet citizens anyway, less from political dominion than political desperation. Though the hunger plan was based upon false political assumptions, it still provided the moral premises for the war in the East. In autumn 1941, 
the Germans starved not to make a reconquered Soviet Union, but to continue their war without imposing any costs on their own civilian population. In September, Goering had to take stock of the new situation, so disastrously different from Nazi expectations. Dreams of a shattered Soviet Union yielding its riches to triumphant Germans had to be abandoned. The classic dilemma of political economy, guns or butter, was supposed to have been resolved in a miraculous way. Guns would make butter. But now, three months into the war, the men carrying the guns very much needed the butter. As the war continued beyond the planned twelve weeks, German soldiers were competing with German civilians for limited food supplies. The invasion itself had halted the supply of grain from the Soviet Union. Now three million German soldiers simply had to be fed without reducing food rations within Germany itself. The Germans lacked contingency plans for failure. The troops had a sense that something was wrong. After all, no one had given them any winter coats, and their night watches were getting cold. But how could the German population be told that the invasion had failed, when the Wehrmacht still seemed to be pushing forward, and Hitler still had moments of euphoria? But if the Nazi leadership could not admit that the war was going badly, then German civilians would have to be spared any negative consequences of the invasion. Grumbling of stomachs might lead to the grumbling of citizens. Germans could not be allowed to make a sacrifice for the troops on the front, at least not too much, and not too soon. A change in domestic food policy might allow them to see the truth, that the war, at least as their leaders had conceived of it, was already lost. Abaka, Goering's food specialist, was sure about what had to be done. The Soviets would have to be deprived of food so that Germans could eat their fill. It was Goering's task to spare the German economy while supplying the German war machine. His original scheme, to starve the Soviet Union after a clear victory, now gave way to an improvisation. German soldiers should take whatever food they needed as they continued to fight a war that was already supposed to be over. On the 16th of September, 1941, just as the timeline for the original lightning victory was exceeded, Goering ordered German troops to live off the land. A local commanding general was more specific. Germans must feed themselves as in the colonial wars. Food from the Soviet Union was to be allocated first to German soldiers, then to Germans in Germany, then to Soviet citizens, and then to Soviet prisoners of war. As the Wehrmacht fought on, in the shorter days and longer nights, as solid roads gave way to the mud and muck of autumn rains, its soldiers had to fend for themselves. Goering's order allowed their misconceived war to continue, at the price of the starvation of millions of Soviet citizens and, of course, the deaths of millions of German and Soviet and other soldiers. Hitler's henchman Goering, in September 1941, behaved strikingly like Stalin's henchman Kaganovich had in December 1932. Both men laid down instructions for a food policy that guaranteed death for millions of people in the months that followed. Both also treated the starvation their policies brought not as a human tragedy, but as enemy agitation. Just as Karganovich had done, Goering instructed his subordinates that hunger was a weapon of the enemy, meant to elicit sympathy where harshness was needed. Stalin and Kaganovich had placed the Ukrainian party between themselves and the Ukrainian population in 1932 and 1933, forcing Ukrainian communists to bear the responsibility for grain collection and to take the blame if targets were not met. Hitler and Goering placed the Wehrmacht between themselves and the hungry Soviet population in 1941 and 1942. During the summer of 1941, some German soldiers had shared their rations with hungry Soviet civilians. A few German officers had tried to ensure that Soviet prisoners of war were fed. In autumn, this would have to cease. If German soldiers wanted to eat, they were told, they would have to starve the surrounding population. They should imagine that any food that entered the mouth of a Soviet citizen was taken from the mouth of a German child. German commanders would have to continue the war, which meant feeding soldiers, which meant starving others. This was the political logic and the moral trap. For the soldiers and the lower-level officers, there was no escape but insubordination or surrender to the enemy, 
prospects as unthinkable for German troops in 1941 as they had been for Ukrainian communists in 1932. In September 1941, the three Wehrmacht army groups, North, Center, and South, greeted the new food policy from rather different positions. Army Group North, tasked to conquer the Baltic states and northwestern Russia, had laid siege to Leningrad in September. Army Group Center raced through Belarus in August. After a long pause, in which some of its forces assisted Army Group South in the battle for Kiev, it advanced again toward Moscow in early October. Army Group South, meanwhile, made its way through Ukraine toward the Caucasus, much more slowly than anticipated. Platoons of German soldiers resembled the communist brigades of a decade before, taking as much food as they could as quickly as possible. Army Group South starved Kharkiv and Kiev, the two cities that had served as capitals of Soviet Ukraine. Kiev was taken on the 19th of September 1941, much later than planned, and after much debate about what to do with the city. Consistent with General Plan Ost, Hitler wanted the city to be demolished. The commanders on site, however, needed the bridge over the river Dnipro to continue their advance east. So in the end, German soldiers stormed the city. On the 30th of September, the occupiers banned the supply of food to Kiev. The logic was that the food in the countryside was to remain there, to be collected by the army and then later by a German civilian occupation authority. Yet the peasants around Kiev found their way into the city and even ran markets. The Germans were unable to seal the city as the Soviets had done in 1933. The Wehrmacht was not implementing the original hunger plan, but rather starving where it seemed useful to do so. The Wehrmacht never intended to starve the entire population of Kiev, only to ensure that its own needs were met. Yet this was nevertheless a policy of indifference to human life as such, and it killed perhaps as many as 50,000 people. As one Kievan recorded in December 1941, the Germans were celebrating Christmas, but the locals all move like shadows, there is total famine. In Kharkiv, a similar policy killed perhaps 20,000 people. Among them were 273 children in the city orphanage in 1942. It was near Kharkiv that starving peasant children in 1933 had eaten each other alive in a makeshift orphanage. Now city children, albeit in far smaller numbers, suffered the same kind of horrible death. Hitler's plans for Leningrad, the old capital of Imperial Russia, exceeded even Stalin's darkest fears. Leningrad lay on the Baltic Sea, closer to the Finnish capital Helsinki and the Estonian capital Tallinn than to Moscow. During the Great Terror, Stalin had made sure that Finns were targeted for one of the deadliest of the national actions, believing that Finland might one day lay claim to Leningrad. In November 1939, Stalin had ensured for himself the enmity of the Finns by attacking Finland, which was within his area of influence according to the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. In this winter war, the Finns inflicted heavy losses and damaged the reputation of the Red Army. They finally had to concede about a tenth of their territory in March 1940, giving Stalin a buffer zone around Leningrad. So, in June 1941, Hitler had a Finnish ally, since the Finns naturally wanted to retake land and take revenge in what they would call the Continuation War. But Hitler did not want to take Leningrad and give it to the Finns. He wanted to remove it from the face of the earth. Hitler wanted the population of Leningrad exterminated, the city razed to the ground, and then its territory handed over to the Finns. In September 1941, the Finnish army cut off Leningrad from the north as the Army Group North began a campaign of siege and bombardment of the city from the south. Though German commanders had not all known about Hitler's most radical plans for Soviet cities, they agreed that Leningrad had to be starved. Eduard Wagner, the quartermaster general of the German army, wrote to his wife that the inhabitants of Leningrad, all 3.5 million of them, would have to be left to their fate. They were simply too much for the army's provision packet, and sentimentality would be out of place. Mines were laid around the city to prevent escapes. The surrender of the city was not forthcoming, but had it come, it would not have been accepted. 
the German goal was to starve Leningrad out of existence. At the very beginning of the siege of Leningrad, on the 8th of September 1941, German shells destroyed the city's food warehouses and oil tanks. In October 1941, perhaps 2,500 people died of starvation and associated diseases. In November, the number reached 5,500. In December, 50,000. By the end of the siege in 1944, about one million people had lost their lives. Leningrad was not starved completely because local Soviet authority functioned within the city and distributed what bread there was, and because the Soviet leadership took risks to provision the population. Once the ice froze over Lake Ladoga, there was an escape and supply route. That winter, the temperature would fall to forty below, and the city would face the cold without food stockpiles, heat, or running water. Yet Soviet power within the city did not collapse. The NKVD continued to arrest, interrogate, and imprison. Prisoners were also dispatched across Lake Ladoga. Leningraders were among the 2.5 million or so people whom the NKVD transported to the Gulag during the war. The police and fire departments performed their duties. Dmitry Shostakovich was a volunteer for the fire brigade when he wrote the third movement of his seventh symphony. Libraries remained open, books were read, doctoral dissertations written and defended. Within the great city, Russians and others faced the same dilemmas that Ukrainians and Kazakhs and others had faced ten years before, during the collectivization famines. Wanda Zverieva, a girl in Leningrad during the siege, later remembered her mother with great love and admiration. She was a beautiful woman. I would compare her face to the Mona Lisa. Her father was a physicist with artistic inclinations who would carve wooden sculptures of Greek goddesses with his pocket knife. Late in 1941, as the family was starving, her father went to his office in the hope of finding a ration card that would allow the family to procure food. He stayed away for several days. One night, Wanda awakened to see her mother standing over her with a sickle. She struggled with and overcame her mother, or the shadow that was left of her. She gave her mother's actions the charitable interpretation that her mother wished to spare her the suffering of starvation by killing her quickly. Her father returned with food the following day, but it was too late for her mother, who died a few hours later. The family sewed her in blankets and left her in the kitchen until the ground was soft enough to bury her. It was so cold in the apartment that her body did not decompose. That spring, Wanda's father died of pneumonia. In the Leningrad of the day, such stories could be multiplied hundreds of thousands of times. Vera Kostrovitskaya was one of many Leningrad intellectuals who kept diaries to record the horrors. Of Polish origin, she had lost her husband a few years earlier in the Great Terror. Now she watched as her Russian neighbors starved. In April 1942, she recorded the fate of a stranger she saw every day. With his back to the post, a man sits on the snow, tall, wrapped in rags, over his shoulders a knapsack. He is all huddled up against the post. Apparently he was on his way to the Finland station, got tired and sat down. For two weeks, while I was going back and forth to the hospital, he sat. One, without his knapsack. Two, without his rags. Three, in his underwear. Four, naked. Five, a skeleton with ripped-out entrails. The best recalled Leningrad diary of a girl is that of eleven-year-old Tanya Savicheva, which reads in its entirety as follows. Zhenya died on December 28th at 12.30 a.m., 1941. Grandma died on January 25th, 3 p.m., 1942. Leka died on March 5th at 5 a.m., 1942. Uncle Vasya died on April 13th at 2 after midnight, 1942. Uncle Esha died on May 10th at 4 p.m., 1942. Mother died on May 13th, 7.30 a.m., 1942. Savichevs died. Everyone died. Only Tanya is left. Tanya Savicheva died in 1944. 
The greater the control the Wehrmacht exercised over a population, the more likely that population was to starve. The one place where the Wehrmacht controlled the population completely, the prisoner of war camps, was the site of death on an unprecedented scale. It was in these camps where something very much like the original hunger plan was implemented. Never in modern warfare had so many prisoners been taken so quickly. In one engagement, the Wehrmacht's army group center took 348,000 prisoners near Smolensk. In another, Army Group South took 665,000 near Kiev. In those two September victories alone, more than a million men and some women were taken prisoner. By the end of 1941, the Germans had taken about three million Soviet soldiers prisoner. This was no surprise to the Germans. The three German army groups were expected to move even faster than they did, and thus even more prisoners could have been expected. Simulations had predicted what would happen. Yet the Germans did not prepare for prisoners of war, at least not in the conventional sense. In the customary law of war, prisoners of war are given food, shelter, and medical attention, if only to ensure that the enemy does the same. Hitler wished to reverse the traditional logic. By treating Soviet soldiers horribly, he wished to ensure that German soldiers would fear the same from the Soviets, and so fight desperately to prevent themselves from falling into the hands of the enemy. It seems that he could not bear the idea of soldiers of the master race surrendering to the subhumans of the Red Army. Stalin took much the same view, that Red Army soldiers should not allow themselves to be taken alive. He could not counsel the possibility that Soviet soldiers would retreat and surrender. They were supposed to advance and kill and die. Stalin announced in August 1941 that Soviet prisoners of war would be treated as deserters and their families arrested. When Stalin's son was taken prisoner by the Germans, he had his own daughter-in-law arrested. This tyranny of the offensive in Soviet planning caused Soviet soldiers to be captured. Soviet commanders were fearful of ordering withdrawals, lest they be personally blamed, purged, and executed. Thus their soldiers held positions for too long and were encircled and taken prisoner. The policies of Hitler and Stalin conspired to turn Soviet soldiers into prisoners of war and then prisoners of war into non-people. Once they had surrendered, Soviet prisoners were shocked by the savagery of their German captors. Captured Red Army soldiers were marched in long columns, beaten horribly along the way from the field of battle to the camps. The soldiers captured at Kiev, for example, marched over four hundred kilometers in the open air. As one of them remembered, if an exhausted prisoner sat down by the side of the road, a German escort would approach on his horse and lash with his whip. The person would continue to sit with his head down. Then the escort would take a carbine from the saddle or a pistol from the holster. Prisoners who were wounded, sick, or tired were shot on the spot. Their bodies left for Soviet citizens to find and clean and bury. When the Wehrmacht transported Soviet prisoners by train, it used open freight cars, with no protection from the weather. When the trains reached their destinations, hundreds or sometimes even thousands of frozen corpses would tumble from the open doors. Death rates during transport were as high as seventy percent. Perhaps two hundred thousand prisoners died in these death marches and these death transports. All of the prisoners who arrived in the eighty or so prisoner of war camps established in the occupied Soviet Union were tired and hungry, and many were wounded or ill. Ordinarily, a prisoner of war camp is a simple facility, built by soldiers for other soldiers, but meant to preserve life. Such camps arrive in difficult conditions and in unfamiliar places, but they are constructed by people who know that their own comrades are being held as prisoners by the opposing army. German prisoner of war camps in the Soviet Union, however, were something far out of the ordinary. They were designed to end life. In principle, they were divided into three types. The Dulag, transit camp, the Stalag, base camp for enlisted men and non-commissioned officers, and the smaller Oflags, for officers. In practice, all three types of camps were often nothing more than an open field surrounded by barbed wire. Prisoners were not registered by name, though they were counted. This was an astonishing break with law and custom. Even at the German concentration camps, names were taken. 
There was only one other type of German facility where names were not taken, and it had not yet been invented. No advance provision was made for food, shelter, or medical care. There were no clinics, and very often no toilets. Usually there was no shelter from the elements. The official calorie quotients for the prisoners were far below survival levels and were often not met. In practice, only the stronger prisoners and those who had been selected as guards could be sure of getting any food at all. Soviet prisoners were at first confused by this treatment by the Wehrmacht. One of them guessed that the Germans are teaching us to behave like comrades. Unable to imagine that hunger was a policy, he guessed that the Germans wanted the Soviet prisoners to show solidarity with one another by sharing whatever food they had among themselves. Perhaps this soldier simply could not believe that, like the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany was a state that starved by policy. Ironically, the entire essence of German policy toward the prisoners was that they were not actually equal human beings, and thus certainly not fellow soldiers, and under no circumstances comrades. The guidelines of May 1941 had instructed German soldiers to remember the supposedly inhuman brutality of Russians in battle. German camp guards were informed in September that they would be punished if they used their weapons too little. In autumn 1941, the prisoners of war in all of the Dulags and Stalags went hungry. Even though Goering recognized that the hunger plan as such was impossible, the priorities of German occupation ensured that Soviet prisoners would starve. Imitating and radicalizing the policies of the Soviet Gulag, German authorities gave less food to those who could not work than to those who could, thereby hastening the deaths of the weaker. On the 21st of October 1941, those who could not work saw their official rations cut by 27 per cent. This was, for many prisoners, a purely theoretical reduction, since in many prisoner-of-war camps no one was fed on a regular basis, and in most the weaker had no regular access to food anyway. A remark of the quartermaster-general of the army, Eduard Wagner, made explicit the policy of selection. Those prisoners who could not work, he said, on the 13th of November, are to be starved. Across the camps, prisoners ate whatever they could find, grass, bark, pine needles. They had no meat unless a dog was shot. A few prisoners got horse meat on a few occasions. Prisoners fought to lick utensils, while their German guards laughed at their behavior. When the cannibalism began, the Germans presented it as the result of the low level of Soviet civilization. The drastic conditions of the war bound the Wehrmacht ever more closely to the ideology of National Socialism. To be sure, the German military had been progressively Nazified since 1933. Hitler had dismissed the threat of Röhm and his SA in 1934 and announced German rearmament and conscription in 1935. He had directed German industry towards arms production and produced a series of very real victories in 1938, Austria, Czechoslovakia, 1939, Poland, and 1940, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Belgium, and above all, France. He had had several years to choose his favorites among the higher officers and to purge those whose outlook he found too traditional. The victory in France in 1940 had brought the German military command very close to Hitler, as officers began to believe in his talent. Yet it was the lack of victory in the Soviet Union that made the Wehrmacht inseparable from the Nazi regime. In the starving Soviet Union in autumn 1941, the Wehrmacht was in a moral trap from which National Socialism seemed to offer the only escape. Any remnants of traditional soldierly ideals had to be abandoned in favor of a destructive ethic that made sense of the army's predicament. To be sure, German soldiers had to be fed, but they were eating to gain strength to fight a war that had already been lost. To be sure, calories had to be extracted from the countryside to feed them, but this brought about essentially pointless starvation. As the army high command and the officers in the field implemented illegal and murderous policies, they found no justification except for the sort that Hitler provided, that human beings were containers of calories that should be emptied, and that Slavs, Jews, and Asians, the peoples of the Soviet Union, were less than human and thus more than expendable. Like Ukrainian communists in 1933, German officers in 1941 implemented a policy of starvation. 
In both cases, many individuals had objections or reservations at first, but the groups in the end implicated themselves in the crimes of the regime, and thus subordinated themselves to the moral claims of their leaders. They became the system, as the system became catastrophe. It was the Wehrmacht that established and ran the first network of camps in Hitler's Europe, where people died in the thousands, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, and finally, the millions. Some of the most infamous prisoner of war camps were in occupied Soviet Belarus, where, by late November 1941, death rates had reached 2% per day. At Stalag 352 near Minsk, which one survivor remembered as pure hell, prisoners were packed together so tightly by barbed wire that they could scarcely move. They had to urinate and defecate where they stood. Some 109,500 people died there. At Dulag 185, Dulag 127, and Stalag 341, in the East Belarusian city Mahilau, witnesses saw mountains of unburied corpses outside the barbed wire. Some thirty to 40,000 prisoners died in these camps. At Dulag 131, at Babroisk, the camp headquarters caught fire. Thousands of prisoners burned to death, and another seventeen hundred were gunned down as they tried to escape. All in all, at least thirty thousand people died at Babrosk. At Dulag's 220 and 121 in Homel, as many as half of the prisoners had shelter in abandoned stables. The others had no shelter at all. In December 1941, death rates at these camps climbed from two hundred to four hundred to seven hundred a day. At Dulag 342 at Molodechno, conditions were so awful that prisoners submitted written petitions asking to be shot. The camps in occupied Soviet Ukraine were similar. At Stalag 306 at Kirovohad, German guards reported that prisoners ate the bodies of comrades who had been shot, sometimes before the victims were dead. Rosalia Volkovskaya, a survivor of the women's camp at Volodymyr Volinsky, had a view of what the men faced at the local Stalag 365. We women could see from above that many of the prisoners ate the corpses. At Stalag 346 in Kremenchuk, where inmates got at most 200 grams of bread per day, bodies were thrown into a pit every morning. As in Ukraine in 1933, sometimes the living were buried along with the dead. At least 20,000 people died in that camp. At Dulag 162 in Stalino, today Donetsk, at least 10,000 prisoners at a time were crushed behind barbed wire in a small camp in the center of the city. People could only stand. Only the dying would lie down, because anyone who did would be trampled. Some 25,000 perished, making room for more. Dulag 160 at Korol, southwest of Kiev, was one of the larger camps. Although the site was an abandoned brick factory, prisoners were forbidden to take shelter in its buildings. If they tried to escape there from the rain or snow, they were shot. The commandant of this camp liked to observe the spectacle of prisoners struggling for food. He would ride in on his horse amidst the crowds and crush people to death. In this and other camps near Kiev, perhaps thirty thousand prisoners died. Soviet prisoners of war were also held at dozens of facilities in occupied Poland, in the general government, which had been extended to the southeast after the invasion of the Soviet Union. Here astonished members of the Polish resistance filed reports about the massive death of Soviet prisoners in the winter of 1941-1942. Some 45,690 people died in the camps in the general government in ten days between the 21st and the 30th of October 1941. At Stalag 307 at Deblin, some 80,000 Soviet prisoners died over the course of the war. At Stalag 319 at Kselm, some 60,000 people perished. At Stalag 366 in Shedelsey, 55,000. At Stalag 325 at Zamosht, 28,000. At Stalag 316 at Shedelsey, 23,000. About half a million Soviet prisoners of war starved to death in the general government. As of the end of 1941, the largest group of mortal victims of German rule in occupied Poland was neither the native Poles nor the native Jews, but Soviet prisoners of war, who had been brought west to occupied Poland and left to freeze and starve.
Despite the recent Soviet invasion of Poland, Polish peasants often tried to feed the starving Soviet prisoners they saw. In retaliation, the Germans shot the Polish women carrying the milk jugs and destroyed whole Polish villages. Even had the Soviet prisoners all been healthy and well-fed, death rates in winter 1941-1942 would have been high. Despite what many Germans thought, Slavs had no inborn resistance to cold. Unlike the Germans, Soviet soldiers had sometimes been equipped with winter gear. This the Germans stole. The prisoners of war were usually left without shelter and without warm clothing, enduring temperatures far below freezing. As the camps were often in fields, no trees or hills broke the ruthless winter winds. Prisoners would build for themselves, by hand in the hard earth, simple dugouts where they would sleep. At Homel, three Soviet soldiers, comrades, tried to keep one another warm by sleeping in a tight group. Each would have a turn sleeping in the middle, in the best spot, taking the warmth of his friends. At least one of the three lived to tell the tale. For hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, this was the second political famine in Ukraine in the space of eight years. Many thousands of soldiers from Soviet Ukraine saw their bellies swell for the second time, or witnessed cannibalism for the second time. No doubt very many survivors of the first mass starvation died in the second one. A few Ukrainians, such as Ivan Shulinsky, managed to survive both. The son of a deported Kulak, he recalled the starvation of 1933 and told people that he came from the land of hunger. He would cheer himself in German captivity by singing a traditional Ukrainian song. If I only had wings, I would lift myself to the sky, to the clouds, where there is no pain and no punishment. As during the Soviet starvation campaign of 1933, during the German starvation camp of 1941, many local people in Ukraine did their best to help the dying. Women would identify men as relatives and thus arrange their release. Young women would marry prisoners who were on labor duty outside the camps. The Germans sometimes allowed this, since it meant that the men would be working in an area under German occupation to produce food for Germans. In the city of Kremenchuk, where the food situation seems not to have been dire, laborers from the camps would leave empty bags in the city when they went to work in the morning and recover them full of food left by passers-by in the evening. In 1941, conditions were favorable for such help, as the harvest was unusually good. Women, the reports are almost always of women, would try to feed the prisoners during the death marches or in the camps. Yet most prisoner-of-war camp commanders, most of the time, prevented civilians from approaching the camps with food. Usually such people were driven away by warning shots. Sometimes they were killed. The organization of the camps in the East revealed a contempt for life, the life of Slavs and Asians and Jews anyway, that made such mass starvation thinkable. In German prisoner-of-war camps for Red Army soldiers, the death rate over the course of the war was 57.5%. In the first eight months after Operation Barbarossa, it must have been far higher. In German prisoner-of-war camps for soldiers of the Western Allies, the death rate was less than 5%. As many Soviet prisoners of war died on a single given day in autumn 1941, as did British and American prisoners of war over the course of the entire Second World War. Just as the Soviet population could not be starved at will, the Soviet state could not be destroyed in one blow. But the Germans certainly tried. Part of the idea of the lightning victory was that the Wehrmacht would cover terrain so quickly that the soldiers and the trailing Einsatzgruppen would be able to kill Soviet political elites and Red Army political officers. The official Guidelines for the Behavior of the Troops in Russia, issued on the 19th of May 1941, demanded a crackdown on four groups, agitators, partisans, saboteurs, and Jews. The guidelines for the treatment of political commissars of the 6th of June 1941 specified that captured political officers were to be killed. In fact, local Soviet elites fled to the east, and the more elite such people were, the more likely they were to have been evacuated or to have had the resources to arrange their own escape. The country was vast, and Hitler had no ally invading on another vector who might be able to capture such people. 
German policies of mass murder could affect the Soviet leadership only in the lands that were actually conquered, Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltic states, and a very thin wedge of Russia. This was not very much of the Soviet Union, and the people in question were not of critical importance to the Soviet system. People were shot, but with only minimal consequences for the Soviet state. Most Wehrmacht units seemed to have little difficulty in obeying the Commissar order. Eighty percent of them reported having executed commissars. The military archives preserved the records of 2,252 shootings of such people by the army. The actual number was probably greater. Shooting civilians was mainly the task of the Einsatzgruppen, one that they had already performed in Poland in 1939. As in Poland, the Einsatzgruppen were assigned to murder certain political groups so that the state would collapse. Four Einsatzgruppen followed the Wehrmacht into the Soviet Union, Einsatzgruppe A following Army Group North into the Baltics toward Leningrad, Einsatzgruppe B following Army Group Center through Belarus toward Moscow, Einsatzgruppe C following Army Group South into Ukraine, and Einsatzgruppe D following the 11th Army in the extreme south of Ukraine. As Heydrich clarified in a telegram of the 2nd of July 1941, after having issued the relevant orders orally, the Einsatzgruppen were to kill communist functionaries, Jews in party and state positions, and other dangerous elements. As with the hunger plan, so with the elimination of people defined as political threats. Those in confinement were most vulnerable. By mid-July, the orders had come through to carry out mass murder by shooting in the Stalags and Dulags. On the 8th of September, 1941, Einsatz commandos were ordered to make selections of the prisoners of war, executing state and party functionaries, political commissars, intellectuals, and Jews. In October, the Army High Command gave the Einsatz commandos and the security police unrestricted access to the camps. The Einsatz commandos could not screen the Soviet prisoners of war very carefully. They would interrogate Soviet prisoners of war in their holding pens immediately after they were taken. They would ask commissars, communists, and Jews to step forward. Then they would take them away, shoot them, and throw them into pits. They had few interpreters, and these tended to remember the selections as being somewhat random. The Germans had imprecise notions of the ranks and insignia of the Red Army, and initially mistook buglers for political officers. They knew that officers were allowed to wear their hair longer than enlisted men, but this was an uncertain indicator. It had been some time since most of these men had seen a barber. The only group that could easily be identified at this point were male Jews. German guards examined penises for circumcision. Very occasionally, Jews survived by claiming to be circumcised Muslims. More often, circumcised Muslims were shot as Jews. German doctors seemed to have collaborated willingly in this procedure. Medicine was a highly Nazified profession. As a doctor at the camp at Coral recalled, for every officer and soldier it was, in those times, the most natural thing that every Jew was shot to death. At least 50,000 Soviet Jews were shot after selection, and about 50,000 non-Jews as well. The German prisoner of war camps in the East were far deadlier than the German concentration camps. Indeed, the existing concentration camps changed their character upon contact with prisoners of war. Dachau, Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen, Mauthausen, and Auschwitz became, as the SS used them to execute Soviet prisoners of war, killing facilities. Some 8,000 Soviet prisoners were executed at Auschwitz, 10,000 at Mauthausen, 18,000 at Sachsenhausen. At Buchenwald, in November 1941, the SS arranged a method of mass murder of Soviet prisoners that strikingly resembled Soviet methods in the Great Terror, although exhibiting greater duplicity and sophistication. Prisoners were led into a room in the middle of a stable, where the surroundings were rather loud. They found themselves in what seemed to be a clinical examination room, surrounded by men in white coats, SS men pretending to be doctors. They would have the prisoner stand against a wall at a certain place, supposedly to measure his height. Running through the wall was a vertical slit, which the prisoner's neck would cover. In an adjoining room was another SS man with a pistol. When he saw the neck through the slit, he would fire. The corpse would then be thrown into a third room, the examination room, be quickly cleaned, 
and the next prisoner invited inside. Batches of thirty-five to forty corpses would be taken by truck to a crematorium, a technical advance over Soviet practices. The Germans shot, on a conservative estimate, half a million Soviet prisoners of war. By way of starvation or mistreatment during transit, they killed about 2.6 million more. All in all, perhaps 3.1 million Soviet prisoners of war were killed. The brutality did not bring down the Soviet order. If anything, it strengthened Soviet morale. The screening of political officers, communists, and Jews was pointless. Killing such people already in captivity did not much weaken the Soviet state. In fact, the policies of starvation and screening stiffened the resistance of the Red Army. If soldiers knew that they would starve in agony as German captives, they were certainly more likely to fight. If communists and Jews and political officers knew that they would be shot, they too had little reason to give in. As knowledge of German policies spread, Soviet citizens began to think that Soviet power was perhaps the preferable alternative. As the war continued into November 1941, and more and more German soldiers died at the front and had to be replaced by conscripts from Germany, Hitler and Goering realized that some prisoners of war would be needed as labor inside the Reich. On the 7th of November, Goering gave the order for positive selections for labor. By the end of the war, more than a million Soviet prisoners of war were working in Germany. Mistreatment and hunger were not easily overcome. As a sympathetic German observer noted, of the millions of prisoners, only a few thousand are capable of work. Unbelievably, many of them have died, many have typhus, and the rest are so weak and wretched that they are in no condition to work. Some 400,000 prisoners sent to Germany died. By the terms of the German plans, the invasion of the Soviet Union was an utter fiasco. Operation Barbarossa was supposed to bring a lightning victory. In late autumn 1941, no victory was in sight. The invasion of the Soviet Union was supposed to resolve all economic problems, which it did not. In the end, occupied Belgium, for example, was of greater economic value to Nazi Germany. The Soviet population was supposed to be cleared. In the event, the most important economic input from the Soviet Union was labor. The conquered Soviet Union was also supposed to provide the space for a final solution to what the Nazis regarded as the Jewish problem. Jews were supposed to be worked to death in the Soviet Union, or sent across the Ural Mountains, or exiled to the Gulag. The Soviet Union's self-defense in summer 1941 had made yet another iteration of the final solution impossible. By late 1941, the Nazi leadership had already considered, and been forced to abandon, four distinct versions of the final solution. The Lublin plan for a reservation in eastern Poland failed by November 1939 because the general government was too close and too complicated. The consensual Soviet plan by February 1940 because Stalin was not interested in Jewish emigration. The Madagascar plan by August 1940, because first Poland and then Britain fought instead of cooperating. And now the coercive Soviet plan by November 1941, because the Germans had not destroyed the Soviet state. Though the invasion of the USSR provided no solution, it certainly exacerbated the Jewish problem. Germany's eastern zone of conquest was now essentially identical with the part of the world most densely inhabited by Jews. In occupying Poland, the Baltics, and the Western Soviet Union, the Germans had taken control of the most important traditional homeland of European Jews. About five million Jews now lived under German rule. With the exception of the late Russian Empire, no polity in history had ever ruled so many Jews as Germany did in 1941. The fate of some of the Soviet prisoners who were released from camps in the East suggested what was to come for the Jews. At Auschwitz, in early September 1941, hundreds of Soviet prisoners were gassed with hydrogen cyanide, a pesticide, trade name Zyklon B, that had been used previously to fumigate the barracks of the Polish prisoners in the camp. Later, about a million Jews would be asphyxiated by Zyklon B at Auschwitz. At about the same time, other Soviet prisoners of war were used to test a gas van at Sachsenhausen. 
It pumped its own exhaust into its hold, thereby asphyxiating by carbon monoxide the people locked inside. That same autumn, gas vans would be used to kill Jews in occupied Soviet Belarus and occupied Soviet Ukraine. As of December 1941, carbon monoxide would also be used in a parked gas van at Kselno to kill Polish Jews in lands annexed to Germany. From among the terrorized and starving population of the prisoner of war camps, the Germans recruited no fewer than a million men for duties with the army and the police. At first, the idea was that they would help the Germans to control the territory of the Soviet Union after its government fell. When that did not happen, these Soviet citizens were assigned to assist in the mass crimes that Hitler and his associates pursued on occupied territory as the war continued. Many former prisoners were given shovels and ordered to dig trenches, over which the Germans would shoot Jews. Others were recruited for police formations, which were used to hunt down Jews. Some prisoners were sent to a training camp in Travniki, where they learned to be guards. These Soviet citizens and war veterans, retrained to serve Nazi Germany, would spend 1942 in three death facilities in occupied Poland, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Biozhets, where more than a million Polish Jews would be gassed. Thus, some of the survivors of one German killing policy became accomplices in another, as a war to destroy the Soviet Union became a war to murder the Jews. Chapter 6 Final Solution Hitler's utopias crumbled upon contact with the Soviet Union, but they were refashioned rather than rejected. He was the leader, and his henchmen owed their positions to their ability to divine and realize his will. When that will met resistance, as on the Eastern Front in the second half of 1941, the task of men such as Goering, Himmler, and Heydrich was to rearrange Hitler's ideas such that Hitler's genius was affirmed, along with their own positions in the Nazi regime. The utopias in summer 1941 had been four, a lightning victory that would destroy the Soviet Union in weeks, a hunger plan that would starve 30 million people in months, a final solution that would eliminate European Jews after the war, and a Generalplan Ost that would make of the Western Soviet Union a German colony. Six months after Operation Barbarossa was launched, Hitler had reformulated the war aims such that the physical extermination of the Jews became the priority. By then, his closest associates had taken the ideological and administrative initiatives necessary to realize such a wish. No lightning victory came. Although millions of Soviet citizens were starved, the hunger plan proved impossible. General Plan Ost, or any variant of post-war colonization plans, would have to wait. As these utopias waned, political futures depended upon the extraction of what was feasible from the fantasies. Goering, Himmler, and Heydrich scrambled amidst the moving ruins, claiming what they could. Goering, charged with economics and a hunger plan, fared worst. Regarded as the second man in the Reich and as Hitler's successor, Goering remained immensely prominent in Germany, but played an ever smaller role in the East. As economics became less a matter of grand planning for the post-war period and more a matter of improvising to continue the war, Goering lost his leading position to Albert Speer. Unlike Goering, Heydrich and Himmler were able to turn the unfavorable battlefield situation to their advantage by reformulating the final solution so that it could be carried out during a war that was not going according to plan. They understood that the war was becoming, as Hitler began to say in August 1941, a war against the Jews. Himmler and Heydrich saw the elimination of the Jews as their task. On the 31st of July 1941, Heydrich secured the formal authority from Goering to formulate the final solution. This still involved the coordination of prior deportation schemes with Heydrich's plan of working the Jews to death in the conquered Soviet East. By November 1941, when Heydrich tried to schedule a meeting at Wannsee to coordinate the final solution, he still had such a vision in mind. Jews who could not work would be made to disappear. Jews capable of physical labor would work somewhere in the conquered Soviet Union until they died. Heydrich represented a broad consensus in the German government, though his was not an especially timely plan. 
The Ministry for the East, which oversaw the civilian occupation authorities established in September, took for granted that the Jews would disappear. Its head, Alfred Rosenberg, spoke in November of the biological eradication of Jewry in Europe. This would be achieved by sending the Jews across the Ural Mountains, Europe's eastern boundary. But by November 1941, a certain vagueness had descended upon Heydrich's vision of enslavement and deportation, since Germany had not destroyed the Soviet Union and Stalin still controlled the vast majority of its territory. While Heydrich made bureaucratic arrangements in Berlin, it was Himmler who most ably extracted the practical and the prestigious from Hitler's utopian thinking. From the hunger plan, he took the categories of surplus populations and useless eaters, and would offer the Jews as the people from whom calories could be spared. From the lightning victory, he extracted the four Einsatzgruppen. Their task had been to kill Soviet elites in order to hasten the Soviet collapse. Their first mission had not been to kill all Jews as such. The Einsatzgruppen had no such order when the invasion began, and their numbers were too small but they had experience killing civilians, and they could find local help, and they could be reinforced. From General Plan Ost, Himmler extracted the battalions of order police and thousands of local collaborators, whose preliminary assignment was to help control the conquered Soviet Union. Instead, they provided the manpower that allowed the Germans to carry out truly massive shootings of Jews beginning in August 1941. These institutions, supported by the Wehrmacht and its field police, allowed the Germans to murder about a million Jews east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line by the end of the year. Himmler succeeded because he grasped extremes of the Nazi utopias that operated within Hitler's mind, even as Hitler's will faced the most determined resistance from the world outside. Himmler made the final solution more radical by bringing it forward from the post-war period to the war itself and by showing, after the failure of four previous deportation schemes, how it could be achieved by the mass shooting of Jewish civilians. His prestige suffered little from the failures of the Lightning Victory and the Hunger Plan, which were the responsibility of the Wehrmacht and the economic authorities. Even as he moved the final solution into the realm of the realizable, he still nurtured the dream of the General Plan Ost, Hitler's Garden of Eden. He continued to order revisions of the plan, and arranged an experimental deportation in the Lublin district of the general government, and would, as opportunities presented themselves, urge Hitler to raise cities. In the summer and autumn of 1941, Himmler ignored what was impossible, pondered what was most glorious, and did what could be done. Kill the Jews east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, in occupied eastern Poland, the Baltic States, and the Soviet Union. Aided by this realization of Nazi doctrine during the months when German power was challenged, Himmler and the SS would come to overshadow civilian and military authorities in the occupied Soviet Union and in the German Empire. As Himmler put it, the East belongs to the SS. The East, until very recently, had belonged to the NKVD, one secret of Himmler's success was that he was able to exploit the legacy of Soviet power in the places where it had most recently been installed. In the first lands that German soldiers reached in Operation Barbarossa, they were the world's second occupier. The first German gains in summer 1941 were the territories Germans had granted to the Soviets by the Treaty on Borders and Friendship of September 1939. What had been eastern Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, annexed in the meantime to the Soviet Union. In other words, in Operation Barbarossa, German troops first entered lands that had been independent states through 1939 or 1940, and only then entered the pre-war Soviet Union. Their Romanian ally, meanwhile, conquered the territories that it had lost to the Soviet Union in 1940. The double occupation, first Soviet, then German, made the experience of the inhabitants of these lands all the more complicated and dangerous. A single occupation can fracture a society for generations. Double occupation is even more painful and divisive. It created risks and temptations that were unknown in the West. The departure of one foreign ruler meant nothing more than the arrival of another. When foreign troops left, people had to reckon not with peace, but with the policies of the next occupier. 
They had to deal with the consequences of their own previous commitments under one occupier when the next one came, or make choices under one occupation while anticipating another. For different groups, these alternations could have different meanings. Gentile Lithuanians, for example, could experience the departure of the Soviets in 1941 as a liberation. Jews could not see the arrival of the Germans that way. Lithuania had already undergone two major transformations by the time that German troops arrived in late June 1941. Lithuania, while still an independent state, had appeared to benefit from the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of August 1939. The Treaty on Borders and Friendship of September 1939 had granted Lithuania to the Soviets, but Lithuanians had no way of knowing that. What the Lithuanian leadership perceived that month was something else. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union destroyed Poland, which throughout the interwar period had been Lithuania's adversary. The Lithuanian government had considered Vilnius a city in interwar Poland as its capital. Lithuania, without taking part in any hostilities in September 1939, gained Polish lands for itself. In October 1939, the Soviet Union granted Lithuania Vilnius and the surrounding regions, 2,750 square miles, 457,500 people. The price of Vilnius and other formerly Polish territories was basing rights for Soviet soldiers. Then, just half a year after Lithuania had been enlarged, thanks to Stalin, it was conquered by its seeming Soviet benefactor. In June 1940, Stalin seized control of Lithuania and the other Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, and hastily incorporated them into the Soviet Union. After this annexation, the Soviet Union deported about 21,000 people from Lithuania, including many Lithuanian elites. A Lithuanian Prime Minister and a Lithuanian Foreign Minister were among the exiled thousands. Some Lithuanian political and military leaders escaped the Gulag by fleeing to Germany. These were often people with some prior connections in Berlin, and always people embittered by their experience with Soviet aggression. The Germans favoured the right-wing nationalists among the Lithuanian émigrés, and trained some of them to take part in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Thus. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, Lithuania occupied a unique position. It had profited from the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, then it had been conquered by the Soviets, now it would be occupied by the Germans. After the ruthless year of Soviet occupation, many Lithuanians welcomed this change. Few Lithuanian Jews were among them. Two hundred thousand Jews lived in Lithuania in June 1941, about the same number as in Germany. The Germans arrived in Lithuania with their hand-picked nationalist Lithuanians and encountered local people who were willing to believe, or act as if they believed, that Jews were responsible for Soviet repressions. The Soviet deportations had taken place that very month, and the NKVD had shot Lithuanians in prisons just a few days before the Germans arrived. The Lithuanian diplomat Kazi Skirpa, who returned with the Germans, used this suffering in his radio broadcasts to spur mobs to murder. Some 2,500 Jews were killed by Lithuanians in bloody pogroms in early July. As a result of trained collaboration and local assistance, German killers had all the help that they needed in Lithuania. The initial guidelines for killing Jews in certain positions were quickly exceeded by Einsatzgruppe A and the local collaborators it enlisted. Einsatzgruppe A had followed Army Group North into Lithuania. Einsatzkommando 3 of Einsatzgruppe A, responsible for the major Lithuanian city of Kaunas, had as many helpers as it needed. Einsatzkommando 3 numbered only 139 personnel, including secretaries and drivers, of which there were 44. In the weeks and months to come, Germans drove Lithuanians to killing sites around the city of Kaunas. By the 4th of July 1941, Lithuanian units were killing Jews under German supervision and orders. As early as the 1st of December, Einsatzkommando II considered the Jewish problem in Lithuania resolved. It could report the killing of 133,346 persons, of whom some 114,856 were Jews. Despite Skirpa's wishes, none of this served any Lithuanian political purpose. 
After he tried to declare an independent Lithuanian state, he was placed under house arrest. The city of Vilnius had been the northeastern metropolitan center of independent Poland and briefly the capital of independent and Soviet Lithuania. But throughout all of these vicissitudes, and indeed for the previous half-millennium, Vilnius had been something else, a center of Jewish civilization, known as the Jerusalem of the North. Some seventy thousand Jews lived in the city when the war began. Whereas the rest of Lithuania and the other Baltic states were covered by Einsatzgruppe A, the Vilnius area, along with Soviet Belarus, fell to Einsatzgruppe B. The unit assigned to kill the Vilnius Jews was its Einsatzkommando 9. Here the shooting took place at the Ponari Forest, just beyond the city. By the 23rd of July 1941, the Germans had assembled a Lithuanian auxiliary, which marched columns of Jews to Ponari. There, groups of twelve to twenty people at a time were taken to the edge of a pit, where they had to hand over valuables and clothes. Their gold teeth were removed by force. Some seventy-two thousand Jews from Vilnius and elsewhere, and about eight thousand non-Jewish Poles and Lithuanians were shot at Ponari. Ita Stras was one of the very few survivors among the Jews of Vilnius. She was pulled by Lithuanian policemen to a pit that was already full of corpses. Nineteen years old at the time, she thought, this is the end, and what have I seen of life? The shots missed her, but she fell from fear into the pit. She was then covered by the corpses of the people who came after. Someone marched over the pile and fired downward to make sure that everyone was dead. A bullet hit her hand, but she made no sound. She crept away later. I was barefoot. I walked and walked over corpses. There seemed to be no end to it. Neighboring Latvia, too, had been annexed by the Soviet Union just one year before the German invasion. Some twenty-one thousand Latvian citizens, many of them Latvian Jews, were deported by the Soviets just weeks before the Germans arrived. The NKVD shot Latvian prisoners as the Wehrmacht approached Riga. The Germans' main collaborator here was Viktor Arash, a Latvian nationalist, German on his mother's side, who happened to know the translator that German police forces brought to Riga. He was allowed to form the Arash Commando, which in early July 1941 burned Jews alive in a Riga synagogue. As the Germans organized mass killings, they took care to choose Latvian shooters from among those whose families had suffered under Soviet rule. In July, under the supervision of Einsatzgruppe A commanders, the Arash Commando marched Riga Jews to the nearby Bikanieki forest and shot them. The Germans first carried out a demonstration shooting, and then had the Arash Commando do much of the rest. With the assistance of such Latvians, the Germans were able to kill at least 69,750 of the country's 80,000 Jews by the end of 1941. In the Third Baltic State, Estonia, the sense of humiliation after the Soviet occupation was just as great as in Lithuania and Latvia, if not greater. Unlike Vilnius and Riga, Tallinn had not even partially mobilized its army before surrendering to the Soviets in 1940. It had yielded to Soviet demands before the other Baltic states, thus precluding any sort of Baltic diplomatic solidarity. The Soviets had deported some 11,200 Estonians, including most of the political leadership. In Estonia, too, Einsatzgruppe A found more than enough local collaborators. Estonians who had resisted the Soviets in the forests now joined a self-defense commando under the guidance of the Germans. Estonians who had collaborated with the Soviets also joined, in an effort to restore their reputations. Estonians greeted the Germans as liberators, and in return the Germans regarded Estonians as racially superior not only to the Jews, but to the other Baltic peoples. Jews in Estonia were very few. Estonians from the Self-Defense Commando killed all 963 Estonian Jews who could be found at German orders. In Estonia, the murders and pogroms continued without the Jews. About 5,000 non-Jewish Estonians were killed for their ostensible collaboration with the Soviet regime. East of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Germans encountered the fresh traces of Soviet state-building as they began to build their own empire. 
The signs were even starker in what had been eastern Poland than in the Baltics. Whereas Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania had been incorporated by the Soviet Union a year before the German invasion, in June 1940, eastern Poland had been annexed by the Soviets nine months before that, in September 1939. Here the Germans found evidence of a social transformation. Industry had been nationalized, some farms had been collectivized, and a native elite had been all but destroyed. The Soviets had deported more than 300,000 Polish citizens and shot tens of thousands more. The German invasion prompted the NKVD to shoot some 9,817 imprisoned Polish citizens rather than allow them to fall into German hands. The Germans arrived in the Western Soviet Union in summer 1941 to find NKVD prisons full of fresh corpses. These had to be cleared out before the Germans could use them for their own purposes. Soviet mass murder provided the Germans with an occasion for propaganda. The Nazi line was that suffering under the Soviets was the fault of the Jews, and it found some resonance. With or without German agitation, many people in interwar Europe associated the Jews with communism. Interwar communist parties had, in fact, been heavily Jewish, especially in their leaderships, a fact upon which much of the press throughout Europe had commented for twenty years. Right-wing parties confused the issue by arguing that since many communists were Jews, therefore many Jews were communists. These are very different propositions. The latter one was never true anywhere. Jews were blamed even before the war for the failings of national states. After the war began and national states collapsed during the Soviet or German invasion, the temptation for such scapegoating was all the greater. Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, and Poles had lost not only the independent states made for their nations, but their status and local authority. They had surrendered all of this, in many cases without putting up much of a fight. Nazi propaganda thus had a double appeal. It was no shame to lose to the Soviet communists, since they were backed by a powerful worldwide Jewish conspiracy. But since the Jews were ultimately to blame for communism, it was right to kill them now. In an arc that extended southward from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, the last week of June and the first weeks of July 1941 brought violence against Jews. In Lithuania and Latvia, where the Germans could bring local nationalists with them and could pose at least for a moment as a liberator of whole states, the resonance of propaganda was greater and local participation more notable. In some important places in what had been eastern Poland, such as Bialystok, the Germans carried out large-scale killings with their own forces, thereby setting a kind of example. Bialystok, just east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, had been a city in northeastern Poland, then in Soviet Belarus. Immediately after it was taken by the Wehrmacht on the 27th of June, Order Police Battalion 309 began to plunder and kill civilians. German policemen killed about three hundred Jews and left the bodies lying around the city. Then they drove several hundred more Jews into the synagogue and set it on fire, shooting those who tried to escape. In the two weeks that followed, local Poles took part in some thirty pogroms in the Bialystok region. Meanwhile, Himmler journeyed to Bialystok, where he gave instructions that Jews were to be treated as partisans. The order police took a thousand Jewish men from Bialystok to its outskirts and shot them between the 8th and the 11th of July. Further south, in what had been eastern Poland, in regions where Ukrainians were a majority, Germans appealed to Ukrainian nationalism. Here the Germans blamed the Jews for Soviet oppression of Ukrainians. In Kremenets, where more than a hundred prisoners were found murdered, some 130 Jews were killed in a pogrom. In Lutsk, where some 2,800 prisoners were found machine-gunned, the Germans killed 2,000 Jews, and called this revenge for the wrongs done to Ukrainians by Jewish communists. In Lviv, where about 2,500 prisoners were found dead in the NKVD prison, Einsatzgruppe C and local militia organized a pogrom that lasted for days. The Germans presented these people as Ukrainian victims of Jewish secret policemen. In fact, some of the victims were Poles and Jews, and most of the secret policemen were probably Russians and Ukrainians. The diary of a man belonging to another of the Einsatzgruppen recorded the scene on the 5th of July, 1941. Hundreds of Jews are running down the street with faces covered with blood, holes in their heads, and eyes hanging out. 
In the first few days of the war, local militias, with and without various kinds of German aid and encouragement, killed and instigated others to kill about 19,655 Jews in pogroms. Political calculation and local suffering do not entirely explain the participation in these pogroms. Violence against Jews served to bring the Germans and elements of the local non-Jewish population closer together. Anger was directed, as the Germans wished, toward the Jews, rather than against collaborators with the Soviet regime as such. People who reacted to the Germans' urging knew that they were pleasing their new masters, whether or not they believed that the Jews were responsible for their own woes. By their actions, they were confirming the Nazi world view. The act of killing Jews as revenge for NKVD executions confirmed the Nazi understanding of the Soviet Union as a Jewish state. Violence against Jews also allowed local Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Belarusians and Poles, who had themselves cooperated with the Soviet regime, to escape any such taint. The idea that only Jews served communists was convenient, not just for the occupiers, but for some of the occupied as well. Yet this psychic Nazification would have been much more difficult without the palpable evidence of Soviet atrocities. The pogroms took place where the Soviets had recently arrived and where Soviet power was recently installed, where for the previous months Soviet organs of coercion had organized arrests, executions and deportations. They were a joint production, a Nazi edition of a Soviet text. The encounter with Soviet violence east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line served the SS and its leaders. Himmler and Heydrich had always maintained that life was a clash of ideologies, and that traditional European understandings of the rule of law had to give way to the ruthless violence needed to destroy the racial and ideological enemy in the East. The traditional enforcers of German law, the police, had to become ideological soldiers. Thus, before the war, Himmler and Heydrich had purged the ranks of the police of men deemed unreliable encouraged policemen to join the SS, and placed the SS and the security police, order police plus Gestapo, under a single structure of command. Their goal was to create a unified force dedicated to preemptive racial warfare. By the time of the invasion of the Soviet Union, about a third of German policemen with officer rank belonged to the SS, and about two-thirds belonged to the National Socialist Party. The German surprise attack had caught the NKVD off guard and made the East appear to be a domain of lawlessness primed for a new German order. The NKVD, usually discreet, had been revealed as the murderer of prisoners. Germans broke through the levels of mystification, secrecy and dissimulation that had covered the far greater Soviet crimes of 1937-1938 and 1930-1933. The Germans, along with their allies, were the only power ever to penetrate the territory of the Soviet Union in this way, and so the only people in a position to present such direct evidence of Stalinist murder. Because it was the Germans who discovered these crimes, the prison murders were politics before they were history. Fact, used as propaganda, is all but impossible to disentangle from the politics of its original transmission. Because of the visible record of Soviet violence, German forces of order could present themselves as undoing Soviet crimes, even as they engaged in crimes of their own. In light of their indoctrination, what Germans found in the doubly occupied lands made a certain kind of sense to them. It seemed to be a confirmation of what they had been trained and prepared to see. Soviet criminality supposedly steered by and for the benefit of Jews. Soviet atrocities would help German SS men, policemen and soldiers justify to themselves the policies to which they were soon summoned, the murder of Jewish women and children. Yet the prison shootings, significant as they were to the local people who suffered Soviet criminality, were for Nazi leaders rather catalyst than cause. In July 1941, Himmler was eager to show his master Hitler that he was attuned to the darker side of National Socialism and ready to pursue policies of absolute ruthlessness. His SS and police were in competition for authority in the new eastern colonies with military and civilian occupation authorities. He was also in a personal contest for Hitler's favor with Goering, whose plans for economic expansion lost credibility as the war proceeded. 
Himmler would demonstrate that shooting was easier than starvation, deportation, and slavery. As Reich Commissar for the Strengthening of Germandom, Himmler's authority as Chief of Racial Affairs extended only to conquered Poland, not to the conquered Soviet Union. But as German forces moved into the pre-war Soviet Union, Himmler behaved as if it did, using his power as head of the police and the SS to begin a policy of racial transformation that depended upon mortal violence. In July 1941, Himmler travelled personally through the Western Soviet Union to pass on the new line. Jewish women and children should be killed along with Jewish men. The forces on the ground reacted immediately. Einsatzgruppe C, which had followed army groups south into Ukraine, had been slower than Einsatzgruppe A, the Baltic States, and Einsatzgruppe B, Vilnius and Belarus, to undertake mass shootings of Jews as such. But then, at Himmler's instigation, Einsatzgruppe C killed some 60,000 Jews in August and September. These were organized shootings, not pogroms. Indeed, Einsatzkommando 5 of Einsatzgruppe C complained on the 21st of July that a pogrom by local Ukrainians and German soldiers hindered them from shooting the Jews of Oman. In the next two days, however, Einsatzkommando 5 did shoot about 1,400 Oman Jews, sparing a few Jewish women who were to take gravestones from the Jewish cemetery and use them to build a road. Einsatzkommando 6 of Einsatzgruppe C seems not to have killed women and children until a personal inspection by Himmler. The killing of women and children was a psychological barrier, one that Himmler made sure to break. Even as the Einsatzgruppen were generally killing only Jewish men, Himmler sent units of his Waffen-SS, the combat troops of the SS, to kill entire communities, including the women and children. On the 17th of July 1941, Hitler instructed Himmler to pacify the occupied territories. Two days later, Himmler dispatched the SS Cavalry Brigade to the marshy Polesia region between Ukraine and Belarus, with a direct order to shoot Jewish men and to drive the Jewish women into the swamps. Himmler couched his instructions in the language of partisan warfare. But by the 1st of August, the commander of the cavalry brigade was clarifying that not one male Jew is to be left alive, not one remnant family in the villages. Quickly the Waffen-SS understood Himmler's intentions and helped to spread his message. By the 13th of August, 13,788 Jewish men, women and children had been murdered. Himmler also sent the 1st Infantry SS Brigade to aid the Einsatzgruppen and police forces in Ukraine. Over the course of 1941, Waffen-SS formations killed more than 50,000 Jews east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line. Himmler made sure that the Einsatzgruppen were sufficiently reinforced to kill all the Jews that they found. From August 1941 forward, 12 battalions of the Order Police would provide most of the German manpower for killing actions. The Order Police were supposed to be deployed throughout the conquered Soviet Union. Since the military campaign went more slowly than expected, they were available in larger than expected numbers in the occupied rear areas. By August, the manpower available for mass murder east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line had reached about 20,000. By this time, Himmler seems to have authorized the practice, already widespread, of recruiting local policemen to assist in the shooting. Lithuanians, Latvians and Estonians had taken part in the shooting almost from the beginning. By the end of 1941, tens of thousands of Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians and Tatars had also been recruited to local police forces. Ethnic Germans in the Soviet Union were most desired and took a prominent part in the killings of Jews. With the order police and the local recruits, there was manpower enough for the extermination of the Jews of the occupied Soviet Union. Himmler took the initiative, directed the murders, and organized the coercive bureaucracy. Enjoying the confidence of Hitler, Himmler was able to arrange the institutions of the police to his liking. He extended the institution of higher SS and police leaders to the occupied Soviet Union. In Germany itself, the higher SS and police leaders had proven to be little more than another layer of administration. In the East, they became what Himmler had always wanted them to be, his personal representatives, a crucial stage in a simplified hierarchy of coercive police power. A higher SS and police leader was assigned to army groups north, centre and south, 
while a fourth was held ready for an advance into the Caucasus. These men were theoretically subordinate to the civilian occupation authorities, Reichskommissariat Ostland in the north, Reichskommissariat Ukraine in the south, established in September 1941. In fact, the higher SS and police leaders reported to Himmler. They understood that to kill Jews was to fulfill his desires. At Bletchley Park, where the British were decoding German communications, it became clear that the higher SS and police leaders stand somewhat in competition with each other as to their scores. In late August 1941, the coordination of the German forces was on display at the mass shooting of Jews in the southwest Ukrainian city of Kamianets Podilsky. Here the war itself had created a problem of Jewish refugees. Hungary, a German ally, had been allowed to annex Subcarpathian Ruthenia, the far eastern district of Czechoslovakia. Rather than grant the native Jews of this region Hungarian citizenship, Hungary expelled stateless Jews to the east, to German-occupied Ukraine. The influx of Jews into a German-controlled territory strained limited resources. Friedrich Jekeln, the higher SS and police leader for the area, took the initiative, likely so that he could report a success to Himmler at a meeting on the 12th of August. He flew in personally to make arrangements. The Germans chose a site outside Kamianets Podilsky and forced Jewish refugees and some local Jews to march there. The Jews were shot in pits by Order Police Battalion 320 and Yekelm's personal staff company. Some 23,600 Jews were killed in the course of four days, from the 26th to the 29th of August. Yekelm reported the number by radio to Himmler. This was by far the largest massacre yet carried out by the Germans, and it set a pattern for those to follow. The Wehrmacht aided and abetted such shooting operations, and sometimes requested them. By late August 1941, nine weeks into the war, the Wehrmacht had serious concerns about food supplies and the security of the rear. Murdering Jews would free up food and, according to Nazi logic, prevent partisan uprisings. After the mass shooting at Kamianets Podilsky, the Wehrmacht systematically cooperated with the Einsatzgruppen and the police forces in the destruction of Jewish communities. When a town or a city was taken, the police, if present, would round up some of the Jewish men and shoot them. The army would register the surviving population, noting the Jews. Then the Wehrmacht and the police would negotiate over how many of the remaining Jews could be killed and how many should be left alive as a labor force in a ghetto. After this selection, the police would proceed to a second mass shooting, with the army often providing trucks, ammunition, and guards. If the police were not present, the army would register Jews and organized forced labor itself. The police would arrange the killings later. As central directives became clearer and these protocols of cooperation were established, death tolls among Jews in occupied Soviet Ukraine roughly doubled from July to August 1941, and then again from August to September. In Kiev, in September 1941, a further confrontation with the remnants of Soviet power provided the pretext for the next escalation, the first attempt to murder all of the native Jews present in a large city. On the 19th of September 1941, the Wehrmacht's Army Group South took Kiev, several weeks behind schedule and with the help of Army Group Center. On the 24th of September, a series of bombs and mines exploded, destroying the buildings in central Kiev where the Germans had established offices of their occupation regime. Some of these explosives were on timers set before Soviet forces withdrew from the city, but some seemed to have been detonated by NKVD men who remained in Kiev. As the Germans pulled their dead and wounded from the rubble, the city suddenly seemed unsafe. As a local remembered, the Germans stopped smiling. They had to try to govern the metropolis with a very small number of people, dozens of whom had just been killed, even as they prepared a continued eastward march. The Germans had a clear ideological line to follow. If the NKVD was guilty, the Jews must be blamed. At a meeting on the 26th of September, military authorities agreed with representatives of the police and SS that the mass murder of Kiev Jews would be the appropriate reprisal for the bombing. Although most of the Jews of Kiev had fled before the Germans took the city, tens of thousands remained. They were all to be killed. 
this information was the key to the entire operation. A Wehrmacht propaganda crew printed broadsheet notices that ordered the Jews of Kiev to appear on pain of death at a street corner in a westerly neighborhood of the city. In what would become the standard lie of such mass shooting actions, the Jews were told that they were being resettled. They should thus bring along their documents, money, and valuables. On the 29th of September 1941, most of the remaining Jewish community of Kiev did indeed appear at the appointed location. Some Jews told themselves that since Yom Kippur, the highest Jewish holiday, was the following day, they could not possibly be hurt. Many arrived before dawn, in the hopes of getting good seats on the resettlement train, which did not exist. People packed for a long journey, old women wearing strings of onions around their necks for food. Having been assembled, the more than thirty thousand people walked, as instructed, along Melnik Street in the direction of the Jewish cemetery. Observers from nearby apartments recalled an endless row that was overflowing the entire street and the sidewalks. The Germans had erected a roadblock near the gates of the Jewish cemetery, where documents were verified and non-Jews told to return home. From this point forward, the Jews were escorted by Germans with automatic weapons and dogs. At the checkpoint, if no earlier, many of the Jews must have wondered what their true fate would be. Dina Pronicheva, a woman of thirty, walked ahead of her family to a point where she could hear gunshots. Immediately all was clear to her. But she chose not to tell her parents so as not to worry them. Instead, she walked along with her mother and father until she reached the tables where the Germans demanded valuables and clothes. A German had already taken her mother's wedding ring when Pronicheva realized that her mother, no less than she, understood what was happening. Yet only when her mother whispered sharply to her, You don't look like a Jew, did she try to escape. Such plain communication is rare in such situations when the human mind labors to deny what is actually happening and the human spirit strives toward imitation, subordination, and thus extinction. Pronicheva, who had a Russian husband and thus a Russian surname, told a German at a nearby table that she was not Jewish. He told her to wait at one side until the work of the day was complete. Thus Dina Pronicheva saw what became of her parents, her sister, and the Jews of Kiev. Having surrendered their valuables and documents, people were forced to strip naked. Then they were driven by threats or by shots fired overhead, in groups of about ten, to the edge of a ravine known as Babi Yar. Many of them were beaten. Pronicheva remembered that people were already bloody as they went to be shot. They had to lie down on their stomachs, on the corpses already beneath them, and wait for the shots to come from above and behind. Then would come the next group. Jews came and died for thirty-six hours. People were perhaps alike in dying and in death, but each of them was different until that final moment. Each had different preoccupations and presentiments, until all was clear and then all was black. Some people died thinking about others rather than themselves, such as the mother of the beautiful fifteen-year-old girl Sarah, who begged to be killed at the same time as her daughter. Here there was, even at the end, a thought and a care, that if she saw her daughter shot, she would not see her raped. One naked mother spent what she must have known were her last few seconds of life breastfeeding her baby. When the baby was thrown alive into the ravine, she jumped in after it, and in that way found her death. Only there, in the ditch, were these people reduced to nothing, or to their number, which was thirty-three thousand seven hundred and sixty-one. Since the bodies were later exhumed and burned on pyres, and the bones that did not burn crushed and mixed with sand, the count is what remains. At the end of the day, the Germans decided to kill Dina Pronicheva. Whether or not she was Jewish was moot. She had seen too much. In the darkness she was led to the edge of the ravine along with a few other people. She was not forced to undress. She survived in the only way possible in that situation. Just as the shots began, she threw herself into the gorge and then feigned death. She bore the weight of the German walking across her body, remaining motionless as the boots tread across her breast and her hand like a dead person. She was able to keep open a small air hole as the dirt fell down around her. She heard a small child calling for its mother and thought of her own children. She began to talk to herself. Dina, get up, run away, run to your children. 
Perhaps words made the difference as they had earlier, when her mother, now dead somewhere below, had whispered to her. She dug her way out and crept away quietly. Dina Pronicheva joined the perilous world of the few Jewish survivors in Kiev. The law required that Jews be turned in to the authorities. The Germans offered material incentives, money, and sometimes the keys to the Jews' apartment. The local population, in Kiev as elsewhere in the Soviet Union, was of course accustomed to denouncing enemies of the people. Not so very long before, in 1937 and 1938, the main local enemy denounced at that time to the NKVD had been Polish spies. Now, as the Gestapo settled into the former offices of the NKVD, the enemy was the Jew. Those who came to report Jews to the German police passed by a guard wearing a swastika armband, standing before friezes of the hammer and sickle. The office dealing with Jewish affairs was rather small, since the investigation of Jewish crimes was simple. A Soviet document with Jewish nationality recorded, or a penis without a foreskin, meant death. Isa Belazovskaya, a Kiev Jew in hiding, had a young son called Igor, who was confused by all of this. He asked his mother, What is a Jew? In practice, the answer was given by German policemen reading Soviet identity documents, or by German doctors subjecting boys such as Igor to a medical examination. Isa Belazovskaya felt death everywhere. I felt a strong desire, she remembered, to sprinkle my head, my whole self, with ashes, to hear nothing, to be changed into dust. But she kept going, and she lived. Those who gave up hope sometimes survived thanks to the devotion of their non-Jewish spouses or their families. The midwife, Sophia Eisenstein, for example, was hidden by her husband in a pit he dug at the back of a courtyard. He led her there, dressed as a beggar, and visited her every day as he walked their dog. He talked to her, pretending to talk to the dog. She pleaded with him to poison her. Instead, he kept bringing her food and water. Those Jews who were caught by the police were killed. They were placed in cells of the Kiev prison that had held victims of the Great Terror three years before. When the prison was full, the Jews and other prisoners were driven away at dawn in a covered truck. Residents of Kiev learned to fear this truck as they had feared the NKVD black ravens leaving these same gates. It took the Jews and other prisoners to Babi Yar, where they were forced to disrobe, kneel at the edge of the ravine, and wait for the shot. Babi Yar confirmed the precedent of Kamianets Podilsky for the destruction of Jews in central, eastern, and southern Ukrainian cities. Because Army Group South had captured Kiev late, and because news of German policies spread quickly, most Jews of these regions had fled east and therefore survived. Those who remained almost always did not. On the 13th of October 1941, about 12,000 Jews were killed at Dnipropetrovsk. The Germans were able to use the local administrations established by themselves to facilitate the work of gathering and then killing Jews. In Kharkiv, it appears that Zonderkommando Foray of Einsatzgruppe C had the city administration settle the remaining Jews in a single district. On the 15th and 16th of December, more than 10,000 Kharkiv Jews were taken to a tractor factory at the edge of town. There they were shot in groups by Order Police Battalion 314 and Zonderkommando Foray in January 1942. Some of them were gassed in a truck that piped its own exhaust into its own cargo trailer and thus into the lungs of Jews who were locked inside. Gas vans were also tried in Kiev, but rejected when the security police complained that they disliked removing mangled corpses covered with blood and excrement. In Kiev, the German policemen preferred shooting over ravines and pits. The timing of the mass murder was slightly different in occupied Soviet Belarus, behind the lines of Army Group Center. In the first eight weeks of the war, through August 1941, Einsatz Gruppe B under Artur Neber killed more Jews in Vilnius and in Belarus than any of the other Einsatzgruppen. But the further mass murder of Jews in Belarus was then delayed somewhat by a military consideration. Hitler decided to send divisions from Army Group Center to aid Army Group South in the Battle for Kiev of September 1941. This decision of Hitler's delayed the march of Army Group Center on Moscow, which was its main task. Once Kiev was taken and the march on Moscow could resume, so did the killing. 
On the 2nd of October 1941, Army Group Center began a secondary offensive on Moscow, codenamed Operation Typhoon. Police and security divisions began to clear Jews from its rear. Army Group Center advanced with a force of 1.9 million men in 78 divisions. Then the policy of general mass murder of Jews, including women and children, was extended throughout occupied Soviet Belarus. Throughout September 1941, Zonderkommando 4A and Einsatzkommando 5 of Einsatzgruppe B were already exterminating all Jews of villages and small towns. In early October, that policy was applied to cities. In October 1941, Mahilau became the first substantial city in occupied Soviet Belarus where almost all Jews were killed. A German Austrian policeman wrote to his wife of his feelings and experiences shooting the city's Jews in the first days of the month. During the first try my hand trembled a bit as I shot, but one gets used to it. By the tenth try I aimed calmly and shot surely at the many women, children and infants. I kept in mind that I have two infants at home, whom these hordes would treat just the same, if not ten times worse. The death that we gave them was a beautiful quick death compared to the hellish torments of thousands and thousands in the jails of the GPU. Infants flew in great arcs through the air, and we shot them to pieces in flight, before their bodies fell into the pit and into the water. On the 2nd and 3rd of October 1941, the Germans, with the help of auxiliary policemen from Ukraine, shot 2,273 men, women and children at Mahilau. On the 19th of October, Another 3,726 followed. Here in Belarus, a direct order to kill women and children came from Erich von den Bach-Zelewski, the higher SS and police leader for Russia Center, the terrain behind Army Group Center. Bach, whom Hitler regarded as a man who could wade through a sea of blood, was the direct representative of Himmler and was certainly acting in accordance with Himmler's wishes. In occupied Soviet Belarus, the accord between the SS and the army on the fate of the Jews was especially evident. General Gustav von Bechtolsheim, commander of the infantry division responsible for security in the Minsk area, fervently advocated the mass murder of Jews as a preventive measure. Had the Soviets invaded Europe, he was fond of saying, the Jews would have exterminated the Germans. Jews were no longer humans in the European sense of the word, and thus, must be destroyed. Himmler had endorsed the killing of women and children in July 1941, and then the total extermination of Jewish communities in August 1941, as a small taste of the paradise to come, the Garden of Eden that Hitler desired. It was a post-apocalyptic vision of exaltation after war, of life after death, the resurgence of one race after the extermination of others. Members of the SS shared the racism and the dream. The order police sometimes shared in this vision, and were, of course, corrupted by their own participation. The Wehrmacht officers and soldiers often held essentially the same views as the SS, girded by a certain interpretation of military practicality. That the elimination of the Jews could help bring an increasingly difficult war to a victorious conclusion, or prevent partisan resistance, or at least improve food supplies. Those who did not endorse the mass killing of Jews believed that they had no choice, since Himmler was closer to Hitler than they. Yet as time passed, even such military officers usually came to be convinced that the killing of Jews was necessary, not because the war was about to be won, as Himmler and Hitler could still believe in summer 1941, but because the war could easily be lost. Soviet power never collapsed. In September 1941, two months after the invasion, the NKVD was powerfully in evidence, directed against the most sensitive target, the Germans of the Soviet Union. By an order of the 28th of August, Stalin had 438,700 Soviet Germans deported to Kazakhstan in the first half of September 1941, most of them from an autonomous region in the Volga River. In its speed, competence, and territorial range, this one act of Stalin made a mockery of the confused and contradictory deportation actions that the Germans had carried out in the previous two years. It was at this moment of Stalin's sharp defiance, in mid-September 1941, that Hitler took a strangely ambiguous decision, 
to send German Jews to the East. In October and November, the Germans began to deport German Jews to Minsk, Riga, Kaunas, and Lodz. Up to this point, German Jews had lost their rights and their property, but only rarely their lives. Now they were being sent, albeit without instructions to kill them, to places where Jews had been shot in large numbers. Perhaps Hitler wanted revenge. He could not have failed to notice that the Volga had not become Germany's Mississippi. Rather than settling the Volga Basin as triumphant colonists, Germans were being deported from it as repressed and humbled Soviet citizens. Despair and euphoria were on intimate terms in Hitler's mind, and so an entirely different interpretation is also possible. It is perfectly conceivable that Hitler began to deport German Jews because he wished to believe, or wished others to believe, that Operation Typhoon, the secondary offensive on Moscow that began on the 2nd of October 1941, would bring the war to an end. In a moment of exaltation, Hitler even claimed as much in a speech of the 3rd of October. The enemy is broken and will never rise again. If the war was truly over, then the final solution, as a program of deportations for the post-war period, could begin. Though Operation Typhoon brought no final victory, the Germans went ahead anyway with the deportations of German Jews to the east, which began a kind of chain reaction. The need to make room in these ghettos confirmed one mass killing method, in Riga, in occupied Latvia, and likely hastened the development of another, in Lodz, in occupied Poland. In Riga, the police commander was now Friedrich Jekyll, as higher SS and police leader for Reichskommissariat Ostland. Jekyll, a Riga native, had organized the first massive shooting of Jews at Kamienets Podilski in August. In his former capacity as higher SS and police leader for Reichskommissariat Ukraine. And now, after his transfer, he brought his industrial shooting methods to Latvia. First, he had Soviet prisoners of war dig a series of pits in the Letbarsky woods in the Rumbola forest near Riga. On a single day, the 30th of November 1941, Germans and Latvians marched some 14,000 Jews in columns to the shooting sites forced them to lie down next to each other in pits, and shot them from above. The city of Lodz fell within the domain of Arthur Greiser, who headed the Vaterland, the largest district of Polish territory added to the Reich. Lodz had been the second most populous Jewish city in Poland, and was now the most populous Jewish city in the Reich. Its ghetto was overcrowded before the arrival of the German Jews. It could be that the need to remove Jews from Lodz inspired Greiser, or the SS and security police commanders of the Vaterland, to seek a more efficient method of murder. The Vaterland had always been at the centre of the policy of strengthening Germandom. Hundreds of thousands of Poles had been deported, beginning in 1939, to be replaced by hundreds of thousands of Germans who arrived from the Soviet Union, before the German invasion of the USSR made shipping Germans westward utterly pointless. But the removal of the Jews, always a central element of the plan to make this new German zone racially German, had proven the hardest to implement. Greiser confronted a problem on the scale of his district that Hitler confronted on the scale of his empire. The final solution was officially deportation, but there was nowhere to send the Jews. By early December 1941, a gas van was parked at Gzelno. Hitler's deportation of German Jews in October 1941 smacked of improvisation at the top and uncertainty below. German Jews sent to Minsk and Lodz were not themselves killed, but rather placed in the ghettos. The German Jews sent to Kaunas were, however, killed upon arrival, as were those of the first transport sent to Riga. Whatever Hitler's intentions, German Jews were now being shot. Perhaps Hitler had decided by this point to murder all of the Jews of Europe, including German Jews. If so, even Himmler had not yet grasped his intention. It was Jekon who killed the German Jews arriving in Riga, whom Himmler had not wished to murder. Himmler did set in motion, also in October 1941, a search for a new and more effective way of killing Jews. He made contact with his client, Odilo Globochnik, the SS and police leader for the Lublin district of the general government, who immediately set to work on a new type of facility for the killing of Jews at a site known as Buzhets. 
By November 1941, the concept was not entirely clear and machinery was not yet in place, but certain outlines of Hitler's final version of the final solution were visible. In the occupied Soviet Union, Jews were being killed by bullets on an industrial scale. In annexed and occupied Poland, in the Vaterland and in the general government, gassing facilities were under construction at Kselno and Belzec. In Germany, Jews were being sent to the east, where some of them had already been killed. The final solution as mass murder, initiated east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, was spreading to the west. In November 1941, Army Group Center was pushing toward Moscow to win the delayed but no less glorious final victory. The end of the Soviet system, the beginning of the apocalyptic transformation of blighted Soviet lands into a proud German frontier empire. In fact, German soldiers were heading into a much more conventional apocalypse. Their trucks and tanks were slowed by the autumn mud, their bodies by the lack of proper clothing and warm food. At one point, German officers could see the spires of the Kremlin through their binoculars, but they would never reach the Soviet capital. Their men were at the very limits of their supplies and their endurance. The resistance of the Red Army was ever firmer, its tactics ever more intelligent. On the 24th of November 1941, Stalin ordered his strategic reserves from the Soviet East into battle against Army Group Center of the Wehrmacht. He was confident that he could take this risk. From a highly placed informer in Tokyo, and no doubt from other sources, Stalin had reports that there would be no Japanese attack on Soviet Siberia. He had refused to believe in a German attack in summer 1941, and was wrong. Now he refused to believe in a Japanese attack in autumn 1941, and was right. He had kept his nerve. On the 5th of December, the Red Army went on the offensive at Moscow. German soldiers tasted defeat. Their exhausted horses could not move their equipment back quickly enough. The troops would spend the winter outside, huddling in the cold, short on everything. Stalin's intelligence was correct. Japan was about to commit decisively to a war in the Pacific, which would all but exclude any Japanese offensive in Siberia. The southern course of Japanese imperialism had been set by 1937. It had been clear to all when Japan invaded French Indochina in September 1940. Hitler had discouraged his Japanese ally from joining in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Now, as that invasion had failed, Japanese forces were moving further in the other direction. Even as the Red Army marched west on the 6th of December 1941, a Japanese task force of aircraft carriers was sailing toward Pearl Harbor, the base of the United States Pacific Fleet. On the 7th of December, a German general, in a letter home, described the battles around Moscow. He and his men were fighting for our own naked lives, daily and hourly, against an enemy who in all respects is superior. That same day, two waves of Japanese aircraft attacked the American fleet, destroying several battleships and killing 2,000 servicemen. The following day, the United States declared war on Japan. Three days later, on the 11th of December, Nazi Germany declared war on the United States. This made it very easy for President Franklin D. Roosevelt to declare war on Germany. Stalin's position in East Asia was now rather good. If the Japanese meant to fight the United States for control of the Pacific, it was all but inconceivable that they would confront the Soviets in Siberia. Stalin no longer had to fear a two-front war. What was more, the Japanese attack was bound to bring the United States into the war, as an ally of the Soviet Union. By early 1942, the Americans had already engaged the Japanese in the Pacific. Soon, American supply ships would reach Soviet Pacific ports, unhindered by Japanese submarines, since the Japanese were neutral in the Soviet-German war. A Red Army taking American supplies from the East was an entirely different foe than a Red Army concerned about a Japanese attack from the East. Stalin just had to exploit American aid and encourage the Americans to open a second front in Europe. Then the Germans would be encircled and the Soviet victory certain. Since 1933, Japan had been the great multiplier in the gambles that Hitler and Stalin took with and against each other. Both men, each for his own reasons, wished for Japan to fight its wars in the South, against China on land, 
and the European empires and the United States at sea. Hitler welcomed the bombing of Pearl Harbor, believing that the United States would be slow to arm and would fight in the Pacific rather than in Europe. Even after the failure of Operations Barbarossa and Typhoon, Hitler wished for the Japanese to engage the United States rather than the Soviet Union. Hitler seemed to believe that he could conquer the USSR in early 1942 and then engage an America weakened by the Pacific War. Stalin, too, wished for the Japanese to move south, and had very carefully crafted foreign and military policy that had precisely this effect. His thought was, in essence, the same as Hitler's. The Japanese are to stay away because the lands of the Soviet Union are mine. Berlin and Moscow both wanted to keep Japan in East Asia and in the Pacific, and Tokyo obliged them both. Whom this would serve depended upon the outcome of the German attack on the Soviet Union. Had the German invasion proceeded as envisioned, as a lightning victory that leveled the great Soviet cities and yielded Ukrainian food and Caucasian oil, the Japanese strike on Pearl Harbor might indeed have been good news for Berlin. In such a scenario, the attack on Pearl Harbor would have meant that the Japanese were diverting the United States as Germany consolidated a victorious position in its new colony. The Germans would have initiated Generalplan Ost, or some variant, seeking to become a great land empire self-sufficient in food and oil, and capable of defending themselves against a naval blockade by the United Kingdom and an amphibious assault by the United States. This had always been a fantasy scenario, but it had some light purchase upon reality, so long as German troops were making for Moscow. Since the Germans were turned back at Moscow at the very moment that the Japanese advanced, Pearl Harbor had exactly the opposite meaning. It meant that Germany was in the worst of all possible configurations, not a giant land empire intimidating Great Britain and preparing itself for a confrontation with the United States, but rather a single European country at war against the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States, with allies either weak, Italy, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, or uninvolved in the crucial East European theatre, Japan, Bulgaria. The Japanese seemed to understand this better than the Germans. They wanted Hitler to make a separate peace with Stalin and then fight the British and the Americans for control of Asia and North Africa. The Japanese wished to break Britain's naval power. The Germans tried to work within its bounds. This left Hitler with one world strategy, and he kept to it, the destruction of the Soviet Union and the creation of a land empire on its ruins. In December 1941, Hitler found a strange resolution to his drastic strategic predicament. He himself had told his generals that all continental problems had to be resolved by the end of 1941 so that Germany could prepare for a global conflict with the United Kingdom and the United States. Instead, Germany found itself facing the timeless strategic nightmare, the two-front war, to be fought against three great powers. With characteristic audacity and political agility, Hitler recast the situation in terms that were consistent with Nazi antisemitism, if not with the original planning for the war. What besides utopian planning, inept calculation, racist arrogance and foolish brinkmanship could have brought Germany into a war with the United Kingdom, the United States and the Soviet Union? Hitler had the answer. A worldwide Jewish conspiracy. In January 1939, Hitler had made a speech threatening the Jews with extinction if they succeeded in fomenting another world war. Since summer 1941, German propaganda had played unceasingly on the theme of a tentacular Jewish plot, uniting the British, the Soviets, and ever more the Americans. On the 12th of December 1941, a week after the Soviet counter-attack at Moscow, four days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and one day after the United States reciprocated the German declaration of war, Hitler returned to that speech. He referred to it as a prophecy that would have to be fulfilled. The world war is here, he told some fifty trusted comrades on the 12th of December 1941. The annihilation of Jewry must be the necessary consequence. From that point forward, his most important subordinates understood their task, to kill all Jews wherever possible. Hans Frank, the head of the general government, conveyed the policy in Warsaw a few days later. 
Gentlemen, I must ask you to rid yourselves of all feeling of pity. We must annihilate the Jews wherever we find them, in order to maintain the structure of the Reich as a whole. Jews were now blamed for the looming disaster that could not be named. Nazis would have instantly grasped the connection between the Jewish enemy and the prospect of downfall. They all believed, if they accepted Hitler's view, that Germany had not been defeated on the battlefield in the Last World War, but instead brought down by a stab in the back, a conspiracy of Jews and other internal enemies. Now Jews would also take the blame for the American-British-Soviet alliance. Such a common front of capitalism and communism, went Hitler's reasoning, could only have been consecrated by the Jewish cabals in London, Moscow and Washington. Jews were the aggressors, Germans the victims. If disaster were to be averted, Jews would have to be eliminated. Hitler's propaganda chief, Joseph Goebbels, recorded the moral reversal in his diary. We are not here to have sympathy with the Jews, but only to have sympathy with our German nation. As the war turned Stalin's way, Hitler recast its purpose. The plan had been to destroy the Soviet Union and then eliminate the Jews. Now, as the destruction of the Soviet Union was indefinitely delayed, the utter extermination of the Jews became a wartime policy. The menace henceforth was less the Slavic masses and their supposed Jewish overlords, and more the Jews as such. In 1942, propaganda against Slavs would ease, as more of them came to work in the Reich. Hitler's decision to kill Jews, rather than exploit their labor, was presumably facilitated by his simultaneous decision to exploit the labor of Slavs, rather than kill them. These moves signified an abandonment of most of the initial assumptions about the course of the war, although of course Hitler would never have admitted that. But the mass killing of the Jews at least looked consistent with the initial vision of a frontier empire in the East. In fact, the decision to kill the Jews contradicted that vision, since it was an implicit acceptance that the Germans would never control the vast territories that they would have needed for a final solution by deportation. In logistical terms, mass murder is simpler than mass deportation. At this point, killing was Hitler's only option if he wished to fulfill his own prophecy. His was a land empire rather than a sea empire but he controlled no wastelands into which Jews could disappear. In so far as there had been progress in the final solution, it was in Himmler's demonstration of the method that did not require deportation. Murder. The killing was less a sign of than a substitute for triumph. From late July 1941, Jews had been murdered as the envisaged lightning victory failed to materialize. From December 1941, Jews as such were to be killed as the alliance against Germany grew in strength. Hitler sought and found still deeper emotions and gave voice to more vicious goals, and a German leadership aware of its predicament accepted them. By defining the conflict as a world war, Hitler drew attention away from the lack of a lightning victory and the unwelcome lessons of history that followed from this military failure. In December 1941, German soldiers were staring straight at the fate of Napoleon, whose Grande Armée had reached the outskirts of Moscow faster in 1812 than had the Wehrmacht in 1941. Yet in the end, Napoleon had retreated from winter and Russian reinforcements. As German troops held their positions, they would inevitably confront a repetition of the kinds of battles that had been fought in 1914 to 1918. Long days of sinking into trenches to escape machine guns and artillery, and long years of slow, meaningless movement and countless casualties. The kind of warfare that had supposedly been made obsolete by Hitler's genius was upon them. The German general staff had anticipated losses of about half a million and victory by September. Losses were approaching a million as victory receded in December. All of the failed offensives and missed deadlines and depressing prospects would be less shameful if what the Wehrmacht was fighting was not an ill-planned colonial war of aggression, but a glorious if tragic world war in defense of civilization. If German soldiers were fighting the powers of the whole world, organized by the Jewish cabals of Moscow and London and Washington, then their cause was great and just. If they had to fight a defensive war, as was indeed now in practice the case, then someone else could be handed the role of the aggressor. 
the Jews filled that place in the story, at least for Nazi believers and many German civilians waiting for fathers and husbands to return. German soldiers, whether or not they believed in Jewish responsibility for the war, likely needed ideological revisions less than the politicians and the civilians. They were desperate, but they were still deadly, and they would fight well, and they would fight on, long enough at least for Hitler to fulfill his prophecy. The Wehrmacht was and would remain by far the most effective fighting force in the European theatre, even though its chances for a traditional victory were now nil. By the magic of racial thinking, killing the Jews itself was a German triumph, at a moment when any other victory receded beyond the horizon of the possible. The United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union were enemies of Germany, and the Jews were the enemy of Germany, and thus went the spurious syllogism, they were under the influence of the Jews. If these were Jewish states, then Jews in Europe were their agents. Killing the Jews of Europe was thus an attack on Germany's enemies, directly and indirectly, and was justified not only by moral but by military logic. Himmler noted Hitler's desire that the Jews of Europe, as of December 1941, were to be destroyed as partisans, as agents of Germany's foes behind the lines. By this time, the logic of killing Jews as retribution for partisan attacks had already been developed in the Polesian swamps between Belarus and Ukraine, where Himmler had used it as the reason to kill Jewish men, women and children beginning in July 1941. In Kiev, where the Germans had murdered more than 30,000 Jews in retribution for the Soviet bombings in the city. And even further, in Serbia, where the German armed forces had encountered serious resistance slightly earlier than in the Soviet Union. The Serbian example was perhaps especially pertinent. The German war in southeastern Europe had begun slightly earlier than the war in the Soviet Union, and had brought certain applicable lessons. Germany had invaded Yugoslavia and Greece in spring 1941, just before the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, mainly to rescue its bungling Italian ally from defeat in its own Balkan wars. Though Germany had quickly destroyed the Yugoslav army and created a Croatian puppet state, Resistance in the Serbian occupation zone it shared with Italy was considerable. Some of it came from communists. The German commanding general in Serbia ordered that only Jews and Roma be killed as revenge for the deaths of Germans who fell in action against partisans, at a ratio of one hundred to one. In this way, almost all of the male Jews of Serbia had been shot by the time Himmler made his note about the destruction of Jews as partisans. The logic of Serbia was universalized. Jews as such would be killed as retribution for the US-UK-USSR alliance. Neither Jews nor the Allies could be expected to understand this. It made sense only within the Nazi worldview, which Hitler had just adapted for future use. The fifth and final version of the final solution was mass death. In Nazi parlance, the word resettlement now shifted from description to euphemism. For years, German leaders had imagined that they could resolve Europe's Jewish problem by resettling Jews to one place or another. Jews would be worked to death wherever they landed, and perhaps sterilized so that they could not reproduce. But they would not all be killed as such. Thus, resettlement was incomplete, though not entirely inaccurate as a description of Jewish policy in 1940 and into 1941. Henceforth, resettlement or resettlement to the East would mean mass murder. Perhaps the resettlement euphemism, by suggesting an essential continuity of policy, helped Nazis to overlook the fact that German policy not only changed, but had to change because the war was not going as expected. It might thus have allowed the Germans to shield from themselves the reality that military disaster conditioned their Jewish policy. The Germans had already shown, by December 1941, that they could do something far worse than deport Jews to Poland, Madagascar, or the Soviet Union. They could kill the Jews under their control and blame the victims for their fate. The reality of resettlement from which the Germans now distanced themselves, can be brought closer by simple quotation of German usage. Resettlement site. On the resettlement site eight trenches are situated. One squad of ten officers and men are to work at each trench and are to be relieved every two hours. 
By the time Hitler conveyed his preferences in December 1941, Himmler's SS and police forces, aided by the Wehrmacht and local policemen, had already killed about a million Jews in the occupied Soviet Union. Retrospect conveys a sense of inevitability, and the new German policy of killing all European Jews may appear to be nothing more than the fulfillment of a goal that was, in some sense, already a given. While it is true that Hitler took for granted that the Jews would have no place in his future Europe, and that Himmler's escalating murder must have corresponded to Hitler's wishes, Hitler's decision to speak of the mass murder of all Jews must be seen as just that, a decision. Other responses to the same events, after all, were possible. Germany's ally, Romania, showed the possibility of such reversals. Bucharest had also been pursuing national purification. As of December 1941, Romanian Jews had suffered more than German Jews. Romania had joined in the invasion of the Soviet Union, like Germany under propaganda associating communism with Jews. By invading the Soviet Union along with the Germans, Romania recovered the Bessarabian and Bukovinian territory that the Soviet Union had annexed in 1940. Romania then added a new region called Transnistria, seized from the southern part of Soviet Ukraine. In this zone, in 1941, Romanian policies toward Jews were every bit as brutal as their German equivalents. After taking Odessa, Romanian troops killed about 20,000 local Jews in reprisals for an explosion that destroyed their headquarters in the city. In the Bodanivka district, the Romanians shot more than 40,000 Jews in a few days in late December 1941. The Romanians also created their own set of ghettos and labor camps in Transnistria, where tens of thousands of Jews from Bessarabia and Bukovina perished. All in all, Romania killed about 300,000 Jews. Yet Romania's leadership reacted to the changing course of the war differently than did Hitler. Its policies toward Jews remained brutal, but were gradually softened rather than hardened. By summer 1942, Romania was no longer deporting Jews to Transnistria. When the Germans built death facilities, Romania declined to send its Jews to them. By the end of 1942, Romanian policy had diverged significantly from the German. Romania would attempt to switch sides later in the war, and at that time the survival of remaining Jews would come to seem an asset. The year 1942 was thus a crucial turning point, when German and Romanian policies turned in opposite directions. Germany would kill all Jews because the war was lost. Romania, late that year, would save some Jews for much the same reason. The Romanian dictator, Ion Antonescu, would leave open a crack in the door for negotiations with the Americans and the British. Hitler left the Germans no possibility to escape from their own guilt. Over the course of the year 1942, the Germans killed most of the remaining Jews who were under their occupation. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, mass murder would be carried out at gassing facilities. East of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Germans continued the mass shootings and also used the gas vans that had been tested on the Soviet prisoners of war. In occupied Soviet Ukraine, the killing began again as soon as the earth had thawed enough for the digging of pits, and sometimes where machines were available for digging even sooner. In the eastern part of Soviet Ukraine, Still under military occupation, the shooting simply continued without any pause from late 1941 through early 1942. In January, Einsatzgruppen, assisted by the Wehrmacht, killed smaller Jewish communities that had survived the first sweep, as well as groups of Jewish laborers. In spring 1942, the action shifted from the east to the west, from the military zone to the civilian occupation authority, the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. Here all of the actions were carried out by stationary police forces, battalions of German order police, with the assistance of local militiamen. With the help of tens of thousands of local collaborators, the Germans had the necessary manpower. Killing became extermination last in the lands that the Germans took first. Though the Germans had overrun all of the former lands of eastern Poland in the first ten days of the war, in June 1941, Many of the native Jews of Poland's southeast, now the west of the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, had survived until 1942. 
German forces had already passed through by the time Himmler began to order the destruction of whole Jewish communities. By the time German policy had shifted, most German forces had already departed. In 1942, the Germans undertook a second round of mass shootings in the western district of the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, this time organized by the civilian authorities and implemented by the police, with a great deal of help from local auxiliary policemen. These West Ukrainian districts were typical of the many towns and small cities in the lands that had been eastern Poland, where Jews numbered about half of the population, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. Jews usually inhabited the center of the cities, in stone houses around town squares, rather than the wood shanties of the outskirts. These were settlements where Jews had lived for more than half a millennium, under varying governments and with varying levels of prosperity but with a success demonstrated by the simplest measures of architecture and demography. The majority of this Jewish population in interwar Poland had remained religiously observant and rather separated from the outside world. The languages remained Yiddish and, for religious purposes, Hebrew, and rates of intermarriage with Christians were low. Eastern Poland had remained the heartland of an Ashkenazic Jewish civilization, speaking Yiddish and dominated by rival clans of charismatic Hasidim. This Jewish tradition had outlived the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where it had originated, it had outlived the Russian Empire, and it had outlived the interwar Polish Republic. After the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the joint invasion of Poland, Soviet power and Soviet citizenship were extended to these Jews in 1939-1941, and thus they are usually counted as Soviet Jewish victims of the Nazis. These Jews did live for a time in the Soviet Union after Soviet borders were extended westward to include what had been eastern Poland, and they were subject to Soviet policies. Like the Poles and the Ukrainians and the Belarusians of these lands, they had been subject then to arrests, deportations, and shootings. Jews had lost their businesses and their religious schools, yet this brief period of Soviet rule was hardly enough to make Soviet Jews of them. With the exception of the very youngest children, people in Rivni and similar settlements had been citizens of Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, or Romania for far longer than they were citizens of the Soviet Union. Of the 2.6 million or so Jews killed on the terrains of the Soviet Union, some 1.6 million had been under Soviet jurisdiction for less than two years. Their civilization had been seriously weakened by Soviet rule during 1939 to 1941. It would not survive the German Reich. Rivni, unusually for these cities, had already seen a mass killing action in 1941. Although Kiev was the center of the German police state in Ukraine, Rivni was, in 1941, the provisional capital of the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. The Reichskommissar, Erich Koch, was a man known for his brutality. Hitler's advisers called Koch a second Stalin, and they meant it as a compliment. Koch had already, in autumn 1941, ordered that most of the Jews of Rivni be killed. On the 6th of November 1941, the police had told all Jews without work permits to report for resettlement. Some 17,000 people were then transported to nearby woods known as Sozenki. There they were shot over pits dug earlier by Soviet prisoners of war. The remaining 10,000 or so Jews were then forced to live in a ghetto in the worst part of the city. In early 1942, even after the majority of the Jews were dead, the Rivni Judenrat was trying to maintain for the survivors some means of subsistence. The German authorities, however, had decided that Jews were not to exist at all. In summer 1942, Koch, with an eye to food shortages, took the next step, asking his subordinates for a 100% solution to the Jewish problem. On the night of the 13th of July 1942, Rivni's Jews were herded by German police and Ukrainian auxiliaries from the ghetto. The Jews were forced to walk to the train station, where they were enclosed in train cars. After two days without food and water, they were transported to a quarry near woods outside the town of Kostopil. There they were shot by German security police and the auxiliary policemen. In Lutsk, the Jews constituted about half the population, perhaps 10,000 people. In December 1941, the Jews were forced into a ghetto, where the Germans appointed a Judenrat. 
Generally, the Yurunrat served to extract the wealth of the community in exchange for various stays of execution, some true, some false. The Germans also usually established a Jewish police force, which was used to create the ghettos and then later to clear them. On the 20th of August 1942, in Lutsk, the local Jewish police set out to find Jews who might be in hiding. The same day, Jewish men were sent to woods near Hirka Polonka, seven kilometers from Lutsk, to dig pits. The Germans guarding them made no effort to disguise what was about to happen. They told the men to dig well, as their wives and mothers would be resting in the pits the next day. On the 21st of August, the women and children of Lutsk were taken to Hirka Polonka. The Germans ate and drank and laughed, and forced the women to recite, because I am a Jew, I have no right to live. Then the women were forced, five at a time, to undress and kneel naked over the pits. The next group then had to lie naked over the first layer of corpses and were shot. That same day, the Jewish men were taken to the courtyard of the Lutsk castle and killed there. In Kovel, too, Jews were about half the population, some fourteen thousand people. In May 1942, the Jews of the city were divided into two groups, workers and non-workers, and placed in two separate ghettos, the first in the new town and the second in the old town. One local Jew, having learned the Nazi terms, knew that the Germans saw the second ghetto as the one for useless eaters. On the 2nd of June, German and local auxiliary police surrounded the ghetto in the old town. All six thousand of them were taken to a clearing near Kamin Kashirsky and shot. On the 19th of August, the police repeated this action with the other ghetto, shooting eight thousand more Jews. Then began a hunt for Jews in hiding, who were rounded up and locked in the town's great synagogue with no food and water. Then they were shot, but not before a few of them left their final messages in Yiddish or Polish, scraped with stones, knives, pens, or fingernails on the walls of the temple, where some of them had observed the Sabbath. A wife left a note of love and devotion to her dear husband, so that he might learn of her fate and that of their beautiful child. Two girls together wrote of their love of life. One so wants to live, and they won't allow it. Revenge! Revenge! A young woman was more resigned. I am strangely calm, though it is hard to die at twenty. A mother and father asked their children to say Kaddish for them and to observe the holidays. A daughter left a farewell note to her mother. My beloved mamma, there was no escape. They brought us here from outside the ghetto, and now we must die a terrible death. We are so sorry that you are not with us. I cannot forgive myself this. We thank you, mamma, for all of your devotion. We kiss you over and over. Chapter 7 Holocaust and Revenge Belarus was the center of the confrontation between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. After the German invasion of June 1941, its inhabitants observed, if they survived, the escalation of both German and Soviet violence. Their homeland was a German zone of occupation and a once and future Soviet Republic. Its cities were battlefields of armies in advance and retreat its towns centers of Jewish settlement destroyed by the Holocaust. Its fields became German prisoner of war camps, where Soviet soldiers starved in the tens and hundreds of thousands. In its forests, Soviet partisans and German policemen and Waffen-SS conducted ferocious partisan warfare. The country as a whole was the site of a symbolic competition between Hitler and Stalin represented not only by soldiers behind the lines, partisans in the forests, and policemen over pits, but by propagandists in Berlin and Moscow and Minsk, the Republic's capital city. Minsk was a centerpiece of Nazi destructiveness. The German Air Force had bombed the city into submission on the 24th of June, 1941. The Wehrmacht had to wait for the fires to die down before entering. By the end of July, the Germans had shot thousands of educated people and confined the Jews to the northwest of the city. Minsk would have a ghetto and concentration camps and prisoner of war camps and killing sites. Finally, Minsk was transformed by the Germans into a kind of macabre theater in which they could act out the ersatz victory of killing Jews. In Minsk, in autumn 1941, the Germans were celebrating an imaginary triumph 
even as Moscow held fast. On the 7th of November, the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Germans organized something more dramatic than mere mass shootings. On that morning, they rounded up thousands of Jews from the ghetto. The Germans forced the Jews to wear their best clothes, as though they were dressing up for the Soviet holiday. Then the Germans formed the captives into columns, gave them Soviet flags, and ordered them to sing revolutionary songs. People had to smile for the cameras that were filming the scene. Once beyond Minsk, the 6,624 Jews were taken in trucks to a former NKVD warehouse in the nearby village of Tuchinka. Jewish men returning that evening from forced labor assignments found their entire families gone. As one recalled, out of eight people, my wife, my three children, my elderly mother and her two children, not a soul remained. Terror itself was nothing new. People had been taken from Minsk to Tuchinka in the Black Ravens of the NKVD not so long before, in 1937 and 1938. Yet even at the height of Stalin's great terror of those years, the NKVD was always discreet, taking people by ones and twos in the dark of night. The Germans were carrying out a mass action in the middle of the day, made for public consumption, ripe with meaning, suitable for a propaganda film. The staged parade was supposed to prove the Nazi claim that communists were Jews and Jews were communists. It followed from this, to the Nazi way of thinking, that their removal not only secured the rear area of Army Group Center, but was also a kind of victory in itself. Yet this hollow expression of triumph seemed designed to disguise a more obvious defeat. By the 7th of November 1941, Army Group Center was supposed to have taken Moscow, and had not. Stalin was still in the Soviet capital, and was organizing his own victory celebrations. He had never abandoned the city, not during the initial offensive of Operation Barbarossa of June 1941, not during the secondary offensive of Operation Typhoon of October. Lenin's embalmed corpse was sent away from the Kremlin for safekeeping, but Stalin remained and ruled. Leningrad was besieged, and Minsk and Kiev were taken, but Moscow defended itself under Stalin's obstinate command. On the 6th of November, Stalin spoke defiantly to Soviet citizens. Noting that the Germans called their campaign a war of annihilation, he promised them the same. He referred, for the one and only time, to the Germans' murder of the Jews. In calling the Nazi regime an empire eager to organize pogroms, however, he fell far short of a true description of the ongoing mass murder. The Minsk Jews taken to Tuchinka on the 7th of November, the Soviet holiday, were shot on the 9th of November, the National Socialist holiday. Five thousand more followed on the 20th of November. Traditional empires had never done anything like this to Jews. On any given day in the second half of 1941, the Germans shot more Jews than had been killed by pogroms in the entire history of the Russian Empire. The German murder of Jews was never going to play much of a role in the Soviet vision of the war. From a Stalinist perspective, it was not the killing of Jews that mattered, but the possibilities for its political interpretation. The German identification of Jews with communism was not just a Nazi conviction and a pretext for mass murder. It was also a propaganda weapon against the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union was nothing more than a Jewish empire, then surely, went the Nazi argument, the vast majority of Soviet citizens had no reason to defend it. In November 1941, Stalin was thus preparing an ideological as well as a military defense of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not a state of the Jews, as the Nazis claimed. It was a state of the Soviet peoples, first among whom were the Russians. On the 7th of November, as the Jews marched through Minsk to their deaths, Stalin reviewed a military parade in Moscow. To raise the spirits of his Soviet peoples and to communicate his confidence to the Germans, he had actually recalled Red Army divisions from their defensive positions west of Moscow and had them march through its boulevards. In his address that day, he called upon the Soviet people to follow the example of their great ancestors, mentioning six pre-revolutionary martial heroes, all of them Russians. At a time of desperation, the Soviet leader appealed to Russian nationalism. Stalin was associating himself and his people with the earlier Russian Empire, which just one day before he had mentioned in connection with pogroms of Jews. 
as the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union summoned the heroes of pre-revolutionary Russian history, he had to negotiate with their ghosts. By placing Russians at the center of history, he was implicitly reducing the role of other Soviet peoples, including those who suffered more than Russians from the German occupation. If this was a great patriotic war, as Stalin's close associate Vyacheslav Molotov had said on the day of the German invasion, what was the fatherland, Russia or the Soviet Union? If the conflict was a war of Russian self-defense, what to make of the German mass murder of the Jews? Hitler's public anti-Semitism had placed Stalin, like all the leaders of the Allies, in a profound dilemma. Hitler said that the Allies were fighting for the Jews, and so, fearing that their populations might agree, the Allies had to insist that they were fighting to liberate oppressed nations, but not Jews in particular. Stalin's answer to Hitler's propaganda shaped the history of the Soviet Union for as long as it existed. All of the victims of German killing policies were Soviet citizens, but the greatest of the Soviet nations was the Russians. One of his chief propagandists, Alexander Sherbakov, clarified the line in January 1942. The Russian people, the first among equals in the USSR's family of peoples, are bearing the main burden of the struggle with the German occupiers. By the time Sherbakov uttered those words, the Germans had killed a million Jews east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, including some 190,000 Jews in Belarus. As the freezing weather came to a Minsk ghetto without electricity and fuel, Jews called their home a dead city. In winter 1941 to 1942, Minsk held the largest ghetto on the territory of the pre-war Soviet Union, confining perhaps 70,000 Jews. According to the last Soviet census of 1939, some 71,000 Jews were among the 239,000 residents of the city. Some of the Jews native to Minsk had fled before the Germans took the city at the end of June 1941, and thousands more had been shot in the summer and fall. On the other hand, the Jewish population of the city had been swollen by Jews who had earlier arrived as refugees from Poland. These Polish Jews had fled the German invasion of Poland in 1939, but would flee no further after they were overtaken by German troops in 1941. The escape route east was now sealed. Once Soviet power disappeared from these lands, there could be no more Soviet deportations, which, deadly as they were, preserved Polish Jews from German bullets. There could be no more rescues of the kind organized by the Japanese spy Sugihara in Lithuania in 1940. Minsk was the provincial capital of General Commissariat White Ruthenia, as the Germans called Belarus. The General Commissariat comprised about one-fourth of Soviet Belarus. The eastern part of the Soviet Republic remained under military administration. The southern part was added to the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, and Bialystok was annexed by the Reich. Along with the three occupied Baltic states, General Commissariat White Rusinia constituted the Reichskommissariat Ostland. Belarusian Jews, whether in this civilian occupation authority or the military occupation zone to its east, were behind the lines of Operation Typhoon. As the Wehrmacht advanced, they were killed. As it stalled, some of them were kept alive. For a time. The inability of the Germans to take Moscow in late 1941 saved the remainder of the Jews of Minsk, at least for the moment. As Red Army divisions reinforced from the Far East defended the Soviet capital, battalions of German order police were ordered to the front. These were the very policemen who otherwise would have been tasked with shooting Jews. As the German offensive stalled in late November, the army realized that the boots and coats taken from dead or captured Soviet soldiers would not suffice for the cold winter ahead. Jewish workers in Minsk would have to make more, and so they would have to be allowed to live through the winter. Because Moscow held, the Germans had to drop their initial plans for Minsk. It could not be starved. Its hinterlands could not be emptied of peasants. Some of its Jews would have to live for a time. Germans asserted their dominance in Minsk by marching columns of prisoners of war through the ghetto and through the city. In late 1941, when prisoners of war were very likely to starve to death, some of them survived by fleeing to the Minsk ghetto. The ghetto was still a safer place than the prisoner of war camps. 
In the last few months of 1941, more people died at nearby Dulags and Stalags than in the Minsk ghetto. The enormous Stalag 352, probably the deadliest prisoner of war camp of them all, was a complex of holding pens in and around Minsk. A camp on Shirokaya Street in the middle of the city held both prisoners of war and Jews. The former NKVD facility at Tuchinka now functioned as a German prison and execution site. German policy in occupied Minsk was one of savage and unpredictable terror. The carnivalesque death march of the 7th of November 1941 was only one of a series of murderous incidents that left Jews horrified and confused about their fate. Special humiliations were reserved for Jews who were known and respected before the war. A noted scientist was forced to crawl across Jubilee Square, the center of the ghetto, with a soccer ball on his back. Then he was shot. Germans took Jews as personal slaves to clean their houses and their clothes. The German-Austrian medical doctor Ermfried Eberl in Minsk, after a tour of duty gassing the handicapped in Germany, wrote to his wife that he needed no money in this paradise. When Himmler visited Minsk, he was treated to a show execution of Jews, which was recorded by movie cameras. He seems to have watched himself and the mass murder on film later. Jewish women suffered in particular ways. Despite regulations against racial defilement, some Germans quickly developed a taste for rape as a prelude to murder. At least once Germans carried out a beauty contest of Jewish women, taking them to the cemetery, forcing them to strip naked, and then killing them. In the ghetto, German soldiers would force Jewish girls to dance naked at night. In the morning, only the girls' corpses remained. Perla Ajinskaya recalled what she saw in a dark apartment in the Minsk ghetto one evening in autumn 1941. A little room, a table, a bed. Blood was streaming down the girl's body from deep blackish wounds in her chest. It was quite clear that the girl had been raped and killed. There were gunshot wounds around her genitals. Violence is not confidence, and terror is not mastery. For the first nine months of the occupation from summer 1941 through early spring 1942, the bursts of murder and rape did not bring Minsk under complete German domination. Minsk was an unusual city, a place whose social structure defied the Nazi mind as well as German experience in occupied Poland. Here, in a Soviet metropolis, the history of Jews had taken a different turn than in Poland. Twenty years of social opportunity and political coercion had done their work. The urbane Jews of the city were not organized in any sort of traditional community, since the Soviets had destroyed Jewish religious and communal institutions in the 1920s and 1930s. The younger generation of Jews was highly assimilated, to the point that many had Belarusian or Russian inscribed as their nationality on their Soviet documents. Although this probably meant little to them before 1941, it could save their lives under German rule. Some Minsk Jews had Belarusian or Russian friends and colleagues who were ignorant of or indifferent to religion and nationality. A striking example of the ignorance of Jewish origins was Isai Kazinets, who organized the communist underground throughout the city of Minsk. Neither his friends nor his enemies knew that he was Jewish. Soviet rule had brought a certain sort of toleration and assimilation at the price of habits of subordination and obedience to the commands of Moscow. Political initiative had not been rewarded in Stalin's Soviet Union. Anyone responding with too much avidity to a given situation, or even to a political line, was at risk when the situation or the line changed. Thus, Soviet rule in general, and the Great Terror of 1937-1938 in particular, had taught people not to take spontaneous action. People who had distinguished themselves in the Minsk of the 1930s had been shot by the NKVD at Kurapati. Even when it must have been clear in Moscow that Soviet citizens in Minsk had their own reasons to resist Germans, Communists understood that this would not be enough to protect them from future persecution when the Soviets returned. Kazinets and all local communists hesitated to create any sort of organization, knowing that Stalinism opposed any sort of spontaneous action from below. Left to themselves, they would have endured Hitler for fear of Stalin. An outsider, 
the Polish-Jewish communist Hirsch Smolar helped spur Minsk communists and Jews to action. His curious combination of Soviet and Polish experience provided him with the skills, and perhaps the naivete, to push forward. He had spent the early 1920s in the Soviet Union and spoke Russian, the main language of Minsk. After returning to a Poland where the Communist Party was illegal, he grew accustomed to operating underground and working against local authorities. Arrested by the Polish police and imprisoned, he had been spared the experiences of Stalinist mass shooting that weighed so heavily in Minsk. He was behind bars during the Great Terror of 1937-1938, when Polish communists were invited to the Soviet Union in order to be shot. Released from Polish prison when the Soviet Union invaded Poland in September 1939, Smola served the new Soviet regime. He fled the Germans on foot in June 1941 and got as far as Minsk. After the German occupation of the city, he began to organize the ghetto underground and persuaded Kazinets that a general city underground was permissible as well. Kazinets wanted to know whom Smola was representing. Smola told him truthfully that he stood for no one but himself. This denial seemed to have persuaded Kazinets that Smola was actually authorized by Moscow to work under deep cover. Both men found a large number of willing conspirators within and without the ghetto. By early autumn 1941, both the ghetto and the city were thoroughly penetrated by a dedicated communist underground movement. The underground subverted the organs of German control over Jewish life, the Judenrat, and the Jewish police. In the occupied Soviet Union, as in occupied Poland, German rule forced Jews into ghettos, which were administered by a local Jewish council typically known by the German term Judenrat. In the cities of occupied Poland, the Judenrat was often composed of Jews of some standing in the pre-war community, often the same people who had led the Jewish communal structures that had been legal in independent Poland. In Minsk, such continuity of Jewish leadership was impossible, since the Soviets had eliminated Jewish communal life. The Germans had no easy way to find people who represented Jewish elites and who were accustomed to making compromises with the local authorities. It seems that they chose the initial Minsk Judenrat more or less at random, and chose badly. The entire Judenrat cooperated with the underground. In late 1941 and early 1942, Jews who wished to flee the ghetto could count on help from the Judenrat. Jewish policemen would be stationed away from places where escape attempts were planned, because the Minsk ghetto was enclosed only by barbed wire, the momentary absence of police attention allowed people to flee to the forest, which was very close to the city limits. Very small children were passed through the barbed wire to Gentiles, who agreed to raise them or take them to orphanages. Older children learned the escape routes and came to serve as guides from the city to the nearby forest. Seema Fitterson, one of these guides, carried a ball, which she would play with to signal danger to those following behind her. Children adapted quickly and well, but were in terrible danger all the same. To celebrate that first Christmas under German occupation, Erik von dem bach zelewski the higher SS and police leader, sent thousands of pairs of children's gloves and socks to SS families in Germany. Unlike Jews elsewhere under German occupation, Jews in Minsk had somewhere to run, in the nearby forest, they could try to find Soviet partisans. They knew that the Germans had taken countless prisoners of war, and that some had escaped to the forests. These men had stayed in the woods because they knew that the Germans would shoot them or starve them. Stalin had called in July 1941 for loyal communists to organize partisan units behind the lines, in the hope of establishing some control over this spontaneous movement before it grew in importance. Centralization was not yet possible, the soldiers hid in the forest, and the communists, if they had not fled, did their best to hide their pasts from the Germans. The Minsk underground activists, however, did try to support their armed comrades. On at least one occasion, members of the ghetto underground liberated a Red Army officer from the camp on Shirokaya Street. He became an important partisan leader in the nearby forests, and saved Jews in his turn. 
Jewish laborers in German factories stole winter clothes and boots meant for the German soldiers of Army Group Center and diverted them to the partisans. Workers in arms factories, remarkably, did the same. The Judenrat, required to collect a regular contribution of money from the Jewish population of the ghetto, diverted some of these funds to the partisans. The Germans later concluded that the entire Soviet partisan movement was funded from the ghetto. This was an exaggeration arising from stereotypical ideas of Jewish wealth. But the aid from the Minsk ghetto was reality. Partisan warfare was a nightmare of German military planning, and German army officers had been trained to take a severe line. They had been taught to see Soviet soldiers as the servants of communist political officers, who taught them to fight as partisans in an illegal Asiatic fashion. Partisan warfare was, and is, illegal, since it undermines the convention of uniformed armies directing violence against each other, rather than against surrounding populations. In theory, partisans protect civilians from a hostile occupier. In practice, they, like the occupier, must subsist on what they take from civilians. Since partisans hide among civilians, they bring down, and often intend to bring down, the occupier's retaliation against the local population. Reprisals then serve as recruitment propaganda for the partisans, or leave individual survivors with nowhere to go but the forest. Because German forces were always limited and always in demand at the front, military and civilian authorities were all the more fearful of the disruptions partisans could bring. Belarus, with its plentiful forests and swamps, was ideal territory for partisan warfare. The German army chief of staff later fantasized about using nuclear weapons to clear its wetlands of human population. This technology was not available, of course, but the fantasy gives a sense of both the ruthlessness of German planning and the fears aroused by difficult terrain. The policy of the army was to deter partisan warfare by striking such terror into the population that it loses all will to resist. Bach, the higher SS and police leader, later said that the ultimate explanation for the killing of civilians in anti-partisan actions was Himmler's desire to kill all the Jews and thirty million Slavs. There seemed to be little cost to the Germans in preemptive terror, since the people in question were meant to die anyway, in the hunger plan or general plan Ost. Hitler, who saw partisan warfare as a chance to destroy potential opposition, reacted energetically when Stalin urged local communists to resist the Germans in July. Even before the invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler had already relieved his soldiers of legal responsibility for actions taken against civilians. Now he wanted soldiers and police to kill anyone who even looks at us askance. The Germans had little trouble controlling the partisan movement in late 1941, and simply defined the ongoing mass murder of Jews as the appropriate reprisal. In September 1941, a clinic on anti-partisan warfare was held near Mahilau. Its climax was the shooting of 32 Jews, of whom 19 were women. The general line was that, where there are partisans, there are Jews, and where there are Jews, there are partisans. Just why this was so was harder to establish. The anti-Semitic ideas of Jewish weakness and dissimulation conspired in a sort of explanation. Military commanders were unlikely to believe that Jews would actually take up arms, but often saw the Jewish population as standing behind partisan actions. General Bechtholsheim, responsible for security in the Minsk area, believed that if an act of sabotage is committed in a village and one destroys all of the Jews of the village, one can be certain that one has destroyed the perpetrators or at least those who stood behind them. In this atmosphere, where the partisans were weak and the German reprisals anti-Semitic, most Jews in the Minsk ghetto were in no hurry to escape to the forest. In Minsk, despite all of its horrors, they were at least at home. Despite the regular mass killings, no fewer than half of Minsk's Jews were still alive as 1942 began. In 1942, the Soviet partisan movement took on new strength, at the same moment as the fate of Belarusian Jews was sealed, and for much the same reason. In December 1941, confronted with a world war, 
Hitler communicated his desire that all the Jews of Europe be killed. The Red Army's advance was one of the main sources of the weakening German position in Belarus and of Hitler's newly explicit desire for the murder of all Jews. Advancing Soviet forces were even able to open a gap in the German lines in early 1942. The Suraj Gates, as the space between Army Group North and Army Group Center was called, remained open for half a year. Until September 1942, the Soviets could send trusted men and arms to control and supply the partisans operating in Belarus. Soviet authorities thereby established more or less reliable channels of communication. In May 1942, a central staff of the partisan movement was established in Moscow. Hitler's express decision to kill all the Jews of Europe raised the association of Jews and partisans to a kind of abstraction. Jews were supporters of Germany's enemies, and so had to be preemptively eliminated. Himmler and Hitler associated the Jewish threat with the partisan threat. The logic of the connection between Jews and partisans was vague and troubled, but the significant for the Jews of Belarus, the heartland of partisan warfare, was absolutely clear. In the military occupation zone, the rear of Army Group Center, the killing of Jews began again in January 1942. An Einsatz commando painted Stars of David on their trucks to broadcast their mission of finding Jews and killing them. The leaders of Einsatzgruppe B resolved to kill all the Jews in their zone of responsibility by the 20th of April 1942, which was Hitler's birthday. The civilian occupation authorities in Minsk also followed the new line. Wilhelm Kuber, the general commissar of White Ruthenia, met with his police leaders on the 19th of January 1942. All seemed to accept Kuber's formulation. While Germany's great colonial political task in the East demanded the murder of all Jews, some would have to be preserved for a time as forced labor. Killing actions in Minsk would begin in March, directed against the population that remained in the ghetto during the day while the labor brigades were outside the ghetto at work. On the 1st of March, 1942, the Germans ordered the Judenrat to provide a quota of 5,000 Jews the following day. The ghetto underground told the Judenrat not to bargain Jewish blood, which the Judenrat was probably not inclined to do anyway. Some of the Jewish policemen, rather than aiding the Germans to make their quota, warned their fellow Jews to hide. When the quota was not delivered on the 2nd of March, the Germans shot children and stabbed to death all the wards of the Jewish orphanage. They even killed some workers returning home. In all, they murdered some 3,412 people that day. One Jewish child who escaped the bloodshed was Felix Lipsky. His father had been killed as a Polish spy in Stalin's Great Terror, disappearing, as people did then, never to be seen again. Now the boy saw people he knew as corpses in ditches. He remembered shades of white, skin, undergarments, snow. After the failure of the action of early March 1942, the Germans broke the Minsk underground and accelerated the mass murder of the Jews. In late March and early April 1942, the Germans arrested and executed some 251 underground activists, Jews and non-Jews, including the head of the Judenrat. Kazinets, the organizer of the underground, was executed that July. At around the same time, Reinhard Heydrich visited Minsk and apparently ordered the construction of a death facility. The SS set to work on a new complex at Male Trastanyets, outside Minsk. Beginning in May 1942, some 40,000 people would be killed there. The wives of German officials remembered Male Trastanyets as a nice place to ride horses and collect fur coats, taken from Jewish women before they were shot. Some 10,000 Minsk Jews were killed in the last few days of July 1942. On the last day of the month, Junita Fishnyatskaya wrote a letter to her father to bid him farewell. I am saying goodbye to you before I die. I am so afraid of this death because they throw small children into the mass graves alive. Farewell forever. I kiss you. I kiss you. It was true that Germans sometimes avoided shooting younger children, instead throwing them into the pits with the corpses and allowing them to suffocate under the earth. 
They also had at their disposal another means of killing that allowed them to avoid seeing the end of young life. Gas vans roved the streets of Minsk, the drivers seeking stray Jewish children. The people called the gas vans by a name that had been used for the NKVD trucks during the Great Terror a few years earlier. Soul destroyers. The girls and boys knew what would happen to them if they were caught. They would ask for a tattered bit of dignity as they walked up the ramp to their death. Please, sirs, they would say to the Germans, do not hit us. We can get to the trucks on our own. By spring 1942, the Jews of Minsk were coming to see the forest as less dangerous than the ghetto. Hirsch Smola himself was forced to leave the ghetto for the partisans. Of the ten thousand or so Minsk Jews who found Soviet partisan units, perhaps half survived the war. Smola was among the survivors. Yet partisans did not necessarily welcome Jews. Partisan units were meant to defeat the German occupation, not to help civilians endure it. Jews who lacked arms were often turned away, as were women and children. Even armed Jewish men were sometimes rejected, or even, in some cases, killed for their weapons. Partisan leaders feared that Jews from ghettos were German spies, an accusation that was not as absurd as it might appear. The Germans would indeed seize wives and children, and then tell Jewish husbands to go to the forest and return with information, if they wished to see their families again. The situation of Jews in the forests slowly improved over the course of 1942, as some Jews formed their own partisan units, a development that the central staff of the partisan movement eventually sanctioned. Israel Lapidus formed a unit of some fifty men. Sholem Zarin's 106th detachment counted ten times as many, and raided the Minsk ghetto to rescue Jews. In individual cases, Soviet partisan units provided diversions that allowed Jews to escape from the ghetto. In one case, partisans attacked a German unit on its way to liquidate a ghetto. Oswald Rufeisen, a Jew who worked as a translator for the German police in the town of Mir, smuggled weapons into that ghetto and warned its inhabitants when the liquidation was ordered. Tuvia Bielski, also a Jew, probably rescued more Jews than any other partisan leader. His special gift was to understand the perils of partisan warfare between Stalin and Hitler. Bielski hailed from western Belarus, which is to say from the part of northeastern Poland that the Soviets had annexed in 1939 and then lost to the Germans in 1941. He had served in the Polish army and thus had some military training. He and his family knew the woods well, probably because they were small-time smugglers. Yet his tactical sense was not reducible to any particular experience. On the one hand, he understood his goal as rescuing Jews rather than killing Germans. He and his men generally tried to avoid combat. Don't rush to fight and die, he would say. So few of us are left, we have to save lives. To save a Jew is much more important than to kill Germans. On the other hand, he was able to work with Soviet partisans when they appeared even though their task precisely was to kill Germans. Although his mobile camp was largely composed of women and children, he was able to secure recognition of his status as a partisan leader from the Soviets. By rescuing rather than resisting, Bielski saved more than one thousand people. Bielski was an anomaly within a Soviet partisan movement that was ever larger and ever more subordinate to Moscow. When 1942 began, there were, by Soviet reckonings, perhaps 23,000 partisans in Belarus. The number probably doubled by the time that the central staff was established in May, and doubled again by the end of the year. Partisans in 1941 had scarcely been able to keep themselves alive. In 1942 they were able to attain specific objectives of military and political value. They laid mines and destroyed railroad tracks and locomotives. They were supposed to keep food from the Germans and to destroy the German administration. In practice, the safest way to attack the German occupation structure was to murder unarmed participants in the civilian administration, small-town mayors, school teachers, landowners, and their families. This was not an excess. This was the official policy of the Soviet partisan movement through November 1942. Partisans sought to gain full control of territories which they called partisan republics. 
Partisan operations, effective as they sometimes were, brought inevitable destruction to the Belarusian civilian population, Jewish and Gentile alike. When the Soviet partisans prevented peasants from giving food to the Germans, they all but guaranteed that the Germans would kill the peasants. A Soviet gun threatened a peasant, and then a German gun killed him. Once the Germans believed they had lost control of a given village to the partisans, they would simply torch houses and fields. If they could not reliably get grain, they would keep it from the Soviets by seeing that it was never harvested. When Soviet partisans sabotaged trains, they were in effect ensuring that the population near the site would be exterminated. When Soviet partisans laid mines, they knew that some would detonate under the bodies of Soviet citizens. The Germans swept mines by forcing locals, Belarusians and Jews, to walk hand in hand over minefields. In general, such loss of human life was of little concern to the Soviet leadership. The people who died had been under German occupation, and were therefore suspect, and perhaps even more expendable than the average Soviet citizen. German reprisals also ensured that the ranks of the partisans swelled, as survivors often had no home, no livelihood, and no family to which to return. The Soviet leadership was not especially concerned with the plight of Jews. After November 1941, Stalin never singled out the Jews as victims of Hitler. Some partisan commanders did try to protect Jews, but the Soviets, like the Americans or the British, seemed not to have seriously contemplated direct military action to rescue Jews. The logic of the Soviet system was always to resist independent initiatives and to value human life very cheaply. Jews in ghettos were aiding the German war effort as forced laborers, so their death over pits was of little concern to authorities in Moscow. Jews who were not aiding but hindering the Germans were showing signs of a dangerous capacity for initiative, and might later resist the reimposition of Soviet rule. By Stalinist logic, Jews were suspect either way, if they remained in the ghetto and worked for the Germans, or if they left the ghetto and showed a capacity for independent action. The previous hesitation of local Minsk communists turned out to be justified. Their resistance organization was treated as a front of the Gestapo by the central staff of the partisan movement in Moscow. The people who rescued Minsk Jews and supplied Soviet partisans were labeled a tool of Hitler. Jewish men who did make it into the partisans already felt liberated, as Lev Kravitz recalled. Jewish women generally had a more difficult time. In partisan units, the standard form of address to girls and women was whore and women usually had no choice but to seek a protector. This is perhaps what Rosa Gerasimova, who survived with the partisans, meant when she recalled that life was actually unbearable, but the partisans did rescue me. Some partisan commanders, Jews and non-Jews, did try to protect family camps for women and children and the elderly. Children who had the good luck to be in family camps played a version of hide-and-seek, in which Germans hunted Jews who were protected by partisans. This was true in their case, yet while the partisans saved some 30,000 Jews, it is unclear whether their actions on balance provoked or prevented the killing of Jews. Partisan warfare behind the lines drew German police and military power away from the front and to the hinterland, where policemen and soldiers almost always found it easier to kill Jews than to hunt down and engage partisans. In the second half of 1942, German anti-partisan operations were all but indistinguishable from the mass murder of Jews. Hitler ordered on the 18th of August 1942 that partisans in Belarus be exterminated by the end of the year. It was already understood that the Jews were to be killed by the same deadline. The euphemism, special treatment, meaning shooting, appears in reports about both Jews and Belarusian civilians. The logic for the two undertakings was circular, but nevertheless somehow compelling. Jews were initially to be killed as partisans in 1941, when there were not yet any truly threatening partisan formations. Then, once there were such partisan formations, in 1942, villagers associated with them were to be destroyed like Jews. The equivalence between Jews and partisans was emphasized over and over again, in a downward cycle of rhetoric that could end only when both groups were simply gone. By the middle of 1942, the number of Jews was in rapid decline, 
but the number of partisans was in rapid ascent. This had no effect on Nazi reasoning, except to make the methods for dealing with Belarusian civilians ever more similar to the methods of dealing with Jews. As partisans became difficult to target because they were too powerful, and as Jews became difficult to target because they were too scarce, the Germans subjected the non-Jewish Belarusian population to ever more extraordinary waves of killing. From the perspective of the German police, the final solution and the anti-partisan campaigns blurred together. To take a single example, on the 22nd and 23rd of September 1942, Order Police Battalion 310 was dispatched to destroy three villages for ostensible connections to the partisans. At the first village, Borki, the police apprehended the entire population, marched the men, women and children 700 meters, and then handed out shovels so that people could dig their own graves. The policemen shot the Belarusian peasants without a break from nine in the morning until six in the evening killing 203 men, 372 women, and 130 children. The order police spared 104 people classified as reliable, though it is hard to imagine how they could have remained so after this spectacle. The battalion reached the next village, Zabloetsi, at two in the morning, and surrounded it at 5.30. They forced all of the inhabitants into the local school, and then shot 284 men, women, and children. At the third village, Borisovka, the battalion reported killing 169 men, women, and children. Four weeks later, the battalion was assigned to liquidate Jews at a work camp. When they killed 461 Jews on the 21st of October, they used very similar methods. The only difference was that there was no need to surprise the population, since it was already under guard in the camp. Despite new offensives, the war against the Jews was the only one that the Germans were winning in 1942. Army Group North continued the siege of Leningrad. Army Group Center made no progress toward Moscow. Army Group South was supposed to secure the Volga River and the oil supplies of the Caucasus. Some of its forces reached the Volga in August 1942, but were unable to take Stalingrad. German troops did race through southern Russia into the Caucasus, but were unable to control the crucial areas by winter. This would be the last major German offensive in the Eastern Front. By the end of 1942, the Germans had killed at least 208,089 Jews in Belarus. Killing Jewish civilians did nothing, however, to hinder the Red Army or even to slow the partisans. Lacking personnel in the rear and needing to keep troops at the front, the Germans tried in autumn 1942 to make anti-partisan warfare more efficient. Himmler named Bach, the local higher SS and police leader, chief of anti-partisan warfare in the areas under civilian authority. In practice, the responsibility fell upon his deputy, Kurt von Gottberg, a drunk whose SS career had been rescued by Himmler. Gottberg suffered no war injuries, but had lost part of a leg and his SS commission by driving his automobile into a fruit tree. Himmler paid for the prosthetic leg and had Gottberg reinstated. The assignment to Belarus was a chance to prove his manhood, which he seized. After only one month of police training, he formed his own battle group, which was active from November 1942 through November 1943. In their first five months of campaigning, the men of his battle group reported killing 9,432 partisans, 12,946 partisan suspects, and about 11,000 Jews. In other words, the battle group shot an average of 200 people every day, almost all of them civilians. The unit responsible for more atrocities than any other was the SS Special Commando Der Levanger, which had arrived in Belarus in February 1942. In Belarus, and indeed in all the theatres of the Second World War, few could compete in cruelty with Oskar Derlevanger. He was an alcoholic and drug addict, prone to violence. He had fought in the German right-wing militias after the First World War, and spent the early 1920s tormenting communists and writing a doctoral dissertation on planned economics. He joined the Nazi Party in 1923, but jeopardized his political future by traffic accidents and sexual liaisons with an underage girl. In March 1940, Himmler placed him in charge of a special poacher's brigade, 
a unit made up of criminals imprisoned for hunting on the property of others. Some Nazi leaders romanticized these men, seeing them as pure primitive German types resisting the tyranny of the law. The hunters were first assigned to Lublin, where the unit was strengthened by other criminals, including murderers and the clinically insane. In Belarus, Dierlewanger and his hunters did engage partisans, yet more often they killed civilians whose villages were in the wrong place. Dierlewanger's preferred method was to herd the local population inside a barn, set the barn on fire, and then shoot with machine guns anyone who tried to escape. The SS Special Commando Dierlewanger killed at least 30,000 civilians in its Belarusian tour of duty. Dierlewanger's unit was one of several Waffen-SS and Order Police formations assigned to Belarus to reinforce the battered regular army. By late 1942, German soldiers were horribly fatigued, conscious of defeat, relieved of normal legal obligations to civilians, and under orders to treat partisans with extreme brutality. When assigned to anti-partisan duty, soldiers faced the anxiety of fighting a foe who could appear and disappear at any time, and who knew the land as the soldiers did not. Wehrmacht troops were now cooperating with the police and the SS, whose main task for some time had been the mass murder of civilians, above all Jews. All knew that they were supposed to exterminate the partisans. In these circumstances, the death toll among civilians was bound to be terribly high, regardless of the particulars of German tactics. The main German actions of mid-1942 and onward, known as large operations, were actually designed to kill Belarusian civilians as well as Belarusian Jews. Unable to defeat the partisans as such, the Germans killed the people who might be aiding the struggle. Units were given a daily kill quota, which they generally met by encircling villages and shooting most or all of the inhabitants. They shot people over ditches, or, in the case of Derlewanger and those who followed his example, burned them in barns, or blew them up by forcing them to clear mines. In autumn 1942 and early 1943, the Germans liquidated ghettos and whole villages associated with the partisans. In Operation Swamp Fever in September 1942, the Derlewanger Brigade killed the 8,350 Jews still alive in the ghetto at Baranovici and then proceeded to kill 389 bandits and 1,274 bandit suspects. These attacks were led by Friedrich Jekyll, the higher SS and police chief for Reichskommissariat Ostland, the same man who had organized the mass shootings of Jews at Kamianets Podilsky in Ukraine and the liquidation of the Riga ghetto in Latvia. Operation Hornung of February 1943 began with the liquidation of the Slutz ghetto, which is to say the shooting of some 3,300 Jews. In an area southwest of Slutsk, the Germans killed about 9,000 more people. By early 1943, the people of Belarus, especially the young men, were caught in a deadly competition between German forces and Soviet partisans that made nonsense of the ideologies of both sides. The Germans, lacking personnel, had recruited local men to their police forces and, in the second half of 1942, to a self-defense militia. Many of these people had been communists before the war. The partisans, for their part, began in 1943 to recruit Belarusian policemen in the German service, since these men had at least some arms and training. It was the battlefield failures of the Wehrmacht, rather than any local political or ideological commitment, that determined where Belarusians chose to fight, when they had a choice. The summer offensive of Army Group South failed, and the entire Sixth Army was destroyed in the Battle of Stalingrad. When news of the Wehrmacht's defeat reached Belarus in February 1943, as many as 12,000 policemen and militiamen left the German service and joined the Soviet partisans. According to one report, 800 did so on the 23rd of February alone. This meant that some Belarusians who had killed Jews in the service of Nazis in 1941 and 1942 joined the Soviet partisans in 1943. More than this, the people who recruited these Belarusian policemen, the political officers among the partisans, were sometimes Jews who had escaped death at the hands of Belarusian policemen by fleeing the ghettos. Jews trying to survive the Holocaust recruited its perpetrators. 
Only the Jews, or the few who remained in Belarus in 1943, had a clear reason to be on one side rather than the other. Since they were the Germans' obvious and declared enemy in this war, and German enmity meant murder, they had every incentive to join the Soviets, despite the dangers of partisan life. For Belarusians and Russians and Poles, the risks were more balanced, but the possibility of uninvolvement kept receding. For the Belarusians who ended up fighting and dying on one side or the other, it was very often a matter of chance, a question of who was in the village when the Soviet partisans or the German police appeared on their recruiting missions, which often simply involved press-ganging the young men. Since both sides knew that their membership was largely accidental, they would subject new recruits to grotesque tests of loyalty, such as killing friends or family members who had been captured fighting on the other side. As more and more of the Belarusian population was swept into the partisans or the various police and paramilitaries that the Germans hastily organized, such events simply revealed the essence of the situation. Belarus was a society divided against itself by others. In Belarus, as elsewhere, local German policy was conditioned by general economic concerns. By 1943, the Germans were worried more about labor shortages than about food shortages, and so their policy in Belarus shifted. As the war against the Soviet Union continued and the Wehrmacht took horrible losses month upon month, German men had to be taken from German farms and factories and sent to the front. Such people then had to be replaced if the German economy was to function. Hermann Goering issued an extraordinary directive in October 1942. Belarusian men in suspicious villages were not to be shot, but rather kept alive and sent as forced laborers to Germany. People who could work were to be selected for labor rather than killed, even if they had taken up arms against Germany. By now, Goering seemed to reason, their labor power was all that they could offer to the Reich and it was more significant than their death. Since the Soviet partisans controlled ever more Belarusian territory, ever less food was reaching Germany in any case. If Belarusian peasants could not work for Germany in Belarus, best to force them to work in Germany. This was very grim reaping. Hitler made clear in December 1942 what Goering had implied. The women and children, regarded as less useful as labor, were to be shot. This was a particularly spectacular example of the German campaign to gather forced labor in the East, which had begun with the Poles of the general government and spread to Ukraine before reaching this bloody climax in Belarus. By the end of the war, some eight million foreigners from the East, most of them Slavs, were working in the Reich. It was a rather perverse result, even by the standards of Nazi racism. German men went abroad and killed millions of subhumans, only to import millions of other subhumans to do the work in Germany that the German men would have been doing themselves, had they not been abroad killing subhumans. The net effect, setting aside the mass killing abroad, was that Germany became more of a Slavic land than it had ever been in history. The perversity would reach its extreme in the first months of 1945, when surviving Jews were sent to labor camps in Germany itself. Having killed 5.4 million Jews as racial enemies, the Germans then brought Jewish survivors home to do the work that the killers might have been doing themselves, had they not been abroad killing. Under this new policy, German policemen and soldiers were to kill Belarusian women and children so that their husbands and fathers and brothers could be used as slave laborers. The anti-partisan operations of spring and summer 1943 were thus slavery campaigns rather than warfare of any recognizable kind. Yet because the slave hunts and associated mass murder were sometimes resisted by the Soviet partisans, the Germans did take losses. In May and June 1943, in operations Marksman and Gypsy Baron, named after an opera and an operetta, the Germans aimed to secure railways in the Minsk region as well as workers for Germany. They reported killing 3,152 partisans and deporting 15,801 laborers. Yet they took 294 dead of their own, an absurdly low ratio of one to ten, if one assumed, wrongly, that reported partisan dead were actual partisans rather than generally civilians, but still a significant number. In May 1943, in Operation Cottbus, 
the Germans sought to clear all partisans from an area about 140 kilometers north of Minsk. Their forces destroyed village after village by herding populations into barns and then burning the barns to the ground. On the following days, the local swine and dogs, now without masters, would be seen in villages with burned human limbs in their jaws. The official count was 6,087 dead. But the Derlevanga Brigade alone reported 14,000 killed in this operation. The majority of the dead were women and children. About 6,000 men were sent to Germany as laborers. Operation Hermann, named for Hermann Goering, reached the extreme of this economic logic in summer 1943. Between the 13th of July and the 11th of August, German battle groups were to choose a territory, kill all of the inhabitants except for promising male labor, take all property that could be moved, and then burn everything left standing. After the labor selections among the local Belarusian and Polish populations, the Belarusian and Polish women, children, and aged were shot. This operation took place in western Belarus, in lands that had been invaded by the Soviet Union and annexed from Poland in 1939 before the German invasion that followed in 1941. Polish partisans were also to be found in these forests, fighters who believed that these lands should be restored to Poland. Thus, German anti-partisan actions here were directed against both the Soviet partisans, representing the power that had governed in 1939 to 1941, and the Polish underground, fighting for Polish independence and territorial integrity with the boundaries of 1918 to 1939. The Polish forces were part of the Polish Home Army, reporting to the Polish government in exile in London. Poland was one of the Allies, and so, in principle, Polish and Soviet forces were fighting together against the Germans. But because both the Soviet Union and Poland claimed these lands of Western Soviet Belarus, from the Soviet perspective, or Northeastern Poland, from the Polish, matters were not so simple in practice. Polish fighters found themselves trapped between lawless Soviet and German forces. Polish civilians were massacred by Soviet partisans when Polish forces did not subordinate themselves to Moscow. In Naliboki, on the 8th of May 1943, for example, Soviet partisans shot 127 Poles. Red Army officers invited Home Army officers to negotiate in summer 1943 and then murdered them on the way to the rendezvous points. The commander of the Soviet partisan movement believed that the way to deal with the Home Army was to denounce its men to the Germans, who would then shoot the Poles. Meanwhile, Polish forces were also attacked by the Germans. Polish commanders were in contact with both the Soviets and the Germans at various points, but could make a true alliance with neither. The Polish goal, after all, was to restore an independent Poland within its pre-war boundaries. Just how difficult that would be, as Hitler's power gave way to Stalin's, was becoming clear in the Belarusian swamps. The Germans called the areas cleared of populations in Operation Hermann and the succeeding operations of 1943 dead zones. People found in a dead zone were fair game. The Wehrmacht's 45th Security Regiment killed civilians in Operation Easter Bunny of April 1943. Remnants of Einsatzgruppe D, dispatched to Belarus in spring 1943, contributed to this undertaking. They came from southern Russia and southern Ukraine, where the remnants of Army Group South were falling back after the defeat at Stalingrad. The task of Einsatzgruppe D there had been to cover the German retreat by killing civilians wherever resistance had been reported. In Belarus, it was burning down villages where no resistance whatsoever was encountered after taking whatever livestock it could. Einsatzgruppe D was no longer covering a withdrawal of the Wehrmacht, as it had been further south, but preparing for one. The resort to dead zones implied a recognition that Soviet power would soon return to Belarus. Army Group South, much reduced and fighting under other names, was in retreat. Army Group North still besieged Leningrad, pointlessly. Belarus itself was still behind the lines of Army Group Center, but not for long. At various points during the German occupation of Belarus, it did dawn on some German military and civilian leaders that mass terror was failing, and that the Belarusian population had to be rallied by some means other than terror to support German rule, if the Red Army was to be defeated. This was impossible. 
As everywhere in the occupied Soviet Union, the Germans had succeeded in making most people wish for a return of Soviet rule. A German propaganda specialist sent to Belarus reported that there was nothing that he could possibly tell the population. The German-backed Russian Popular Army of Liberation, Rona in a Russian abbreviation, was the most dramatic attempt to gain local support. It was led by Bronislav Kaminsky, a Soviet citizen of Russian nationality and Polish and perhaps German descent, who had apparently been sent to a Soviet special settlement in the 1930s. He presented himself as an opponent of collectivization. The Germans permitted him an experiment in local self-government in the town of Lokot in northwestern Russia. There Kaminsky was placed in charge of anti-partisan operations, and locals were indeed allowed to keep more of the grain that they produced. As the war turned against the Germans, Kaminsky and his entire apparatus were dispatched from Russia to Belarus, where they were supposed to play a similar role. Kaminsky was ordered to fight the Soviet partisans in Belarus, but he and his group could barely protect themselves in their home base. Understandably, the Belarusian locals regarded Rona as foreigners who were taking land while speaking about property rights. In 1942 and 1943, Wilhelm Kuba, the head of the General Commissariat White Rusinia, tried to reverse some of the basic principles of German colonialism in the hope of rallying the population to resist the Red Army. He tried nationality concessions, sponsoring Belarusian schools, and organizing various Belarusian advisory councils and militias. In June 1943, he went so far as to undo the collectivization of agriculture, decreeing that Belarusian peasants could own their own land. The policy was doubly absurd. Much of the countryside was controlled by the partisans who killed people who opposed collective farming and the German army and police in the meantime were rejecting property rights in a comparably categorical way by looting and burning farmsteads, killing farm families, and sending farmers to work as forced laborers in Germany. Since the Germans did not respect the Belarusian peasants' right to life, peasants found it hard to take seriously the new commitment to private property. Even if Kuba had somehow succeeded, his policies revealed the impossibility of a German colonization of the East. The Slavs were meant to be starved and displaced. Kuba wanted to govern and fight with their help. The collective farm was to be maintained to extract food. Kuba promised to dissolve it and allow Belarusians to farm as they wished. By undoing both Soviet and Nazi policies, Kuba was revealing their basic similarity in the countryside. Both Soviet self-colonization and German racial colonization involved purposeful economic exploitation. But because the Germans were more murderous, and because German murders were fresher in the minds of the locals, Soviet power came to seem like the lesser evil, or even like a liberation. The Soviet partisans put an end to Kuba's experiments. He was killed by a bomb that his maid placed under his bed in September 1943. In Belarus, more than anywhere else, the Nazi and Soviet systems overlapped and interacted. Its relatively small territory was the site of intensive warfare, partisan campaigning, and mass atrocity. It was the rear area of a German army group center that would do anything to take Moscow, and the target of the Red Army divisions of the Belarusian Front who were planning to return. It was fully controlled by neither the German administration nor the partisans, each of which used terror in the absence of reliable material or moral inducements to loyalty. It was home to one of Europe's densest populations of Jews, doomed to destruction, but also unusually capable of resistance. It seems likely that more Jews resisted Hitler in Minsk and Belarus than anywhere else, although, with rare exceptions, they could not resist Nazi rule without aiding Soviet power. Bielski's and Zorin's units were the largest Jewish partisan formations in Europe. There was no grey area, no liminal zone, no marginal space. None of the comforting clichés of the sociology of mass murder applied. It was black on black. Germans killed Jews as partisans, and many Jews became partisans. The Jews who became partisans were serving the Soviet regime, and were taking part in a Soviet policy to bring down retributions upon civilians. The partisan war in Belarus was a perversely interactive effort of Hitler and Stalin, who each ignored the laws of war and escalated the conflict behind the front lines. 
Once both Operation Barbarossa and Operation Typhoon had failed, the German position in the rear was doomed. Initial anti-partisan policy, like so much else in German planning, depended upon a quick and total victory. Personnel were sufficient to kill Jews, but not to fight partisans. Lacking adequate personnel, the Germans murdered and intimidated. Terror served as a force multiplier, but the forces multiplied were ultimately Stalin's. There was a Soviet partisan movement, and the Germans did try to suppress it. Yet German policies, in practice, were little more than mass murder. In one Wehrmacht report, 10,431 partisans were reported shot, but only 90 guns were reported taken. That means that almost all of those killed were, in fact, civilians. As it inflicted its first 15,000 mortal casualties, the Special Commando Derlewanger lost only 92 men, many of them, no doubt, to friendly fire and alcoholic accidents. A ratio such as that was possible only when the victims were unarmed civilians. Under the cover of anti-partisan operations, the Germans murdered Belarusian, or Jewish, or Polish, or Russian civilians in 5,295 different localities in occupied Soviet Belarus. Several hundred of these villages and towns were burned to the ground. All in all, the Germans killed about 350,000 people in their anti-partisan campaign, at the very least 90% of them unarmed. The Germans killed half a million Jews in Belarus, including 30,000 during the anti-partisan operations. It was unclear just how these 30,000 people were to be counted, as Jews killed in the final solution, or as Belarusian civilians killed in anti-partisan reprisals. The Germans themselves often failed to make the distinction, for very practical reasons. As one German commander confided to his diary, the bandits and Jews burned in houses and bunkers were not counted. Of the nine million people who were on the territory of Soviet Belarus in 1941, some 1.6 million were killed by the Germans in actions away from battlefields, including about 700,000 prisoners of war, 500,000 Jews, and 320,000 people counted as partisans, the vast majority of whom were unarmed civilians. These three general campaigns constituted the three greatest German atrocities in Eastern Europe, and together they struck Belarus with the greatest force and malice. Another several hundred thousand inhabitants of Soviet Belarus were killed in action as soldiers of the Red Army. The Soviet partisans also contributed to the total number of fatalities. They reported killing 17,431 people as traitors on the terrain of Soviet Belarus by the 1st of January 1944. This figure does not include civilians whom they killed for other reasons, or civilians whom they killed in the following months. In all, tens of thousands of people in Belarus were killed by the partisans in their own retribution actions, or in the western regions taken from Poland as class enemies. A few more tens of thousands of people native to the region certainly died after arrests during the Soviet occupation of 1939 to 1941 and especially during the Soviet deportations of 1940 and 1941, during the journey or in Kazakhstan. A rough estimate of two million total mortal losses on the territory of present-day Belarus during the Second World War seems reasonable and conservative. More than a million other people fled the Germans, and another two million were deported as forced labor or removed from their original residence for another reason. Beginning in 1944, the Soviets deported a quarter million more people to Poland, and tens of thousands more to the Gulag. By the end of the war, half the population of Belarus had either been killed or moved. This cannot be said of any other European country. The Germans intended worse than they achieved. The starvation of prisoners of war at Stalag 352 in Minsk and other prisoner of war camps was only a fraction of the deaths foreseen by the hunger plan. The clearing of peasants were on a smaller scale than the massive depopulation of Belarus envisaged by General Plan Ost. About a million Belarusians were exploited as forced labor, though not always worked to death, as envisaged by General Plan Ost. Mahilau, where the mass extermination of urban Jews began and where the anti-partisan clinic was held, was supposed to become a large killing facility. It did not. It seems that the crematoria ordered by the SS for Mahilau ended up in Auschwitz. 
Minsk, too, was to be the site of a killing facility, with its own crematoria. Once the work of killing was completed, Minsk itself was to be leveled. Wilhelm Kuber imagined replacing the city with a German settlement named Asgard, after the mythical home of the Norse gods. Of the Nazi utopias, only the elimination of the Jews was realized, although again not exactly as the Germans had planned. In Belarus, as elsewhere, the final solution was the one atrocity that took on a more radical form in the realization than in the conception. Soviet Jews were supposed to work themselves to death, building a German empire, or be deported further east. This proved impossible. Most Jews in the east were killed where they lived. In Minsk, there were a few exceptions, those Jews who escaped and survived, often at the price of partaking in the descent into mass violence, and those Jews kept for labor, who died a bit later than the others, and sometimes further from home. In September 1943, some of the last Jews of Minsk were deported west to occupied Poland, to a facility known as Sobibor. There they encountered a death factory of a kind unknown even in Belarus, where, one might have thought, all earthly horrors had already been revealed. Chapter 8 The Nazi Death Factories about 5.4 million Jews died under German occupation. Nearly half of them were murdered east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, usually by bullets, sometimes by gas. The rest perished west of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, usually by gas, sometimes by bullets. East of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, a million Jews were killed in the second half of 1941, in the first six months of the German occupation. Another million were killed in 1942. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, Jews came under German control significantly earlier, but were killed later. In the East, the most economically productive Jews, the young men, were often shot right away, in the first days or weeks of the war. Then economic arguments were turned against the women, children, and elderly, who became useless eaters. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, ghettos were established pending a deportation to Lublin, Madagascar, or Russia that never came. Uncertainty about the final version of the final solution between 1939 and 1941 meant that Jews west of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line were put to work. This created a certain economic argument for their preservation. The mass murder of Polish Jews in the general government and in Polish lands annexed to Germany was initiated after more than two years of German occupation and more than a year after Jews had been consigned to ghettos. These Polish Jews were gassed at six major facilities, four in the general government and two in the lands annexed to the Reich, function in one combination or another from December 1941 through November 1944. Xelno Buzets, Sobibor, Treblinka, Majdanek, Auschwitz. The core of the killing campaign west of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line was Operation Reinhardt, the gassing of 1.3 million Polish Jews at Buzets, Sobibor, and Treblinka in 1942. Its last chapter was Auschwitz, where about 200,000 Polish Jews and more than 700,000 other European Jews were gassed most of them in 1943 and 1944. The origins of Operation Reinhardt lie in Himmler's interpretations of Hitler's desires. Aware of the successful gassing experiments performed on Soviet prisoners of war, Himmler entrusted the creation of a new gassing facility for Jews to his client Odilo Globochnik on about the 13th of October 1941. Globochnik was the SS and police leader of the Lublin district of the general government, which was a crucial testing ground for Nazi racial utopias. Globochnik had expected that millions of Jews would be deported to his region where he would put them to work in slave labor colonies. After the attack on the Soviet Union, Globochnik was charged with the implementation of General Plan Ost. Though this grand design for exterminatory colonization was generally tabled after the Soviet Union failed to collapse, Globochnik actually implemented it in part in his Lublin district, driving a hundred thousand Poles from their homes. He wanted a general cleansing of the general government of Jews, and also of Poles. 
By late October 1941, Globochnik had chosen a site for the new gassing facility, Buzhets, just south and east of Lublin. The changing plans for the use of this place revealed a shift of Nazi utopias from exterminatory colonization to extermination as such. In 1940, Globochnik had established a slave labor site at Buzhets, where he imagined that two million Jews would dig anti-tank ditches by hand. He harbored such fantasies because an early version of the final solution had involved the deportation of European Jews to his Lublin district. In the event, Globochnik had to settle for a labor force at Buzhets of no more than 30,000 Jews. He finally abandoned his defense project in October 1940. A year later, having spoken to Himmler, he imagined another way to exploit the site, for the extermination of the Jews. Globochnik would seek and find a way for Germans to kill Jews west of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, where they lacked the personnel for mass shooting campaigns and where they were unwilling to arm Poles as auxiliaries. The facility at Buzhets would require just a few German commanders to operate. The basic labor would be provided by Jewish slaves. The facility would be guarded and operated chiefly with non-Germans chosen from the training camp at Travniki in the Lublin district. The first Travniki men were captured Red Army soldiers taken from the prisoner of war camps. The Travniki men were largely Soviet Ukrainians, but included representatives of other Soviet nationalities, including Russians and the occasional person of Jewish origin, chosen, of course, by accident. The Germans preferred Soviet Germans when they could be found. The changing mission of the Travniki men, like the changing use of Buzhets, revealed the transformation of Hitler's utopias. In Globochnik's initial scheme, these men were to serve as policemen under German command in the conquered Soviet Union. Since the Soviet Union was not in fact conquered, the Travniki men could be prepared for another special task operating the facilities where the Jews of Poland would be gassed. The Travniki men knew nothing of this general design when they were recruited, and had no political or personal stake in this policy. For them, Poland was a foreign country, and its Jews were a foreign people. They presumably had a strong interest in keeping their jobs. Their recruitment rescued them from a likely death by starvation. Even if they somehow had the courage to defy the Germans anyway, they knew that they could not safely return to the Soviet Union. In leaving the Dulags and Stalags, they had stamped themselves as German collaborators. In December 1941, the Travniki men, wearing black uniforms, assisted in the construction of a ramp and a rail spur, which would allow communication by train to Buzhets. Soviet citizens were providing the labor for a German killing policy. Buzhets was not to be a camp. People spend the night at camps. Belzec was to be a death factory, where Jews would be killed upon arrival. There was a German precedent for such a facility, where people arrived under false pretenses, were told that they needed to be showered, and then were killed by carbon monoxide gas. Between 1939 and 1941 in Germany, six killing facilities had been used to murder the handicapped, the mentally ill, and others deemed unworthy of life. After a test run of gassing the Polish handicapped in the Vaterland, Hitler's chancellery organized a secret program to kill German citizens. It was staffed by doctors, nurses, and police chiefs. One of its main organizers was Hitler's personal doctor. The medical science of the mass murder was simple. Carbon monoxide, CO, binds much better than oxygen, O2, to the hemoglobin in blood, and thereby prevents red blood cells from performing their normal function of bringing oxygen to tissues. The victims were brought in for ostensible medical examinations, and then led to showers, where they were asphyxiated by carbon monoxide released from canisters. If the victims had gold teeth, they were marked beforehand with a chalk cross on their backs, so that these could be extracted after their death. Children were the first victims, the parents receiving mendacious letters from doctors about how they had died during treatment. Most of the victims of the euthanasia program were non-Jewish Germans, although German Jews with disabilities were simply killed without any screening whatsoever. At one killing facility, the personnel celebrated the ten-thousandth cremation by bedecking a corpse with flowers. 
The declared end of the euthanasia program coincided with Globochnik's mission to develop a new technique for the gassing of Polish Jews. By August 1941, when Hitler called the program to a halt for fear of domestic resistance, it had registered 70,273 deaths and created a model of deceptive killing by lethal gas. The suspension of the euthanasia program left a group of policemen and doctors with certain skills, but without employment. In October 1941, Glavochnik summoned a group of them to the Lublin district to run his planned death facilities for Jews. Some 92 of the 450 or so men who would serve Globochnik in the task of gassing the Polish Jews had prior experience in the euthanasia program. The most important of them was Christian Wirth, who had overseen the euthanasia program. As the head of Hitler's chancellery put it, a large part of my organization was to be used in a solution to the Jewish question that will extend to the ultimate possible consequences. Globochnik was not the only one to exploit the experience of the euthanasia crews. A gassing facility at Xelmo in Nevatoland also exploited the technical experience of the euthanasia program. Whereas Globochnik's Lublin district was the experimental site for the destructive side of Himmler's program for strengthening Germandom, Arthur Greiser's Vaterland was the site of most actual deportation. Hundreds of thousands of Poles were shipped to the general government, and hundreds of thousands of Germans arrived from the Soviet Union. Greiser faced the same problem as Hitler, on a smaller scale. After all the movement, the Jews remained, and by late 1941 no plausible site for deportation was evident. Greiser did manage to deport a few thousand Jews to the general government, but these were replaced by Jews deported from the rest of Germany. The head of the Zecherheitsdienst, SD, in Greiser's regional capital Poznan, had proposed a solution on the 16th of July 1941. There is the danger this winter that the Jews can no longer all be fed. It is to be seriously considered whether the most humane solution might not be to finish off those Jews not capable of working by some sort of fast-working preparation. This would in any event be more pleasant than letting them starve. The fast-working preparation was carbon monoxide, as used in the euthanasia program. A gas van was tested on Soviet prisoners of war in September 1941. Thereafter, gas vans were used in occupied Belarus and Ukraine, especially to kill children. The killing machine at Xelno was a parked gas van, operated under the supervision of Herbert Langer, who had gassed the handicapped in the euthanasia program. As of the 5th of December, Germans were using the Xelno facility to kill Jews in the Vaterland. Some 145,301 Jews were killed at Xelno in 1941 or 1942. Xelno was operative until the Jewish population of the Vaterland was reduced, essentially, to a very functional labor camp inside the Lodz ghetto. But the killing paused in early April, just as the killing in the Lublin district was beginning. Buzhets was to be a new model, more efficient and more durable than Xelno. Most likely in consultation with Wirt, Globochnik decided to build a permanent facility where many people could be gassed at once behind walls, as with the euthanasia program, but one where carbon monoxide gas could be reliably generated from internal combustion engines, as with the gas vans. Rather than parking a vehicle, as at Xelno, this meant removing the engine from a vehicle, linking it with pipes to a purpose-built gas chamber, surrounding that gas chamber with fences, and then connecting the death factory to population centers by rail. Such were the simple innovations of Buzhets, but they were enough. The Nazi leadership had always understood the Polish Jews to be at the heart of the Jewish problem. The German occupation had divided Jews who had been Polish citizens into three different political zones. As of December 1941, some 300,000 Polish Jews were living in the Vaterland and other Polish lands annexed to Germany. They were now subject to gassing at Selno. The 1.3 million or so Polish Jews on the eastern side of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line were subject to shooting from June 1941, and most of their number would be killed in 1942. The largest group of Polish Jews under German occupation were those in ghettos in the general government. 
Until June 1941, the general government held half of the pre-war population of Polish Jews, about 1,613,000 people. When a Galicia district was added after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the number of Jews in the general government reached about 2,143,000. Those half million or so Jews in Galicia, east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, were subject to shooting. When Himmler and Globocznik began, in March 1942, to kill the Polish Jews of the general government, they were undertaking an unambiguous policy to destroy the major Jewish population of Europe. On the 14th of March, 1942, Himmler spent the night in Lublin and spoke with Globocznik. Two days later, the Germans began the deportation of Jews from the Lublin district to Buzhets. On the night of the 16th of March, about 1,600 Jews who lacked labor documents were rounded up in Lublin, shipped away, and gassed. In the second half of March, 1942, the Germans began to clear the Lublin district of Jews village by village, town by town. Hermann Hoefler, Globocznik's lieutenant for resettlement, led a staff that developed the necessary techniques. Jews from smaller ghettos were ordered to larger ones. Then Jews with dangerous associations, suspected communists and Polish army veterans, were shot. In the final preparatory step, the population was filtered, and younger men and others deemed suitable for labor were given new papers. West of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the Germans arranged matters so that they did less of the actual killing themselves. The institutions of the ghetto, its Judenrat and Jewish police force, were turned toward its destruction. Globocznik's staff would begin an action in a given town or city by contacting the local security police, and then assemble a force of German policemen. If the Germans had at their disposal a Jewish police force, as they did in communities of any size, Jewish policemen were then required to do the bulk of the actual work of assembling their fellow Jews for transports. In cities, the Jewish police far outnumbered the Germans from whom they took orders. Since they had no firearms, they could only use force against fellow Jews. Sometimes Travniki men were also available to help. The German police ordered the Jewish police to assemble the Jewish population at a given assembly point by a certain time. At first, Jews were often lured to the collection point with promises of food or more attractive labor assignments in the East. Then, in roundups that took several days, the Germans and the Jewish police would blockade particular blocks or particular houses and force their inhabitants to go to a collection point. Germans shot small children, pregnant women, and the handicapped or elderly on the spot. In larger towns and cities, where more than one round-up was necessary, these measures were repeated with increasing violence. The Germans were aiming for daily quotas to fill trains, and would sometimes pass on quotas to the Jewish police, who were responsible, at the risk of their own positions and thus lives, for filling them. The ghetto was sealed during and also after the action, so that the German police could plunder without hindrance from the local population. Once the Jews reached Buzhets, they were doomed. They arrived unarmed to a closed and guarded facility, with little chance of understanding their situation, let alone resisting the Germans and the armed Travniki men. Much like the patients at the euthanasia centers, they were told that they had to enter a certain building in order to be disinfected. They were required to remove their clothes and discard their valuables, on the explanation that these two would be disinfected and returned. Then they were marched, naked, into chambers that were pumped full of carbon monoxide. Only two or three Jews who disembarked at Buzhets survived. About 434,508 did not. Wirt commanded the facility through the summer of 1942 and seems to have excelled in his duties. Thereafter he would serve as general inspector of Buzhets and the two other facilities that would be built on the same model. This system worked nearly to perfection in the Lublin district of the general government. Deportations to Buzhets from the Krakow district began slightly later, with similar results. Jews from the Galicia district suffered from the overlap of two German killing methods. Beginning in summer 1941, they were shot, and then from March 1942, they were gassed at Buzhets. 
Galicia was to the east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, and so Jews there were subject to shooting. But it had been added to the general government, so its Jews were also subject to gassing. Thomas Hecht, a Galician Jew who survived, recounted some of the ways Jews might die in Galicia. Two aunts, an uncle and a cousin were gassed at Beltzek. His father, one of his brothers, an aunt, an uncle and a cousin were shot. His other brother died at a labor camp. Meanwhile, Globochnik's staff and his Travniki men built another death facility on the Buzhets model in the Lublin district, at Sobibor, just north of Lublin. Functional from April 1942, it killed, in exactly the same way as Beltek, some 180,000 Jews, with only about 40 survivors. Globochnik and his men had mastered the necessary procedures for the core of the operation. Roundups in the ghettos, carried out by Hoefler's men, German police and locals. Order in the camps, as maintained by a crew of Travniki men, a few Germans, and a large Jewish workforce. And the mass murder itself, carried out by suffocation through exposure to carbon monoxide from an internal combustion engine. Having achieved mortality rates of 99.99% at Buzhets and Sobibor, Himmler ordered on the 17th of April 1942 the construction of a third facility, this time in the Warsaw district of the general government. A crew with euthanasia experience, accompanied by Travniki men, was dispatched to a site near the village of Treblinka, where construction of the death factory began on the 1st of June 1942. The laborers were Jews from the region, who were killed when the project was complete. The man who oversaw the construction was, like the commanders of Buzhets and Sobibor, a veteran of the euthanasia program. Unlike Franz Stangl at Sobibor and Christian Wirt at Buzhets, however, Ermfried Eberl was a medical doctor rather than a police chief. He had directed two of the euthanasia facilities. Eberl seemed delighted at his latest assignment. It's going very well for me, he wrote to his wife during the construction of the death facility at Treblinka. There's lots to do, and that's fun. As the camp neared completion, he was pleased and proud of this accomplishment. He was happy that Globochnik's Lublin model would be extended to Warsaw. Home to much of the Polish educated classes and to Europe's largest society of Jews, Warsaw was a metropolis that had no place in the Nazi worldview. As of spring 1942, more than 350,000 Jews were still alive in the Warsaw Ghetto. Warsaw was the largest city in the general government, but not its administrative center. Hans Frank, the general governor, preferred to rule from Krakow, taking over the ancient Polish royal castle and presenting himself as latter-day racial royalty. In October 1939, he had stymied attempts to resolve the Jewish problem by transporting Jews into the Lublin district of the general government. In December 1941, Frank told his subordinates that they must get rid of the Jews. He had no idea, even then, how this could be achieved. But by spring 1942, Frank knew. Lublin had something to offer Frank. It was no longer the district that would attract more Jews to the general government, but the place where Jews who already lived in the general government could be murdered. This was welcome. Travniki men arrived in Warsaw in February and April. In summer 1942, Frank ceded control of Jewish employment, and then the ghettos themselves to the SS. The assassination of a very prominent SS commander provided the pretext for the next escalation. After Hitler and Himmler, Reinhard Heydrich was the most important architect of the policy to exterminate the Jews. He was also a typical example of the Nazi tendency to entrust several offices to one person. Already the head of the Reich Security main office, he was placed in charge of the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, the Czech lands annexed to Germany in 1939. On the 27th of May, 1942, he was injured in an assassination attempt by a Czech and a Slovak employed by British intelligence, and died on the 4th of June. Hitler and Himmler were annoyed with him for travelling without a security detail, which Heydrich believed he did not need because of his popularity among Czechs. In the Czech lands, the Germans pursued no repressive policies comparable to those in occupied Poland and the Soviet Union. Heydrich had made a special point of favoring the Czech working class. 
Heydrich's assassination meant the loss of a planner of the final solution, but the gain of a martyr. Hitler and Himmler met and spoke on June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 1942. Himmler gave the eulogy. Ours is the holy duty to avenge his death, to take up his labor, and to destroy the enemies of our people without mercy or weakness. One Czech village, Lidice, would be totally destroyed as retribution for the assassination of Heydrich. Its men were shot on the spot, its women sent to the German concentration camp at Ravensbrück, and the children gassed at Kselno. The Nazi policy of the complete elimination of Polish Jews in the general government now took the name Operation Reinhardt as a tribute to Heydrich. The reference to the assassination made victims of the Germans, and allowed the mass murder of Jews to be presented as retribution. Within the Nazi worldview, the assassination of Heydrich in May 1942 played a role similar to that of the American declaration of war in December 1941. It gave rise to a feeling of righteous solidarity among the ostensibly attacked Nazis, and it distracted attention from the true sources of German predicaments and policies. Heydrich became a prominent victim of the supposed international Jewish conspiracy that was responsible for the war. Jews were killed because Hitler had defined this as an aim of the war. But even after he made his desires known, the timing of their death was conditioned by German perceptions of the war's course and associated economic priorities. Jews were more likely to die when Germans were concerned with food shortages, and less likely to die when Germans were concerned with labor shortages. Hitler announced his decision to kill all the Jews not long after he had announced his decision that Soviet prisoners of war should be used as labor rather than killed. In early 1942, surviving Soviet prisoners of war were integrated into the labor force in Germany proper, while Hans Frank succeeded in organizing a colonial Polish economy in his general government. With labor supplies momentarily assured, food became the primary concern, both in the Reich and in occupied Poland. Goering had to announce cuts in food rations for Germans in the Reich in April 1942 and the average consumption of calories in the Reich did indeed decline considerably that year. Frank, for his part, was concerned with the improvement of food supplies to his Polish working class. Thus, in summer 1942, economic concerns, as understood by the Germans, hastened rather than hindered the plan to murder all of the Polish Jews. When food rather than labor was the primary anxiety, Jews became useless eaters and even those working for the benefit of the German economy and the Wehrmacht were in danger. By the end of 1942, Hans Frank again wanted labor more than he wanted food, and thus wanted remaining Jews to be kept alive. By then, most Polish Jews were already dead. The German economy was like a razor tightrope that Jews were forced to walk, barefoot, blindfolded, and without a net. It was all that was between them and death. It was bloody and treacherous. It was certain to fail them. The death facility at Treblinka was completed on the 11th of July, 1942. Eight days later, on the 19th of July, 1942, Himmler ordered the complete resettlement of the entire Jewish population of the general government by the 31st of December, 1942. This meant, before all, Warsaw. In Warsaw, on the 22nd of July, 1942, Globochnik's resettlement specialist, Hermann Hofler, and his group of SS ghetto-clearers briefed the local security police in Warsaw, and then paid a visit to Adam Chernyakov, head of the Judenrat. Hofler told Chernyakov that he would have to present 5,000 Jews at a transfer point, or Umschlagplatz, the following day. Chernyakov, who knew of the earlier ghetto clearings in the Lublin district, seemed to grasp what was afoot. Rather than accept responsibility for a part in the coordination of the murder of his people, he killed himself. With Chernyakov dead, the Germans then turned to deception, ordering the Jewish police to hang signs promising bread and marmalade to those who would appear at the Umschlagplatz. The first transport of about 5,000 Jews departed Warsaw for Treblinka on the 23rd of July. As Blumer Bergman recalled, people who were starving would do anything for a bit of food, even if you know that you're going to be killed.
Thus began the operation in the Warsaw Ghetto that the Germans called the Large Action. Huffler and his crew installed themselves in the ghetto at Zelazna 103. As they had done in other cities and towns in the Lublin, Krakow, and Galicia district of the general government, they and the local security police now turned to coercion. With the help of a few hundred Travniki men and about two thousand Jewish policemen, the Germans organized roundups in the Warsaw Ghetto almost every single day for the next two months. After the very hungry were gone, the Jewish police next took groups who seemed helpless, the orphans, the poor, the homeless, prisoners. The old and the young had no chance whatsoever. Children under the age of fifteen disappeared entirely from the ghetto. The Germans shot very young children, the sick, the handicapped, and the aged, on the spot. At first, the Jewish police were able to carry out the task with little German supervision. After a few days of deporting the hungry and the helpless, the Germans applied the same technique in Warsaw as elsewhere, the surprise blockade of an apartment building or part of a street, the verification of papers, and the deportation of all Jews not deemed necessary for labor. The Jewish police, supervised by the German police, carried out the first blockade on the 29th of July, 1942. The Germans decided which areas were to be cleared at what times. The Jewish policeman would open at dawn a sealed envelope with instructions about which areas were to be cleared on that day. In general, the Germans carried out two actions each day, aiming to fill a quota. The elections for labor kept some individuals alive, but undermined any collective spirit of resistance. Although the Germans were far from precise in their observation of the difference between documented laborers and others, selection created a crucial social division between those Jews who had papers and those who did not, and brought a general preoccupation with personal security. People tended to believe that they and their families could remain in the ghetto with the right jobs and the right papers. This privatization of hope was doom for the collectivity. Available energy was spent in the hunt for documents, rather than in the coordination of resistance. No one tried, as yet, to wrest the monopoly of force within the ghetto from the Germans and the Jewish police. So long as there was no Jewish group willing to resist the Jewish police, the roundups and deportations could continue, with German oversight, but quite limited German personnel. By August 1942, the Germans required that Jewish policemen each produce five Jews a day for deportation, or else see members of their own families deported. This had the effect of removing those who could not defend themselves. The major orphanages were emptied on the 5th of August. The famous educator Janusz Korczak led his children to the Umschlagplatz. He held two of them by the hand and walked with his head high. Among the 6,623 people deported that day, with him were the educators and caretakers of the ghetto's orphans, his colleague, Stefania Wilczynska, and many others. Policemen took the old and the young to Umschlagplatz on carts. 